The blow was so heavy that she did not look for the man who had abandoned her, but threw herself at her mother's knees and confessed her misfortune, and, some months after, gave birth to a boy. 4. Years passed, and Francois Tessier grew old, without there having been any alteration in his life. He led the dull, monotonous life of an office clerk, without hope and without expectation. Every day he got up at the same time, went through the same streets, went through the same door, passed the same porter, went into the same office, sat in the same chair, and did the same work. He was alone in the world, alone during the day in the midst of his different colleagues, and alone at night in his bachelor's lodgings, and he laid by a hundred francs a month against old age. Every Sunday he went to the champs Elysee to watch the elegant people, the carriages, and the pretty women. And the next day he used to say to one of his colleagues, the return of the carriages from the Bois du Boulogne was very brilliant yesterday. One fine Sunday morning, however, he went into the Parc Monceau, where the mothers and nurses, sitting on the sides of the walks, watched the children playing, and suddenly Francois Tessier started. A woman passed by, holding two children by the hand, a little boy of about ten and a little girl of four. It was she. He walked another hundred yards anti then fell into a chair, choking with emotion. She had not recognized him, and so he came back, wishing to see her again. She was sitting down now, and the boy was standing by her side very quietly, while the little girl was making sand castles. It was she, it was certainly she, but she had the reserved appearance of a lady, was dressed simply, and looked self-possessed and dignified. He looked at her from a distance, for he did not venture to go near. But the little boy raised his head, and Francois Tessier felt himself tremble. It was his own son, there could be no doubt of that. And, as he looked at him, he thought he could recognize himself as he appeared in an old photograph taken years ago. He remained hidden behind a tree, waiting for her to go that he might follow her. He did not sleep that night. The idea of the child especially tormented him. His son. Oh, if he could only have known, have been sure. But what could he have done? However, he went to the house where she lived and asked about her. He was told that a neighbor, an honorable man of strict morals, had been touched by her distress and had married her. He knew the fault she had committed and had married her, and had even recognized the child, his, Francois Tessier's child, as his own. He returned to the Parc Monceau every Sunday, for then he always saw her, and each time he was seized with a mad, an irresistible longing to take his son into his arms, to cover him with kisses and to steal him, to carry him off. He suffered horribly in his wretched isolation as an old bachelor, with nobody to care for him, and he also suffered atrocious mental torture, torn by paternal tenderness springing from remorse. Longing and jealousy and from that need of loving one's own children which nature has implanted in all. At last he determined to make a despairing attempt, and, going up to her, as she entered the park, he said, standing in the middle of the path, pale and with trembling lips, you do not recognize me. She raised her eyes, looked at him, uttered an exclamation of horror, of terror, and, taking the two children by the hand, she rushed away, dragging them after her, while he went home and wept inconsolably. Months passed without his seeing her again, but he suffered, day and night, for he was a prey to his paternal love. He would gladly have died, if he could only have kissed his son. He would have committed murder, performed any task, braved any danger, ventured anything. He wrote to her, but she did not reply, and, after writing her some twenty letters, he saw that there was no hope of altering her determination, and then he formed the desperate resolution of writing to her husband. Being quite prepared to receive a bullet from a revolver, if need be. His letter only consisted of a few lines, as follows. Monsieur, you must have a perfect horror of my name, but I am so wretched, so overcome by misery that my only hope is in you, and, therefore, I venture to request you to grant me an interview of only five minutes. I have the honor, etc. The next day he received the reply. Monsieur, I shall expect you tomorrow, Tuesday, at five o'clock. As he went up the staircase, Francois Tessier's heart beat so violently that he had to stop several times. There was a dull and violent thumping noise in his breast, 
as of some animal galloping, and he could breathe only with difficulty, and had to hold on to the banisters, in order not to fall. He rang the bell on the third floor, and when a maid servant had opened the door, he asked, Does Monsieur Flamel live here? Yes, Monsieur. Kindly come in. He was shown into the drawing room. He was alone, and waited, feeling bewildered, as in the midst of a catastrophe, until a door opened, and a man came in. He was tall, serious and rather stout, and wore a black frock coat, and pointed to a chair with his hand. François Tessier sat down, and then said, with choking breath, Monsieur, Monsieur, I do not know whether you know my name, whether you know? Monsieur Flamel interrupted him. You need not tell it me, Monsieur, I know it. My wife has spoken to me about you. He spoke in the dignified tone of voice of a good man who wishes to be severe, and with the commonplace stateliness of an honorable man, and Francois Tissier continued. Well, Monsieur, I want to say this, I am dying of grief, of remorse, of shame. And I would like once, only once to kiss the child. Monsieur Flamel got up and rang the bell, and when the servant came in, he said, Will you bring Louis here? When she had gone out, they remained face to face, without speaking, as they had nothing more to say to one another, and waited. Then, suddenly, a little boy of ten rushed into the room and ran up to the man whom he believed to be his father, but he stopped when he saw the stranger, and Monsieur Flamel kissed him and said, Now, go and kiss that gentleman, my dear. And the child went up to the stranger and looked at him. Francois Tessier had risen. He let his hat fall, and was ready to fall himself as he looked at his son, while Monsieur Flamel had turned away, from a feeling of delicacy, and was looking out of the window. The child waited in surprise. But he picked up the hat and gave it to the stranger. Then Francois, taking the child up in his arms, began to kiss him wildly all over his face, on his eyes, his cheeks, his mouth, his hair. And the youngster, frightened at the shower of kisses, tried to avoid them, turned away his head, and pushed away the man's face with his little hands. But suddenly Francois Tessier put him down and cried, Goodbye. Goodbye. And he rushed out of the room as if he had been a thief. My uncle Sosthenes. Some people are free thinkers from sheer stupidity. My uncle Sosthenes was one of these. Some people are often religious for the same reason. The very sight of a priest threw my uncle into a violent rage. He would shake his fist and make grimaces at him, and would then touch a piece of iron when the priest's back was turned, forgetting that the latter action showed a belief after all, the belief in the evil eye. Now, when beliefs are unreasonable, one should have all or none at all. I myself am a free thinker. I revolt at all dogmas, but feel no anger toward places of worship, be they Catholic, Apostolic, Roman, Protestant, Greek, Russian, Buddhist, Jewish, or Mohammedan. My uncle was a Freemason, and I used to declare that they are stupider than old women devotees. That is my opinion, and I maintain it, if we must have any religion at all, the old one is good enough for me. What is their object? Mutual help to be obtained by tickling the palms of each other's hands. I see no harm in it, for they put into practice the Christian precept, do unto others as ye would they should do unto you. The only difference consists in the tickling, but it does not seem worth while to make such a fuss about lending a poor devil half a crown. To all my arguments my uncle's reply used to be. We are raising up a religion against a religion. Free thought will kill clericalism. Freemasonry is the stronghold of those who are demolishing all deities. Very well, my dear uncle, I would reply, in my heart I felt inclined to say, you old idiot. It is just that which I am blaming you for. Instead of destroying, you are organizing competition, it is only a case of lowering prices. And then, if you admitted only free thinkers among you, I could understand it, but you admit anybody. You have a number of Catholics among you, even the leaders of the party. Pius IX is said to have been one of you before he became Pope. If you call a society with such an organization a bulwark against clericalism, I think it is an extremely weak one. My dear boy, my uncle would reply, with a wink, we are most to be dreaded in politics. 
slowly and surely we are everywhere undermining the monarchical spirit. Then I broke out, yes, you are very clever. If you tell me that Freemasonry is an election machine, I will grant it. I will never deny that it is used as a machine to control candidates of all shades, if you say that it is only used to hoodwink people, to drill them to go to the polls as soldiers are sent under fire, I agree with you. If you declare that it is indispensable to all political ambitions because it changes all its members into electoral agents, I should say to you, that is as clear as the sun. But when you tell me that it serves to undermine the monarchical spirit, I can only laugh in your face. Just consider that gigantic and secret democratic association which had Prince Napoleon for its Grand Master under the Empire. Which has the Crown Prince for its Grand Master in Germany, the Tsar's brother in Russia, and to which the Prince of Wales and King Humbert, and nearly all the crowned heads of the globe belong. You are quite right, my uncle said. But all these persons are serving our projects without guessing it. I felt inclined to tell him he was talking a pack of nonsense. It was, however, indeed a sight to see my uncle when he had a Freemason to dinner. On meeting they shook hands in a manner that was irresistibly funny, one could see that they were going through a series of secret, mysterious signs. Then my uncle would take his friend into a corner to tell him something important, and at dinner they had a peculiar way of looking at each other, and of drinking to each other, in a manner as if to say, we know all about it, don't we? and to think that there are millions on the face of the globe who are amused at such monkey tricks. I would sooner be a Jesuit. Now, in our town there really was an old Jesuit who was my uncle's detestation. Every time he met him, or if he only saw him at a distance, he used to say, Get away, you toad. And then, taking my arm, he would whisper to me, See here, that fellow will play me a trick some day or other, I feel sure of it. My uncle spoke quite truly, and this was how it happened, and through my fault. It was close on Holy Week, and my uncle made up his mind to give a dinner on Good Friday, a real dinner, with his favorite chitlins and black puddings. I resisted as much as I could, and said, I shall eat meat on that day, but at home, quite by myself. Your manifestation, as you call it, is an idiotic idea. Why should you manifest? What does it matter to you if people do not eat any meat? But my uncle would not be persuaded. He asked three of his friends to dine with him at one of the best restaurants in the town, and as he was going to pay the bill I had certainly, after all, no scruples about manifesting. At four o'clock we took a conspicuous place in the most frequented restaurant in the town, and my uncle ordered dinner in a loud voice for six o'clock. We sat down punctually and at ten o'clock we had not yet finished. Five of us had drunk eighteen bottles of choice, still wine and four of champagne. Then my uncle proposed what he was in the habit of calling the Archbishop's Circuit. Each man put six small glasses in front of him, each of them filled with a different liqueur, and they had all to be emptied at one gulp, one after another, while one of the waiters counted twenty. It was very stupid, but my uncle thought it was very suitable to the occasion. At eleven o'clock he was as drunk as a fly. So we had to take him home in a cab and put him to bed, and one could easily foresee that his anti-clerical demonstration would end in a terrible fit of indigestion. As I was going back to my lodgings, being rather drunk myself, with a cheerful drunkenness, a Machiavellian idea struck me which satisfied all my skeptical instincts. I arranged my necktie, put on a look of great distress, and went and rang loudly at the old Jesuit's door. As he was deaf he made me wait a longish while, but at length appeared at his window in a cotton nightcap and asked what I wanted. I shouted out at the top of my voice, Make haste, reverend sir, and open the door, a poor, despairing, sick man is in need of your spiritual ministrations. The good, kind man put on his trousers as quickly as he could, and came down without his cassock. I told him in a breathless voice that my uncle, the freethinker, had been taken suddenly ill, and fearing it was going to be something serious, he had been seized with a sudden dread of death, and wished to see the priest and talk to him. To have his advice and comfort, to make his peace with the church, and to confess, so as to be able to cross the dreaded threshold at peace with himself. And I added in a mocking tone. 
At any rate, he wishes it, and if it does him no good it can do him no harm. The old Jesuit, who was startled, delighted, and almost trembling, said to me, Wait a moment, my son, I will come with you. But I replied, Pardon me, reverend father, if I do not go with you, but my convictions will not allow me to do so. I even refused to come and fetch you, so I beg you not to say that you have seen me, but to declare that you had a presentiment, a sort of revelation of his illness. The priest consented and went off quickly. Knocked at my uncle's door, and was soon let in, and I saw the black cassock disappear within that stronghold of free thought. I hid under a neighboring gateway to wait results. Had he been well, my uncle would have half murdered the Jesuit, but I knew that he would scarcely be able to move an arm, and I asked myself gleefully what sort of a scene would take place between these antagonists, what disputes, what arguments. What a hubbub, and what would be the issue of the situation, which my uncle's indignation would render still more tragic. I laughed till my sides ached and said half aloud, Oh, what a joke, what a joke. Meanwhile it was getting very cold, and I noticed that the Jesuits stayed a long time, and I thought, they are having an argument, I suppose. One, two, three hours passed, and still the Reverend Father did not come out. What had happened? Had my uncle died in a fit when he saw him, or had he killed the cassock gentleman? Perhaps they had mutually devoured each other? This last supposition appeared very unlikely, for I fancied that my uncle was quite incapable of swallowing a grain more nourishment at that moment. At last the day broke. I was very uneasy, and, not venturing to go into the house myself, went to one of my friends who lived opposite. I woke him up, explained matters to him, much to his amusement and astonishment, and took possession of his window. At nine o'clock he relieved me, and I got a little sleep. At two o'clock I, in my turn, replaced him. We were utterly astonished. At six o'clock the Jesuit left, with a very happy and satisfied look on his face, and we saw him go away with a quiet step. Then, timid and ashamed, I went and knocked at the door of my uncle's house. And when the servant opened it I did not dare to ask her any questions, but went upstairs without saying a word. My uncle was lying, pale and exhausted, with weary, sorrowful eyes and heavy arms, on his bed. A little religious picture was fastened to one of the bed curtains with a pin. Why, uncle, I said, in bed still. Are you not well? He replied in a feeble voice. Oh, my dear boy, I have been very ill, nearly dead. How was that, uncle? I don't know, it was most surprising. But what is stranger still is that the Jesuit priest who has just left, you know, that excellent man whom I have made such fun of, had a divine revelation of my state, and came to see me. I was seized with an almost uncontrollable desire to laugh, and with difficulty said, Oh, really? Yes, he came. He heard a voice telling him to get up and come to me, because I was going to die. I was a revelation. I pretended to sneeze, so as not to burst out laughing, I felt inclined to roll on the ground with amusement. In about a minute I managed to say indignantly. And you received him, uncle? You, a freethinker, a freemason? You did not have him thrown out of doors? He seemed confused, and stammered. Listen a moment, it is so astonishing, so astonishing and providential. He also spoke to me about my father, it seems he knew him formerly. Your father, uncle? But that is no reason for receiving a Jesuit. I know that, but I was very ill, and he looked after me most devotedly all night long. He was perfect, no doubt he saved my life, those men all know a little of medicine. Oh! He looked after you all night? But you said just now that he had only been gone a very short time. That is quite true, I kept him to breakfast after all his kindness. He had it at a table by my bedside while I drank a cup of tea. And he ate meat? My uncle looked vexed, as if I had said something very uncalled for, and then added. Don't joke, Gaston, such things are out of place at times. He has shown me more devotion than many a relation would have done, and I expect to have his convictions respected. 
This rather upset me, but I answered, nevertheless, very well, uncle, and what did you do after breakfast? We played a game of bezique, and then he repeated his breviary while I read a little book which he happened to have in his pocket, and which was not by any means badly written. A religious book, uncle? Yes, and no, or, rather, no. It is the history of their missions in Central Africa, and is rather a book of travels and adventures. What these men have done is very grand. I began to feel that matters were going badly, so I got up. Well, goodbye, uncle, I said, I see you are going to give up Freemasonry for religion, you are a renegade. He was still rather confused, and stammered. Well, but religion is a sort of Freemasonry. When is your Jesuit coming back? I asked. I don't, I don't know exactly, tomorrow, perhaps, but it is not certain. I went out, altogether overwhelmed. My joke turned out very badly for me. My uncle became thoroughly converted, and if that had been all I should not have cared so much. Clerical or Freemason, to me it is all the same, six of one and half a dozen of the other, but the worst of it is that he has just made his will, yes, made his will, and he has disinherited me in favor of that rascally Jesuit. The Baroness. Come with me, said my friend Boronet, you will see some very interesting bric-a-brac and works of art there. He conducted me to the first floor of an elegant house in one of the big streets of Paris. We were welcomed by a very pleasing man, with excellent manners, who led us from room to room, showing us rare things, the price of which he mentioned carelessly. Large sums, ten, twenty on thirty, fifty thousand francs, dropped from his lips with such grace and ease that one could not doubt that this gentleman merchant had millions shut up in his safe. I had known him by reputation for a long time. Very bright, clever, intelligent, he acted as intermediary in all sorts of transactions. He kept in touch with all the richest art amateurs in Paris, and even of Europe and America, knowing their tastes and preferences. He apprised them by letter, or by wire if they lived in a distant city, as soon as he knew of some work of art which might suit them. Men of the best society had had recourse to him in times of difficulty either to find money for gambling, or to pay off a debt, or to sell a picture, a family jewel, or a tapestry. It was said that he never refused his services when he saw a chance of gain. Boronet seemed very intimate with this strange merchant. They must have worked together in many a deal. I observed the man with great interest. He was tall, thin, bald, and very elegant. His soft, insinuating voice had a peculiar, tempting charm which seemed to give the objects a special value. When he held anything in his hands, he turned it round and round, looking at it with such skill, refinement, and sympathy that the object seemed immediately to be beautiful and transformed by his look and touch and its value increased in one's estimation, after the object had passed from the showcase into his hands. And your crucifix, said Boronet, that beautiful Renaissance crucifix which you showed me last year? The man smiled and answered. It has been sold, and in a very peculiar manner. There is a real Parisian story for you. Would you like to hear it? With pleasure. Do you know the Baroness Samoris? Yes and no. I have seen her once, but I know what she is. You know, everything? Yes. Would you mind telling me, so that I can see whether you are not mistaken? Certainly. Madame. Samoris is a woman of the world who has a daughter, without anyone having known her husband. At any rate, she is received in a certain tolerant, or blind society. She goes to church and devoutly partakes of communion, so that everyone may know it, and she never compromises herself. She expects her daughter to marry well. Is that correct? Yes, but I will complete your information. She is a woman who makes herself respected by her admirers in spite of everything. That is a rare quality, for in this manner she can get what she wishes from a man. The man whom she has chosen without his suspecting it courts her for a long time, longs for her timidly, wins her with astonishment and possesses her with consideration. He does not notice that he is paying, she is so tactful. 
and she maintains her relations on such a footing of reserve and dignity that he would slap the first man who dared doubt her in the least. And all this in the best of faith. Several times I have been able to render little services to this woman. She has no secrets from me. Toward the beginning of January she came to me in order to borrow thirty thousand francs. Naturally, I did not lend them to her. But, as I wished to oblige her, I told her to explain her situation to me completely, so that I might see whether there was not something I could do for her. She told me her troubles in such cautious language that she could not have spoken more delicately of her child's first communion. I finally managed to understand that times were hard and that she was penniless. The commercial crisis, political unrest, rumors of war, had made money scarce even in the hands of her clients. And then, of course, she was very particular. She would associate only with a man in the best of society, who could strengthen her reputation as well as help her financially. A reveller, no matter how rich, would have compromised her forever, and would have made the marriage of her daughter quite doubtful. She had to maintain her household expenses and continue to entertain, in order not to lose the opportunity of finding, among her numerous visitors, the discreet and distinguished friend for whom she was waiting and whom she would choose. I showed her that my thirty thousand francs would have but little likelihood of returning to me, for, after spending them all, she would have to find at least sixty thousand more, in a lump, to pay me back. She seemed very disheartened when she heard this. I did not know just what to do when an idea, a really fine idea, struck me. I had just bought this Renaissance crucifix which I showed you, an admirable piece of workmanship, one of the finest of its land that I have ever seen. My dear friend, I said to her, I am going to send you that piece of ivory. You will invent some ingenious, touching, poetic story, anything that you wish, to explain your desire for parting with it. It is, of course, a family heirloom left you by your father. I myself will send you amateurs, or will bring them to you. The rest concerns you. Before they come I will drop you a line about their position, both social and financial. This crucifix is worth fifty thousand francs, but I will let it go for thirty thousand. The difference will belong to you. She considered the matter seriously for several minutes, and then answered, Yes, it is, perhaps, a good idea. I thank you very much. The next day I sent her my crucifix, and the same evening the Baron de Saint Hospital. For three months I sent her my best clients, from a business point of view. But I heard nothing more from her. One day I received a visit from a foreigner who spoke very little French. I decided to introduce him personally to the Baroness, in order to see how she was getting along. A footman in black livery received us and ushered us into a quiet little parlor, furnished with taste, where we waited for several minutes. She appeared, charming as usual, extended her hand to me and invited us to be seated, and when I had explained the reason of my visit, she rang. The footman appeared. See if MLLE Isabel can let us go into her oratory. The young girl herself brought the answer. She was about fifteen years of age, modest and good to look upon in the sweet freshness of her youth. She wished to conduct us herself to her chapel. It was a kind of religious boudoir where a silver lamp was burning before the crucifix, my crucifix, on a background of black velvet. The setting was charming and very clever. The child crossed herself and then said, Look, gentlemen. Isn't it beautiful? I took the object, examined it and declared it to be remarkable. The foreigner also examined it, but he seemed much more interested in the two women than in the crucifix. A delicate odor of incense, flowers and perfume pervaded the whole house. One felt at home there. This really was a comfortable home, where one would have liked to linger. When we had returned to the parlor I delicately broached the subject of the price. Madame Samoris, lowering her eyes, asked fifty thousand francs. Then she added, If you wish to see it again, Monsieur, I very seldom go out before three o'clock. And I can be found at home every day. In the street the stranger asked me for some details about the Baroness, whom he had found charming. But I did not hear anything more from either of them. Three months passed by. 
One morning, hardly two weeks ago, she came here at about lunchtime and, placing a roll of bills in my hand, said, My dear, you are an angel. Here are 50,000 francs. I am buying your crucifix, and I am paying 20,000 francs more for it than the price agreed upon, on condition that you always, always send your clients to me, for it is still for sale. Mother and son. A party of men were chatting in the smoking room after dinner. We were talking of unexpected legacies, strange inheritances. Then M. Lou Brumant, who was sometimes called the illustrious judge and at other times the illustrious lawyer, went and stood with his back to the fire. I have, said he, to search for an heir who disappeared under peculiarly distressing circumstances. It is one of those simple and terrible dramas of ordinary life, a thing which possibly happens every day, and which is nevertheless one of the most dreadful things I know. Here are the facts. Nearly six months ago, I was called to the bedside of a dying woman. She said to me, Monsieur, I want to entrust to you the most delicate, the most difficult, and the most wearisome mission that can be conceived. Be good enough to notice my will, which is there on the table. A sum of five thousand francs is left to you as a fee if you do not succeed, and of a hundred thousand francs if you do succeed. I want you to find my son after my death. She asked me to assist her to sit up in bed, in order that she might talk with greater ease, for her voice, broken and gasping, was whistling in her throat. It was a very wealthy establishment. The luxurious apartment, of an elegant simplicity, was upholstered with materials as thick as walls, with a soft inviting surface. The dying woman continued. You are the first to hear my horrible story. I will try to have strength enough to finish it. You must know all, in order that you, whom I know to be a kind-hearted man as well as a man of the world, may have a sincere desire to aid me with all your power. Listen to me. Before my marriage, I loved a young man, whose suit was rejected by my family because he was not rich enough. Not long afterward, I married a man of great wealth. I married him through ignorance, through obedience, through indifference, as young girls do marry. I had a child, a boy. My husband died in the course of a few years. He whom I had loved had married, in his turn. When he saw that I was a widow, he was crushed by grief at knowing he was not free. He came to see me, he wept and sobbed so bitterly that it was enough to break my heart. He came to see me at first as a friend. Perhaps I ought not to have received him. What could I do? I was alone, so sad, so solitary, so hopeless. And I loved him still. What sufferings we women have sometimes to endure. I had only him in the world, my parents being dead. He came frequently, he spent whole evenings with me. I should not have let him come so often, seeing that he was married. But I had not enough willpower to prevent him from coming. How can I tell it, he became my lover. How did this come about? Can I explain it? Can anyone explain such things? Do you think it could be otherwise when two human beings are drawn to each other by the irresistible force of mutual affection? Do you believe, monsieur, that it is always in our power to resist, that we can keep up the struggle forever, and refuse to yield to the prayers, the supplications, the tears, the frenzied words, the appeals on bended knees? The transports of passion, with which we are pursued by the man we adore, whom we want to gratify even in his slightest wishes, whom we desire to crown with every possible happiness, and whom, if we are to be guided by a worldly code of honor, we must drive to despair? What strength would it not require? What a renunciation of happiness! What self-denial! And even what virtuous selfishness! In short, monsieur, I was his mistress, and I was happy. I became, and this was my greatest weakness and my greatest piece of cowardice I became his wife's friend. We brought up my son together, we made a man of him, a thorough man, intelligent, full of sense and resolution, of large and generous ideas. The boy reached the age of seventeen. He, the young man, was fond of my whom I lover, almost as fond of him as I was myself, for he had been equally cherished and cared for by both of us. He used to call him his dear friend, and respected him immensely, 
having never received from him anything but wise counsels and an example of integrity, honor, and probity. He looked upon him as an old loyal and devoted comrade of his mother, as a sort of moral father, guardian, protector, how am I to describe it? Perhaps the reason why he never asked any questions was that he had been accustomed from his earliest years to see this man in my house, at my side, and at his side, always concerned about us both. One evening the three of us were to dine together, this was my chief amusement, and I waited for the two men, asking myself which of them would be the first to arrive. The door opened, it was my old friend. I went toward him, with outstretched arms. And he pressed my lips in a long, delicious kiss. All of a sudden, a slight sound, a faint rustling, that mysterious sensation which indicates the presence of another person, made us start and turn round abruptly. Jean, my son, stood there, livid, staring at us. There was a moment of atrocious confusion. I drew back, holding out my hand toward my son as if in supplication, but I could not see him. He had gone. We remained facing each other, my lover and I, crushed, unable to utter a word. I sank into an armchair, and I felt a desire, a vague, powerful desire, to flee, to go out into the night, and to disappear forever. Then convulsive sobs rose in my throat, and I wept, shaken with spasms, my heart breaking, all my nerves writhing with the horrible sensation of an irreparable misfortune, and with that dreadful sense of shame which, in such moments as this, fills a mother's heart. He looked at me in a terrified manner, not venturing to approach, to speak to me, or to touch me, for fear of the boy's return. At last he said, I am going to follow him to talk to him, to explain matters to him. In short, I must see him and let him know. And he hurried away. I waited, waited in a distracted frame of mind, trembling at the least sound, starting with fear and with some unutterably strange and intolerable emotion at every slight crackling of the fire in the grate. I waited an hour, two hours, feeling my heart swell with a dread I had never before experienced, such anguish that I would not wish the greatest criminal to endure ten minutes of such misery. Where was my son? What was he doing? About midnight, a messenger brought me a note from my lover. I still know its contents by heart. Has your son returned? I did not find him. I am down here. I do not want to go up at this hour. I wrote in pencil on the same slip of paper. Jean has not returned. You must find him. And I remained all night in the armchair, waiting for him. I felt as if I were going mad. I longed to run wildly about, to roll on the ground. And yet I did not even stir, but kept waiting hour after hour. What was going to happen? I tried to imagine, to guess. But I could form no conception, in spite of my efforts, in spite of the tortures of my soul. And now I feared that they might meet. What would they do in that case? What would my son do? My mind was torn with fearful doubts, with terrible suppositions. You can understand my feelings, can you not, monsieur? My chambermaid, who knew nothing, who understood nothing, came into the room every moment, believing, naturally, that I had lost my reason. I sent her away with a word or a movement of the hand. She went for the doctor, who found me in the throes of a nervous attack. I was put to bed. I had brain fever. When I regained consciousness, after a long illness, I saw beside my bed my lover, alone. I exclaimed. My son? Where is my son? He made no reply. I stammered. Dead dead. Has he committed suicide? No, no, I swear it. But we have not found him in spite of all my efforts. Then, becoming suddenly exasperated and even indignant, for women are subject to such outbursts of unaccountable and unreasoning anger, I said. I forbid you to come near me or to see me again unless you find him. Go away. He did go away. I have never seen one or the other of them since, monsieur, and thus I have lived for the last twenty years. Can you imagine what all this meant to me? Can you understand this monstrous punishment, this slow, perpetual laceration of a mother's heart, this abominable, endless waiting? 
Endless, did I say? No, it is about to end, for I am dying. I am dying without ever again seeing either of them, either one or the other. He, the man I loved, has written to me every day for the last twenty years, and I, I have never consented to see him, even for one second. For I had a strange feeling that, if he were to come back here, my son would make his appearance at the same moment. Oh! My son! My son! Is he dead? Is he living? Where is he hiding? Over there, perhaps, beyond the great ocean, in some country so far away that even its very name is unknown to me. Does he ever think of me? Ah! If he only knew! How cruel one's children are! Did he understand to what frightful suffering he condemned me, into what depths of despair, into what tortures, he cast me while I was still in the prime of life, leaving me to suffer until this moment, when I am about to die who me, his mother? Who loved him with all the intensity of a mother's love? Oh! Isn't it cruel, cruel? You will tell him all this, monsieur, will you not? You will repeat to him my last words. My child, my dear, dear child, be less harsh toward poor women. Life is already brutal and savage enough in its dealings with them. My dear son, think of what the existence of your poor mother has been ever since the day you left her. My dear child, forgive her, and love her, now that she is dead, for she has had to endure the most frightful penance ever inflicted on a woman. She gasped for breath, trembling, as if she had addressed the last words to her son and as if he stood by her bedside. Then she added. You will tell him also, monsieur, that I never again saw the other. Once more she ceased speaking, then, in a broken voice, she said. Leave me now, I beg of you. I want to die all alone, since they are not with me." Maitre Lubrument added. And I left the house, messieurs, crying like a fool, so bitterly, indeed, that my coachman turned round to stare at me. And to think that, every day, dramas like this are being enacted all around us. I have not found the son, that son, well, say what you like about him, but I call him that criminal son. The Hand all were crowding around M. Bermudier, the judge, who was giving his opinion about the St. Cloud mystery. For a month this inexplicable crime had been the talk of Paris. Nobody could make head or tail of it. M. Bermudier, standing with his back to the fireplace, was talking, citing the evidence, discussing the various theories, but arriving at no conclusion. Some women had risen, in order to get nearer to him, and were standing with their eyes fastened on the clean-shaven face of the judge, who was saying such weighty things. They were shaking and trembling, moved by fear and curiosity, and by the eager and insatiable desire for the horrible, which haunts the soul of every woman. One of them, paler than the others, said during a pause. It's terrible. It verges on the supernatural. The truth will never be known. The judge turned to her. True, madam, it is likely that the actual facts will never be discovered. As for the word supernatural which you have just used, it has nothing to do with the matter. We are in the presence of a very cleverly conceived and executed crime, so well enshrouded in mystery that we cannot disentangle it from the involved circumstances which surround it. But once I had to take charge of an affair in which the uncanny seemed to play a part. In fact, the case became so confused that it had to be given up. Several women exclaimed at once. Oh! Tell us about it. M. Bermudier smiled in a dignified manner, as a judge should, and went on. Do not think, however, that I, for one minute, ascribed anything in the case to supernatural influences. I believe only in normal causes. But if, instead of using the word supernatural to express what we do not understand, we were simply to make use of the word inexplicable, it would be much better. At any rate, in the affair of which I am about to tell you, it is especially the surrounding, preliminary circumstances which impressed me. Here are the facts. I was, at that time, a judge at Ayacho, a little white city on the edge of a bay which is surrounded by high mountains. The majority of the cases which came up before me concerned vendettas. 
There are some that are superb, dramatic, ferocious, heroic. We find there the most beautiful causes for revenge of which one could dream, enmities hundreds of years old, quieted for a time but never extinguished. Abominable stratagems, murders becoming massacres and almost deeds of glory. For two years I heard of nothing but the price of blood, of this terrible Corsican prejudice which compels revenge for insults meted out to the offending person and all his descendants and relatives. I had seen old men, children, cousins murdered. My head was full of these stories. One day I learned that an Englishman had just hired a little villa at the end of the bay for several years. He had brought with him a French servant, whom he had engaged on the way at Marseilles. Soon this peculiar person, living alone, only going out to hunt and fish, aroused a widespread interest. He never spoke to anyone, never went to the town, and every morning he would practice for an hour or so with his revolver and rifle. Legends were built up around him. It was said that he was some high personage, fleeing from his fatherland for political reasons, then it was affirmed that he was in hiding after having committed some abominable crime. Some particularly horrible circumstances were even mentioned. In my judicial position I thought it necessary to get some information about this man, but it was impossible to learn anything. He called himself Sir John Rowell. I therefore had to be satisfied with watching him as closely as I could, but I could see nothing suspicious about his actions. However, as rumors about him were growing and becoming more widespread, I decided to try to see this stranger myself, and I began to hunt regularly in the neighborhood of his grounds. For a long time I watched without finding an opportunity. At last it came to me in the shape of a partridge which I shot and killed right in front of the Englishman. My dog fetched it for me, but, taking the bird, I went at once to Sir John Rowell and, begging his pardon, asked him to accept it. He was a big man, with red hair and beard, very tall, very broad, a kind of calm and polite Hercules. He had nothing of the so-called British stiffness, and in a broad English accent he thanked me warmly for my attention. At the end of a month we had had five or six conversations. One night, at last, as I was passing before his door, I saw him in the garden, seated astride a chair, smoking his pipe. I bowed and he invited me to come in and have a glass of beer. I needed no urging. He received me with the most punctilious English courtesy, sang the praises of France and of Corsica, and declared that he was quite in love with this country. Then, with great caution and under the guise of a vivid interest, I asked him a few questions about his life and his plans. He answered without embarrassment, telling me that he had traveled a great deal in Africa, in the Indies, in America. He added, laughing. I have had many adventures. Then I turned the conversation on hunting, and he gave me the most curious details on hunting the hippopotamus, the tiger, the elephant and even the gorilla. I said. Are all these animals dangerous? He smiled. Oh, no. Man is the worst. And he laughed a good broad laugh, the wholesome laugh of a contented Englishman. I have also frequently been man-hunting. Then he began to talk about weapons, and he invited me to come in and see different makes of guns. His parlor was draped in black, black silk embroidered in gold. Big yellow flowers, as brilliant as fire, were worked on the dark material. He said. It is a Japanese material. But in the middle of the widest panel a strange thing attracted my attention. A black object stood out against a square of red velvet. I went up to it, it was a hand, a human hand. Not the clean white hand of a skeleton, but a dried black hand, with yellow nails, the muscles exposed and traces of old blood on the bones, which were cut off as clean as though it had been chopped off with an axe, near the middle of the forearm. Around the wrist, an enormous iron chain, riveted and soldered to this unclean member, fastened it to the wall by a ring strong enough to hold an elephant in leash. I asked. What is that? The Englishman answered quietly. That is my best enemy. It comes from America, too. The bones were severed by a sword and the skin cut off with a sharp stone and dried in the sun for a week. I touched these human remains, which must have belonged to a giant. 
The uncommonly long fingers were attached by enormous tendons which still had pieces of skin hanging to them in places. This hand was terrible to see. It made one think of some savage vengeance. I said. This man must have been very strong. The Englishman answered quietly. Yes, but I was stronger than he. I put on this chain to hold him. I thought that he was joking. I said. This chain is useless now, the hand won't run away. Sir John Rowell answered seriously. It always wants to go away. This chain is needed. I glanced at him quickly, questioning his face, and I asked myself. Is he an insane man or a practical joker? But his face remained inscrutable, calm and friendly. I turned to other subjects and admired his rifles. However, I noticed that he kept three loaded revolvers in the room, as though constantly in fear of some attack. I paid him several calls. Then I did not go any more. People had become used to his presence, everybody had lost interest in him. A whole year rolled by. One morning, toward the end of November, my servant awoke me and announced that Sir John Rowell had been murdered during the night. Half an hour later I entered the Englishman's house, together with the police commissioner and the captain of the gendarmes. The servant, bewildered and in despair, was crying before the door. At first I suspected this man, but he was innocent. The guilty party could never be found. On entering Sir John's parlor, I noticed the body, stretched out on its back, in the middle of the room. His vest was torn, the sleeve of his jacket had been pulled off, everything pointed to, a violent struggle. The Englishman had been strangled. His face was black, swollen and frightful, and seemed to express a terrible fear. He held something between his teeth, and his neck, pierced by five or six holes which looked as though they had been made by some iron instrument, was covered with blood. A physician joined us. He examined the finger marks on the neck for a long time and then made this strange announcement. It looks as though he had been strangled by a skeleton. A cold chill seemed to run down my back, and I looked over to where I had formerly seen the terrible hand. It was no longer there. The chain was hanging down, broken. I bent over the dead man and, in his contracted mouth, I found one of the fingers of this vanished hand, cut, or rather sawed off by the teeth down to the second knuckle. Then the investigation began. Nothing could be discovered. No door, window or piece of furniture had been forced. The two watchdogs had not been aroused from their sleep. Here, in a few words, is the testimony of the servant. For a month his master had seemed excited. He had received many letters, which he would immediately burn. Often, in a fit of passion which approached madness, he had taken a switch and struck wildly at this dried hand riveted to the wall, and which had disappeared, no one knows how, at the very hour of the crime. He would go to bed very late and carefully lock himself in. He always kept weapons within reach. Often at night he would talk loudly as though he were quarreling with someone. That night, somehow, he had made no noise, and it was only on going to open the windows that the servant had found Sir John murdered. He suspected no one. I communicated what I knew of the dead man to the judges and public officials. Throughout the whole island a minute investigation was carried on. Nothing could be found out. One night, about three months after the crime, I had a terrible nightmare. I seemed to see the horrible hand running over my curtains and walls like an immense scorpion or spider. Three times I awoke, three times I went to sleep again. Three times I saw the hideous object galloping round my room and moving its fingers like legs. The following day the hand was brought me, found in the cemetery, on the grave of Sir John Rowell, who had been buried there because we had been unable to find his family. The first finger was missing. Ladies, there is my story. I know nothing more. The women, deeply stirred, were pale and trembling. One of them exclaimed. But that is neither a climax nor an explanation. We will be unable to sleep unless you give us your opinion of what had occurred. The judge smiled severely. Oh. Ladies, I shall certainly spoil your terrible dreams. 
I simply believe that the legitimate owner of the hand was not dead, that he came to get it with his remaining one. But I don't know how. It was a kind of vendetta. One of the women murmured. No, it can't be that. And the judge, still smiling, said. Didn't I tell you that my explanation would not satisfy you? A tress of hair. The walls of the cell were bare and whitewashed. A narrow grated window, placed so high that one could not reach it, lighted this sinister little room. The mad inmate, seated on a straw chair, looked at us with a fixed, vacant and haunted expression. He was very thin, with hollow cheeks and hair almost white, which one guessed might have turned gray in a few months. His clothes appeared to be too large for his shrunken limbs, his sunken chest and empty paunch. One felt that this man's mind was destroyed, eaten by his thoughts, by one thought, just as a fruit is eaten by a worm. His craze, his idea was there in his brain, insistent, harassing, destructive. It wasted his frame little by little. It, the invisible, impalpable, intangible, immaterial idea, was mining his health, drinking his blood, snuffing out his life. What a mystery was this man, being killed by an ideal. He aroused sorrow, fear and pity, this madman. What strange, tremendous and deadly thoughts dwelt within this forehead which they creased with deep wrinkles which were never still. He has terrible attacks of rage, said the doctor to me. His is one of the most peculiar cases I have ever seen. He has seizures of erotic and macabresque madness. He is a sort of necrophile. He has kept a journal in which he sets forth his disease with the utmost clearness. In it you can, as it were, put your finger on it. If it would interest you, you may go over this document. I followed the doctor into his office, where he handed me this wretched man's diary, saying, read it and tell me what you think of it. I read as follows. Until the age of thirty-two I lived peacefully, without knowing love. Life appeared very simple, very pleasant and very easy. I was rich. I enjoyed so many things that I had no passion for anything in particular. It was good to be alive. I awoke happy every morning and did those things that pleased me during the day and went to bed at night contented, in the expectation of a peaceful tomorrow and a future without anxiety. I had had a few flirtations without my heart being touched by any true passion or wounded by any of the sensations of true love. It is good to live like that. It is better to love but it is terrible. And yet those who love in the ordinary way must experience ardent happiness, though less than mine possibly, for love came to me in a remarkable manner. As I was wealthy, I bought all kinds of old furniture and old curiosities, and I often thought of the unknown hands that had touched these objects, of the eyes that had admired them, of the hearts that had loved them, for one does love things. I sometimes remained hours and hours looking at a little watch of the last century. It was so tiny, so pretty with its enamel and gold chasing. And it kept time as on the day when a woman first bought it, enraptured at owning this dainty trinket. It had not ceased to vibrate, to live its mechanical life, and it had kept up its regular tick-tock since the last century. Who had first worn it on her bosom amid the warmth of her clothing, the heart of the watch beating beside the heart of the woman? What hand had held it in its warm fingers, had turned it over and then wiped the enameled shepherds on the case to remove the slight moisture from her fingers? What eyes had watched the hands on its ornamental face for the expected, the beloved, the sacred hour? How I wished I had known her, seen her, the woman who had selected this exquisite and rare object. She is dead. I am possessed with a longing for women of former days. I love, from afar, all those who have loved. The story of those dead and gone loves fills my heart with regrets. Oh, the beauty, the smiles, the youthful caresses, the hopes. Should not all that be eternal? How I have wept whole nights thinking of those poor women of former days, so beautiful, so loving, so sweet, whose arms were extended in an embrace, and who now are dead. A kiss is immortal. It goes from lips to lips, from century to century, from age to age. Men receive them, give them, and die. The past attracts me, the present terrifies me because the future means death. I regret all that has gone by. 
I mourn all who have lived. I should like to check time, to stop the clock. But time goes, it goes, it passes, it takes from me each second a little of myself for the annihilation of tomorrow. And I shall never live again. Farewell, ye women of yesterday. I love you. But I am not to be pitied. I found her, the one I was waiting for, and through her I enjoyed an estimable pleasure. I was sauntering in Paris on a bright, sunny morning, with a happy heart and a high step, looking in at the shop windows with the vague interest of an idler. All at once I noticed in the shop of a dealer in antiques a piece of Italian furniture of the seventeenth century. It was very handsome, very rare. I set it down as being the work of a Venetian artist named Vitelli, who was celebrated in his day. I went on my way. Why did the remembrance of that piece of furniture haunt me with such insistence that I retraced my steps? I again stopped before the shop, in order to take another look at it, and I felt that it tempted me. What a singular thing temptation is! One gazes at an object, and, little by little, it charms you, it disturbs you, it fills your thoughts as a woman's face might do. The enchantment of it penetrates your being, a strange enchantment of form, color, and appearance of an inanimate object. And one loves it, one desires it, one wishes to have it. A longing to own it takes possession of you, gently at first, as though it were timid, but growing, becoming intense, irresistible. And the dealer seemed to guess, from your ardent gaze, your secret and increasing longing. I bought this piece of furniture and had it sent home at once. I placed it in my room. Oh, I am sorry for those who do not know the honeymoon of the collector with the antique he has just purchased. One looks at it tenderly and passes one's hand over it as if it were human flesh, one comes back to it every moment, one is always thinking of it, wherever one goes, whatever one does. The dear recollection of it pursues you in the street, in society, everywhere, and when you return home at night, before taking off your gloves or your hat, you go and look at it with the tenderness of a lover. Truly, for eight days I worshipped this piece of furniture. I opened its doors and pulled out the drawers every few moments. I handled it with rapture, with all the intense joy of possession. But one evening I surmised, while I was feeling the thickness of one of the panels, that there must be a secret drawer in it, my heart began to beat, and I spent the night trying to discover this secret cavity. I succeeded on the following day by driving a knife into a slit in the wood. A panel slid back and I saw, spread out on a piece of black velvet, a magnificent tress of hair. Yes, a woman's hair, an immense coil of fair hair, almost red, which must have been cut off close to the head, tied with a golden cord. I stood amazed, trembling, confused. An almost imperceptible perfume, so ancient that it seemed to be the spirit of a perfume, issued from this mysterious drawer and this remarkable relic. I lifted it gently, almost reverently, and took it out of its hiding place. It at once unwound in a golden shower that reached to the floor, dense but light, soft and gleaming like the tail of a comet. A strange emotion filled me. What was this? When, how, why had this hair been shut up in this drawer? What adventure, what tragedy did this souvenir conceal? Who had cut it off? A lover on a day of farewell, a husband on a day of revenge, or the one whose head it had graced on the day of despair? Was it as she was about to take the veil that they had cast thither that love dowry as a pledge to the world of the living? Was it when they were going to nail down the coffin of the beautiful young corpse that the one who had adored her had cut off her tresses, the only thing that he could retain of her, the only living part of her body that would not suffer decay? The only thing he could still love, and caress, and kiss in his paroxysms of grief? Was it not strange that this tress should have remained as it was in life? when not an atom of the body on which it grew was in existence? It fell over my fingers, tickled the skin with a singular caress, the caress of a dead woman. It affected me so that I felt as though I should weep. I held it in my hands for a long time, then it seemed as if it disturbed me, as though something of the soul had remained in it. And I put it back on the velvet, rusty from age, and pushed in the drawer, closed the doors of the antique cabinet and went out for a walk to meditate. I walked along, filled with sadness and also with unrest, that unrest that one feels when in love. 
I felt as though I must have lived before, as though I must have known this woman. And Vion's lines came to my mind like a sob. Tell me where, and in what place, is Flora, the beautiful Roman, Hipparchia and Thais. Who was her cousin German? Echo answers in the breeze. O'er river and lake that blows. Their beauty was above all praise. But where are last year's snows? The queen, white as lilies. Who sang as sing the birds? Bertha Broadfoot, Beatrice, Alice. Ermengarde, Princess of Maine. And Joan, the good Lorraine. Burned by the English at Rouen. Where are they, virgin queen? And where are last year's snows? When I got home again I felt an irresistible longing to see my singular treasure, and I took it out and, as I touched it, I felt a shiver go all through me. For some days, however, I was in my ordinary condition, although the thought of that tress of hair was always present to my mind. Whenever I came into the house I had to see it and take it in my hands. I turned the key of the cabinet with the same hesitation that one opens the door leading to one's beloved, for in my hands and my heart I felt a confused, singular, constant sensual longing to plunge my hands in the enchanting golden flood of those dead tresses. Then, after I had finished caressing it and had locked the cabinet I felt as if it were a living thing, shut up in there, imprisoned, and I longed to see it again. I felt again the imperious desire to take it in my hands, to touch it, to even feel uncomfortable at the cold, slippery, irritating, bewildering contact. I lived thus for a month or two, I forget how long. It obsessed me, haunted me. I was happy and tormented by turns, as when one falls in love, and after the first vows have been exchanged. I shut myself in the room with it to feel it on my skin, to bury my lips in it, to kiss it. I wound it round my face, covered my eyes with the golden flood so as to see the day gleam through its gold. I loved it. Yes, I loved it. I could not be without it nor pass an hour without looking at it. And I waited, I waited, for what? I do not know, for her. One night I woke up suddenly, feeling as though I were not alone in my room. I was alone, nevertheless, but I could not go to sleep again, and, as I was tossing about feverishly, I got up to look at the golden tress. It seemed softer than usual, more lifelike. Do the dead come back? I almost lost consciousness as I kissed it. I took it back with me to bed and pressed it to my lips as if it were my sweetheart. Do the dead come back? She came back. Yes, I saw her, I held her in my arms, just as she was in life, tall, fair and round. She came back every evening, the dead woman, the beautiful, adorable, mysterious unknown. My happiness was so great that I could not conceal it. No lover ever tasted such intense, terrible enjoyment. I loved her so well that I could not be separated from her. I took her with me always and everywhere. I walked about the town with her as if she were my wife, and took her to the theater, always to a private box. But they saw her, they guessed, they arrested me. They put me in prison like a criminal. They took her. Oh, misery! Here the manuscript stopped. And as I suddenly raised my astonished eyes to the doctor a terrific cry, a howl of impotent rage and of exasperated longing resounded through the asylum. Listen, said the doctor. We have to douse the obscene madman with water five times a day. Sergeant Bertrand was the only one who was in love with the dead. Filled with astonishment, horror and pity, I stammered out. But, that tress, did it really exist? The doctor rose, opened a cabinet full of files and instruments and tossed over a long tress of fair hair which flew toward me like a golden bird. I shivered at feeling its soft, light touch on my hands. And I sat there, my heart beating with disgust and desire, disgust as at the contact of anything accessory to a crime and desire as at the temptation of some infamous and mysterious thing. The doctor said as he shrugged his shoulders. The mind of man is capable of anything. On the river. I rented a little country house last summer on the banks of the Seine, several leagues from Paris, and went out there to sleep every evening. After a few days I made the acquaintance of one of my neighbors, a man between thirty and forty, 
who certainly was the most curious specimen I ever met. He was an old boating man, and crazy about boating. He was always beside the water, on the water, or in the water. He must have been born in a boat, and he will certainly die in a boat at the last. One evening as we were walking along the banks of the Seine, I asked him to tell me some stories about his life on the water. The good man at once became animated, his whole expression changed, he became eloquent, almost poetical. There was in his heart one great passion, an absorbing, irresistible passion the river. Ah, he said to me, how many memories I have, connected with that river that you see flowing beside us. You people who live in streets know nothing about the river. But listen to a fisherman as he mentions the word. To him it is a mysterious thing, profound, unknown, a land of mirages and phantasmagoria, where one sees by night things that do not exist, hears sounds that one does not recognize, trembles without knowing why. As in passing through a cemetery, and it is, in fact, the most sinister of cemeteries, one in which one has no tomb. The land seems limited to the river boatmen, and on dark nights, when there is no moon, the river seems limitless. A sailor has not the same feeling for the sea. It is often remorseless and cruel, it is true. But it shrieks, it roars, it is honest, the great sea, while the river is silent and perfidious. It does not speak, it flows along without a sound, and this eternal motion of flowing water is more terrible to me than the high waves of the ocean. Dreamers maintain that the sea hides in its bosom vast tracts of blue where those who are drowned roam among the big fishes, amid strange forests and crystal grottos. The river has only black depths where one rots in the slime. It is beautiful, however, when it sparkles in the light of the rising sun and gently laps its banks covered with whispering reeds. The poet says, speaking of the ocean, O oh waves, what mournful tragedies ye know! Deep waves, the dread of kneeling mothers' hearts. Ye tell them to each other as ye roll. On flowing tide, and this it is that gives. The sad despairing tones unto your voice. As on ye roll at eve, by mounting tide. Well, I think that the stories whispered by the slender reeds, with their little soft voices, must be more sinister than the lugubrious tragedies told by the roaring of the waves. But as you have asked for some of my recollections, I will tell you of a singular adventure that happened to me ten years ago. I was living, as I am now, in Mother Lafon's house, and one of my closest friends, Louis Burnett who has now given up boating, his low shoes and his bare neck, to go into the Supreme Court, was living in the village of C. Two leagues further down the river. We dined together every day, sometimes at his house, sometimes at mine. One evening as I was coming home along and was pretty tired, rowing with difficulty my big boat, a twelve-footer, which I always took out at night, I stopped a few moments to draw breath near the reed-covered point yonder, about two hundred meters from the railway bridge. It was a magnificent night, the moon shone brightly, the river gleamed, the air was calm and soft. This peacefulness tempted me. I thought to myself that it would be pleasant to smoke a pipe in this spot. I took up my anchor and cast it into the river. The boat floated downstream with the current, to the end of the chain, and then stopped, and I seated myself in the stern on my sheepskin and made myself as comfortable as possible. There was not a sound to be heard, except that I occasionally thought I could perceive an almost imperceptible lapping of the water against the bank, and I noticed taller groups of reeds which assumed strange shapes and seemed, at times, to move. The river was perfectly calm but I felt myself affected by the unusual silence that surrounded me. All the creatures, frogs and toads, those nocturnal singers of the marsh, were silent. Suddenly a frog croaked to my right and close beside me. I shuddered. It ceased and I heard nothing more and resolved to smoke to soothe my mind. But, although I was a noted colorer of pipes, I could not smoke. At the second draw I was nauseated and gave up trying. I began to sing. The sound of my voice was distressing to me. So I lay still, but presently the slight motion of the boat disturbed me. It seemed to me as if she were making huge lurches, from bank to bank of the river, touching each bank alternately. Then I felt as though an invisible force, or being, were drawing her to the surface of the water and lifting her out, to let her fall again. 
I was tossed about as in a tempest. I heard noises around me. I sprang to my feet with a single bound. The water was glistening, all was calm. I saw that my nerves were somewhat shaky, and I resolved to leave the spot. I pulled the anchor chain, the boat began to move, then I felt a resistance. I pulled harder, the anchor did not come up. It had caught on something at the bottom of the river, and I could not raise it. I began pulling again, but all in vain. Then, with my oars, I turned the boat with its head upstream to change the position of the anchor. It was no use, it was still caught. I flew into a rage and shook the chain furiously. Nothing budged. I sat down, disheartened, and began to reflect on my situation. I could not dream of breaking this chain or detaching it from the boat, for it was massive and was riveted at the bows to a piece of wood as thick as my arm. However, as the weather was so fine I thought that it probably would not be long before some fishermen came to my aid. My ill luck had quieted me. I sat down and was able, at length, to smoke my pipe. I had a bottle of rum. I drank two or three glasses, and was able to laugh at the situation. It was very warm, so that, if need be, I could sleep out under the stars without any great harm. All at once there was a little knock at the side of the boat. I gave a start, and a cold sweat broke out all over me. The noise was, doubtless, caused by some piece of wood borne along by the current, but that was enough, and I again became a prey to a strange nervous agitation. I seized the chain and tensed my muscles in a desperate effort. The anchor held firm. I sat down again, exhausted. The river had slowly become enveloped in a thick white fog which lay close to the water, so that when I stood up I could see neither the river, nor my feet, nor my boat. But could perceive only the tops of the reeds, and farther off in the distance the plain, lying white in the moonlight, with big black patches rising up from it towards the sky, which were formed by groups of Italian poplars. I was as if buried to the waist in a cloud of cotton of singular whiteness, and all sorts of strange fancies came into my mind. I thought that someone was trying to climb into my boat which I could no longer distinguish, and that the river, hidden by the thick fog, was full of strange creatures which were swimming all around me. I felt horribly uncomfortable, my forehead felt as if it had a tight band round it, my heart beat so that it almost suffocated me, and, almost beside myself, I thought of swimming away from the place. But then, again, the very idea made me tremble with fear. I saw myself, lost, going by guesswork in this heavy fog, struggling about amid the grasses and reeds which I could not escape, my breath rattling with fear, neither seeing the bank, nor finding my boat. And it seemed as if I would feel myself dragged down by the feet to the bottom of these black waters. In fact, as I should have had to ascend the stream at least 500 meters before finding a spot free from grasses and rushes where I could land, there were nine chances to one that I could not find my way in the fog and that I should drown. No matter how well I could swim. I tried to reason with myself. My will made me resolve not to be afraid, but there was something in me besides my will, and that other thing was afraid. I asked myself what there was to be afraid of. My brave ego ridiculed my coward ego, and never did I realize, as on that day, the existence in us of two rival personalities, one desiring a thing, the other resisting, and each winning the day in turn. This stupid, inexplicable fear increased and became terror. I remained motionless, my eyes staring, my ears on the stretch with expectation. Of what? I did not know, but it must be something terrible. I believe if it had occurred to a fish to jump out of the water, as often happens, nothing more would have been required to make me fall over, stiff and unconscious. However, by a violent effort I succeeded in becoming almost rational again. I took up my bottle of rum and took several pulls. Then an idea came to me, and I began to shout with all my might towards all the points of the compass in succession. When my throat was absolutely paralyzed I listened. A dog was howling, at a great distance. I drank some more rum and stretched myself out at the bottom of the boat. I remained there about an hour, perhaps two, not sleeping, my eyes wide open, with nightmares all about me. I did not dare to rise, and yet I intensely longed to do so. 
I delayed it from moment to moment. I said to myself, come, get up, and I was afraid to move. At last I raised myself with infinite caution as though my life depended on the slightest sound that I might make, and looked over the edge of the boat. I was dazzled by the most marvelous, the most astonishing sight that it is possible to see. It was one of those phantasmagoria of fairyland, one of those sights described by travelers on their return from distant lands, whom we listened to without believing. The fog which, two hours before, had floated on the water, had gradually cleared off and massed on the banks, leaving the river absolutely clear. While it formed on either bank an uninterrupted wall six or seven meters high, which shone in the moonlight with the dazzling brilliance of snow. One saw nothing but the river gleaming with light between these two white mountains. And high above my head sailed the great full moon, in the midst of a bluish, milky sky. All the creatures in the water were awake. The frogs croaked furiously, while every few moments I heard, first to the right and then to the left, the abrupt, monotonous and mournful metallic note of the bullfrogs. Strange to say, I was no longer afraid. I was in the midst of such an unusual landscape that the most remarkable things would not have astonished me. How long this lasted I do not know, for I ended by falling asleep. When I opened my eyes the moon had gone down and the sky was full of clouds. The water lapped mournfully, the wind was blowing, it was pitch dark. I drank the rest of the rum, then listened, while I trembled, to the rustling of the reeds and the foreboding sound of the river. I tried to see, but could not distinguish my boat, nor even my hands, which I held up close to my eyes. Little by little, however, the blackness became less intense. All at once I thought I noticed a shadow gliding past, quite near me. I shouted, a voice replied, it was a fisherman. I called him, he came near and I told him of my ill luck. He rowed his boat alongside of mine and, together, we pulled at the anchor chain. The anchor did not move. Day came, gloomy gray, rainy and cold, one of those days that bring one sorrows and misfortunes. I saw another boat. We hailed it. The man on board of her joined his efforts to ours, and gradually the anchor yielded. It rose, but slowly, slowly, loaded down by a considerable weight. At length we perceived a black mass and we drew it on board. It was the corpse of an old woman with a big stone round her neck. The Cripple The following adventure happened to me about 1882. I had just taken the train and settled down in a corner, hoping that I should be left alone, when the door suddenly opened again and I heard a voice say, Take care, monsieur, we are just at a crossing, the step is very high. Another voice answered, That's all right, Laurent, I have a firm hold on the handle. Then a head appeared and two hands seized the leather straps hanging on either side of the door and slowly pulled up an enormous body, whose feet striking on the step sounded like two canes. When the man had hoisted his torso into the compartment I noticed, at the loose edge of his trousers, the end of a wooden leg, which was soon followed by its mate. A head appeared behind this traveler and asked, Are you all right, monsieur? Yes, my boy. Then here are your packages and crutches and a servant, who looked like an old soldier, climbed in, carrying in his arms a stack of bundles wrapped in black and yellow papers and carefully tied. He placed one after the other in the net over his master's head. Then he said, There, monsieur, that is all. There are five of them, the candy, the doll the drum, the gun, and the pâté de foie gras. Very well, my boy. Thank you, Lauren. Good health. The man closed the door and walked away, and I looked at my neighbor. He was about thirty-five, although his hair was almost white, he wore the ribbon of the Legion of Honor. He had a heavy mustache and was quite stout, with the stoutness of a strong and active man who was kept motionless on account of some infirmity. He wiped his brow, sighed, and, looking me full in the face, he asked, Does smoking annoy you, monsieur? No, monsieur. Surely I knew that I, that voice, that face. But when and where had I seen them? I had certainly met that man, spoken to him, shaken his hand. That was a long, long time ago. 
It was lost in the haze wherein the mind seems to feel around blindly for memories and pursues them like fleeing phantoms without being able to seize them. He, too, was observing me, staring me out of countenance, with the persistence of a man who remembers slightly but not completely. Our eyes, embarrassed by this persistent contact, turned away. Then, after a few minutes, drawn together again by the obscure and tenacious will of working memory, they met once more, and I said, Monsieur, instead of staring at each other for an hour or so, would it not be better to try to discover where we have known each other? My neighbor answered graciously, You are quite right, Monsieur. I named myself, I am Henri Bonclair, a magistrate. He hesitated for a few minutes. Then, with the vague look and voice which accompany great mental tension, he said, Oh, I remember perfectly. I met you twelve years ago, before the war, at the Poinsels. Yes, monsieur. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. You are Lieutenant Revelier? Yes. I was Captain Revelier even up to the time when I lost my feet, both of them together from one cannonball. Now that we knew each other's identity we looked at each other again. I remembered perfectly the handsome, slender youth who led the Caudalans with such frenzied agility and gracefulness that he had been nicknamed the Fury. Going back into the dim, distant past, I recalled a story which I had heard and forgotten, one of those stories to which one listens but forgets, and which leave but a faint impression upon the memory. There was something about love in it. Little by little the shadows cleared up, and the face of a young girl appeared before my eyes. Then her name struck me with the force of an explosion, Mademoiselle de Mandel. I remembered everything now. It was indeed a love story, but quite commonplace. The young girl loved this young man, and when I had met them there was already talk of the approaching wedding. The youth seemed to be very much in love, very happy. I raised my eye to the net, where all the packages which had been brought in by the servant were trembling from the motion of the train and the voice of the servant came back to me, as if he had just finished speaking. He had said, There, monsieur, that is all. There are five of them, the candy, the doll, the drum, the gun, and the pâté de foie gras. Then, in a second, a whole romance unfolded itself in my head. It was like all those which I had already read, where the young lady married notwithstanding the catastrophe, whether physical or financial. Therefore, this officer who had been maimed in the war had returned, after the campaign, to the young girl who had given him her promise, and she had kept her word. I considered that very beautiful, but simple, just as one, considers simple all devotions and climaxes in books or in plays. It always seems, when one reads or listens to these stories of magnanimity, that one could sacrifice oneself with enthusiastic pleasure and overwhelming joy. But the following day, when an unfortunate friend comes to borrow some money, there is a strange revulsion of feeling. But, suddenly, another supposition, less poetic and more realistic, replaced the first one. Perhaps he had married before the war, before this frightful accident, and she, in despair and resignation, had been forced to receive, care for, cheer, and support this husband, who had departed, a handsome man, and had returned without his feet. A frightful wreck, forced into immobility, powerless anger, and fatal obesity. Was he happy or in torture? I was seized with an irresistible desire to know his story, or, at least, the principal points, which would permit me to guess that which he could not or would not tell me. Still thinking the matter over, I began talking to him. We had exchanged a few commonplace words. And I raised my eyes to the net, and thought, he must have three children, the bonbons are for his wife, the doll for his little girl, the drum and the gun for his sons, and this pâté de foie gras for himself. Suddenly I asked him, Are you a father, monsieur? He answered, No, monsieur. I suddenly felt confused, as if I had been guilty of some breach of etiquette, and I continued, I beg your pardon. I had thought that you were when I heard your servant speaking about the toys. One listens and draws conclusions unconsciously. He smiled and then murmured, no, I am not even married. I am still at the preliminary stage. I pretended suddenly to remember, and said, Oh. That's true. When I knew you, you were engaged to Mademoiselle de Mandel, I believe. 
Yes, monsieur, your memory is excellent. I grew very bold and added, I also seem to remember hearing that Mademoiselle de Mandel married monsieur, monsieur. He calmly mentioned the name, monsieur de Floral. Yes, that's it. I remember it was on that occasion that I heard of your wound. I looked him full in the face, and he blushed. His full face, which was already red from the oversupply of blood, turned crimson. He answered quickly, with a sudden ardor of a man who is pleading a cause which is lost in his mind and in his heart, but which he does not wish to admit. It is wrong, monsieur, to couple my name with that of Madame de Fleurel. When I returned from the war without my feet, alas! I never would have permitted her to become my wife. Was it possible? When one marries, monsieur, it is not in order to parade one's generosity. It is in order to live every day, every hour, every minute, every second beside a man, and if this man is disfigured, as I am, it is a death sentence to marry him. Oh, I understand, I admire all sacrifices and devotions when they have a limit, but I do not admit that a woman should give up her whole life, all joy, all her dreams, in order to satisfy the admiration of the gallery. When I hear, on the floor of my room, the tapping of my wooden legs and of my crutches, I grow angry enough to strangle my servant. Do you think that I would permit a woman to do what I myself am unable to tolerate? And, then, do you think that my stumps are pretty? He was silent. What could I say? He certainly was right. Could I blame her, hold her in contempt, even say that she was wrong? No. However, the end which conformed to the rule, to the truth, did not satisfy my poetic appetite. These heroic deeds demand a beautiful sacrifice, which seemed to be lacking, and I felt a certain disappointment. I suddenly asked, has Madame de Fleurel any children? Yes, one girl and two boys. It is for them that I am bringing these toys. She and her husband are very kind to me. The train was going up the incline to St. Germain. It passed through the tunnels, entered the station, and stopped. I was about to offer my arm to the wounded officer, in order to help him descend, when two hands were stretched up to him through the open door. Hello. My dear Revelier. Ah. Hello, Fleurel. Standing behind the man, the woman, still beautiful, was smiling and waving her hands to him. A little girl, standing beside her, was jumping for joy, and two young boys were eagerly watching the drum and the gun, which were passing from the car into their father's hands. When the cripple was on the ground, all the children kissed him. Then they set off, the little girl holding in her hand the small varnished rung of a crutch, just as she might walk beside her big friend and hold his thumb. A stroll. When old man Liras, bookkeeper for Messrs. Labuse and Company, left the store, he stood for a minute bewildered at the glory of the setting sun. He had worked all day in the yellow light of a small jet of gas, far in the back of the store, on a narrow court, as deep as a well. The little room where he had been spending his days for forty years was so dark that even in the middle of summer one could hardly see without gaslight from eleven until three. It was always damp and cold, and from this hole on which his window opened came the musty odor of a sewer. For forty years Monsieur Liras had been arriving every morning in this prison at eight o'clock, and he would remain there until seven at night, bending over his books, writing with the industry of a good clerk. He was now making three thousand francs a year, having started at fifteen hundred. He had remained a bachelor, as his means did not allow him the luxury of a wife, and as he had never enjoyed anything, he desired nothing. From time to time, however, tired of this continuous and monotonous work, he formed a platonic wish, gad. If I only had an income of fifteen thousand francs, I would take life easy. He had never taken life easy, as he had never had anything but his monthly salary. His life had been uneventful, without emotions, without hopes. The faculty of dreaming with which everyone is blessed had never developed in the mediocrity of his ambitions. When he was twenty-one he entered the employ of Messrs. Labuse and Company. And he had never left them. In 1856 he had lost his father and then his mother in 1859. Since then the only incident in his life was when he moved, in 1868,
because his landlord had tried to raise his rent. Every day his alarm clock, with a frightful noise of rattling chains, made him spring out of bed at six o'clock precisely. Twice, however, this piece of mechanism had been out of order, once in 1866 and again in 1874. He had never been able to find out the reason why. He would dress, make his bed, sweep his room, dust his chair and the top of his bureau. All this took him an hour and a half. Then he would go out, buy a roll at the Lahour Bakery, in which he had seen eleven different owners without the name ever changing, and he would eat this roll on the way to the office. His entire existence had been spent in the narrow, dark office, which was still decorated with the same wallpaper. He had entered there as a young man, as assistant to Monsieur Brumont, and with the desire to replace him. He had taken his place and wished for nothing more. The whole harvest of memories which other men reap in their span of years, the unexpected events, sweet or tragic loves, adventurous journeys, all the occurrences of a free existence, all these things had remained unknown to him. Days, weeks, months, seasons, years, all were alike to him. He got up every day at the same hour, started out, arrived at the office, ate luncheon, went away, had dinner and went to bed without ever interrupting the regular monotony of similar actions, deeds and thoughts. Formerly he used to look at his blonde mustache and wavy hair in the little round mirror left by his predecessor. Now, every evening before leaving, he would look at his white mustache and bald head in the same mirror. Forty years had rolled by, long and rapid, dreary as a day of sadness and as similar as the hours of a sleepless night. Forty years of which nothing remained, not even a memory, not even a misfortune, since the death of his parents. Nothing. That day Monsieur Lyris stood by the door, dazzled at the brilliancy of the setting sun, and instead of returning home he decided to take a little stroll before dinner, a thing which happened to him four or five times a year. He reached the boulevards, where people were streaming along under the green trees. It was a spring evening, one of those first warm and pleasant evenings which fill the heart with the joy of life. Monsieur Liras went along with his mincing old man's step, he was going along with joy in his heart, at peace with the world. He reached the Champs-Élysées, and he continued to walk, enlivened by the sight of the young people trotting along. The whole sky was aflame, the Arc de Triomphe stood out against the brilliant background of the horizon, like a giant surrounded by fire. As he approached the immense monument, the old bookkeeper noticed that he was hungry, and he went into a wine dealer's for dinner. The meal was served in front of the store, on the sidewalk. It consisted of some mutton, salad, and asparagus. It was the best dinner that Monsieur Liras had had in a long time. He washed down his cheese with a small bottle of burgundy, had his after-dinner cup of coffee, a thing which he rarely took, and finally a little pony of brandy. When he had paid he felt quite youthful, even a little moved. And he said to himself, what a fine evening. I will continue my stroll as far as the entrance to the Bois de Boulogne. It will do me good. He set out. An old tune which one of his neighbors used to sing kept returning to his mind. He kept on humming it over and over again. A hot, still night had fallen over Paris. Monsieur Liras walked along the avenue du Bois de Boulogne and watched the cabs drive by. They kept coming with their shining lights, one behind the other, giving him a glimpse of the couples inside, the women in their light dresses and the men dressed in black. It was one long procession of lovers, riding under the warm, starlit sky. They kept on coming in rapid succession. They passed by in the carriages, silent, side by side, lost in their dreams, in the emotion of desire, in the anticipation of the approaching embrace. The warm shadows seemed to be full of floating kisses. A sensation of tenderness filled the air. All these carriages full of tender couples, all these people intoxicated with the same idea, with the same thought, seemed to give out a disturbing, subtle emanation. At last Monsieur Liras grew a little tired of walking, and he sat down on a bench to watch these carriages pass by with their burdens of love. Almost immediately a woman walked up to him and sat down beside him. Good evening, Papa, she said. He answered, Madam, you are mistaken. She slipped her arm through his, saying, Come along, now, don't be foolish. Listen. 
He arose and walked away, with sadness in his heart. A few yards away another woman walked up to him and asked, Won't you sit down beside me? He said, What makes you take up this life? She stood before him and in an altered, hoarse, angry voice exclaimed, Well, it isn't for the fun of it, anyhow. He insisted in a gentle voice, Then what makes you? She grumbled, I've got to live. Foolish question. And she walked away, humming. Monsieur Lyris stood there bewildered. Other women were passing near him, speaking to him and calling to him. He felt as though he were enveloped in darkness by something disagreeable. He sat down again on a bench. The carriages were still rolling by. He thought, I should have done better not to come here, I feel all upset. He began to think of all this venal or passionate love, of all these kisses, sold or given, which were passing by in front of him. Love? He scarcely knew it. In his lifetime he had only known two or three women, his means forcing him to live a quiet life, and he looked back at the life which he had led, so different from everybody else, so dreary, so mournful, so empty. Some people are really unfortunate. And suddenly, as though a veil had been torn from his eyes, he perceived the infinite misery, the monotony of his existence, the past, present and future misery. His last day similar to his first one, with nothing before him, behind him or about him, nothing in his heart or any place. The stream of carriages was still going by. In the rapid passage of the open carriage he still saw the two silent, loving creatures. It seemed to him that the whole of humanity was flowing on before him, intoxicated with joy, pleasure, and happiness. He alone was looking on. Tomorrow he would again be alone, always alone, more so than anyone else. He stood up, took a few steps, and suddenly he felt as tired as though he had taken a long journey on foot, and he sat down on the next bench. What was he waiting for? What was he hoping for? Nothing. He was thinking of how pleasant it must be in old age to return home and find the little children. It is pleasant to grow old when one is surrounded by those beings who owe their life to you, who love you, who caress you, who tell you charming and foolish little things which warm your heart and console you for everything. And, thinking of his empty room, clean and sad, where no one but himself ever entered, a feeling of distress filled his soul, and the place seemed to him more mournful even than his little office. Nobody ever came there, no one ever spoke in it. It was dead, silent, without the echo of a human voice. It seems as though walls retain something of the people who live within them, something of their manner, face and voice. The very houses inhabited by happy families are gayer than the dwellings of the unhappy. His room was as barren of memories as his life. And the thought of returning to this place, all alone, of getting into his bed, of again repeating all the duties and actions of every evening, this thought terrified him. As though to escape farther from this sinister home, and from the time when he would have to return to it, he arose and walked along a path to a wooded corner, where he sat down on the grass. About him, above him, everywhere, he heard a continuous, tremendous, confused rumble, composed of countless and different noises, a vague and throbbing pulsation of life, the life breath of Paris, breathing like a giant. The sun was already high and shed a flood of light on the Bois de Boulogne. A few carriages were beginning to drive about and people were appearing on horseback. A couple was walking through a deserted alley. Suddenly the young woman raised her eyes and saw something brown in the branches. Surprised and anxious, she raised her hand, exclaiming, Look! What is that? Then she shrieked and fell into the arms of her companion, who was forced to lay her on the ground. The policeman who had been called cut down an old man who had hung himself with his suspenders. Examination showed that he had died the evening before. Papers found on him showed that he was a bookkeeper for Messrs. Labuse and Company and that his name was Lyris. His death was attributed to suicide, the cause of which could not be suspected. Perhaps a sudden access of madness. Alexander At four o'clock that day, as on every other day, Alexander rolled the three-wheeled chair for cripples up to the door of the little house. Then, in obedience to the doctor's orders, he would push his old and infirm mistress about until six o'clock. 
When he had placed the light vehicle against the step, just at the place where the old lady could most easily enter it, he went into the house. And soon a furious, hoarse old soldier's voice was heard cursing inside the house, it issued from the master, the retired ex-captain of infantry, Joseph Marimbal. Then could be heard the noise of doors being slammed, chairs being pushed about, and hasty footsteps, then nothing more. After a few seconds, Alexander reappeared on the threshold, supporting with all his strength Madame Marimbal, who was exhausted from the exertion of descending the stairs. When she was at last settled in the rolling chair, Alexander passed behind it, grasped the handle, and set out toward the river. Thus they crossed the little town every day amid the respectful greeting of all. These bows were perhaps meant as much for the servant as for the mistress, for if she was loved and esteemed by all, this old trooper, with his long, white, patriarchal beard, was considered a model domestic. The July sun was beating down unmercifully on the street bathing the low houses in its crude and burning light. Dogs were sleeping on the sidewalk in the shade of the houses, and Alexander, a little out of breath, hastened his footsteps in order sooner to arrive at the avenue which leads to the water. Madame Marimbal was already slumbering under her white parasol, the point of which sometimes grazed along the man's impassive face. As soon as they had reached the Ali de Tillels, she awoke in the shade of the trees, and she said in a kindly voice, Go more slowly, my poor boy, you will kill yourself in this heat. Along this path, completely covered by arched linden trees, the Mavitek flowed in its winding bed bordered by willows. The gurgling of the eddies and the splashing of the little waves against the rocks lent to the walk the charming music of babbling water and the freshness of damp air. Madame Marimbal inhaled with deep delight the humid charm of this spot and then murmured, Ah! I feel better now. But he wasn't in a good humor today. Alexander answered, No, madam. For thirty five years he had been in the service of this couple, first as officer's orderly, then as simple valet who did not wish to leave his masters. And for the last six years, every afternoon, he had been wheeling his mistress about through the narrow streets of the town. From this long and devoted service, and then from this daily tete a tete, a kind of familiarity arose between the old lady and the devoted servant, affectionate on her part, deferential on his. They talked over the affairs of the house exactly as if they were equals. Their principal subject of conversation and of worry was the bad disposition of the captain, soured by a long career which had begun with promise, run along without promotion, and ended without glory. Madame Marimbal continued, he certainly was not in a good humor today. This happens too often since he has left the service. And Alexander, with a sigh, completed his mistress's thoughts, Oh, madam might say that it happens every day and that it also happened before leaving the army. That is true. But the poor man has been so unfortunate. He began with a brave deed, which obtained for him the legion of honor at the age of twenty. And then from twenty to fifty he was not able to rise higher than captain, whereas at the beginning he expected to retire with at least the rank of colonel. Madame might also admit that it was his fault. If he had not always been as cutting as a whip, his superiors would have loved and protected him better. Harshness is of no use, one should try to please if one wishes to advance. As far as his treatment of us is concerned, it is also our fault, since we are willing to remain with him, but with others it's different. Madame Marimbal was thinking. Oh, for how many years had she thus been thinking of the brutality of her husband, whom she had married long ago because he was a handsome officer, decorated quite young and full of promise, so they said. What mistakes one makes in life? She murmured, Let us stop a while, my poor Alexander, and you rest on that bench. It was a little worm-eaten bench, placed at a turn in the alley. Every time they came in this direction Alexander was accustomed to making a short pause on this seat. He sat down and with a proud and familiar gesture he took his beautiful white beard in his hand, and, closing his fingers over it, ran them down to the point, which he held for a minute at the pit of his stomach. As if once more to verify the length of this growth. Madame Marimbal continued, I married him, it is only just and natural that I should bear his injustice, but what I do not understand is why you also should have supported it, my good Alexander. He merely shrugged his shoulders and answered, 
Oh. I, madam. She added, really. I have often wondered. When I married him you were his orderly and you could hardly do otherwise than endure him. But why did you remain with us, who pay you so little and who treat you so badly, when you could have done as everyone else does, settle down, marry, have a family? He answered, Oh, madam. With me it's different. Then he was silent. But he kept pulling his beard as if he were ringing a bell within him, as if he were trying to pull it out, and he rolled his eyes like a man who is greatly embarrassed. Madame Marimbal was following her own train of thought, you are not a peasant. You have an education. He interrupted her proudly, I studied surveying, madam. Then why did you stay with us and blast your prospects? He stammered, that's it. That's it. It's the fault of my dispositin. How so, of your disposition? Yes, when I become attached to a person I become attached to him, that's all. She began to laugh, you are not going to try to tell me that Marimbal's sweet disposition caused you to become attached to him for life. He was fidgeting about on his bench visibly embarrassed, and he muttered behind his long beard. It was not he, it was you. The old lady, who had a sweet face, with a snowy line of curly white hair between her forehead and her bonnet, turned around in her chair and observed her servant with a surprised look, exclaiming, I, my poor Alexander. How so? He began to look up in the air, then to one side, then toward the distance, turning his head as do timid people when forced to admit shameful secrets. At last he exclaimed, with the courage of a trooper who is ordered to the line of fire, you see, it's this way, the first time I brought a letter to Mademoiselle from the lieutenant, Mademoiselle gave me a frank and a smile, and that settled it. Not understanding well, she questioned him explain yourself. Then he cried out, like a malefactor who is admitting a fatal crime, I had a sentiment for Madame. There. She answered nothing, stopped looking at him, hung her head, and thought. She was good, full of justice, gentleness, reason, and tenderness. In a second she saw the immense devotion of this poor creature, who had given up everything in order to live beside her, without saying anything. And she felt as if she could cry. Then, with a sad but not angry expression, she said, let us return home. He rose and began to push the wheelchair. As they approached the village they saw Captain Marimbal coming toward them. As soon as he joined them he asked his wife, with a visible desire of getting angry, what have we for dinner? Some chicken with flagellets. He lost his temper, chicken. Chicken. Always chicken. By all that's holy, I've had enough chicken. Have you no ideas in your head, that you make me eat chicken every day? She answered, in a resigned tone, but, my dear, you know that the doctor has ordered it for you. It's the best thing for your stomach. If your stomach were well, I could give you many things which I do not dare set before you now. Then, exasperated, he planted himself in front of Alexander, exclaiming, Well, if my stomach is out of order it's the fault of that brute. For thirty-five years he has been poisoning me with his abominable cooking. Madame Marimbal suddenly turned about completely, in order to see the old domestic. Their eyes met, and in this single glance they both said thank you, to each other. The Log the drawing room was small, full of heavy draperies and discreetly fragrant. A large fire burned in the grate and a solitary lamp at one end of the mantelpiece threw a soft light on the two persons who were talking. She, the mistress of the house, was an old lady with white hair, but one of those old ladies whose unwrinkled skin is as smooth as the finest paper and scented, impregnated with perfume. With the delicate essences which she had used in her bath for so many years. He was a very old friend, who had never married, a constant friend, a companion in the journey of life, but nothing more. They had not spoken for about a minute, and were both looking at the fire, dreaming of no matter what, in one of those moments of friendly silence between people who have no need to be constantly talking in order to be happy together. When suddenly a large log, a stump covered with burning roots, fell out. It fell over the fire dogs into the drawing room and rolled onto the carpet scattering great sparks around it. The old lady, with a little scream, sprang to her feet to run away, 
while he kicked the log back onto the hearth and stamped out all the burning sparks with his boots. When the disaster was remedied, there was a strong smell of burning, and, sitting down opposite to his friend, the man looked at her with a smile and said, as he pointed to the log, That is the reason why I never married. She looked at him in astonishment, with the inquisitive gaze of women who wish to know everything, that I which women have who are no longer very young, in which a complex, and often roguish, curiosity is reflected, and she asked. How so? Oh, it is a long story, he replied, a rather sad and unpleasant story. My old friends were often surprised at the coldness which suddenly sprang up between one of my best friends whose Christian name was Julian, and myself. They could not understand how two such intimate and inseparable friends, as we had been, could suddenly become almost strangers to one another, and I will tell you the reason of it. He and I used to live together at one time. We were never apart, and the friendship that united us seemed so strong that nothing could break it. One evening when he came home, he told me that he was going to get married, and it gave me a shock as if he had robbed me or betrayed me. When a man's friend marries, it is all over between them. The jealous affection of a woman, that suspicious, uneasy and carnal affection, will not tolerate the sturdy and frank attachment, that attachment of the mind, of the heart, and that mutual confidence which exists between two men. You see, however great the love may be that unites them a man and a woman are always strangers in mind and intellect, they remain belligerents, they belong to different races. There must always be a conqueror and a conquered, a master and a slave. Now the one, now the other, they are never two equals. They press each other's hands, those hands trembling with amorous passion. But they never press them with a long, strong, loyal pressure, with that pressure which seems to open hearts and to lay them bare in a burst of sincere, strong, manly affection. Philosophers of old, instead of marrying and procreating as a consolation for their old age children, who would abandon them, sought for a good, reliable friend, and grew old with him in that communion of thought which can only exist between men. Well, my friend Julian married. His wife was pretty, charming, a little, curly-haired blonde, plump and lively, who seemed to worship him. At first I went but rarely to their house, feeling myself de trop. But, somehow, they attracted me to their home, they were constantly inviting me, and seemed very fond of me. Consequently, by degrees, I allowed myself to be allured by the charm of their life. I often dined with them, and frequently, when I returned home at night, thought that I would do as he had done, and get married, as my empty house now seemed very dull. They appeared to be very much in love, and were never apart. Well, one evening Julian wrote and asked me to go to dinner, and I naturally went. My dear fellow, he said, I must go out directly afterward on business, and I shall not be back until eleven o'clock. But I shall be back at eleven precisely, and I reckon on you to keep Bertha company. The young woman smiled. It was my idea, she said, to send for you. I held out my hand to her. You are as nice as ever, I said, and I felt a long, friendly pressure of my fingers, but I paid no attention to it, so we sat down to dinner, and at eight o'clock Julian went out. As soon as he had gone, a kind of strange embarrassment immediately seemed to arise between his wife and me. We had never been alone together yet, and in spite of our daily increasing intimacy, this tete-a-tete -tete placed us in a new position. At first I spoke vaguely of those indifferent matters with which one fills up an embarrassing silence, but she did not reply, and remained opposite to me with her head down in an undecided manner, as if she were thinking over some difficult subject. And as I was at a loss for small talk, I held my tongue. It is surprising how hard it is at times to find anything to say. And then also I felt something in the air, something I could not express, one of those mysterious premonitions that warn one of another person's secret intentions in regard to yourself, whether they be good or evil. That painful silence lasted some time, and then Bertha said to me, Will you kindly put a log on the fire for it is going out? So I opened the box where the wood was kept, which was placed just where yours is, took out the largest log and put it on top of the others, which were three parts burned, and then silence again reigned in the room. In a few minutes the log was burning so brightly that it scorched our faces, 
and the young woman raised her eyes to mine, eyes that had a strange look to me. It is too hot now, she said, let us go and sit on the sofa over there. So we went and sat on the sofa, and then she said suddenly, looking me full in the face. What would you do if a woman were to tell you that she was in love with you? Upon my word, I replied, very much at a loss for an answer, I cannot foresee such a case, but it would depend very much upon the woman. She gave a hard, nervous, vibrating laugh. One of those false laughs which seem as if they must break thin glass, and then she added, men are never either venturesome or spiteful. And, after a moment's silence, she continued, have you ever been in love, Monsieur Paul? I was obliged to acknowledge that I certainly had, and she asked me to tell her all about it. Whereupon I made up some story or other. She listened to me attentively, with frequent signs of disapproval and contempt, and then suddenly she said, No, you understand nothing about the subject. It seems to me that real love must unsettle the mind, upset the nerves and distract the head, that it must, how shall I express it, be dangerous, even terrible, almost criminal and sacrilegious, that it must be a kind of treason. I mean to say that it is bound to break laws, fraternal bonds, sacred obligations, when love is tranquil, easy, lawful and without dangers, is it really love? I did not know what answer to give her, and I made this philosophical reflection to myself, oh! Female brain, here, indeed, you show yourself. While speaking, she had assumed a demure saintly air. And, resting on the cushions, she stretched herself out at full length, with her head on my shoulder, and her dress pulled up a little so as to show her red stockings, which the firelight made look still brighter. In a minute or two she continued. I suppose I have frightened you? I protested against such a notion, and she leaned against my breast altogether, and without looking at me, she said, if I were to tell you that I love you, what would you do? And before I could think of an answer, she had thrown her arms around my neck, had quickly drawn my head down, and put her lips to mine. Oh! My dear friend, I can tell you that I did not feel at all happy. What? Deceived Julian? Become the lover of this little, silly, wrong-headed, deceitful woman, who was, no doubt, terribly sensual, and whom her husband no longer satisfied. To betray him continually, to deceive him, to play at being in love merely because I was attracted by forbidden fruit, by the danger incurred and the friendship betrayed. No, that did not suit me, but what was I to do? To imitate Joseph would be acting a very stupid and, moreover, difficult part, for this woman was enchanting in her perfidy, inflamed by audacity, palpitating and excited. Let the man who has never felt on his lips the warm kiss of a woman who is ready to give herself to him throw the first stone at me. Well, a minute more, you understand what I mean? A minute more, and I should have been, no, she would have been. I beg your pardon, he would have been, when a loud noise made us both jump up. The log had fallen into the room, knocking over the fire irons and the fender, and on to the carpet, which it had scorched, and had rolled under an armchair, which it would certainly set alight. I jumped up like a madman, and, as I was replacing on the fire that log which had saved me, the door opened hastily, and Julian came in. I am free, he said, with evident pleasure. The business was over two hours sooner than I expected. Yes, my dear friend, without that log, I should have been caught in the very act, and you know what the consequences would have been. You may be sure that I took good care never to be found in a similar situation again, never, never. Soon afterward I saw that Julian was giving me the cold shoulder, as they say. His wife was evidently undermining our friendship. By degrees he got rid of me, and we have altogether ceased to meet. I never married, which ought not to surprise you, I think. Julie Romaine Two years ago this spring I was making a walking tour along the shore of the Mediterranean. Is there anything more pleasant than to meditate while walking at a good pace along a highway? One walks in the sunlight, through the caressing breeze, at the foot of the mountains, along the coast of the sea. And one dreams. What a flood of illusions, loves, adventures pass through a pedestrian's mind during a two-hours march. What a crowd of confused and joyous hopes enter into you with the mild, light air. You drink them in with the breeze, 
and they awaken in your heart a longing for happiness which increases with the hunger induced by walking. The fleeting, charming ideas fly and sing like birds. I was following that long road which goes from St. Raphael to Italy, or, rather, that long, splendid panoramic highway which seems made for the representation of all the love poems of earth. And I thought that from Cannes, where one poses, to Monaco, where one gambles, people come to this spot of the earth for hardly any other purpose than to get embroiled or to throw away money on chance games. Displaying under this delicious sky and in this garden of roses and oranges all base vanities and foolish pretensions and vile lusts, showing up the human mind such as it is, servile, ignorant, arrogant and full of cupidity. Suddenly I saw some villas in one of those ravishing bays that one meets at every turn of the mountain. There were only four or five fronting the sea at the foot of the mountains, and behind them a wild fir wood slopes into two great valleys that were untraversed by roads. I stopped short before one of these chalets, it was so pretty, a small white house with brown trimmings, overrun with rambler roses up to the top. The garden was a mass of flowers, of all colors and all kinds, mixed in a coquettish, well-planned disorder. The lawn was full of them, big pots flanked each side of every step of the porch, pink or yellow clusters framed each window, and the terrace with the stone balustrade, which enclosed this pretty little dwelling, had a garland of enormous red bells. Like drops of blood. Behind the house I saw a long avenue of orange trees in blossom, which went up to the foot of the mountain. Over the door appeared the name, Villa d'Anton, in small gold letters. I asked myself what poet or what fairy was living there, what inspired, solitary being had discovered this spot and created this dream house, which seemed to Nestle in a nosegay. A workman was breaking stones up the street, and I went to him to ask the name of the proprietor of this jewel. It is Madame Julie Romaine, he replied. Julie Romaine. In my childhood, long ago, I had heard them speak of this great actress, the rival of Rachel. No woman ever was more applauded and more loved, especially more loved. What duets and suicides on her account and what sensational adventures! How old was this seductive woman now? Sixty, seventy, seventy-five. Julie Romaine here, in this house. The woman who had been adored by the greatest musician and the most exquisite poet of our land. I still remember the sensation, I was then twelve years of age, which her flight to Sicily with the latter, after her rupture with the former, caused throughout France. She had left one evening, after a premiere, where the audience had applauded her for a whole half hour, and had recalled her eleven times in succession. She had gone away with the poet, in a post-chaise, as was the fashion then. They had crossed the sea, to love each other in that antique island, the daughter of Greece, in that immense orange wood which surrounds Palermo, and which is called the Shell of Gold. People told of their ascension of Mount Etna and how they had leaned over the immense crater, arm in arm, cheek to cheek, as if to throw themselves into the very abyss. Now he was dead, that maker of verses so touching and so profound that they turned, the heads of a whole generation, so subtle and so mysterious that they opened a new world to the younger poets. The other one also was dead, the deserted one, who had attained through her musical periods that are alive in the memories of all, periods of triumph and of despair, intoxicating triumph and heartrending despair. And she was there, in that house veiled by flowers. I did not hesitate, but rang the bell. A small servant answered, a boy of eighteen with awkward mean and clumsy hands. I wrote in pencil on my card a gallant compliment to the actress, begging her to receive me. Perhaps, if she knew my name, she would open her door to me. The little valet took it in, and then came back, asking me to follow him. He led me to a neat and decorous salon, furnished in the Louis Philippe style, with stiff and heavy furniture, from which a little maid of sixteen, slender but not pretty, took off the covers in my honor. Then I was left alone. On the walls hung three portraits, that of the actress in one of her roles, that of the poet in his close-fitting greatcoat and the ruffled shirt then in style, and that of the musician seated at a piano. She, blonde, charming, but affected, according to the fashion of her day, was smiling, with her pretty mouth and blue eyes, the painting was careful, fine, elegant, but lifeless. Those faces seemed to be already looking upon posterity. 
The whole place had the air of a bygone time, of days that were done and men who had vanished. A door opened and a little woman entered, old, very old, very small, with white hair and white eyebrows, a veritable white mouse, and as quick and furtive of movement. She held out her hand to me, saying in a voice still fresh, sonorous, and vibrant. Thank you, monsieur. How kind it is of the men of today to remember the women of yesterday. Sit down. I told her that her house had attracted me, that I had inquired for the proprietor's name, and that, on learning it, I could not resist the desire to ring her bell. This gives me all the more pleasure, monsieur, she replied, as it is the first time that such a thing has happened. When I received your card, with the gracious note, I trembled as if an old friend who had disappeared for twenty years had been announced to me. I am like a dead body, whom no one remembers, of whom no one will think until the day when I shall actually die. Then the newspapers will mention Julie Romaine for three days, relating anecdotes and details of my life, reviving memories, and praising me greatly. Then all will be over with me. After a few moments of silence, she continued. And this will not be so very long now. In a few months, in a few days, nothing will remain but a little skeleton of this little woman who is now alive. She raised her eyes toward her portrait, which smiled down upon this caricature of herself, then she looked at those of the two men, the disdainful poet and the inspired musician, who seemed to say, what does this ruin want of us? An indefinable, poignant, irresistible sadness overwhelmed my heart, the sadness of existences that have had their day, but who are still debating with their memories, like a person drowning in deep water. From my seat I could see on the high road the handsome carriages that were whirling from Nice to Monaco, inside them I saw young, pretty, rich and happy women and smiling, satisfied men. Following my eye, she understood my thought and murmured with a smile of resignation. One cannot both be and have been. How beautiful life must have been for you. I said. She heaved a great sigh. Beautiful and sweet. And for that reason I regret it so much. I saw that she was disposed to talk of herself, so I began to question her, gently and discreetly, as one might touch bruised flesh. She spoke of her successes, her intoxications and her friends, of her whole triumphant existence. Was it on the stage that you found your most intense joys, your true happiness? I asked. Oh, no, she replied quickly. I smiled. Then, raising her eyes to the two portraits, she said, with a sad glance. It was with them. Which one? I could not help asking. Both. I even confuse them up a little now in my old woman's memory, and then I feel remorse. Then, madam, your acknowledgement is not to them, but to love itself. They were merely its interpreters. That is possible. But what interpreters? Are you sure that you have not been, or that you might not have been, loved as well or better by a simple man, but not a great man, who would have offered to you his whole life and heart, all his thoughts, all his days, his whole being? While these gave you two redoubtable rivals, music and poetry? No, monsieur, no, she exclaimed emphatically, with that still youthful voice, which caused the soul to vibrate. Another one might perhaps have loved me more, but he would not have loved me as these did. Ah! Those two sang to me of the music of love as no one else in the world could have sung of it. How they intoxicated me! Could any other man express what they knew so well how to express in tones and in words? Is it enough merely to love if one cannot put all the poetry and all the music of heaven and earth into love? And they knew how to make a woman delirious with songs and with words. Yes, perhaps there was more of illusion than of reality in our passion, but these illusions lift you into the clouds, while realities always leave you trailing in the dust. If others have loved me more, through these two I have understood, felt and worshipped love. Suddenly she began to weep. She wept silently, shedding tears of despair. I pretended not to see, looking off into the distance. She resumed, after a few minutes. You see, monsieur, with nearly every one the heart ages with the body. But this has not happened with me. My body is sixty-nine years old, while my poor heart is only twenty. 
and that is the reason why I live all alone, with my flowers and my dreams. There was a long silence between us. She grew calmer and continued, smiling. How you would laugh at me, if you knew, if you knew how I pass my evenings, when the weather is fine. I am ashamed and I pity myself at the same time. Beg as I might, she would not tell me what she did. Then I rose to leave. Already, she exclaimed. And as I said that I wished to dine at Monte Carlo, she asked timidly. Will you not dine with me? It would give me a great deal of pleasure. I accepted at once. She rang, delighted, and after giving some orders to the little maid she took me over her house. A kind of glass-enclosed veranda, filled with shrubs, opened into the dining room, revealing at the farther end the long avenue of orange trees extending to the foot of the mountain. A low seat, hidden by plants, indicated that the old actress often came there to sit down. Then we went into the garden, to look at the flowers. Evening fell softly, one of those calm, moist evenings when the earth breathes forth all her perfumes. Daylight was almost gone when we sat down at table. The dinner was good and it lasted a long time, and we became intimate friends, she and I, when she understood what a profound sympathy she had aroused in my heart. She had taken two thimblefuls of wine, as the phrase goes, and had grown more confiding and expansive. Come, let us look at the moon, she said. I adore the good moon. She has been the witness of my most intense joys. It seems to me that all my memories are there, and that I need only look at her to bring them all back to me. And even sometimes, in the evening, I offer to myself a pretty play, yes, pretty, if you only knew. But no, you would laugh at me. I cannot, I dare not, no, no, really, no. I implored her to tell me what it was. Come, now. Come, tell me, I promise you that I will not laugh. I swear it to you, come, now. She hesitated. I took her hands, those poor little hands, so thin and so cold. And I kissed them one after the other, several times, as her lovers had once kissed them. She was moved and hesitated. You promise me not to laugh? Yes, I swear it to you. Well, then, come. She rose, and as the little domestic, awkward in his green livery, removed the chair behind her, she whispered quickly a few words into his ear. Yes, madam, at once, he replied. She took my arm and led me to the veranda. The avenue of oranges was really splendid to see. The full moon made a narrow path of silver, a long bright line, which fell on the yellow sand, between the round, opaque crowns of the dark trees. As these trees were in bloom, their strong, sweet perfume filled the night, and swarming among their dark foliage I saw thousands of fireflies, which looked like seeds fallen from the stars. Oh, what a setting for a love scene! I exclaimed. She smiled. Is it not true? Is it not true? You will see. And she made me sit down beside her. This is what makes one long for more life. But you hardly think of these things, you men of today. You are speculators, merchants, and men of affairs. You no longer even know how to talk to us. When I say you, I mean young men in general. Love has been turned into a liaison which very often begins with an unpaid dressmaker's bill. If you think the bill is dearer than the woman, you disappear. But if you hold the woman more highly, you pay it. Nice morals, and a nice kind of love. She took my hand. Look. I looked, astonished and delighted. Down there at the end of the avenue, in the moonlight, were two young people, with their arms around each other's waist. They were walking along, interlaced, charming, with short, little steps, crossing the flakes of light, which illuminated them momentarily, and then sinking back into the shadow. The youth was dressed in a suit of white satin, such as men wore in the 18th century, and had on a hat with an ostrich plume. The girl was arrayed in a gown with panniers, and the high, powdered coiffure of the handsome dames of the time of the Regency. They stopped a hundred paces from us, and standing in the middle of the avenue, they kissed each other with graceful gestures. Suddenly I recognized the two little servants. 
Then one of those dreadful fits of laughter that convulse you made me writhe in my chair. But I did not laugh aloud. I resisted, convulsed and feeling almost ill, as a man whose leg is cut off resists the impulse to cry out. As the young pair turned toward the farther end of the avenue they again became delightful. They went farther and farther away, finally disappearing as a dream disappears. I no longer saw them. The avenue seemed a sad place. I took my leave at once, so as not to see them again, for I guessed that this little play would last a long time, awakening, as it did, a whole past of love and of stage scenery. The artificial past, deceitful and seductive, false but charming, which still stirred the heart of this amorous old comedian. The Rondoli Sisters I I set out to see Italy thoroughly on two occasions, and each time I was stopped at the frontier and could not get any further. So I do not know Italy, said my friend, Charles Juvent. And yet my two attempts gave me a charming idea of the manners of that beautiful country. Sometime, however, I must visit its cities, as well as the museums and works of art with which it abounds. I will make another attempt to penetrate into the interior, which I have not yet succeeded in doing. You don't understand me, so I will explain, in the spring of 1874 I was seized with an irresistible desire to see Venice, Florence, Rome and Naples. I am, as you know, not a great traveler, it appears to me a useless and fatiguing business. Nights spent in a train, the disturbed slumbers of the railway carriage, with the attendant headache and stiffness in every limb, the sudden waking in that rolling box, the unwashed feeling, with your eyes and hair full of dust. The smell of the coal on which one's lungs feed, those bad dinners in the drafty refreshment rooms are, according to my ideas, a horrible way of beginning a pleasure trip. After this introduction, we have the miseries of the hotel, of some great hotel full of people, and yet so empty, the strange room and the doubtful bed. I am most particular about my bed, it is the sanctuary of life. We entrust our almost naked and fatigued bodies to it, so that they may be reanimated by reposing between soft sheets and feathers. There we find the most delightful hours of our existence, the hours of love and of sleep. The bed is sacred, and should be respected, venerated, and loved by us as the best and most delightful of our earthly possessions. I cannot lift up the sheets of a hotel bed without a shudder of disgust. Who has occupied it the night before? Perhaps dirty, revolting people have slept in it. I begin, then, to think of all the horrible people with whom one rubs shoulders every day, people with suspicious-looking skin which makes one think of the feet and all the rest. I call to mind those who carry about with them the sickening smell of garlic or of humanity. I think of those who are deformed and unhealthy, of the perspiration emanating from the sick, of everything that is ugly and filthy in man. And all this, perhaps, in the bed in which I am about to sleep. The mere idea of it makes me feel ill as I get into it. And then the hotel dinners, those dreary table d'hote dinners in the midst of all sorts of extraordinary people or else those terrible solitary dinners at a small table in a restaurant, feebly lighted by a wretched composite candle under a shade. Again, those terribly dull evenings in some unknown town. Do you know anything more wretched than the approach of dusk on such an occasion? One goes about as if almost in a dream, looking at faces that one never has seen before and never will see again, listening to people talking about matters which are quite indifferent to you in a language that perhaps you do not understand. You have a terrible feeling, almost as if you were lost, and you continue to walk on so as not to be obliged to return to the hotel, where you would feel more lost still because you are at home, in a home which belongs to anyone who can pay for it. And at last you sink into a chair of some well-lighted café, whose gilding and lights oppress you a thousand times more than the shadows in the streets. Then you feel so abominably lonely sitting in front of the glass of flatbok beer that a kind of madness seizes you the longing to go somewhere or other, no matter where. As long as you need not remain in front of that marble table amid those dazzling lights. And then, suddenly, you are aware that you are really alone in the world, always and everywhere, and that in places which we know, the familiar jostlings give us the illusion only of human fraternity. At such moments of self-abandonment and somber isolation in distant cities one thinks broadly, clearly, and profoundly.
then one suddenly sees the whole of life outside the vision of eternal hope, apart from the deceptions of our innate habits, and of our expectations of happiness, which we indulge in dreams never to be realized. It is only by going a long distance from home that we can fully understand how short-lived and empty everything near at hand is, by searching for the unknown, we perceive how commonplace and evanescent everything is. Only by wandering over the face of the earth can we understand how small the world is, and how very much alike it is everywhere. How well I know, and how I hate and almost fear, those haphazard walks through unknown streets. And this was the reason why, as nothing would induce me to undertake a tour in Italy by myself, I made up my mind to accompany my friend Paul Pavoli. You know Paul, and how he idealizes women. To him the earth is habitable only because they are there, the sun gives light and is warm because it shines upon them, the air is soft and balmy because it blows upon their skin and ruffles the soft hair on their temples. And the moon is charming because it makes them dream and imparts a languorous charm to love. Every act and action of Paul's has woman for its motive, all his thoughts, all his efforts and hopes are centered in them. When I mentioned Italy to Paul he at first absolutely refused to leave Paris. I, however, began to tell him of the adventures I had on my travels. I assured him that all Italian women are charming, and I made him hope for the most refined pleasures at Naples, thanks to certain letters of introduction which I had, and so at last he allowed himself to be persuaded. 2. We took the express one Thursday evening, Paul and I. Hardly anyone goes south at that time of the year, so that we had the carriages to ourselves, and both of us were in a bad temper on leaving Paris, sorry for having yielded to the temptation of this journey, and regretting Marley, the Seine. And our lazy boating excursions, and all those pleasures in and near Paris which are so dear to every true Parisian. As soon as the train started Paul stuck himself in his corner, and said, It is most idiotic to go all that distance, and as it was too late for him to change his mind then, I said, well, you should not have come. He made no answer, and I felt very much inclined to laugh when I saw how furious he looked. He is certainly always rather like a squirrel, but then every one of us has retained the type of some animal or other as the mark of his primitive origin. How many people have jaws like a bulldog, or heads like goats, rabbits, foxes, horses, or oxen? Paul is a squirrel turned into a man. He has its bright, quick eyes, its hair, its pointed nose, its small, fine, supple, active body, and a certain mysterious resemblance in his general bearing. In fact, a similarity of movement, of gesture, and of bearing which might almost be taken for a recollection. At last we both went to sleep with that uncomfortable slumber of the railway carriage, which is interrupted by horrible cramps in the arms and neck and by the sudden stoppages of the train. We woke up as we were passing along the Rhone. Soon the continued noise of crickets came in through the windows, that cry which seems to be the voice of the warm earth, the song of Provence, and seemed to instill into our looks, our breasts, and our souls the light and happy feeling of the south, that odor of the parched earth, of the stony and light soil of the olive with its gray-green foliage. When the train stopped again a railway guard ran along the train calling out valence in a sonorous voice, with an accent that again gave us a taste of that province which the shrill note of the crickets had already imparted to us. Nothing fresh happened till we got to Marseilles, where we alighted for breakfast, but when we returned to our carriage we found a woman installed there. Paul, with a delighted glance at me, gave his short mustache a mechanical twirl, and passed his fingers through his hair which had become slightly out of order with the night's journey. Then he sat down opposite the newcomer. Whenever I happen to see a striking new face either in traveling or in society, I always have the strongest inclination to find out what character, mind, and intellectual capacities are hidden beneath those features. She was a young and pretty woman, certainly a native of the south of France, with splendid eyes, beautiful wavy black hair which was so thick and long that it seemed almost too heavy for her head. She was dressed with a certain southern bad taste which made her look a little vulgar. Her regular features had none of the grace and finish of the refined races, of that slight delicacy which members of the aristocracy inherit from their birth, and which is the hereditary mark of thinner blood. Her bracelets were too big to be of gold, 
she wore earrings with large white stones that were certainly not diamonds, and she belonged unmistakably to the people. One surmised that she would talk too loud and shout on every occasion with exaggerated gestures. When the train started she remained motionless in her place, in the attitude of a woman who was indignant, without even looking at us. Paul began to talk to me, evidently with an eye to effect, trying to attract her attention, as shopkeepers expose their choice wares to catch the notice of passers-by. She, however, did not appear to be paying the least attention. To loan. Ten minutes to wait. Refreshment room, the porters shouted. Paul motioned to me to get out, and as soon as we had done so, he said. I wonder who on earth she can be. I began to laugh. I am sure I don't know, and I don't in the least care. He was quite excited. She is an uncommonly fresh and pretty girl. What eyes she has, and how cross she looks. She must have been dreadfully worried, for she takes no notice of anything. You will have all your trouble for nothing, I growled. He began to lose his temper. I am not taking any trouble, my dear fellow. I think her an extremely pretty woman, that is all. If one could only speak to her. But I don't know how to begin. Cannot you give me an idea? Can't you guess who she is? Upon my word, I cannot. However, I should rather think she is some strolling actress who is going to rejoin her company after a love adventure. He seemed quite upset, as if I had said something insulting. What makes you think that? On the contrary, I think she looks most respectable. Just look at her bracelets, I said, her earrings and her whole dress. I should not be the least surprised if she were a dancer or a circus rider, but most likely a dancer. Her whole style smacks very much of the theater. He evidently did not like the idea. She is much too young, I am sure, why, she is hardly twenty. Well, I replied, there are many things which one can do before one is twenty. Dancing and elocution are among them. Take your seats for nice, Vintimiglia, the guards and porters called. We got in, our fellow passenger was eating an orange, and certainly she did not do it elegantly. She had spread her pocket handkerchief on her knees, and the way in which she tore off the peel and opened her mouth to put in the pieces, and then spat the pips out of the window, showed that her training had been decidedly vulgar. She seemed, also, more put out than ever, and swallowed the fruit with an exceedingly comic air of rage. Paul devoured her with his eyes, and tried to attract her attention and excite her curiosity. But in spite of his talk, and of the manner in which he brought in well-known names, she did not pay the least attention to him. After passing Frigis in a stay, Raphael, the train passed through a veritable garden, a paradise of roses, and groves of oranges and lemons covered with fruits and flowers at the same time. That delightful coast from Marseilles to Genoa is a kingdom of perfumes in a home of flowers. June is the time to see it in all its beauty, when in every narrow valley and on every slope, the most exquisite flowers are growing luxuriantly. And the roses. Fields, hedges, groves of roses. They climb up the walls, blossom on the roofs, hang from the trees, peep out from among the bushes. They are white, red, yellow, large and small, single, with a simple self-colored dress, or full and heavy in brilliant toilettes. Their breath makes the air heavy and relaxing and the still more penetrating odor of the orange blossoms sweetens the atmosphere till it might almost be called the refinement of odor. The shore, with its brown rocks, was bathed by the motionless Mediterranean. The hot summer sun stretched like a fiery cloth over the mountains, over the long expanses of sand, and over the motionless, apparently solid blue sea. The train went on through the tunnels, along the slopes, above the water, on straight, wall-like viaducts, and a soft, vague, saltish smell, a smell of drying seaweed, mingled at times with the strong, heavy perfume of the flowers. But Paul neither saw, looked at, nor smelled anything, for our fellow traveler engrossed all his attention. When we reached Cannes, as he wished to speak to me he signed to me to get out, and as soon as I did so, he took me by the arm. Do you know, she is really charming? Just look at her eyes, and I never saw anything like her hair. Don't excite yourself, I replied, or else address her, 
if you have any intentions that way. She does not look unapproachable. I fancy, although she appear to be a little bit grumpy. Why don't you speak to her, he said. I don't know what to say, for I am always terribly stupid at first, I can never make advances to a woman in the street. I follow them, go round and round them, and quite close to them, but never know what to say at first. I only once tried to enter into conversation with a woman in that way. As I clearly saw that she was waiting for me to make overtures, and as I felt bound to say something, I stammered out, I hope you are quite well, madam. She laughed in my face, and I made my escape. I promised Paul to do all I could to bring about a conversation, and when we had taken our places again, I politely asked our neighbor. Have you any objection to the smell of tobacco, madam? She merely replied, non capisco. So she was an Italian. I felt an absurd inclination to laugh. As Paul did not understand a word of that language, I was obliged to act as his interpreter, so I said in Italian. I asked you, madam, whether you had any objection to tobacco smoke? With an angry look she replied, Che mi fa. She had neither turned her head nor looked at me, and I really did not know whether to take this what do I care for an authorization, a refusal, a real sign of indifference, or for a mere let me alone. Madam, I replied, if you mind the smell of tobacco in the least. She again said, Micah, in a tone which seemed to mean, I wish to goodness you would leave me alone. It was, however, a kind of permission, so I said to Paul. You may smoke. He looked at me in that curious sort of way that people have when they try to understand others who are talking in a strange language before them, and asked me. What did you say to her? I asked whether we might smoke, and she said we might do whatever we liked. Whereupon I lighted my cigar. Did she say anything more? If you had counted her words you would have noticed that she used exactly six, two of which gave me to understand that she knew no French, so four remained, and much can be said in four words. Paul seemed quite unhappy, disappointed, and at sea, so to speak. But suddenly the Italian asked me, in that tone of discontent which seemed habitual to her, do you know at what time we shall get to Genoa? At eleven o'clock, I replied. Then after a moment I went on. My friend and I are also going to Genoa, and if we can be of any service to you, we shall be very happy, as you are quite alone. But she interrupted with such a mica, that I did not venture on another word. What did she say? Paul asked. She said she thought you were charming. But he was in no humor for joking, and begged me dryly not to make fun of him, so I translated her question and my polite offer, which had been so rudely rejected. Then he really became as restless as a caged squirrel. If we only knew, he said, what hotel she was going to, we would go to the same. Try to find out so as to have another opportunity to make her talk. It was not particularly easy, and I did not know what pretext to invent, desirous as I was to make the acquaintance of this unapproachable person. We passed Nice, Monaco, Mentone, and the train stopped at the frontier for the examination of luggage. Although I hate those ill-bred people who breakfast and dine in railway carriages, I went and bought a quantity of good things to make one last attack on her by their means. I felt sure that this girl must, ordinarily, be by no means inaccessible. Something had put her out and made her irritable, but very little would suffice, a mere word or some agreeable offer, to decide her and vanquish her. We started again, and we three were still alone. I spread my eatables on the seat. I cut up the fowl, put the slices of ham neatly on a piece of paper, and then carefully laid out our dessert, strawberries, plums, cherries and cakes, close to the girl. When she saw that we were about to eat she took a piece of chocolate and two little crisp cakes out of her pocket and began to munch them. Ask her to have some of ours, Paul said in a whisper. That is exactly what I wish to do, but it is rather a difficult matter. As she, however, glanced from time to time at our provisions, I felt sure that she would still be hungry when she had finished what she had with her. So, as soon as her frugal meal was over, I said to her, It would be very kind of you if you would take some of this fruit. Again she said Micah, but less crossly than before. Well, then, I said, may I offer you a little wine? 
I see you have not drunk anything. It is Italian wine, and as we are now in your own country, we should be very pleased to see such a pretty Italian mouth accept the offer of its French neighbors. She shook her head slightly, evidently wishing to refuse, but very desirous of accepting, and her mica this time was almost polite. I took the flask, which was covered with straw in the Italian fashion, and filling the glass, I offered it to her. Please drink it, I said, to bid us welcome to your country. She took the glass with her usual look, and emptied it at a draught, like a woman consumed with thirst, and then gave it back to me without even saying thank you. I then offered her the cherries. Please take some, I said, we shall be so glad if you will. Out of her corner she looked at all the fruit spread out beside her, and said so rapidly that I could scarcely follow her, Amy non piaciono ni lucirigi ni lususin, almo sultano lu fragili. What does she say? Paul asked. That she does riot care for cherries or plums, but only for strawberries. I put a newspaper full of wild strawberries on her lap, and she ate them quickly, tossing them into her mouth from some distance in a coquettish and charming manner. When she had finished the little red heap, which soon disappeared under the rapid action of her hands, I asked her. What may I offer you now? I will take a little chicken, she replied. She certainly devoured half of it, tearing it to pieces with the rapid movements of her jaws like some carnivorous animal. Then she made up her mind to have some cherries, which she did not like, and then some plums, then some little cakes. Then she said, I have had enough, and sat back in her corner. I was much amused, and tried to make her eat more, insisting, in fact, till she suddenly flew into a rage, and flung such a furious mica at me, that I would no longer run the risk of spoiling her digestion. I turned to my friend. My poor Paul, I said, I am afraid we have had our trouble for nothing. The night came on, one of those hot summer nights which extend their warm shade over the burning and exhausted earth. Here and there, in the distance, by the sea, on capes and promontories, bright stars, which I was, at times, almost inclined to confound with lighthouses, began to shine on the dark horizon. The scent of the orange trees became more penetrating, and we breathed with delight, distending our lungs to inhale it more deeply. The balmy air was soft, delicious, almost divine. Suddenly I noticed something like a shower of stars under the dense shade of the trees along the line, where it was quite dark. It might have been taken for drops of light, leaping, flying, playing and running among the leaves, or for small stars fallen from the skies in order to have an excursion on the earth. But they were only fireflies dancing a strange fiery ballet in the perfumed air. One of them happened to come into our carriage and shed its intermittent light, which seemed to be extinguished one moment and to be burning the next. I covered the carriage lamp with its blue shade and watched the strange fly careering about in its fiery flight. Suddenly it settled on the dark hair of our neighbor, who was half dozing after dinner. Paul seemed delighted, with his eyes fixed on the bright, sparkling spot, which looked like a living jewel on the forehead of the sleeping woman. The Italian woke up about eleven o'clock, with the bright insect still in her hair. When I saw her move, I said, we are just getting to Genoa, madam, and she murmured, without answering me, as if possessed by some obstinate and embarrassing thought. What am I going to do, I wonder? And then she suddenly asked. Would you like me to come with you? I was so taken aback that I really did not understand her. With us? How do you mean? She repeated, looking more and more furious. Would you like me to be your guide now, as soon as we get out of the train? I am quite willing, but where do you want to go? She shrugged her shoulders with an air of supreme indifference. Wherever you like, what does it matter to me? She repeated her, che me fa, twice. But we are going to the hotel. Very well, let us all go to the hotel, she said, in a contemptuous voice. I turned to Paul, and said. She wishes to know whether we should like her to come with us. My friend's utter surprise restored my self-possession. He stammered. With us? Where to? What for? How? I don't know, but she made this strange proposal to me in a most irritated voice. 
I told her that we were going to the hotel, and she said, very well, let us all go there. I suppose she is without a penny. She certainly has a very strange way of making acquaintances. Paul, who was very much excited, exclaimed. I am quite agreeable. Tell her that we will go wherever she likes. Then, after a moment's hesitation, he said uneasily. We must know, however, with whom she wishes to go, with you or with me. I turned to the Italian, who did not even seem to be listening to us, and said. We shall be very happy to have you with us, but my friend wishes to know whether you will take my arm or his. She opened her black eyes wide with vague surprise, and said, Che and I F.A.? I was obliged to explain myself. In Italy, I believe, when a man looks after a woman, fulfills all her wishes, and satisfies all her caprices, he is called a petito. Which of us two will you take for your petito? Without the slightest hesitation she replied. You. I turned to Paul. You see, my friend, she chooses me, you have no chance. All the better for you, he replied in a rage. Then, after thinking for a few moments, he went on. Do you really care about taking this creature with you? She will spoil our journey. What are we to do with this woman, who looks like I don't know what? They will not take us in at any decent hotel. I, however, just began to find the Italian much nicer than I had thought her at first, and I was now very desirous to take her with us. The idea delighted me. I replied, my dear fellow, we have accepted, and it is too late to recede. You were the first to advise me to say yes. It is very stupid, he growled, but do as you please. The train whistled, slackened speed, and we ran into the station. I got out of the carriage, and offered my new companion my hand. She jumped out lightly, and I gave her my arm, which she took with an air of seeming repugnance. As soon as we had claimed our luggage we set off into the town, Paul walking in utter silence. To what hotel shall we go? I asked him. It may be difficult to get into the city of Paris with a woman, especially with this Italian. Paul interrupted me. Yes, with an Italian who looks more like a dancer than a duchess. However, that is no business of mine. Do just as you please. I was in a state of perplexity. I had written to the city of Paris to retain our rooms, and now I did not know what to do. Two commissionaries followed us with our luggage. I continued, you might as well go on first and say that we are coming. And give the landlord to understand that I have a, a friend with me and that we should like rooms quite by themselves for us three, so as not to be brought in contact with other travelers. He will understand, and we will decide according to his answer. But Paul growled, thank you, such commissions in such parts do not suit me, by any means. I did not come here to select your apartments or to minister to your pleasures. But I was urgent, look here, don't be angry. It is surely far better to go to a good hotel than to a bad one, and it is not difficult to ask the landlord for three separate bedrooms and a dining room. I put a stress on three, and that decided him. He went on first, and I saw him go into a large hotel while I remained on the other side of the street, with my fair Italian, who did not say a word, and followed the porters with the luggage. Paul came back at last, looking as dissatisfied as my companion. That is settled, he said, and they will take us in, but here are only two bedrooms. You must settle it as you can. I followed him, rather ashamed of going in with such a strange companion. There were two bedrooms separated by a small sitting room. I ordered a cold supper, and then I turned to the Italian with a perplexed look. We have only been able to get two rooms, so you must choose which you like. She replied with her eternal, Chamey F.A. I thereupon took up her little black wooden trunk, such as servants use, and took it into the room on the right, which I had chosen for her. A bit of paper was fastened to the box, on which was written, Mademoiselle Francesca Rondoli, Genoa. Your name is Francesca? I asked, and she nodded her head, without replying. We shall have supper directly, I continued. Meanwhile, I dare say you would like to arrange your toilette a little? She answered with a mica, a word which she employed just as frequently as Chamey F.A., but I went on, 
it is always pleasant after a journey. Then I suddenly remembered that she had not, perhaps, the necessary requisites, for she appeared to me in a very singular position, as if she had just escaped from some disagreeable adventure, and I brought her my dressing case. I put out all the little instruments for cleanliness and comfort which it contained, a nail brush, a new toothbrush, I always carry a selection of them about with me, my nail scissors, a nail file, and sponges. I uncorked a bottle of eau de cologne, one of lavender water, and a little bottle of new mown hay, so that she might have a choice. Then I opened my powder box and put out the powder puff, placed my fine towels over the water jug, and a piece of new soap near the basin. She watched my movements with a look of annoyance in her wide-open eyes, without appearing either astonished or pleased at my forethought. Here is all that you require, I then said, I will tell you when supper is ready. When I returned to the sitting room I found that Paul had shut himself in the other room, so I sat down to wait. A waiter went to and fro, bringing plates and glasses. He laid the table slowly, then put a cold chicken on it, and told me that all was ready. I knocked gently at Mademoiselle Rondely's door. Come in, she said, and when I did so I was struck by a strong, heavy smell of perfumes, as if I were in a hairdresser's shop. The Italian was sitting on her trunk in an attitude either of thoughtful discontent or absent-mindedness. The towel was still folded over the water jug that was full of water, and the soap, untouched and dry, was lying beside the empty basin, but one would have thought that the young woman had used half the contents of the bottles of perfume. The eau de cologne, however, had been spared, as only about a third of it had gone, but to make up for that she had used a surprising amount of lavender water and new mown hay. A cloud of violet powder, a vague white mist, seemed still to be floating in the air, from the effects of her overpowdering her face and neck. It seemed to cover her eyelashes, eyebrows, and the hair on her temples like snow, while her cheeks were plastered with it, and layers of it covered her nostrils, the corners of her eyes, and her chin. When she got up she exhaled such a strong odor of perfume that it almost made me feel faint. When we sat down to supper, I found that Paul was in a most execrable temper, and I could get nothing out of him but blame, irritable words, and disagreeable remarks. Mademoiselle Francesca ate like an ogre, and as soon as she had finished her meal she threw herself upon the sofa in the sitting room. Sitting down beside her, I said gallantly, kissing her hand. Shall I have the bed prepared, or will you sleep on the couch? It is all the same to me. Chami F.A. Her indifference vexed me. Should you like to retire at once? Yes. I am very sleepy. She got up, yawned, gave her hand to Paul, who took it with a furious look, and I lighted her into the bedroom. A disquieting feeling haunted me. Here is all you want, I said again. The next morning she got up early, like a woman who is accustomed to work. She woke me by doing so and I watched her through my half-closed eyelids. She came and went without hurrying herself, as if she were astonished at having nothing to do. At length she went to the dressing table, and in a moment emptied all my bottles of perfume. She certainly also used some water, but very little. When she was quite dressed, she sat down on her trunk again, and clasping one knee between her hands, she seemed to be thinking. At that moment I pretended to first notice her, and said, Good morning, Francesca. Without seeming in at all a better temper than the previous night, she murmured, Good morning. When I asked her whether she had slept well, she nodded her head, and jumping out of bed, I went and kissed her. She turned her face toward me like a child who is being kissed against its will. But I took her tenderly in my arms, and gently pressed my lips on her eyelids, which she closed with evident distaste under my kisses on her fresh cheek and full lips which she turned away. You don't seem to like being kissed, I said to her. Micah was her only answer. I sat down on the trunk by her side, and passing my arm through hers, I said, Micah. 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 In reply to everything. I shall call you Mademoiselle Micah, I think. For the first time I fancied that I saw the shadow of a smile on her lips but it passed by so quickly that I may have been mistaken. But if you never say anything but Micah, I shall not know what to do to please you. Let me see. 
What shall we do today? She hesitated a moment, as if some fancy had flitted through her head, and then she said carelessly, It is all the same to me, whatever you like. Very well, Mademoiselle Micah, we will have a carriage and go for a drive. As you please, she said. Paul was waiting for us in the dining room, looking as bored as third parties usually do in love affairs. I assumed a delighted air and shook hands with him with triumphant energy. What are you thinking of doing? He asked. First of all, we will go and see a little of the town, and then we might get a carriage and take a drive in the neighborhood. We breakfasted almost in silence, and then set out. I dragged Francesca from palace to palace, and she either looked at nothing or merely glanced carelessly at the various masterpieces. Paul followed us, growling all sorts of disagreeable things. Then we all three took a drive in silence into the country and returned to dinner. The next day it was the same thing and the next day again, and on the third Paul said to me, Look here, I am going to leave you. I am not going to stop here for three weeks watching you make love to this creature. I was perplexed and annoyed, for to my great surprise I had become singularly attached to Francesca. A man is but weak and foolish, carried away by the merest trifle, and a coward every time that his senses are excited or mastered. I clung to this unknown girl, silent and dissatisfied as she always was. I liked her somewhat ill-tempered face, the dissatisfied droop of her mouth, the weariness of her look, I liked her fatigued movements, the contemptuous way in which she let me kiss her, the very indifference of her caresses. A secret bond, that mysterious bond of physical love, which does not satisfy, bound me to her. I told Paul so, quite frankly. He treated me as if I were a fool, and then said, Very well, take her with you. But she obstinately refused to leave Genoa, without giving any reason. I besought, I reasoned, I promised, but all was of no avail, and so I stayed on. Paul declared that he would go by himself, and went so far as to pack up his portmanteau. But he remained all the same. Thus a fortnight passed. Francesca was always silent and irritable, lived beside me rather than with me, responded to all my requirements and all my propositions with her perpetual Chami F.A., or with her no less perpetual Micah. My friend became more and more furious, but my only answer was, you can go if you are tired of staying. I am not detaining you. Then he called me names, overwhelmed me with reproaches, and exclaimed, where do you think I can go now? We had three weeks at our disposal, and here is a fortnight gone. I cannot continue my journey now, and, in any case, I am not going to Venice, Florence, and Rome all by myself. But you will pay for it, and more dearly than you think, most likely. You are not going to bring a man all the way from Paris in order to shut him up at a hotel in Genoa with an Italian adventuress. When I told him, very calmly, to return to Paris, he exclaimed that he intended to do so the very next day. But the next day he was still there, still in a rage and swearing. By this time we began to be known in the streets through which we wandered from morning till night. Sometimes French people would turn round astonished at meeting their fellow countrymen in the company of this girl with her striking costume, who looked singularly out of place, not to say compromising, beside us. She used to walk along, leaning on my arm, without looking at anything. Why did she remain with me, with us, who seemed to do so little to amuse her? Who was she? Where did she come from? What was she doing? Had she any plan or idea? Where did she live? As an adventuress, or by chance meetings? I tried in vain to find out and to explain it. The better I knew her the more enigmatical she became. She seemed to be a girl of poor family who had been taken away, and then cast aside and lost. What did she think would become of her, or whom was she waiting for? She certainly did not appear to be trying to make a conquest of me, or to make any real profit out of me. I tried to question her, to speak to her of her childhood and family, but she never gave me an answer. I stayed with her, my heart unfettered and my senses enchained, never wearied of holding her in my arms, that proud and quarrelsome woman, captivated by my senses, or rather carried away, overcome by a youthful, healthy, powerful charm. 
which emanated from her fragrant person and from the well-molded lines of her body. Another week passed, and the term of my journey was drawing on, for I had to be back in Paris by the 11th of July. By this time Paul had come to take his part in the adventure, though still grumbling at me, while I invented pleasures, distractions and excursions to amuse Francesca and my friend, and in order to do this I gave myself a great amount of trouble. One day I proposed an excursion to Sta Margarita, that charming little town in the midst of gardens, hidden at the foot of a slope which stretches far into the sea up to the village of Portofino. We three walked along the excellent road which goes along the foot of the mountain. Suddenly Francesca said to me, I shall not be able to go with you tomorrow, I must go and see some of my relatives. That was all. I did not ask her any questions, as I was quite sure she would not answer me. The next morning she got up very early. When she spoke to me it was in a constrained and hesitating voice. If I do not come back again, shall you come and fetch me? Most certainly I shall, was my reply. Where shall I go to find you? Then she explained, you must go into the street Victor Emanuel, down the Falcone Road and the side street San Rafael and into the furniture shop in the building at the right at the end of a court, and there you must ask for Madame Rondely. That is the place. And so she went away, leaving me rather astonished. When Paul saw that I was alone, he stammered out, where, is Francesca? And when I told him what had happened, he exclaimed, my dear fellow, let us make use of our opportunity, and bolt, as it is, our time is up. Two days, more or less, make no difference. Let us go at once, go and pack up your things. Off we go. But I refused. I could not, as I told him, leave the girl in that manner after such companionship for nearly three weeks. At any rate, I ought to say goodbye to her and make her accept a present. I certainly had no intention of behaving badly to her. But he would not listen, he pressed and worried me, but I would not give way. I remained indoors for several hours, expecting Francesca's return, but she did not come, and at last, at dinner, Paul said with a triumphant air. She has flown, my dear fellow, it is certainly very strange. I must acknowledge that I was surprised and rather vexed. He laughed in my face and made fun of me. It is not exactly a bad way of getting rid of you, though rather primitive. Just wait for me, I shall be back in a moment, they often say. How long are you going to wait? I should not wonder if you were foolish enough to go and look for her at the address she gave you. Does Madame Rondely live here, please? No, Monsieur. I'll bet that you are longing to go there. Not in the least, I protested and I assure you that if she does not come back tomorrow morning I shall leave by the express at eight o'clock. I shall have waited twenty-four hours, and that is enough, my conscience will be quite clear. I spent an uneasy and unpleasant evening, for I really had at heart a very tender feeling for her. I went to bed at twelve o'clock, and hardly slept at all. I got up at six, called Paul, packed up my things, and two hours later we set out for France together. Three. The next year, at just about the same period, I was seized as one is with a periodical fever, with a new desire to go to Italy, and I immediately made up my mind to carry it into effect. There is no doubt that every really well-educated man ought to see Florence, Venice and Rome. This travel has, also, the additional advantage of providing many subjects of conversation in society and of giving one an opportunity for bringing forward artistic generalities which appear profound. This time I went alone, and I arrived at Genoa at the same time as the year before, but without any adventure on the road. I went to the same hotel, and actually happened to have the same room. I was hardly in bed when the recollection of Francesca which, since the evening before, had been floating vaguely through my mind, haunted me with strange persistency. I thought of her nearly the whole night, and by degrees the wish to see her again seized me, a confused desire at first which gradually grew stronger and more intense. At last I made up my mind to spend the next day in Genoa to try to find her, and if I should not succeed, to take the evening train. Early in the morning I set out on my search. I remembered the directions she had given me when she left me, perfectly, Victor Emanuel Street, 
house of the furniture dealer, at the bottom of the yard on the right. I found it without the least difficulty, and I knocked at the door of a somewhat dilapidated-looking dwelling. It was opened by a stout woman, who must have been very handsome, but who actually was only very dirty. Although she had too much embonpoint, she still bore the lines of majestic beauty. Her untidy hair fell over her forehead and shoulders, and one fancied one could see her floating about in an enormous dressing gown covered with spots of dirt and grease. Round her neck she wore a great gilt necklace, and on her wrists were splendid bracelets of Genoa filigree work. In rather a hostile manner she asked me what I wanted, and I replied by requesting her to tell me whether Francesca Rondoli lived there. What do you want with her? she asked. I had the pleasure of meeting her last year, and I should like to see her again. The old woman looked at me suspiciously. Where did you meet her? she asked. Why, here in Genoa itself. What is your name? I hesitated a moment, and then I told her. I had hardly done so when the Italian put out her arms as if to embrace me. Oh! You are the Frenchman, how glad I am to see you! But what grief you caused the poor child! She waited for you a month, yes, a whole month. At first she thought you would come to fetch her. She wanted to see whether you loved her. If you only knew how she cried when she saw that you were not coming. She cried till she seemed to have no tears left. Then she went to the hotel, but you had gone. She thought that most likely you were traveling in Italy, and that you would return by Genoa to fetch her, as she would not go with you. And she waited more than a month, monsieur, and she was so unhappy, so unhappy. I am her mother. I really felt a little disconcerted, but I regained my self-possession, and asked. Where is she now? She has gone to Paris with a painter, a delightful man who loves her very much, and who gives her everything that she wants. Just look at what she sent me, they are very pretty, are they not? And she showed me, with quite southern animation, her heavy bracelets and necklace. I have also, she continued, earrings with stones in them, a silk dress, and some rings, but I only wear them on grand occasions. Oh! She is very happy, monsieur, very happy. She will be so pleased when I tell her you have been here. But pray come in and sit down. You will take something or other, surely? But I refused, as I now wished to get away by the first train. But she took me by the arm and pulled me in, saying, Please, come in, I must tell her that you have been in here. I found myself in a small, rather dark room, furnished with only a table and a few chairs. She continued, Oh, she is very happy now, very happy. When you met her in the train she was very miserable, she had had an unfortunate love affair in Marseilles, and she was coming home, poor child. But she liked you at once, though she was still rather sad, you understand. Now she has all she wants, and she writes and tells me everything that she does. His name is Bellman, and they say he is a great painter in your country. He fell in love with her at first sight. But you will take a glass of syrup, it is very good. Are you quite alone, this year? Yes, I said, quite alone. I felt an increasing inclination to laugh, as my first disappointment was dispelled by what Mother Rondely said. I was obliged, however, to drink a glass of her syrup. So you are quite alone, she continued. How sorry I am that Francesca is not here now she would have been company for you all the time you stayed. It is not very amusing to go about all by oneself, and she will be very sorry also. Then, as I was getting up to go, she exclaimed. But would you not like Carlotta to go with you? She knows all the walks very well. She is my second daughter, monsieur. No doubt she took my look of surprise for consent, for she opened the inner door and called out up the dark stairs which I could not see. Carlotta. Carlotta. Make haste down, my dear child. I tried to protest, but she would not listen. No. She will be very glad to go with you, she is very nice, and much more cheerful than her sister, and she is a good girl, a very good girl, whom I love very much. In a few moments a tall, slender, dark girl appeared, her hair hanging down, 
and her youthful figure showing unmistakably beneath an old dress of her mother's. The latter at once told her how matters stood. This is Francesca's Frenchman, you know, the one whom she knew last year. He is quite alone and has come to look for her, poor fellow, so I told him that you would go with him to keep him company. The girl looked at me with her handsome dark eyes and said, smiling. I have no objection if he wishes it. I could not possibly refuse and merely said. Of course, I shall be very glad of your company. Her mother pushed her out. Go and get dressed directly, put on your blue dress and your hat with the flowers, and make haste. As soon as she had left the room the old woman explained herself, I have two others, but they are much younger. It costs a lot of money to bring up for children. Luckily the eldest is off my hands at present. Then she told all about herself, about her husband, who had been an employee on the railway, but who was dead, and she expatiated on the good qualities of Carlotta, her second girl, who soon returned, dressed, as her sister had been, in a striking, peculiar manner. Her mother examined her from head to foot, and, after finding everything right, she said, Now, my children, you can go. Then turning to the girl, she said, Be sure you are back by ten o'clock tonight, you know the door is locked then. The answer was, All right, Mama, don't alarm yourself. She took my arm and we went wandering about the streets, just as I had wandered the previous year with her sister. We returned to the hotel for lunch, and then I took my new friend to Santa Margarita, just as I had taken her sister the year previously. During the whole fortnight which I had at my disposal, I took Carlotta to all the places of interest in and about Genoa. She gave me no cause to regret her sister. She cried when I left her, and the morning of my departure I gave her four bracelets for her mother, besides a substantial token of my affection for herself. One of these days I intend to return to Italy, and I cannot help remembering with a certain amount of uneasiness, mingled with hope, that Madame Rondoli has two more daughters. Original Short Stories, Volume 7 Guy de Maupassant Original Short Stories Translated by Albert M. C. McMaster, B.A. A. E. Henderson, B.A. Enemy, Casada and others. Volume 7 The False Gems Monsieur Lantin had met the young girl at a reception at the house of the second head of his department, and had fallen head over heels in love with her. She was the daughter of a provincial tax collector, who had been dead several years. She and her mother came to live in Paris, where the latter, who made the acquaintance of some of the families in her neighborhood, hoped to find a husband for her daughter. They had very moderate means and were honorable, gentle, and quiet. The young girl was a perfect type of the virtuous woman in whose hands every sensible young man dreams of one day entrusting his happiness. Her simple beauty had the charm of angelic modesty, and the imperceptible smile which constantly hovered about the lips seemed to be the reflection of a pure and lovely soul. Her praises resounded on every side. People never tired of repeating, happy the man who wins her love. He could not find a better wife. Monsieur Lantin, then chief clerk in the Department of the Interior, enjoyed a snug little salary of 3,500 francs, and he proposed to this model young girl and was accepted. He was unspeakably happy with her. She governed his household with such clever economy that they seemed to live in luxury. She lavished the most delicate attentions on her husband, coaxed and fondled him. And so great was her charm that six years after their marriage, Monsieur Lantin discovered that he loved his wife even more than during the first days of their honeymoon. He found fault with only two of her tastes, her love for the theater, and her taste for imitation jewelry. Her friends, the wives of some petty officials, frequently procured for her a box at the theater, often for the first representations of the new plays and her husband was obliged to accompany her, whether he wished it or not, to these entertainments which bored him excessively after his day's work at the office. After a time, Monsieur Lantin begged his wife to request some lady of her acquaintance to accompany her, and to bring her home after the theatre. She opposed this arrangement, at first. But, after much persuasion, finally consented, to the infinite delight of her husband. 
Now, with her love for the theater, came also the desire for ornaments. Her costumes remained as before, simple, in good taste, and always modest. But she soon began to adorn her ears with huge rhinestones, which glittered and sparkled like real diamonds. Around her neck she wore strings of false pearls, on her arms bracelets of imitation gold, and combs set with glass jewels. Her husband frequently remonstrated with her, saying, My dear, as you cannot afford to buy real jewelry, you ought to appear adorned with your beauty and modesty alone, which are the rarest ornaments of your sex. But she would smile sweetly, and say, What can I do? I am so fond of jewelry. It is my only weakness. We cannot change our nature. Then she would wind the pearl necklace round her fingers, make the facets of the crystal gems sparkle, and say, Look! Are they not lovely? One would swear they were real. Monsieur Lantin would then answer, smilingly, You have bohemian tastes, my dear. Sometimes, of an evening, when they were enjoying a tete-a-tete -tete by the fireside, she would place on the tea table the Morocco leather box containing the trash, as Monsieur Lantin called it. She would examine the false gems with a passionate attention, as though they imparted some deep and secret joy, and she often persisted in passing a necklace around her husband's neck, and, laughing heartily, would exclaim, How droll you look! Then she would throw herself into his arms, and kiss him affectionately. One evening, in winter, she had been to the opera, and returned home chilled through and through. The next morning she coughed, and eight days later she died of inflammation of the lungs. Monsieur Lantin's despair was so great that his hair became white in one month. He wept unceasingly. His heart was broken as he remembered her smile, her voice, every charm of his dead wife. Time did not assuage his grief. Often, during office hours, while his colleagues were discussing the topics of the day, his eyes would suddenly fill with tears, and he would give vent to his grief in heartrending sobs. Everything in his wife's room remained as it was during her lifetime, all her furniture, even her clothing, being left as it was on the day of her death. Here he was wont to seclude himself daily and think of her who had been his treasure the joy of his existence. But life soon became a struggle. His income, which, in the hands of his wife, covered all household expenses, was now no longer sufficient for his own immediate wants. And he wondered how she could have managed to buy such excellent wine and the rare delicacies which he could no longer procure with his modest resources. He incurred some debts and was soon reduced to absolute poverty. One morning, finding himself without a cent in his pocket, he resolved to sell something, and immediately the thought occurred to him of disposing of his wife's paste jewels, for he cherished in his heart a sort of rancor against these deceptions, which had always irritated him in the past. The very sight of them spoiled, somewhat, the memory of his lost darling. To the last days of her life she had continued to make purchases, bringing home new gems almost every evening, and he turned them over some time before finally deciding to sell the heavy necklace, which she seemed to prefer, and which, he thought, ought to be worth about six or seven francs. For it was a very fine workmanship, though only imitation. He put it in his pocket and started out in search of what seemed a reliable jeweler's shop. At length he found one and went in, feeling a little ashamed to expose his misery and also to offer such a worthless article for sale. Sir, said he to the merchant, I would like to know what this is worth. The man took the necklace, examined it, called his clerk, and made some remarks in an undertone. He then put the ornament back on the counter and looked at it from a distance to judge of the effect. Monsieur Lantin, annoyed at all these ceremonies, was on the point of saying, Oh, I know well enough it is not worth anything, when the jeweler said, Sir, that necklace is worth from twelve to fifteen thousand francs. But I could not buy it, unless you can tell me exactly where it came from. The widower opened his eyes wide and remained gaping, not comprehending the merchant's meaning. Finally he stammered, You say, are you sure? The other replied, Drilly, you can try elsewhere and see if anyone will offer you more. I consider it worth fifteen thousand at the most. Come back, here, if you cannot do better. Monsieur Lantin, beside himself with astonishment, took up the necklace and left the store. 
he wished time for reflection. Once outside, he felt inclined to laugh and said to himself, The fool! Oh, the fool! Had I only taken him at his word! That jeweler cannot distinguish real diamonds from the imitation article. A few minutes after, he entered another store, in the Rue de la Paix. As soon as the proprietor glanced at the necklace, he cried out. Ah, uh, parbleu! I know it well. It was bought here. Monsieur Lantin, greatly disturbed, asked. How much is it worth? Well, I sold it for twenty thousand francs. I am willing to take it back for eighteen thousand, when you inform me, according to our legal formality, how it came to be in your possession. This time, Monsieur Lantin was dumbfounded. He replied, But, but, examine it well. Until this moment I was under the impression that it was imitation. The jeweler asked, What is your name, sir? Lantin, I am in the employ of the Minister of the Interior. I live at number 16 Rue des Martyrs. The merchant looked through his books, found the entry, and said, That necklace was sent to Madame Lantin's address, 16 Rue des Martyrs, July 20, 1876. The two men looked into each other's eyes, the widow were speechless with astonishment. The jeweler scenting a thief. The latter broke the silence. Will you leave this necklace here for twenty-four hours, said he, I will give you a receipt. Monsieur Lantin answered hastily, yes, certainly. Then, putting the ticket in his pocket, he left the store. He wandered aimlessly through the streets, his mind in a state of dreadful confusion. He tried to reason, to understand. His wife could not afford to purchase such a costly ornament. Certainly not. But, then, it must have been a present, a present, a present, from whom? Why was it given her? He stopped and remained standing in the middle of the street. A horrible doubt entered his mind, she? Then, all the other jewels must have been presents, too. The earth seemed to tremble beneath him, the tree before him to be falling, he threw up his arms and fell to the ground, unconscious. He recovered his senses in a pharmacy, into which the passers-by had borne him. He asked to be taken home, and, when he reached the house, he shut himself up in his room and wept until nightfall. Finally, overcome with fatigue, he went to bed and fell into a heavy sleep. The sun awoke him next morning, and he began to dress slowly to go to the office. It was hard to work after such shocks. He sent a letter to his employer, requesting to be excused. Then he remembered that he had to return to the jewelers. He did not like the idea, but he could not leave the necklace with that man. He dressed and went out. It was a lovely day. A clear, blue sky smiled on the busy city below. Men of leisure were strolling about with their hands in their pockets. Monsieur Lantin, observing them, said to himself, The rich, indeed, are happy. With money it is possible to forget even the deepest sorrow. One can go where one pleases, and in travel find that distraction which is the surest cure for grief. Oh, if I were only rich! He perceived that he was hungry, but his pocket was empty. He again remembered the necklace. Eighteen thousand francs. Eighteen thousand francs. What a sum! He soon arrived in the Rue de la Paix, opposite the jewelers. 18,000 francs. Twenty times he resolved to go in, but shame kept him back. He was hungry, however, very hungry, and not a cent in his pocket. He decided quickly, ran across the street, in order not to have time for reflection, and rushed into the store. The proprietor immediately came forward, and politely offered him a chair, the clerks glanced at him knowingly. I have made inquiries, Monsieur Lantin, said the jeweler, and if you are still resolved to dispose of the gems, I am ready to pay you the price I offered. Certainly, sir, stammered Monsieur Lantin. Whereupon the proprietor took from a drawer eighteen large bills, counted, and handed them to Monsieur Lantin, who signed a receipt, and, with trembling hand, put the money into his pocket. As he was about to leave the store, he turned toward the merchant, who still wore the same knowing smile, and lowering his eyes, said, I have, I have other gems, which came from the same source. 
Will you buy them, also? The merchant bowed, certainly, sir. Monsieur Lantin said gravely, I will bring them to you. An hour later, he returned with the gems. The large diamond earrings were worth 20,000 francs, the bracelets, 35,000. The rings, 16,000, a set of emeralds and sapphires, 14,000, a gold chain with solitaire pendant, 40,000, making the sum of 143,000 francs. The jeweler remarked, jokingly. There was a person who invested all her savings in precious stones. Monsieur Lantin replied, seriously. It is only another way of investing one's money. That day he lunched at Voisin's and drank wine worth twenty francs a bottle. Then he hired a carriage and made a tour of the Bois. He gazed at the various turnouts with a kind of disdain and could hardly refrain from crying out to the occupants. I, too, am rich, I am worth two hundred thousand francs. Suddenly he thought of his employer. He drove up to the bureau and entered gaily, saying, Sir, I have come to resign my position. I have just inherited three hundred thousand francs. He shook hands with his former colleagues and confided to them some of his projects for the future. He then went off to dine at the Café Anglais. He seated himself beside a gentleman of aristocratic bearing and, during the meal, informed the latter confidentially that he had just inherited a fortune of four hundred thousand francs. For the first time in his life, he was not bored at the theater and spent the remainder of the night in a gay frolic. Six months afterward, he married again. His second wife was a very virtuous woman, but had a violent temper. She caused him much sorrow. Fascination I can tell you neither the name of the country, nor the name of the man. It was a long, long way from here on a fertile and burning shore. We had been walking since the morning along the coast, with the blue sea bathed in sunlight on one side of us, and the shore covered with crops on the other. Flowers were growing quite close to the waves, those light, gentle, lulling waves. It was very warm, a soft warmth permeated with the odor of the rich, damp, fertile soil. One fancied one was inhaling germs. I had been told that evening that I should meet with hospitality at the house of a Frenchman who lived in an orange grove at the end of a promontory. Who was he? I did not know. He had come there one morning ten years before, and had bought land which he planted with vines and sowed with grain. He had worked, this man, with passionate energy, with fury. Then as he went on from month to month, year to year, enlarging his boundaries, cultivating incessantly the strong virgin soil, he accumulated a fortune by his indefatigable labor. But he kept on working, they said. Rising at daybreak, he would remain in the fields till evening, superintending everything without ceasing, tormented by one fixed idea, the insatiable desire for money, which nothing can quiet, nothing satisfy. He now appeared to be very rich. The sun was setting as I reached his house. It was situated as described, at the end of a promontory in the midst of a grove of orange trees. It was a large square house, quite plain, and overlooked the sea. As I approached, a man wearing a long beard appeared in the doorway. Having greeted him, I asked if he would give me shelter for the night. He held out his hand and said, smiling. Come in, monsieur, consider yourself at home. He led me into a room, and put a man's servant at my disposal with the perfect ease and familiar graciousness of a man of the world. Then he left me saying, We will dine as soon as you are ready to come downstairs. We took dinner, sitting opposite each other, on a terrace facing the sea. I began to talk about this rich, distant, unknown land. He smiled as he replied carelessly. Yes, this country is beautiful. But no country satisfies one when they are far from the one they love. You regret France? I regret Paris. Why do you not go back? Oh, I will return there. And gradually we began to talk of French society, of the boulevards, and things Parisian. He asked me questions that showed he knew all about these things, mentioned names, all the familiar names in vaudeville known on the sidewalks. Whom does one see at Tortoni's now? Always the same crowd, except those who died. 
I looked at him attentively, haunted by a vague recollection. I certainly had seen that head somewhere. But where? And when? He seemed tired, although he was vigorous, and sad, although he was determined. His long, fair beard fell on his chest. He was somewhat bald and had heavy eyebrows and a thick mustache. The sun was sinking into the sea, turning the vapor from the earth into a fiery mist. The orange blossoms exhaled their powerful, delicious fragrance. He seemed to see nothing besides me, and gazing steadfastly he appeared to discover in the depths of my mind the far away, beloved and well-known image of the wide, shady pavement leading from the Madeline to the Rue Drouet. Do you know Boutrell? Yes, indeed. Has he changed much? Yes, his hair is quite white. And La Ritamie? The same as ever. And the women? Tell me about the women. Let's see. Do you know Suzanne Werner? Yes, very much. But that is over. Ah. And Sophie Astier? Dead. Poor girl. Did you, did you know? But he ceased abruptly, and then, in a changed voice, his face suddenly turning pale, he continued. No, it is best that I should not speak of that any more, it breaks my heart. Then, as if to change the current of his thoughts he rose. Would you like to go in, he said. Yes, I think so. And he preceded me into the house. The downstairs rooms were enormous, bare and mournful, and had a deserted look. Plates and glasses were scattered on the tables, left there by the dark-skinned servants who wandered incessantly about this spacious dwelling. Two rifles were banging from two nails, on the wall. And in the corners of the rooms were spades, fishing poles, dried palm leaves, every imaginable thing set down at random when people came home in the evening and ready to hand when they went out at any time, or went to work. My host smiled as he said. This is the dwelling, or rather the kennel, of an exile, but my own room is cleaner. Let us go there. As I entered I thought I was in a second-hand store, it was so full of things of all descriptions, strange things of various kinds that one felt must be souvenirs. On the walls were two pretty paintings by well-known artists, draperies, weapons, swords and pistols, and exactly in the middle, on the principal panel, a square of white satin in a gold frame. Somewhat surprised, I approached to look at it, and perceived a hairpin fastened in the center of the glossy satin. My host placed his hand on my shoulder. That, said he, is the only thing that I look at here, and the only thing that I have seen for ten years. M. Prudhomme said, this sword is the most memorable day of my life. I can say, this hairpin is all my life. I sought for some commonplace remark, and ended by saying, you have suffered on account of some woman? He replied abruptly. Say, rather, that I am suffering like a wretch. But come out on my balcony. A name rose to my lips just now which I dared not utter, for if you had said dead as you did of Sophie Astier, I should have fired a bullet into my brain this very day. We had gone out on the wide balcony from whence we could see two gulfs, one to the right and the other to the left, enclosed by high gray mountains. It was just twilight and the reflection of the sunset still lingered in the sky. He continued. Is Jean de Limars still alive? His eyes were fastened on mine and were full of a trembling anxiety. I smiled. Parbleu, she is prettier than ever. Do you know her? Yes. He hesitated and then said. Very well? No. He took my hand. Tell me about her, he said. Why, I have nothing to tell. She is one of the most charming women, or, rather, girls, and the most admired in Paris. She leads a delightful existence and lives like a princess, that is all. I love her, he murmured in a tone in which he might have said, I am going to die. Then suddenly he continued. Ah. For three years we lived in a state of terror and delight. I almost killed her five or six times. She tried to pierce my eyes with that hairpin that you saw just now. Look, do you see that little white spot beneath my left eye? We loved each other. How can I explain that infatuation? 
you would not understand it. There must be a simple form of love, the result of the mutual impulse of two hearts and two souls. But there is also assuredly an atrocious form, that tortures one cruelly, the result of the occult blending of two unlike personalities who detest each other at the same time that they adore one another. In three years this woman had ruined me. I had four million francs which she squandered in her calm manner, quietly, eat them up with a gentle smile that seemed to fall from her eyes onto her lips. You know her? There is something irresistible about her. What is it? I do not know. Is it those gray eyes whose glance penetrates you like a gimlet and remains there like the point of an arrow? It is more likely the gentle, indifferent and fascinating smile that she wears like a mask. Her slow grace pervades you little by little. Exhales from her like a perfume, from her slim figure that scarcely sways as she passes you, for she seems to glide rather than walk, from her pretty voice with its slight drawl that would seem to be the music of her smile. From her gestures, also, which are never exaggerated, but always appropriate, and intoxicate your vision with their harmony. For three years she was the only being that existed for me on the earth. How I suffered. For she deceived me as she deceived everyone. Why? For no reason, just for the pleasure of deceiving. And when I found it out, when I treated her as a common girl and a beggar, she said quietly, Are we married? Since I have been here I have thought so much about her that at last I understand her. She is Manon Lescott, come back to life. It is Marion, who could not love without deceiving, Marion for whom love, amusement, money, are all one. He was silent. After a few minutes he resumed. When I had spent my last so on her she said simply, You understand, my dear boy, that I cannot live on air and weather. I love you very much, better than anyone, but I must live. Poverty and I could not keep house together. And if I should tell you what a horrible life I led with her. When I looked at her I would just as soon have killed her as kissed her. When I looked at her. I felt a furious desire to open my arms to embrace and strangle her. She had, back of her eyes, something false and intangible that made me execrate her, and that was, perhaps, the reason I loved her so well. The eternal feminine, the odious and seductive feminine, was stronger in her than in any other woman. She was full of it, overcharged, as with a venomous and intoxicating fluid. She was a woman to a greater extent than anyone has ever been. And when I went out with her she would look at all men in such a manner that she seemed to offer herself to each in a single glance. This exasperated me, and still it attached me to her all the more. This creature in just walking along the street belonged to everyone, in spite of me, in spite of herself, by the very fact of her nature, although she had a modest, gentle carriage. Do you understand? And what torture? At the theater, at the restaurant she seemed to belong to others under my very eyes. And as soon as I left her she did belong to others. It is now ten years since I saw her and I love her better than ever. Night spread over the earth. A strong perfume of orange blossoms pervaded the air. I said, Will you see her again? Parbleu. I now have here, in land and money, seven to eight thousand francs. When I reach a million I shall sell out and go away. I shall have enough to live on with her for a year, one whole year. And then, goodbye, my life will be finished. But after that? I asked. After that, I do not know. That will be all, I may possibly ask her to take me as a valet de chamber. Yvette Samoris. The Comtesse Samoris. That lady in black over there? The very one. She's wearing mourning for her daughter, whom she killed. You don't mean that seriously? How did she die? Oh. It is a very simple story, without any crime in it, any violence. Then what really happened? Almost nothing. Many courtesans are born to be virtuous women, they say, and many women called virtuous are born to be courtesans, is that not so? Now, Madame Samoris, who was born a courtesan, had a daughter born a virtuous woman, that's all. I don't quite understand you. I'll explain what I mean. 
The Contesse is nothing but a common, ordinary parvenu originating no one knows where. A Hungarian or Wallachian countess or I know not what. She appeared one winter in apartments she had taken in the Champs Elysees, that quarter for adventurers and adventuresses, and opened her drawing room to the first comer or to anyone that turned up. I went there. Why? You will say. I really can't tell you. I went there, as everyone goes to such places because the women are facile and the men are dishonest. You know that set composed of filibusters with varied decorations, all noble, all titled, all unknown at the embassies, with the exception of those who are spies. All talk of their honor without the slightest occasion for doing so, boast of their ancestors, tell you about their lives, braggarts, liars, sharpers, as dangerous as the false cards they have up their sleeves, as delusive as their names, in short. The aristocracy of the Banyo. I adore these people. They are interesting to study, interesting to know, amusing to understand, often clever, never commonplace like public functionaries. Their wives are always pretty, with a slight flavor of foreign roguery, with the mystery of their existence, half of it perhaps spent in a house of correction. They have, as a rule, magnificent eyes and incredible hair. I adore them also. Madame Samoris is the type of these adventuresses, elegant, mature and still beautiful. Charming feline creatures, you feel that they are vicious to the marrow of their bones. You find them very amusing when you visit them, they give card parties. They have dances and suppers, in short, they offer you all the pleasures of social life. And she had a daughter, a tall, fine-looking girl, always ready for amusement, always full of laughter and reckless gaiety, a true adventurous daughter, but, at the same time, an innocent, unsophisticated, artless girl, who saw nothing, knew nothing. Understood nothing of all the things that happened in her father's house. The girl was simply a puzzle to me. She was a mystery. She lived amid those infamous surroundings with a quiet, tranquil ease that was either terribly criminal or else the result of innocence. She sprang from the filth of that class like a beautiful flower fed on corruption. How do you know about them? How do I know? That's the funniest part of the business. One morning there was a ring at my door, and my valet came up to tell me that M. Joseph Bonenthal wanted to speak to me. I said directly. And who is this gentleman? My valet replied, I don't know, monsieur. Perhaps tis someone that wants employment. And so it was. The man wanted me to take him as a servant. I asked him where he had been last. He answered, with the Comtesse Samoris. Ah, said I, but my house is not a bit like hers. I know that well, monsieur, he said, and that's the very reason I want to take service with monsieur. I've had enough of these people, a man may stay a little while with them, but he won't remain long with them. I required an additional man's servant at the time, and so I took him. A month later Mademoiselle Yvette Samoris died mysteriously, and here are all the details of her death I could gather from Joseph, who got them from his sweetheart, the Contessa's chambermaid. It was a ball night, and two newly arrived guests were chatting behind a door. Mademoiselle Yvette, who had just been dancing, leaned against this door to get a little air. They did not see her approaching, but she heard what they were saying. And this was what they said. But who is the father of the girl? A Russian, it appears, Count Rovolov. He never comes near the mother now. And who is the reigning prince today? That English prince standing near the window. Madame Samoris adores him. But her adoration of any one never lasts longer than a month or six weeks. Nevertheless, as you see, she has a large circle of admirers. All are called, and nearly all are chosen. That kind of thing costs a good deal, but, hang it, what can you expect? And where did she get this name of Samoris? From the only man perhaps that she ever loved, a Jewish banker from Berlin who goes by the name of Samuel Morris. Good. Thanks. Now that I know what kind of woman she is and have seen her, I'm off. What a shock this was to the mind of a young girl endowed with all the instincts of a virtuous woman. What despair overwhelmed that simple soul. What mental tortures quenched her unbounded gaiety, 
her delightful laughter, her exultant satisfaction with life. What a conflict took place in that youthful heart up to the moment when the last guest had left. Those were things that Joseph could not tell me. But, the same night, Yvette abruptly entered her mother's room just as the Countess was getting into bed, sent out the lady's maid, who was close to the door, and, standing erect and pale and with great staring eyes, she said, Mama, listen to what I heard a little while ago during the ball. And she repeated word for word the conversation just as I told it to you. The Countess was so stunned that she did not know what to say in reply at first. When she recovered her self-possession she denied everything and called God to witness that there was no truth in the story. The young girl went away, distracted but not convinced. And she began to watch her mother. I remember distinctly the strange alteration that then took place in her. She became grave and melancholy. She would fix on us her great earnest eyes as if she wanted to read what was at the bottom of our hearts. We did not know what to think of her and used to imagine that she was looking out for a husband. One evening she overheard her mother talking to her admirer and later saw them together, and her doubts were confirmed. She was heartbroken, and after telling her mother what she had seen, she said coldly, like a man of business laying down the terms of an agreement. Here is what I have determined to do, Mama, we will both go away to some little town. Or rather into the country. We will live there quietly as well as we can. Your jewelry alone may be called a fortune. If you wish to marry some honest man, so much the better, still better will it be if I can find one. If you don't consent to do this, I will kill myself. This time the Countess ordered her daughter to go to bed and never to speak again in this manner, so unbecoming in the mouth of a child toward her mother. Yvette's answer to this was, I give you a month to reflect. If, at the end of that month, we have not changed our way of living, I will kill myself, since there is no other honorable issue left to my life. And she left the room. At the end of a month the Countess Samoris had resumed her usual entertainments, as though nothing had occurred. One day, under the pretext that she had a bad toothache, Yvette purchased a few drops of chloroform from a neighboring chemist. The next day she purchased more and every time she went out she managed to procure small doses of the narcotic. She filled a bottle with it. One morning she was found in bed, lifeless and already quite cold, with a cotton mask soaked in chloroform over her face. Her coffin was covered with flowers, the church was hung in white. There was a large crowd at the funeral ceremony. Ah! Well, if I had known, but you never can know, I would have married that girl for she was infernally pretty. And what became of the mother? Oh! She shed a lot of tears over it. She has only begun to receive visits again for the past week. And what explanation is given of the girl's death? Oh! They pretended that it was an accident caused by a new stove, the mechanism of which got out of order. As a good many such accidents have occurred, the thing seemed probable enough. A vendetta. The widow of Paolo Severini lived alone with her son in a poor little house on the outskirts of Bonifacio. The town, built on an outjutting part of the mountain, in places even overhanging the sea, looks across the straits, full of sandbanks, towards the southernmost coast of Sardinia. Beneath it, on the other side and almost surrounding it, is a cleft in the cliff like an immense corridor which serves as a harbor and along it the little Italian and Sardinian fishing boats come by a circuitous route between precipitous cliffs as far as the first houses, and every two weeks the old, wheezy steamer which makes the trip to Ayacho. On the white mountain the houses, massed together, makes an even wider spot. They look like the nests of wild birds, clinging to this peak, overlooking this terrible passage, where vessels rarely venture. The wind, which blows uninterruptedly, has swept bare the forbidding coast, it drives through the narrow straits and lays waste both sides. The pale streaks of foam, clinging to the black rocks, whose countless peaks rise up out of the water, look like bits of rag floating and drifting on the surface of the sea. The house of Widow Saverini, clinging to the very edge of the precipice, looks out, through its three windows, over this wild and desolate picture. She lived there alone, 
with her son Antonia and their dog Semilanti, a big, thin beast, with a long rough coat, of the sheepdog breed. The young man took her with him when out hunting. One night, after some kind of a quarrel, Antoine Saverini was treacherously stabbed by Nicolas Ravalotti, who escaped the same evening to Sardinia. When the old mother received the body of her child, which the neighbors had brought back to her, she did not cry, but she stayed there for a long time motionless, watching him. Then, stretching her wrinkled hand over the body, she promised him a vendetta. She did not wish anybody near her, and she shut herself up beside the body with the dog, which howled continuously, standing at the foot of the bed, her head stretched towards her master and her tail between her legs. She did not move any more than did the mother, who, now leaning over the body with a blank stare, was weeping silently and watching it. The young man, lying on his back, dressed in his jacket of coarse cloth, torn at the chest, seemed to be asleep. But he had blood all over him, on his shirt, which had been torn off in order to administer the first aid, on his vest, on his trousers, on his face, on his hands. Clots of blood had hardened in his beard and in his hair. His old mother began to talk to him. At the sound of this voice the dog quieted down. Never fear, my boy, my little baby, you shall be avenged. Sleep, sleep, you shall be avenged. Do you hear? It's your mother's promise. And she always keeps her word, your mother does, you know she does. Slowly she leaned over him, pressing her cold lips to his dead ones. Then Semilanti began to howl again with a long, monotonous, penetrating, horrible howl. The two of them, the woman and the dog, remained there until morning. Antoine Saverini was buried the next day, and soon his name ceased to be mentioned in Bonifacio. He had neither brothers nor cousins. No man was there to carry on the vendetta. His mother, the old woman, alone pondered over it. On the other side of the straits she saw, from morning until night, a little white speck on the coast. It was the little Sardinian village Longosardo, where Corsican criminals take refuge when they are too closely pursued. They compose almost the entire population of this hamlet, opposite their native island, awaiting the time to return, to go back to the Maquis. She knew that Nicholas Ravalotti had sought refuge in this village. All alone, all day long, seated at her window, she was looking over there and thinking of revenge. How could she do anything without help he she, an invalid and so near death? But she had promised, she had sworn on the body. She could not forget, she could not wait. What could she do? She no longer slept at night, she had neither rest nor peace of mind, she thought persistently. The dog, dozing at her feet, would sometimes lift her head and howl. Since her master's death she often howled thus, as though she were calling him, as though her beast's soul, inconsolable too, had also retained a recollection that nothing could wipe out. One night, as Semilanti began to howl, the mother suddenly got hold of an idea, a savage, vindictive, fierce idea. She thought it over until morning. Then, having arisen at daybreak she went to church. She prayed, prostrate on the floor, begging the Lord to help her, to support her, to give to her poor, broken-down body the strength which she needed in order to avenge her son. She returned home. In her yard she had an old barrel, which acted as a cistern. She turned it over, emptied it, made it fast to the ground with sticks and stones. Then she chained Semilanti to this improvised kennel and went into the house. She walked ceaselessly now, her eyes always fixed on the distant coast of Sardinia. He was over there, the murderer. All day and all night the dog howled. In the morning the old woman brought her some water in a bowl, but nothing more. No soup, no bread. Another day went by. Semilanti, exhausted, was sleeping. The following day her eyes were shining, her hair on end and she was pulling wildly at her chain. All this day the old woman gave her nothing to eat. The beast, furious, was barking hoarsely. Another night went by. Then, at daybreak, Mother Saverini asked a neighbor for some straw. She took the old rags which had formerly been worn by her husband and stuffed them so as to make them look like a human body. Having planted a stick in the ground, in front of Semilanti's kennel, 
she tied to it this dummy, which seemed to be standing up. Then she made a head out of some old rags. The dog, surprised, was watching this straw man, and was quiet, although famished. Then the old woman went to the store and bought a piece of black sausage. When she got home she started a fire in the yard, near the kennel, and cooked the sausage. Semilanti, frantic, was jumping about, frothing at the mouth, her eyes fixed on the food, the odor of which went right to her stomach. Then the mother made of the smoking sausage a necktie for the dummy. She tied it very tight around the neck with string, and when she had finished she untied the dog. With one leap the beast jumped at the dummy's throat, and with her paws on its shoulders she began to tear at it. She would fall back with a piece of food in her mouth, then would jump again, sinking her fangs into the string, and snatching few pieces of meat she would fall back again and once more spring forward. She was tearing up the face with her teeth and the whole neck was in tatters. The old woman, motionless and silent, was watching eagerly. Then she chained the beast up again, made her fast for two more days and began this strange performance again. For three months she accustomed her to this battle, to this meal conquered by a fight. She no longer chained her up, but just pointed to the dummy. She had taught her to tear him up and to devour him without even leaving any traces in her throat. Then, as a reward, she would give her a piece of sausage. As soon as she saw the man, Semilanti would begin to tremble. Then she would look up to her mistress, who, lifting her finger, would cry, Go, in a shrill tone. When she thought that the proper time had come, the widow went to confession and, one Sunday morning she partook of communion with an ecstatic fervor. Then, putting on men's clothes and looking like an old tramp, she struck a bargain with a Sardinian fisherman who carried her and her dog to the other side of the straits. In a bag she had a large piece of sausage. Semilanti had had nothing to eat for two days. The old woman kept letting her smell the food and wetting her appetite. They got to Longosardo. The Corsican woman walked with a limp. She went to a baker's shop and asked for Nicholas Ravalotti. He had taken up his old trade, that of carpenter. He was working alone at the back of his store. The old woman opened the door and called. Hello, Nicholas. He turned around. Then releasing her dog, she cried. Go, go. Eat him up. Eat him up. The maddened animal sprang for his throat. The man stretched out his arms, clasped the dog and rolled to the ground. For a few seconds he squirmed, beating the ground with his feet. Then he stopped moving, while Semilanti dug her fangs into his throat and tore it to ribbons. Two neighbors, seated before their door, remembered perfectly having seen an old beggar come out with a thin, black dog which was eating something that its master was giving him. At nightfall the old woman was at home again. She slept well that night. My twenty-five days. I had just taken possession of my room in the hotel, a narrow den between two papered partitions, through which I could hear every sound made by my neighbors and I was beginning to arrange my clothes and linen in the wardrobe with a long mirror, when I opened the drawer which is in this piece of furniture. I immediately noticed a roll of paper. Having opened it, I spread it out before me, and read this title. My Twenty-Five Days. It was the diary of a guest at the watering place, of the last occupant of my room, and had been forgotten at the moment of departure. These notes may be of some interest to sensible and healthy persons who never leave their own homes. It is for their benefit that I transcribe them without altering a letter. Chetel Giyon, July 15th At the first glance it is not lively, this country. However, I am going to spend twenty-five days here, to have my liver and stomach treated, and to get thin. The twenty-five days of any one taking the baths are very like the twenty-eight days of the reserves, they are all devoted to fatigue duty, severe fatigue duty. Today I have done nothing as yet, I have been getting settled. I have made the acquaintance of the locality and of the doctor. Chatel Guyon consists of a stream in which flows yellow water, in the midst of several hillocks on which are a casino, some houses, and some stone crosses. On the bank of the stream, at the end of the valley, may be seen a square building surrounded by a little garden, this is the bathing establishment. 
sad people wander around this building, the invalids. A great silence reigns in the walks shaded by trees, for this is not a pleasure resort, but a true health resort, one takes care of one's health as a business, and one gets well, so it seems. Those who know affirm, even, that the mineral springs perform true miracles here. However, no vote of offering is hung around the cashier's office. From time to time a gentleman or a lady comes over to a kiosk with a slate roof, which shelters a woman of smiling and gentle aspect. And a spring boiling in a basin of cement, not a word is exchanged between the invalid and the female custodian of the healing water. She hands the newcomer a little glass in which air bubbles sparkle in the transparent liquid. The guest drinks and goes off with a grave step to resume his interrupted walk beneath the trees. No noise in the little park, no breath of air in the leaves, no voice passes through this silence. One ought to ride at the entrance to this district, no one laughs here, they take care of their health. The people who chat resemble mutes who merely open their mouths to simulate sounds, so afraid are they that their voices might escape. In the hotel, the same silence. It is a big hotel, where you dine solemnly with people of good position, who have nothing to say to each other. Their manners bespeak good breeding, and their faces reflect the conviction of a superiority of which it might be difficult for some to give actual proofs. At two o'clock I made my way up to the casino, a little wooden hut perched on a hillock, which one reaches by a goat path. But the view from that height is admirable. Chatel Guyon is situated in a very narrow valley, exactly between the plain and the mountain. I perceive, at the left, the first great billows of the mountains of Auvergne, covered with woods, and here in their big grey patches, hard masses of lava, for we are at the foot of the extinct volcanoes. At the right, through the narrow cut of the valley, I discover a plain, infinite as the sea, steeped in a bluish fog which lets one only dimly discern the villages, the towns, the yellow fields of ripe grain, and the green squares of meadowland shaded with apple trees. It is the Lamagna, an immense level, always enveloped in a light veil of vapor. The night has come. And now, after having dined alone, I write these lines beside my open window. I hear, over there, in front of me, the little orchestra of the casino, which plays airs just as a foolish bird might sing all alone in the desert. A dog barks at intervals. This great calm does one good. Good night. July 16th. Dot, nothing new. I have taken a bath and then a shower bath. I have swallowed three glasses of water, and I have walked along the paths in the park, a quarter of an hour between each glass, then half an hour after the last. I have begun my twenty-five days. July 17th, remarked two mysterious, pretty women who are taking their baths and their meals after everyone else has finished. July 18th thought, nothing new. July 19th, saw the two pretty women again. They have style and a little indescribable air which I like very much. July 20th, long walk in a charming wooded valley, as far as the hermitage of Sans Souci. This country is delightful, although sad, but so calm, so sweet, so green. One meets along the mountain roads long wagons loaded with hay, drawn by two cows at a slow pace or held back by them in going down the slopes with a great effort of their heads, which are yoked together. A man with a big black hat on his head is driving them with a slender stick, tipping them on the side or on the forehead. And often with a simple gesture, an energetic and serious gesture, he suddenly halts them when the excessive load precipitates their journey down the two rugged descents. The air is good to inhale in these valleys. And, if it is very warm, the dust bears with it a light odor of vanilla and of the stable, for so many cows pass over these roots that they leave reminders everywhere. And this odor is a perfume, when it would be a stench if it came from other animals. July 21st, Excursion to the Valley of the Envil. It is a narrow gorge enclosed by superb rocks at the very foot of the mountain. A stream flows amid the heaped-up boulders. As I reached the bottom of this ravine I heard women's voices, and I soon perceived the two mysterious ladies of my hotel, who were chatting, seated on a stone. The occasion appeared to me a good one, and I introduced myself without hesitation. My overtures were received without embarrassment. 
We walked back together to the hotel. And we talked about Paris. They knew, it seemed, many people whom I knew, too. Who can they be? I shall see them tomorrow. There is nothing more amusing than such meetings as this. July 22 D. Day passed almost entirely with the two unknown ladies. They are very pretty, by Jove, one a brunette and the other a blonde. They say they are widows. Hem? I offered to accompany them to Royette tomorrow, and they accepted my offer. Chatel Guyon is less sad than I thought on my arrival. July 23D. Day spent at Royette. Royette is a little patch of hotels at the bottom of a valley, at the gate of Clermont Ferrand. A great many people there. A large park full of life. Superb view of the Poide Dome, seen at the end of a perspective of valleys. My fair companions are very popular, which is flattering to me. The man who escorts a pretty woman always believes himself crowned with an aureole, with much more reason, the man who is accompanied by one on each side of him. Nothing is so pleasant as to dine in a fashionable restaurant with a female companion at whom everybody stares, and there is nothing better calculated to exalt a man in the estimation of his neighbors. To go to the Bois, in a trap drawn by a sorry nag, or to go out into the boulevard escorted by a plain woman, are the two most humiliating things that could happen to a sensitive heart that values the opinion of others. Of all luxuries, woman is the rarest and the most distinguished, she is the one that costs most and which we desire most, she is, therefore the one that we should seek by preference to exhibit to the jealous eyes of the world. To exhibit to the world a pretty woman leaning on your arm is to excite, all at once, every kind of jealousy. It is as much as to say, look here. I am rich, since I possess this rare and costly object. I have taste, since I have known how to discover this pearl, perhaps, even, I am loved by her, unless I am deceived by her, which would still prove that others also consider her charming. But, what a disgrace it is to walk about town with an ugly woman! And how many humiliating things this gives people to understand! In the first place, they assume she must be your wife, for how could it be supposed that you would have an unattractive sweetheart? A true woman may be ungraceful, but then, her ugliness implies a thousand disagreeable things for you. One supposes you must be a notary or a magistrate, as these two professions have a monopoly of grotesque and well-dowered spouses. Now, is this not distressing to a man? And then, it seems to proclaim to the public that you have the odious courage, and are even under a legal obligation, to caress that ridiculous face and that ill-shaped body, and that you will, without doubt, be shameless enough to make a mother of this by no means desirable being, which is the very height of the ridiculous. July 24. I never leave the side of the two unknown widows, whom I am beginning to know quite well. This country is delightful and our hotel is excellent. Good season. The treatment is doing me an immense amount of good. July 25. Drive in a landau to the Lake of Tazanat. An exquisite and unexpected jaunt decided on at luncheon. We started immediately on rising from table. After a long journey through the mountains we suddenly perceived an admirable little lake, quite round, very blue, clear as glass, and situated at the bottom of an extinct crater. One side of this immense basin is barren, the other is wooded. In the midst of the trees is a small house where sleeps a good-natured, intellectual man, a sage who passes his days in this Virgilian region. He opens his dwelling for us. An idea comes into my head. I exclaim. Supposing we bathe? Yes, they said, but costumes. Bah! We are in the wilderness. And we did bathe. If I were a poet, how I would describe this unforgettable vision of those lissom young forms in the transparency of the water. The high, sloping sides shut in the lake, motionless, gleaming and round, as a silver coin, the sun pours into it a flood of warm light, and along the rocks the fair forms move in the almost invisible water in which the swimmers seemed suspended. On the sand at the bottom of the lake one could see their shadows as they moved along. July 26. Some persons seemed to look with shocked and disapproving eyes at my rapid intimacy with the two fair widows. There are some people, then, 
who imagine that life consists in being bored. Everything that appears to be amusing becomes immediately a breach of good breeding or morality. For them duty has inflexible and mortally tedious rules. I would draw their attention, with all respect, to the fact that duty is not the same for Mormons, Arab Zulus, Turks, Englishmen, and Frenchmen, and that there are very virtuous people among all these nations. I will cite a single example. As regards women, duty begins in England at nine years of age, in France at fifteen. As for me, I take a little of each people's notion of duty, and of the whole I make a result comparable to the morality of good King Solomon. July 27, Good News I have lost 620 grams in weight. Excellent, this water of Chatel Guyon. I am taking the widows to dine at Ryham. A sad town whose anagram constitutes it an objectionable neighbor to Healing Springs, Ryham, Maury. July 28th, hello, how's this? My two widows have been visited by two gentlemen who came to look for them. Two widowers, without doubt. They are leaving this evening. They have written to me on fancy notepaper. July 29th, uh, alone. Long excursion on foot to the extinct crater of Natra. Splendid view. July 30th. Dot, nothing. I am taking the treatment. July 31st. Ditto. Ditto. This pretty country is full of polluted streams. I am drawing the notice of the municipality to the abominable sewer which poisons the road in front of the hotel. All the kitchen refuse of the establishment is thrown into it. This is a good way to breed cholera. August 1st. Dot, nothing. The treatment. August 2. D. Uh, admirable walk to Chateau Neuf, a place of sojourn for rheumatic patients, where everybody is lame. Nothing can be queerer than this population of cripples. August 3. D. Dot, nothing. The treatment. August 4. Dot, ditto. Ditto. August 5. Dot, ditto. Ditto. August 6. Dot, despair. I have just weighed myself. I have gained 310 grams. But then? August 7. Drove 66 kilometers in a carriage on the mountain. I will not mention the name of the country through respect for its women. This excursion had been pointed out to me as a beautiful one, and one that was rarely made. After four hours on the road, I arrived at a rather pretty village on the banks of a river in the midst of an admirable wood of walnut trees. I had not yet seen a forest of walnut trees of such dimensions in Auvergne. It constitutes, moreover, all the wealth of the district, for it is planted on the village common. This common was formerly only a hillside covered with brushwood. The authorities had tried in vain to get it cultivated. There was scarcely enough pasture on it to feed a few sheep. Today it is a superb wood, thanks to the women, and it has a curious name, it is called the Sins of the Cure. Now I must say that the women of the mountain districts have the reputation of being light, lighter than in the plain. A bachelor who meets them owes them at least a kiss, and if he does not take more he is only a blockhead. If we consider this fairly, this way of looking at the matter is the only one that is logical and reasonable. As woman, whether she be of the town or the country, has her natural mission to please man, man should always show her that she pleases him. If he abstains from every sort of demonstration, this means that he considers her ugly. It is almost an insult to her. If I were a woman, I would not receive, a second time, a man who failed to show me respect at our first meeting, for I would consider that he had failed in appreciation of my beauty, my charm, and my feminine qualities. So the bachelors of the village X often proved to the women of the district that they found them to their taste, and, as the cure was unable to prevent these demonstrations, as gallant as they were natural. He resolved to utilize them for the benefit of the general prosperity. So he imposed as a penance on every woman who had gone wrong that she should plant a walnut tree on the common. And every night lanterns were seen moving about like will-o'-the-wisps on the hillock, for the erring ones scarcely liked to perform their penance in broad daylight. In two years there was no longer any room on the lands belonging to the village, 
and today, they calculate that there are more than 3,000 trees around the belfry which rings out the services amid their foliage. These are the sins of the cure. Since we have been seeking for so many ways of rewooding France, the administration of forests might surely enter into some arrangement with the clergy to employ a method so simple as that employed by this humble cure. August 7. Dot, treatment August 8. I am packing up my trunks and saying goodbye to the charming little district so calm and silent, to the green mountain, to the quiet valleys, to the deserted casino, from which you can see, almost veiled by its light, bluish mist. The immense plain of the Lamagna. I shall leave tomorrow. Here the manuscript stopped. I will add nothing to it, my impressions of the country not having been exactly the same as those of my predecessor. For I did not find the two widows. The terror. You say you cannot possibly understand it, and I believe you. You think I am losing my mind? Perhaps I am, but for other reasons than those you imagine, my dear friend. Yes, I am going to be married, and will tell you what has led me to take that step. I may add that I know very little of the girl who is going to become my wife tomorrow, I have only seen her four or five times. I know that there is nothing unpleasing about her, and that is enough for my purpose. She is small, fair, and stout, so, of course, the day after tomorrow I shall ardently wish for a tall, dark, thin woman. She is not rich, and belongs to the middle classes. She is a girl such as you may find by the gross, well adapted for matrimony, without any apparent faults, and with no particularly striking qualities. People say of her. Lee. Lajal is a very nice girl, and tomorrow they will say, what a very nice woman Madame Raymond is. She belongs, in a word, to that immense number of girls whom one is glad to have for one's wife, till the moment comes when one discovers that one happens to prefer all other women to that particular woman whom one has married. Well, you will say to me, what on earth did you get married for? I hardly like to tell you the strange and seemingly improbable reason that urged me on to this senseless act. The fact, however, is that I am afraid of being alone. I don't know how to tell you or to make you understand me, but my state of mind is so wretched that you will pity me and despise me. I do not want to be alone any longer at night. I want to feel that there is someone close to me, touching me, a being who can speak and say something, no matter what it be. I wish to be able to awaken somebody by my side, so that I may be able to ask some sudden question, a stupid question even, if I feel inclined, so that I may hear a human voice, and feel that there is some waking soul close to me. Someone whose reason is at work. So that when I hastily light the candle I may see some human face by my side, because, because, I am ashamed to confess it, because I am afraid of being alone. Oh, you don't understand me yet. I am not afraid of any danger. If a man were to come into the room, I should kill him without trembling. I am not afraid of ghosts, nor do I believe in the supernatural. I am not afraid of dead people, for I believe in the total annihilation of every being that disappears from the face of this earth. Well, yes, well, it must be told, I am afraid of myself, afraid of that horrible sensation of incomprehensible fear. You may laugh, if you like. It is terrible, and I cannot get over it. I am afraid of the walls, of the furniture, of the familiar objects, which are animated, as far as I am concerned, by a kind of animal life. Above all, I am afraid of my own dreadful thoughts, of my reason, which seems as if it were about to leave me, driven away by a mysterious and invisible agony. At first I feel a vague uneasiness in my mind, which causes a cold shiver to run all over me. I look round, and of course nothing is to be seen and I wish that there were something there, no matter what, as long as it were something tangible. I am frightened merely because I cannot understand my own terror. If I speak, I am afraid of my own voice. If I walk, I am afraid of I know not what, behind the door, behind the curtains, in the cupboard, or under my bed, and yet all the time I know there is nothing anywhere, and I turn round suddenly because I am afraid of what is behind me. Although there is nothing there, and I know it. I become agitated. I feel that my fear increases, and so I shut myself up in my own room, get into bed, and hide under the clothes. 
and there, cowering down, rolled into a ball, I close my eyes in despair, and remain thus for an indefinite time, remembering that my candle is a light on the table by my bedside, and that I ought to put it out, and yet, I dare not do it. It is very terrible, is it not, to be like that? Formerly, I felt nothing of all that. I came home quite calm, and went up and down my apartment without anything disturbing my peace of mind. Had any one told me that I should be attacked by a malady, for I can call it nothing else, of most improbable fear, such a stupid and terrible malady as it is, I should have laughed outright. I was certainly never afraid of opening the door in the dark. I went to bed slowly, without locking it, and never got up in the middle of the night to make sure that everything was firmly closed. It began last year in a very strange manner on a damp autumn evening. When my servant had left the room, after I had dined, I asked myself what I was going to do. I walked up and down my room for some time, feeling tired without any reason for it, unable to work, and even without energy to read. A fine rain was falling, and I felt unhappy, a prey to one of those fits of despondency, without any apparent cause, which make us feel inclined to cry, or to talk, no matter to whom, so as to shake off our depressing thoughts. I felt that I was alone, and my rooms seemed to me to be more empty than they had ever been before. I was in the midst of infinite and overwhelming solitude. What was I to do? I sat down, but a kind of nervous impatience seemed to affect my legs, so I got up and began to walk about again. I was, perhaps, rather feverish, for my hands, which I had clasped behind me, as one often does when walking slowly, almost seemed to burn one another. Then suddenly a cold shiver ran down my back, and I thought the damp air might have penetrated into my rooms, so I lit the fire for the first time that year, and sat down again and looked at the flames. But soon I felt that I could not possibly remain quiet, and so I got up again and determined to go out, to pull myself together, and to find a friend to bear me company. I could not find anyone, so I walked to the boulevard to try and meet some acquaintance or other there. It was wretched everywhere, and the wet pavement glistened in the gaslight, while the oppressive warmth of the almost impalpable rain lay heavily over the streets and seemed to obscure the light of the lamps. I went on slowly, saying to myself, I shall not find a soul to talk to. I glanced into several cafés, from the Madeleine as far as the Faubourg Poissonnière, and saw many unhappy-looking individuals sitting at the tables who did not seem even to have enough energy left to finish the refreshments they had ordered. For a long time I wandered aimlessly up and down, and about midnight I started for home. I was very calm and very tired. My janitor opened the door at once, which was quite unusual for him, and I thought that another lodger had probably just come in. When I go out I always double-lock the door of my room, and I found it merely closed, which surprised me. But I supposed that some letters had been brought up for me in the course of the evening. I went in and found my fire still burning so that it lighted up the room a little, and, while in the act of taking up a candle, I noticed somebody sitting in my armchair by the fire, warming his feet, with his back toward me. I was not in the slightest degree frightened. I thought, very naturally, that some friend or other had come to see me. No doubt the porter, to whom I had said I was going out, had lent him his own key. In a moment I remembered all the circumstances of my return, how the street door had been opened immediately, and that my own door was only latched and not locked. I could see nothing of my friend but his head, and he had evidently gone to sleep while waiting for me, so I went up to him to rouse him. I saw him quite distinctly, his right arm was hanging down and his legs were crossed. The position of his head, which was somewhat inclined to the left of the armchair, seemed to indicate that he was asleep. Who can it be? I asked myself. I could not see clearly, as the room was rather dark, so I put out my hand to touch him on the shoulder, and it came in contact with the back of the chair. There was nobody there, the seat was empty. I fairly jumped with fright. For a moment I drew back as if confronted by some terrible danger, then I turned round again, impelled by an imperious standing upright, panting with fear, so upset that I could not collect my thoughts, and ready to faint but I am a cool man, and soon recovered myself. I thought, 
it is a mere hallucination, that is all, and I immediately began to reflect on this phenomenon. Thoughts fly quickly at such moments. I had been suffering from an hallucination that was an incontestable fact. My mind had been perfectly lucid and had acted regularly and logically, so there was nothing the matter with the brain. It was only my eyes that had been deceived. They had had a vision, one of those visions which lead simple folk to believe in miracles. It was a nervous seizure of the optical apparatus, nothing more, the eyes were rather congested, perhaps. I lit my candle, and when I stooped down to the fire in doing so I noticed that I was trembling, and I raised myself up with a jump, as if somebody had touched me from behind. I was certainly not by any means calm. I walked up and down a little, and hummed a tune or two. Then I double-locked the door and felt rather reassured, now, at any rate, nobody could come in. I sat down again and thought over my adventure for a long time. Then I went to bed and blew out my light. For some minutes all went well, I lay quietly on my back, but presently an irresistible desire seized me to look round the room, and I turned over on my side. My fire was nearly out, and the few glowing embers threw a faint light on the floor by the chair, where I fancied I saw the man sitting again. I quickly struck a match, but I had been mistaken, there was nothing there. I got up, however, and hid the chair behind my bed, and tried to get to sleep, as the room was now dark. But I had not forgotten myself for more than five minutes, when in my dream I saw all the scene which I had previously witnessed as clearly as if it were reality. I woke up with a start, and having lit the candle, sat up in bed, without venturing even to try to go to sleep again. Twice, however, sleep overcame me for a few moments in spite of myself, and twice I saw the same thing again, till I fancied I was going mad. When day broke, however, I thought that I was cured, and slept peacefully till noon. It was all past and over. I had been feverish, had had the nightmare. I know not what. I had been ill, in fact, but yet thought I was a great fool. I enjoyed myself thoroughly that evening. I dined at a restaurant and afterward went to the theater, and then started for home. But as I got near the house I was once more seized by a strange feeling of uneasiness. I was afraid of seeing him again. I was not afraid of him, not afraid of his presence, in which I did not believe, but I was afraid of being deceived again. I was afraid of some fresh hallucination, afraid lest fear should take possession of me. For more than an hour I wandered up and down the pavement. Then, feeling that I was really too foolish, I returned home. I breathed so hard that I could hardly get upstairs, and remained standing outside my door for more than ten minutes. Then suddenly I had a courageous impulse and my will asserted itself. I inserted my key into the lock, and went into the apartment with a candle in my hand. I kicked open my bedroom door, which was partly open, and cast a frightened glance toward the fireplace. There was nothing there. A. H. What a relief and what a delight! What a deliverance! I walked up and down briskly and boldly, but I was not altogether reassured, and kept turning round with a jump, the very shadows in the corners disquieted me. I slept badly, and was constantly disturbed by imaginary noises, but did not see him. No, that was all over. Since that time I have been afraid of being alone at night. I feel that the specter is there, close to me, around me, but it has not appeared to me again. And supposing it did, what would it matter, since I do not believe in it and know that it is nothing? However, it still worries me, because I am constantly thinking of it. His right arm hanging down and his head inclined to the left like a man who was asleep, I don't want to think about it. Why, however, am I so persistently possessed with this idea? His feet were close to the fire. He haunts me. It is very stupid, but who and what is he? I know that he does not exist except in my cowardly imagination, in my fears, and in my agony. There, enough of that. Yes, it is all very well for me to reason with myself, to stiffen my backbone, so to say. But I cannot remain at home because I know he is there. I know I shall not see him again, he will not show himself again, that is all over. But he is there, all the same, in my thoughts. 
He remains invisible, but that does not prevent his being there. He is behind the doors, in the closed cupboard, in the wardrobe, under the bed, in every dark corner. If I open the door or the cupboard, if I take the candle to look under the bed and throw a light on the dark places he is there no longer, but I feel that he is behind me. I turn round, certain that I shall not see him, that I shall never see him again, but for all that, he is behind me. It is very stupid, it is dreadful, but what am I to do? I cannot help it. But if there were two of us in the place I feel certain that he would not be there any longer, for he is there just because I am alone, simply and solely because I am alone. Legend of Montste Michel I had first seen it from Cancale, this fairy castle in the sea. I got an indistinct impression of it as of a grey shadow outlined against the misty sky. I saw it again from a vranche at sunset. The immense stretch of sand was red, the horizon was red, the whole boundless bay was red. The rocky castle rising out there in the distance like a weird, seigneurial residence, like a dream palace, strange and beautiful this alone remained black in the crimson light of the dying day. The following morning at dawn I went toward it across the sands, my eyes fastened on this gigantic jewel, as big as a mountain, cut like a cameo, and as dainty as lace. The nearer I approached the greater my admiration grew, for nothing in the world could be more wonderful or more perfect. As surprised as if I had discovered the habitation of a god, I wandered through those halls supported by frail or massive columns, raising my eyes in wonder to those spires which looked like rockets starting for the sky. And to that marvelous assemblage of towers, of gargoyles, of slender and charming ornaments, a regular fireworks of stone, granite lace, a masterpiece of colossal and delicate architecture. As I was looking up in ecstasy a lower Normandy peasant came up to me and told me the story of the great quarrel between St. Michael and the devil. A skeptical genius has said, God made man in his image and man has returned the compliment. This saying is an eternal truth, and it would be very curious to write the history of the local divinity of every continent as well as the history of the patron saints in each one of our provinces. The Negro has his ferocious man-eating idols. The polygamous Mahometan fills his paradise with women, the Greeks, like a practical people, deified all the passions. Every village in France is under the influence of some protecting saint, modeled according to the characteristics of the inhabitants. Saint Michael watches over Lower Normandy, Saint Michael, the radiant and victorious angel, the sword carrier, the hero of heaven, the victorious, the conqueror of Satan. But this is how the Lower Normandy peasant, cunning, deceitful and tricky, understands and tells of the struggle between the great saint and the devil. To escape from the malice of his neighbor, the devil, Saint Michael built himself, in the open ocean, this habitation worthy of an archangel, and only such a saint could build a residence of such magnificence. But as he still feared the approaches of the wicked one, he surrounded his domains by quicksands, more treacherous even than the sea. The devil lived in a humble cottage on the hill, but he owned all the salt marshes, the rich lands where grow the finest crops, the wooded valleys and all the fertile hills of the country, while the saint ruled only over the sands. Therefore Satan was rich, whereas Saint Michael was as poor as a church mouse. After a few years of fasting the saint grew tired of this state of affairs and began to think of some compromise with the devil, but the matter was by no means easy, as Satan kept a good hold on his crops. He thought the thing over for about six months, then one morning he walked across to the shore. The demon was eating his soup in front of his door when he saw the saint. He immediately rushed toward him, kissed the hem of his sleeve, invited him in and offered him refreshments. Saint Michael drank a bowl of milk and then began, I have come here to propose to you a good bargain. The devil, candid and trustful, answered, That will suit me. Here it is. Give me all your lands. Satan, growing alarmed, wished to speak but. The saint continued, Listen first. Give me all your lands. I will take care of all the work, the plowing, the sowing, the fertilizing, everything, and we will share the crops equally. How does that suit you? The devil, who was naturally lazy, accepted. He only demanded, in addition, a few of those delicious gray mullet, which are caught around the solitary mount. St. Michael promised the fish. 
They grasped hands and spat on the ground to show that it was a bargain, and the saint continued, See here, so that you will have nothing to complain of. Choose that part of the crops which you prefer, the part that grows above ground or the part that stays in the ground. Satan cried out, I will take all that will be above ground. It's a bargain, said the saint. And he went away. Six months later, all over the immense domain of the devil, one could see nothing but carrots, turnips, onions, salsify, all the plants whose juicy roots are good and savory and whose useless leaves are good for nothing but for feeding animals. Satan wished to break the contract, calling St. Michael a swindler. But the saint, who had developed quite a taste for agriculture, went back to see the devil and said, Really, I hadn't thought of that at all. It was just an accident, no fault of mine. And to make things fair with you, this year I'll let you take everything that is under the ground. Very well, answered Satan. The following spring all the evil spirits' lands were covered with golden wheat, oats as big as beans, flax, magnificent calza, red clover, peas, cabbage, artichokes, everything that develops into grains or fruit in the sunlight. Once more Satan received nothing, and this time he completely lost his temper. He took back his fields and remained deaf to all the fresh propositions of his neighbor. A whole year rolled by. From the top of his lonely manor St. Michael looked at the distant and fertile lands and watched the devil direct the work, take in his crops and thresh the wheat. And he grew angry, exasperated at his powerlessness. As he was no longer able to deceive Satan, he decided to wreak vengeance on him, and he went out to invite him to dinner for the following Monday. You have been very unfortunate in your dealings with me, he said. I know it, but I don't want any ill feeling between us, and I expect you to dine with me. I'll give you some good things to eat. Satan, who was as greedy as he was lazy, accepted eagerly. On the day appointed he donned his finest clothes and set out for the castle. St. Michael sat him down to a magnificent meal. First there was a vol event, full of cock's crests and kidneys, with meatballs, then two big gray mullet with cream sauce, a turkey stuffed with chestnuts soaked in wine, some salt marsh lamb as tender as cake. Vegetables which melted in the mouth and nice hot pancake which was brought on smoking and spreading a delicious odor of butter. They drank new, sweet, sparkling cider and heady red wine, and after each course they whetted their appetites with some old apple brandy. The devil drank and ate to his heart's content. In fact he took so much that he was very uncomfortable and began to retch. Then St. Michael arose in anger and cried in a voice like thunder, What? Before me, rascal. You dare, before me. Satan, terrified, ran away, and the saint, seizing a stick, pursued him. They ran through the halls, turning round the pillars, running up the staircases, galloping along the cornices, jumping from gargoyle to gargoyle. The poor devil, who was woefully ill, was running about madly and trying hard to escape. At last he found himself at the top of the last terrace, right at the top, from which could be seen the immense bay, with its distant towns, sands and pastures. He could no longer escape, and the saint came up behind him and gave him a furious kick, which shot him through space like a cannonball. He shot through the air like a javelin and fell heavily before the town of Mordine. His horns and claws stuck deep into the rock, which keeps through eternity the traces of this fall of Satan. He stood up again, limping, crippled until the end of time, and as he looked at this fatal castle in the distance, standing out against the setting sun, he understood well that he would always be vanquished in this unequal struggle. And he went away limping, heading for distant countries, leaving to his enemy his fields, his hills, his valleys, and his marshes. And this is how St. Michael, the patron saint of Normandy, vanquished the devil. Another people would have dreamed of this battle in an entirely different manner. A New Year's Gift Jacques de Randall, having dined at home alone, told his valet he might go out, and he sat down at his table to write some letters. He ended every year in this manner, writing and dreaming. He reviewed the events of his life since last New Year's Day, things that were now all over and dead. And, in proportion as the faces of his friends rose up before his eyes, he wrote them a few lines, a cordial New Year's greeting on the 1st of January. So he sat down, opened a drawer, 
took out of it a woman's photograph, gazed at it a few moments, and kissed it. Then, having laid it beside a sheet of notepaper, he began. My dear Irene, you must by this time have received the little souvenir I sent you addressed to the maid. I have shut myself up this evening in order to tell you. The pen here ceased to move. Jacques rose up and began walking up and down the room. For the last ten months he had had a sweetheart, not like the others, a woman with whom one engages in a passing intrigue of the theatrical world or the demimonde, but a woman whom he loved and won. He was no longer a young man, although he was still comparatively young for a man, and he looked on life seriously in a positive and practical spirit. Accordingly, he drew up the balance sheet of his passion, as he drew up every year the balance sheet of friendships that were ended or freshly contracted, of circumstances and persons that had entered into his life. His first ardor of love having grown calmer, he asked himself with the precision of a merchant making a calculation what was the state of his heart with regard to her, and he tried to form an idea of what it would be in the future. He found there a great and deep affection, made up of tenderness, gratitude and the thousand subtleties which give birth to long and powerful attachments. A ring at the bell made him start. He hesitated. Should he open the door? But he said to himself that one must always open the door on New Year's night, to admit the unknown who is passing by and knocks, no matter who it may be. So he took a wax candle, passed through the antechamber, drew back the bolts, turned the key, pulled the door back, and saw his sweetheart standing pale as a corpse, leaning against the wall. He stammered. What is the matter with you? She replied. Are you alone? Yes. Without servants? Yes. You are not going out? No. She entered with the air of a woman who knew the house. As soon as she was in the drawing room, she sank down on the sofa, and, covering her face with her hands, began to weep bitterly. He knelt down at her feet, and tried to remove her hands from her eyes, so that he might look at them, and exclaimed. Irene, Irene, what is the matter with you? I implore you to tell me what is the matter with you. Then, amid her sobs, she murmured. I can no longer live like this. Live like this? What do you mean? Yes. I can no longer live like this. I have endured so much. He struck me this afternoon. Who? Your husband? Yes, my husband. Ah. He was astonished, having never suspected that her husband could be brutal. He was a man of the world, of the better class, a clubman, a lover of horses, a theatergoer and an expert swordsman. He was known, talked about, appreciated everywhere, having very courteous manners, a very mediocre intellect, an absence of education and of the real culture needed in order to think like all well-bred people. And finally, a respect for conventionalities. He appeared to devote himself to his wife, as a man ought to do in the case of wealthy and well-bred people. He displayed enough of anxiety about her wishes, her health, her dresses, and, beyond that, left her perfectly free. Randall, having become Irene's friend, had a right to the affectionate handclasp which every husband endowed with good manners owes to his wife's intimate acquaintance. Then, when Jacques, after having been for some time the friend, became the lover, his relations with the husband were more cordial, as is fitting. Jacques had never dreamed that there were storms in this household, and he was bewildered at this unexpected revelation. He asked. How did it happen? Tell me. Thereupon she related a long story, the entire history of her life since the day of her marriage, the first disagreement arising out of a mere nothing, then becoming accentuated at every new difference of opinion between two dissimilar dispositions. Then came quarrels, a complete separation, not apparent, but real, next, her husband showed himself aggressive, suspicious, violent. Now, he was jealous, jealous of Jacques, and that very day, after a scene, he had struck her. She added with decision, I will not go back to him. Do with me what you like. Jacques sat down opposite to her, their knees touching. He took her hands. My dear love, you are going to commit a gross, an irreparable folly. If you want to leave your husband, 
put him in the wrong, so that your position as a woman of the world may be saved. She asked, as she looked at him uneasily. Then, what do you advise me? To go back home and to put up with your life there till the day when you can obtain either a separation or a divorce, with the honors of war. Is not this thing which you advise me to do a little cowardly? No, it is wise and sensible. You have a high position, a reputation to protect, friends to preserve and relations to deal with. You must not lose all these through a mere caprice. She rose up and said with violence. Well, no. I cannot stand it any longer. It is at an end. It is at an end. Then, placing her two hands on her lover's shoulders and looking him straight in the face, she asked, Do you love me? Yes. Really and truly? Yes. Then take care of me. He exclaimed, Take care of you? In my own house? Here? Why, you are mad. It would mean losing you forever, losing you beyond hope of recall. You are mad. She replied, slowly and seriously, like a woman who feels the weight of her words. Listen, Jacques. He has forbidden me to see you again, and I will not play this comedy of coming secretly to your house. You must either lose me or take me. My dear Irene, in that case, obtain your divorce, and I will marry you. Yes, you will marry me in two years at the soonest. Yours is a patient love. Look here. Reflect. If you remain here he'll come tomorrow to take you away, seeing that he is your husband, seeing that he has right and law on his side. I did not ask you to keep me in your own house, Jacques, but to take me anywhere you like. I thought you loved me enough to do that. I have made a mistake. Goodbye. She turned round and went toward the door so quickly that he was only able to catch hold of her when she was outside the room. Listen, Irene. She struggled and would not listen to him. Her eyes were full of tears and she stammered. Let me alone. Let me alone. Let me alone. He made her sit down by force, and once more falling on his knees at her feet, he now brought forward a number of arguments and counsels to make her understand the folly and terrible risk of her project. He omitted nothing which he deemed necessary to convince her, finding even in his very affection for her incentives to persuasion. As she remained silent and cold as ice, he begged of her, implored of her to listen to him, to trust him, to follow his advice. When he had finished speaking, she only replied, Are you disposed to let me go away now? Take away your hands, so that I may rise to my feet. Look here, Irene. Will you let me go? Irene, is your resolution irrevocable? Will you let me go? Tell me only whether this resolution, this mad resolution of yours, which you will bitterly regret, is irrevocable? Yes, let me go. Then stay. You know well that you are at home here. We shall go away tomorrow morning. She rose to her feet in spite of him, and said in a hard tone, No. It is too late. I do not want sacrifice, I do not want devotion. Stay. I have done what I ought to do, I have said what I ought to say. I have no further responsibility on your behalf. My conscience is at peace. Tell me what you want me to do, and I will obey. She resumed her seat, looked at him for a long time, and then asked, in a very calm voice. Well, then, explain. Explain what? What do you wish me to explain? Everything, everything that you thought about before changing your mind. Then I will see what I ought to do. But I thought about nothing at all. I had to warn you that you were going to commit an act of folly. You persist, then I ask to share in this act of folly and I even insist on it. It is not natural to change one's mind so quickly. Listen, my dear love. It is not a question here of sacrifice or devotion. On the day when I realized that I loved you, I said to myself what every lover ought to say to himself in the same case, the man who loves a woman, who makes an effort to win her, who gets her, and who takes her. Enters into a sacred contract with himself and with her. 
That is, uh, of course, in dealing with a woman like you, not a woman with a fickle heart and easily impressed. Marriage which has a great social value, a great legal value, possesses in my eyes only a very slight moral value, taking into account the conditions under which it generally takes place. Therefore, when a woman, united by this lawful bond, but having no attachment to her husband, whom she cannot love, a woman whose heart is free, meets a man whom she cares for, and gives herself to him, when a man who has no other tie takes a woman in this way, I say that they pledge themselves toward each other by this mutual and free agreement much more than by the yes uttered in the presence of the mayor. I say that, if they are both honorable persons, their union must be more intimate, more real, more wholesome, than if all the sacraments had consecrated it. This woman risks everything. And it is exactly because she knows it, because she gives everything, her heart, her body, her soul, her honor, her life, because she has foreseen all miseries, all dangers, all catastrophes, because she dares to do a bold act, an intrepid act. Because she is prepared, determined to brave everything, her husband, who might kill her, and society, which may cast her out. This is why she is worthy of respect in the midst of her conjugal infidelity, this is why her lover, in taking her, should also foresee everything, and prefer her to everyone else whatever may happen. I have nothing more to say. I spoke in the beginning like a sensible man whose duty it was to warn you, and now I am only a man, a man who loves you, command, and I obey. Radiant, she closed his mouth with a kiss, and said in a low tone, It is not true, darling. There is nothing the matter. My husband does not suspect anything. But I wanted to see, I wanted to know, what you would do. I wished for a New Year's gift, the gift of your heart, another gift besides the necklace you sent me. You have given it to me. Thanks. Thanks. God be thanked for the happiness you have given me. Friend Patience. What became of Laramie? He is captain in the 6th Dragoons. And Pinson? He's a sub-prefect. And Racolet? Dead. We were searching for other names which would remind us of the youthful faces of our younger days. Once in a while we had met some of these old comrades, bearded, bald, married, fathers of several children, and the realization of these changes had given us an unpleasant shudder, reminding us how short life is, how everything passes away. How everything changes. My friend asked me. And patience, fat patience? I almost, howled. Oh. As for him, just listen to this. Four or five years ago I was in Limoges, on a tour of inspection, and I was waiting for dinner time. I was seated before the big café in the Place du Theatre, just bored to death. The tradespeople were coming by twos, threes or fours, to take their absinthe or vermouth, talking all the time of their own or other people's business, laughing loudly or lowering their voices in order to impart some important or delicate piece of news. I was saying to myself, what shall I do after dinner? And I thought of the long evening in this provincial town, of the slow, dreary walk through unknown streets, of the impression of deadly gloom which these provincial people produce on the lonely traveler, and of the whole oppressive atmosphere of the place. I was thinking of all these things as I watched the little jets of gas flare up, feeling my loneliness increase with the falling shadows. A big, fat man sat down at the next table and called in a stentorian voice. Waiter, my bitters. The mic came out like the report of a cannon. I immediately understood that everything was his in life, and not another's. That he had his nature, by Jove, his appetite, his trousers, his everything, his, more absolutely and more completely than anyone else's. Then he looked round him with a satisfied air. His bitters were brought, and he ordered. My newspaper. I wondered, which newspaper can his be? The title would certainly reveal to me his opinions, his theories, his principles, his hobbies, his weaknesses. The waiter brought the temps. I was surprised. Why the temps, a serious, somber, doctrinaire, impartial sheet? I thought. He must be a serious man with settled and regular habits, in short, a good bourgeois. 
He put on his gold-rimmed spectacles, leaned back before beginning to read, and once more glanced about him. He noticed me, and immediately began to stare at me in an annoying manner. I was even going to ask the reason for this attention, when he exclaimed from his seat. Well, by all that's holy, if this isn't Gontran Lardois. I answered. Yes, monsieur, you are not mistaken. Then he quickly rose and came toward me with hands outstretched. Well, old man, how are you? As I did not recognize him at all I was greatly embarrassed. I stammered. Why very well in you? He began to laugh I bet you don't recognize me. No, not exactly. It seems, however. He slapped me on the back. Come on, no joking. I am Patience, Robert Patience, your friend, your chum. I recognized him. Yes, Robert Patience, my old college chum. It was he. I took his outstretched hand. And how are you? Fine. His smile was like a paean of victory. He asked. What are you doing here? I explained that I was government inspector of taxes. He continued, pointing to my red ribbon. Then you have been a success? I answered. Fairly so. And you? I am doing well. What are you doing? I'm in business. Making money? Heaps. I'm very rich. But come around to lunch, tomorrow noon, 17 Rue du Cochante, you will see my place. He seemed to hesitate a second, then continued. Are you still the good sport that you used to be? I, I hope so. Not married? No. Good. And do you still love a good time and potatoes? I was beginning to find him hopelessly vulgar. Nevertheless, I answered yes. And pretty girls? Most assuredly. He began to laugh good-humoredly. Good, good. Do you remember our first escapade, in Bordeaux, after that dinner at Rudy's? What a spree! I did, indeed, remember that spree, and the recollection of it cheered me up. This called to mind other pranks. He would say. Say, do you remember the time when we locked the proctor up in old man Latoque's cellar? And he laughed and banged the table with his fist, and then he continued. Yes, 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 and do you remember the face of the geography teacher, M. Marin, the day we set off a firecracker in the globe, just as he was haranguing about the principal volcanoes of the earth? Then suddenly I asked him. And you, are you married? He exclaimed. Ten years, my boy, and I have four children, remarkable youngsters, but you'll see them and their mother. We were talking rather loud, the people around us looked at us in surprise. Suddenly my friend looked at his watch, a chronometer the size of a pumpkin, and he cried. Thunder. I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave you, I am never free at night. He rose, took both my hands, shook them as though he were trying to wrench my arms from their sockets, and exclaimed. So long, then, till tomorrow noon. So long. I spent the morning working in the office of the Collector General of the Department. The chief wished me to stay to luncheon, but I told him that I had an engagement with a friend. As he had to go out, he accompanied me. I asked him. Can you tell me how I can find the Rue du Cope Cachante? He answered. Yes, it's only five minutes walk from here. As I have nothing special to do, I will take you there. We started out and soon found ourselves there. It was a wide, fine-looking street, on the outskirts of the town. I looked at the houses and I noticed number 17. It was a large house with a garden behind it. The façade, decorated with frescoes, in the Italian style, appeared to me as being in bad taste. There were goddesses holding vases, others swathed in clouds. Two stone cupids supported the number of the house. I said to the treasurer, Here is where I am going. I held my hand out to him. He made a quick, strange gesture, said nothing and shook my hand. I rang. A maid appeared. I asked. Monsieur Patience, if you please? She answered. 
Right here, sir. Is it to Monsieur that you wish to speak? Yes. The hall was decorated with paintings from the brush of some local artist. Pauls and Virginius were kissing each other under palm trees bathed in a pink light. A hideous oriental lantern was ranging from the ceiling. Several doors were concealed by bright hangings. But what struck me especially was the odor. It was a sickening and perfumed odor, reminding one of rice powder and the moldy smell of a cellar. An indefinable odor in a heavy atmosphere as oppressive as that of public baths. I followed the maid up a marble stairway, covered with a green, oriental carpet, and was ushered into a sumptibus parlor. Left alone, I looked about me. The room was richly furnished, but in the pretentious taste of a parvenu. Rather fine engravings of the last century represented women with powdered hair dressed high surprised by gentlemen in interesting positions. Another lady, lying in a large bed, was teasing with her foot a little dog, lost in the sheets. One drawing showed four feet, bodies concealed behind a curtain. The large room, surrounded by soft couches, was entirely impregnated with that enervating and insipid odor which I had already noticed. There seemed to be something suspicious about the walls, the hangings, the exaggerated luxury, everything. I approached the window to look into the garden. It was very big, shady, beautiful. A wide path wound round a grass plot in the midst of which was a fountain, entered a shrubbery and came out farther away. And, suddenly, yonder, in the distance, between two clumps of bushes, three women appeared. They were walking slowly, arm in arm, clad in long, white tea gowns covered with lace. Two were blondes and the other was dark-haired. Almost immediately they disappeared again behind the trees. I stood there entranced, delighted with this short and charming apparition, which brought to my mind a whole world of poetry. They had scarcely allowed themselves to be seen, in just the proper light, in that frame of foliage, in the midst of that mysterious, delightful park. It seemed to me that I had suddenly seen before me the great ladies of the last century, who were depicted in the engravings on the wall. And I began to think of the happy, joyous, witty and amorous times when manners were so graceful and lips so approachable. A deep voice made me jump. Patience had come in, beaming, and held out his hands to me. He looked into my eyes with the sly look which one takes when divulging secrets of love, and, with a Napoleonic gesture, he showed me his sumptuous parlor, his park, the three women, who had reappeared in the back of it, then. In a triumphant voice, where the note of pride was prominent, he said. And to think that I began with nothing, my wife and my sister-in-law. Abandoned. I really think you must be mad, my dear, to go for a country walk in such weather as this. You have had some very strange notions for the last two months. You drag me to the seaside in spite of myself, when you have never once had such a whim during all the forty-four years that we have been married. You chose Fee Camp, which is a very dull town, without consulting me in the matter and now you are seized with such a rage for walking, you who hardly ever stir out on foot, that you want to take a country walk on the hottest day of the year. Ask D'Aprival to go with you, as he is ready to gratify all your whims. As for me, I am going back to have a nap. Madame de Cadar turned to her old friend and said, Will you come with me, Monsieur D'Aprival? He bowed with a smile, and with all the gallantry of former years. I will go wherever you go, he replied. Very well, then, go and get a sunstroke, Monsieur de Cadar said, and he went back to the Hotel de Baines to lie down for an hour or two. As soon as they were alone, the old lady and her old companion set off, and she said to him in a low voice, squeezing his hand. At last. At last. You are mad, he said in a whisper. I assure you that you are mad. Think of the risk you are running. If that man. She started. Oh. Henri, do not say that man when you are speaking of him. Very well, he said abruptly, if our son guesses anything, if he has any suspicions, he will have you, he will have us both in his power. You have got on without seeing him for the last forty years. What is the matter with you today? They had been going up the long street that leads from the sea to the town, and now they turn to the right to go to Etretat. 
The white road stretched in front of him, then under a blaze of brilliant sunshine, so they went on slowly in the burning heat. She had taken her old friend's arm and was looking straight in front of her, with a fixed and haunted gaze, and at last she said, And so you have not seen him again, either? No, never. Is it possible? My dear friend, do not let us begin that discussion again. I have a wife and children and you have a husband, so we both of us have much to fear from other people's opinion. She did not reply. She was thinking of her long past youth and of many sad things that had occurred. How well she recalled all the details of their early friendship, his smiles, the way he used to linger, in order to watch her until she was indoors. What happy days they were, the only really delicious days she had ever enjoyed, and how quickly they were over. And then, her discovery, of the penalty she paid. What anguish! Of that journey to the South, that long journey, her sufferings, her constant terror, that secluded life in the small, solitary house on the shores of the Mediterranean, at the bottom of a garden, which she did not venture to leave. How well she remembered those long days which she spent lying under an orange tree, looking up at the round, red fruit, amid the green leaves. How she used to long to go out, as far as the sea, whose fresh breezes came to her over the wall, and whose small waves she could hear lapping on the beach. She dreamed of its immense blue expanse sparkling under the sun, with the white sails of the small vessels, and a mountain on the horizon. But she did not dare to go outside the gate. Suppose anybody had recognized her. And those days of waiting, those last days of misery and expectation. The impending suffering, and then that terrible night. What misery she had endured, and what a night it was. How she had groaned and screamed. She could still see the pale face of her lover, who kissed her hand every moment, and the clean-shaven face of the doctor and the nurse's white cap. And what she felt when she heard the child's feeble cries, that wail, that first effort of a human's voice. And the next day. The next day. The only day of her life on which she had seen and kissed her son. For, from that time, she had never even caught a glimpse of him. And what a long, void existence hers had been since then, with the thought of that child always, always floating before her. She had never seen her son, that little creature that had been part of herself even once since then, they had taken him from her, carried him away, and had hidden him. All she knew was that he had been brought up by some peasants in Normandy, that he had become a peasant himself, had married well, and that his father, whose name he did not know, had settled a handsome sum of money on him. How often during the last forty years had she wished to go and see him and to embrace him? She could not imagine to herself that he had grown. She always thought of that small human atom which she had held in her arms and pressed to her bosom for a day. How often she had said to M. de Aprival, I cannot bear it any longer, I must go and see him. But he had always stopped her and kept her from going. She would be unable to restrain and to master herself, their son would guess it and take advantage of her, blackmail her, she would be lost. What is he like, she said. I do not know. I have not seen him again, either. Is it possible? To have a son and not to know him, to be afraid of him and to reject him as if he were a disgrace. It is horrible. They went along the dusty road, overcome by the scorching sun, and continually ascending that interminable hill. One might take it for a punishment, she continued. I have never had another child, and I could no longer resist the longing to see him, which has possessed me for forty years. You men cannot understand that. You must remember that I shall not live much longer, and suppose I should never see him, never have seen him. Is it possible? How could I wait so long? I have thought about him every day since, and what a terrible existence mine has been. I have never awakened, never, do you understand, without my first thoughts being of him, of my child? How is he? Oh, how guilty I feel toward him. Ought one to fear what the world may say in a case like this? I ought to have left everything to go after him, to bring him up and to show my love for him. I should certainly have been much happier, but I did not dare, I was a coward. How I have suffered! 
Oh, how those poor, abandoned children must hate their mothers. She stopped suddenly, for she was choked by her sobs. The whole valley was deserted and silent in the dazzling light and the overwhelming heat, and only the grasshoppers uttered their shrill, continuous chirp among the sparse yellow grass on both sides of the road. Sit down a little, he said. She allowed herself to be led to the side of the ditch and sank down with her face in her hands. Her white hair, which hung in curls on both sides of her face, had become tangled. She wept, overcome by profound grief, while he stood facing her, uneasy and not knowing what to say, and he merely murmured, Come, take courage. She got up. I will, she said, and wiping her eyes, she began to walk again with the uncertain step of an elderly woman. A little farther on the road passed beneath a clump of trees, which hid a few houses, and they could distinguish the vibrating and regular blows of a blacksmith's hammer on the anvil. And presently they saw a wagon standing on the right side of the road in front of a low cottage, and two men shoeing a horse under a shed. Monsieur d'Apreval went up to them. Where is Pierre Benedict's farm? he asked. Take the road to the left, close to the inn, and then go straight on, it is the third house past Poritz. There is a small spruce fir close to the gate, you cannot make a mistake. They turned to the left. She was walking very slowly now, her legs threatened to give way, and her heart was beating so violently that she felt as if she should suffocate, while at every step she murmured, as if in prayer. Oh! Heaven! Heaven! Monsieur d'Apreval, who was also nervous and rather pale, said to her somewhat gruffly, If you cannot manage to control your feelings, you will betray yourself at once. Do try and restrain yourself. How can I, she replied. My child. When I think that I am going to see my child. They were going along one of those narrow country lanes between farmyards that are concealed beneath a double row of beech trees at either side of the ditches, and suddenly they found themselves in front of a gate. Beside which there was a young spruce fir. This is it, he said. She stopped suddenly and looked about her. The courtyard, which was planted with apple trees, was large and extended as far as the small thatched dwelling house. On the opposite side were the stable, the barn, the cow house and the poultry house, while the gig, the wagon and the manure cart were under a slated outhouse for calves were grazing under the shade of the trees and black hens were wandering all about the enclosure. All was perfectly still. The house door was open, but nobody was to be seen, and so they went in, when immediately a large black dog came out of a barrel that was standing under a pear tree, and began to bark furiously. There were four beehives on boards against the wall of the house. Monsieur d'Apreval stood outside and called out. Is anybody at home? Then a child appeared, a little girl of about ten, dressed in a chemise and a linen, petticoat, with dirty, bare legs and a timid and cunning look. She remained standing in the doorway, as if to prevent anyone going in. What do you want? She asked. Is your father in? No. Where is he? I don't know. And your mother? Gone after the cows. Will she be back soon? I don't know. Then suddenly the lady, as if she feared that her companion might force her to return, said quickly, I shall not go without having seen him. We will wait for him, my dear friend. As they turned away, they saw a peasant woman coming toward the house, carrying two tin pails, which appeared to be heavy and which glistened brightly in the sunlight. She limped with her right leg, and in her brown knitted jacket, that was faded by the sun and washed out by the rain, she looked like a poor, wretched, dirty servant. Here is Mama, the child said. When she got close to the house, she looked at the strangers angrily and suspiciously, and then she went in, as if she had not seen them. She looked old and had a hard, yellow, wrinkled face, one of those wooden faces that country people so often have. Monsieur d'Apreval called her back. I beg your pardon, madam but we came in to know whether you could sell us two glasses of milk. She was grumbling when she reappeared in the door, after putting down her pails. I don't sell milk, she replied. We are very thirsty, he said, and Madame is very tired. Can we not get something to drink? 
The peasant woman gave them an uneasy and cunning glance, and then she made up her mind. As you are here, I will give you some, she said, going into the house, and almost immediately the child came out and brought two chairs, which she placed under an apple tree, and then the mother, in turn, brought out two bowls of foaming milk, which she gave to the visitors. She did not return to the house, however, but remained standing near them, as if to watch them and to find out for what purpose they had come there. You have come from Fee Camp, she said. Yes, Monsieur D'Apreval replied, we are staying at Fee Camp for the summer. And then, after a short silence, he continued. Have you any fowls you could sell us every week? The woman hesitated for a moment and then replied. Yes, I think I have. I suppose you want young ones? Yes, of course. What do you pay for them in the market? De Preval, who had not the least idea, turned to his companion. What are you paying for poultry in fee camp, my dear lady? Four francs and four francs fifty centimes, she said, her eyes full of tears, while the farmer's wife, who was looking at her askance, asked in much surprise. Is the lady ill, as she is crying? He did not know what to say, and replied with some hesitation. No, no, but she lost her watch as we came along, a very handsome watch, and that troubles her. If anybody should find it, please let us know. Mother Benedict did not reply, as she thought it a very equivocal sort of answer, but suddenly she exclaimed. Oh, here is my husband. She was the only one who had seen him, as she was facing the gate. De Preval started and Madame de Cadar nearly fell as she turned round suddenly on her chair. A man bent nearly double and out of breath stood there, ten yards from them, dragging a cow at the end of a rope. Without taking any notice of the visitors, he said. Confound it! What a brute! And he went past them and disappeared in the cowhouse. Her tears had dried quickly as she sat there startled, without a word and with the one thought in her mind, that this was her son, and de Preval, whom the same thought had struck very unpleasantly, said in an agitated voice. Is this Monsieur Benedict? Who told you his name? the wife asked, still rather suspiciously. The blacksmith at the corner of the high road, he replied, and then they were all silent, with their eyes fixed on the door of the cowhouse, which formed a sort of black hole in the wall of the building. Nothing could be seen inside, but they heard a vague noise, movements and footsteps in the sound of hoofs, which were deadened by the straw on the floor, and soon the man reappeared in the door, wiping his forehead, and came toward the house with long, slow strides. He passed the strangers without seeming to notice them and said to his wife, Go and draw me a jug of cider, I am very thirsty. Then he went back into the house, while his wife went into the cellar and left the two Parisians alone. Let us go, let us go, Henri, Madame de Cadar said, nearly distracted with grief, and so D'Apreval took her by the arm, helped her to rise, and sustaining her with all his strength, for he felt that she was nearly fainting, he led her out. After throwing five francs on one of the chairs. As soon as they were outside the gate, she began to sob and said, shaking with grief. Oh! Oh! Is that what you have made of him? He was very pale, and replied coldly. I did what I could. His farm is worth eighty thousand francs, and that is more than most of the sons of the middle classes have. They returned slowly, without speaking a word. She was still crying. The tears ran down her cheeks continually for a time, but by degrees they stopped, and they went back to Fee Camp, where they found Monsieur de Cadar waiting dinner for them. As soon as he saw them, he began to laugh and exclaimed. So my wife has had a sunstroke, and I am very glad of it. I really think she has lost her head for some time past. Neither of them replied, and when the husband asked them, rubbing his hands. Well, I hope that, at least, you have had a pleasant walk? Monsieur D'Apreval replied. A delightful walk, I assure you, perfectly delightful. The Maison Tellier they went there every evening about eleven o'clock, just as they would go to the club. Six or eight of them. Always the same set, not fast men, but respectable tradesmen, and young men in government or some other employ, and they would drink their chartreuse, and laugh with the girls, 
or else talk seriously with Madame Tellier, whom everybody respected. And then they would go home at twelve o'clock. The younger men would sometimes stay later. It was a small, comfortable house painted yellow, at the corner of a street behind St. Etienne's Church, and from the windows one could see the docks full of ships being unloaded, the big salt marsh, and, rising beyond it, the Virgin's Hill with its old grey chapel. Madame Tellier, who came of a respectable family of peasant proprietors in the department of the Eure, had taken up her profession, just as she would have become a milliner or dressmaker. The prejudice which is so violent and deeply rooted in large towns does not exist in the country places in Normandy. The peasant says. It is a paying business, and he sends his daughter to keep an establishment of this character just as he would send her to keep a girl's school. She had inherited the house from an old uncle, to whom it had belonged. Monsieur and Madame Tellier, who had formerly been innkeepers near Ivetot, had immediately sold their house, as they thought that the business at Fee Camp was more profitable. And they arrived one fine morning to assume the direction of the enterprise, which was declining on account of the absence of the proprietors. They were good people enough in their way, and soon made themselves liked by their staff and their neighbors. Monsieur died of apoplexy two years later, for as the new place kept him in idleness and without any exercise, he had grown excessively stout, and his health had suffered. Since she had been a widow, all the frequenters of the establishment made much of her, but people said that, personally, she was quite virtuous, and even the girls in the house could not discover anything against her. She was tall, stout and affable, and her complexion, which had become pale in the dimness of her house, the shutters of which were scarcely ever opened, shone as if it had been varnished. She had a fringe of curly false hair, which gave her a juvenile look, that contrasted strongly with the ripeness of her figure. She was always smiling and cheerful, and was fond of a joke, but there was a shade of reserve about her, which her occupation had not quite made her lose. Coarse words always shocked her, and when any young fellow who had been badly brought up called her establishment a hard name, she was angry and disgusted. In a word, she had a refined mind, and although she treated her women as friends, yet she very frequently used to say that she and they were not made of the same stuff. Sometimes during the week she would hire a carriage and take some of her girls into the country, where they used to enjoy themselves on the grass by the side of the little river. They were like a lot of girls let out from school, and would run races and play childish games. They had a cold dinner on the grass, and drank cider, and went home at night with a delicious feeling of fatigue, and in the carriage they kissed Madame Tellier as their kind mother, who was full of goodness and complaisance. The house had two entrances. At the corner there was a sort of taproom, which sailors and the lower orders frequented at night, and she had two girls whose special duty it was to wait on them with the assistance of Frederick, a short, light-haired, beardless fellow. As strong as a horse. They set the half-bottles of wine and the jugs of beer on the shaky marble tables before the customers, and then urged the men to drink. The three other girls, there were only five of them, formed a kind of aristocracy, and they remained with the company on the first floor, unless they were wanted downstairs and there was nobody on the first floor. The Salon de Jupiter, where the tradesmen used to meet, was papered in blue, and embellished with a large drawing representing Lita and the Swan. The room was reached by a winding staircase, through a narrow door opening on the street, and above this door a lantern enclosed in wire, such as one still sees in some towns, at the foot of the shrine of some saint, burned all night long. The house, which was old and damp, smelled slightly of mildew. At times there was an odor of eau de cologne in the passages, or sometimes from a half-open door downstairs the noisy mirth of the common men sitting and drinking rose to the first floor much to the disgust of the gentlemen who were there. Madame Tellier, who was on friendly terms with her customers, did not leave the room, and took much interest in what was going on in the town, and they regularly told her all the news. Her serious conversation was a change from the ceaseless chatter of the three women. It was a rest from the obscene jokes of those stout individuals who every evening indulged in the commonplace debauchery of drinking a glass of liqueur in company with common women. The names of the girls on the first floor were Fernande, Raphael, and Rosa, the Jade. As the staff was limited, Madame had endeavored that each member of it should be a pattern, 
an epitome of the feminine type, so that every customer might find as nearly as possible the realization of his ideal. Fernande represented the handsome blonde, she was very tall, rather fat, and lazy, a country girl, who could not get rid of her freckles, and whose short, light, almost colorless, toe-like hair, like combed-out hemp, barely covered her head. Raphael, who came from Marseilles, played the indispensable part of the handsome Jewess, and was thin, with high cheekbones, which were covered with rouge, and black hair covered with pomatum, which curled on her forehead. Her eyes would have been handsome, if the right one had not had a speck in it. Her Roman nose came down over a square jaw, where two false upper teeth contrasted strangely with the bad color of the rest. Rosa was a little roll of fat, nearly all body, with very short legs, and from morning till night she sang songs, which were alternately risque or sentimental, in a harsh voice. Told silly, interminable tales, and only stopped talking in order to eat, and left off eating in order to talk, she was never still, and was active as a squirrel, in spite of her ambampoing and her short legs. Her laugh, which was a torrent of shrill cries, resounded here and there, ceaselessly, in a bedroom, in the loft, in the café, everywhere, and all about nothing. The two women on the ground floor, Lodi's, who was nicknamed La Cocotte, and Flora, whom they called Balanquoise, because she limped a little, the former always dressed as the goddess of liberty, with a tricolored sash, and the other as a Spanish woman, with a string of copper coins in her carroty hair, which jingled at every uneven step, looked like cooks dressed up for the carnival. They were like all other women of the lower orders, neither uglier nor better looking than they usually are. They looked just like servants at an inn, and were generally called the two pumps. A jealous peace, which was, however, very rarely disturbed, reigned among these five women, thanks to Madame Tellier's conciliatory wisdom, and to her constant good humor, and the establishment, which was the only one of the kind in the little town, was very much frequented. Madame Tellier had succeeded in giving it such a respectable appearance, she was so amiable and obliging to everybody, her good heart was so well known, that she was treated with a certain amount of consideration. The regular customers spent money on her, and were delighted when she was especially friendly toward them, and when they met during the day, they would say, until this evening, you know where, just as men say, at the club, after dinner. In a word, Madame Tellier's house was somewhere to go to, and they very rarely missed their daily meetings there. One evening toward the end of May, the first arrival, Monsieur Poulin, who was a timber merchant and had been mayor, found the door shut. The lantern behind the grating was not alight, there was not a sound in the house, everything seemed dead. He knocked, gently at first, but then more loudly, but nobody answered the door. Then he went slowly up the street, and when he got to the marketplace he met Monsieur Duvert, the gunmaker, who was going to the same place, so they went back together, but did not meet with any better success. But suddenly they heard a loud noise, close to them, and on going round the house, they saw a number of English and French sailors, who were hammering at the closed shutters of the taproom with their fists. The two tradesmen immediately made their escape, but a low PST stopped them, it was Monsieur Tournevau, the fish curer, who had recognized them and was trying to attract their attention. They told him what had happened, and he was all the more annoyed, as he was a married man and father of a family, and only went on Saturdays. That was his regular evening, and now he should be deprived of this dissipation for the whole week. The three men went as far as the quay together, and on the way they met young Monsieur Philippe, the banker's son, who frequented the place regularly, and Monsieur Pinapes, the collector, and they all returned to the Rue Aux Jewifs together to make a last attempt. But the exasperated sailors were besieging the house, throwing stones at the shutters, and shouting, and the five first-floor customers went away as quickly as possible and walked aimlessly about the streets. Presently they met Monsieur Dupuy, the insurance agent, and then Monsieur Vass, the judge of the Tribunal of Commerce, and they took a long walk, going to the pier first of all, where they sat down in a row on the granite parapet and watched the rising tide, and when the promenaders had sat there for some time, Monsieur Tournevau said, This is not very amusing. Decidedly not, Monsieur Pinapes replied, and they started off to walk again. After going through the street alongside the hill, they returned over the wooden bridge which crosses the retinue, 
passed close to the railway, and came out again on the marketplace, when, suddenly, a quarrel arose between Monsieur Pinapes, the collector, and Monsieur Tournevau about an edible mushroom which one of them declared he had found in the neighborhood. As they were out of temper already from having nothing to do, they would very probably have come to blows, if the others had not interfered. Monsieur Pinapes went off furious, and soon another altercation arose between the ex-mayor, Monsieur Poulin, and Monsieur Dupuy, the insurance agent, on the subject of the tax collector's salary and the profits which he might make. Insulting remarks were freely passing between them, when a torrent of formidable cries was heard, and the body of sailors, who were tired of waiting so long outside a closed house, came into the square. They were walking arm in arm, two and two, and formed a long procession, and were shouting furiously. The townsmen hid themselves in a doorway, and the yelling crew disappeared in the direction of the abbey. For a long time they still heard the noise, which diminished like a storm in the distance, and then silence was restored. Monsieur Poulin and Monsieur Dupuy, who were angry with each other, went in different directions, without wishing each other goodbye. The other four set off again, and instinctively went in the direction of Madame Tellier's establishment, which was still closed, silent, impenetrable. A quiet, but obstinate drunken man was knocking at the door of the lower room, and then stopped and called Frederick, in a low voice, but finding that he got no answer, he sat down on the doorstep, and waited the course of events. The others were just going to retire, when the noisy band of sailors reappeared at the end of the street. The French sailors were shouting the Marseillaise, and the Englishmen rule Britannia. There was a general lurching against the wall, and then the drunken fellows went on their way toward the quay, where a fight broke out between the two nations, in the course of which an Englishman had his arm broken and a Frenchman his nose split. The drunken man who had waited outside the door was crying by that time, as drunken men and children cry when they are vexed, and the others went away. By degrees, calm was restored in the noisy town. Here and there, at moments, the distant sound of voices could be heard, and then died away in the distance. One man only was still wandering about, Monsieur Tournevau, the fish curer, who was annoyed at having to wait until the following Saturday, and he hoped something would turn up, he did not know what. But he was exasperated at the police for thus allowing an establishment of such public utility, which they had under their control, to be closed. He went back to it and examined the walls, trying to find out some reason, and on the shutter he saw a notice stuck up. He struck a wax match and read the following, in a large, uneven hand, closed on account of the confirmation. Then he went away, as he saw it was useless to remain, and left the drunken man lying on the pavement fast asleep, outside that inhospitable door. The next day, all the regular customers, one after the other, found some reason for going through the street, with a bundle of papers under their arm to keep them in countenance. And with a furtive glance they all read that mysterious notice. Closed on account of the confirmation. Part 2 Madame Tellier had a brother, who was a carpenter in their native place, Verville, in the department of Ure. When she still kept the inn at Ivetot, she had stood godmother to that brother's daughter, who had received the name of Constance, Constance Rivet, she herself being a rivet on her father's side. The carpenter, who knew that his sister was in a good position, did not lose sight of her, although they did not meet often, for they were both kept at home by their occupations, and lived a long way from each other. But as the girl was twelve years old, and going to be confirmed, he seized that opportunity to write to his sister, asking her to come and be present at the ceremony. Their old parents were dead, and as she could not well refuse her goddaughter, she accepted the invitation. Her brother, whose name was Joseph, hoped that by dint of showing his sister attention, she might be induced to make her will in the girl's favor, as she had no children of her own. His sister's occupation did not trouble his scruples in the least, and, besides, nobody knew anything about it at Verville. When they spoke of her, they only said, Madame Tellier is living at Fee Camp, which might mean that she was living on her own private income. It was quite twenty leagues from Fee Camp to Verville, and for a peasant, twenty leagues on land is as long a journey as crossing the ocean would be to city people. The people at Verville had never been further than Rouen and nothing attracted the people from Fee Camp to a village of five hundred houses in the middle of a plain, 
and situated in another department. At any rate, nothing was known about her business. But the confirmation was coming on, and Madame Tellier was in great embarrassment. She had no substitute and did not at all care to leave her house, even for a day. For all the rivalries between the girls upstairs and those downstairs would infallibly break out. No doubt Frederick would get drunk, and when he was in that state, he would knock anybody down for a mere word. At last, however, she made up her mind to take them all with her, with the exception of the man, to whom she gave a holiday until the next day but one. When she asked her brother, he made no objection, but undertook to put them all up for a night, and so on Saturday morning the eight o'clock express carried off Madame Tellier and her companions in a second-class carriage. As far as Buzeville they were alone, and chattered like magpies, but at that station a couple got in. The man, an old peasant, dressed in a blue blouse with a turned-down collar, wide sleeves tied at the wrist, ornamented with white embroidery, wearing an old high hat with long nap, held an enormous green umbrella in one hand, and a large basket in the other, from which the heads of three frightened ducks protruded. The woman, who sat up stiffly in her rustic finery, had a face like a fowl, with a nose that was as pointed as a bill. She sat down opposite her husband and did not stir, as she was startled at finding herself in such smart company. There was certainly an array of striking colors in the carriage. Madame Tellier was dressed in blue silk from head to foot, and had on a dazzling red imitation French cashmere shawl. Fernande was puffing in a scotch plaid dress, of which her companions had laced the bodice as tight as they could, forcing up her full bust, that was continually heaving up and down. Raphael, with a bonnet covered with feathers, so that it looked like a bird's nest, had on a lilac dress with gold spots on it, and there was something oriental about it that suited her Jewish face. Rosa had on a pink skirt with largo flounces, and looked like a very fat child, an obese dwarf, while the two pumps looked as if they had cut their dresses out of old flowered curtains dating from the restoration. As soon as they were no longer alone in the compartment, the ladies put on staid looks, and began to talk of subjects which might give others a high opinion of them. But at Bolbeck a gentleman with light whiskers, a gold chain, and wearing two or three rings, got in, and put several parcels wrapped in oilcloth on the rack over his head. He looked inclined for a joke, and seemed a good-hearted fellow. Are you ladies changing your quarters? he said, and that question embarrassed them all considerably. Madame Tellier, however, quickly regained her composure, and said sharply, to avenge the honor of her corps. I think you might try and be polite. He excused himself, and said, I beg your pardon, I ought to have said your nunnery. She could not think of a retort, so, perhaps thinking she had said enough, Madame gave him a dignified bow and compressed her lips. Then the gentleman, who was sitting between Rosa and the old peasant, began to wink knowingly at the ducks whose heads were sticking out of the basket, and when he felt that he had fixed the attention of his public. He began to tickle them under the bills and spoke funnily to them to make the company smile. We have left our little pond, quack. Quack. To make the acquaintance of the little spit, chuack. Chuack. The unfortunate creatures turned their necks away, to avoid his caresses, and made desperate efforts to get out of their wicker prison, and then, suddenly, all at once, uttered the most lamentable quacks of distress. The women exploded with laughter. They leaned forward and pushed each other, so as to see better, they were very much interested in the ducks, and the gentleman redoubled his airs, his wit and his teasing. Rosa joined in, and leaning over her neighbor's legs, she kissed the three animals on the head, and immediately all the girls wanted to kiss them, in turn, and as they did so the gentleman took them on his knee, jumped them up and down and pinched their arms. The two peasants, who were even in greater consternation than their poultry, rolled their eyes as if they were possessed, without venturing to move, and their old wrinkled faces had not a smile, not a twitch. Then the gentleman, who was a commercial traveler, offered the ladies suspenders by way of a joke, and taking up one of his packages, he opened it. It was a joke, for the parcel contained garters. There were blue silk, pink silk, red silk, violet silk, mauve silk garters, and the buckles were made of two gilt metal cupids embracing each other. 
The girls uttered exclamations of delight and looked at them with that gravity natural to all women when they are considering an article of dress. They consulted one another by their looks or in a whisper, and replied in the same manner, and Madame Tellier was longingly handling a pair of orange garters that were broader and more imposing looking than the rest. Really fit for the mistress of such an establishment. The gentleman waited, for he had an idea. Come, my kittens, he said, you must try them on. There was a torrent of exclamations, and they squeezed their petticoats between their legs, but he quietly waited his time and said, Well, if you will not try them on I shall pack them up again. And he added cunningly, I offer any pair they like to those who will try them on. But they would not, and sat up very straight and looked dignified. But the two pumps looked so distressed that he renewed his offer to them, and Flora, especially, visibly hesitated, and he insisted, Come, my dear, a little courage. Just look at that lilac pair, it will suit your dress admirably. That decided her, and pulling up her dress she showed a thick leg fit for a milkmaid, in a badly fitting, coarse stocking. The commercial traveler stooped down and fastened the garter. When he had done this, he gave her the lilac pair and asked, Who next? I. I, they all shouted at once, and he began on Rosa, who uncovered a shapeless, round thing without any ankle, a regular sausage of a leg, as Raphael used to say. Lastly, Madame Tellier herself put out her leg, a handsome, muscular Norman leg, and in his surprise and pleasure, the commercial traveler gallantly took off his hat to salute that master calf, like a true French cavalier. The two peasants, who were speechless from surprise, glanced sideways out of the corner of one eye, and they looked so exactly like fowls that the man with the light whiskers, when he sat up, said, Condio Vurithico under their very noses and that gave rise to another storm of amusement. The old people got out at Mottaville with their basket, their ducks, and their umbrella, and they heard the woman say to her husband as they went away, They are no good and are off to that cursed place, Paris. The funny commercial traveler himself got out at Rouen, after behaving so coarsely that Madame Tellier was obliged sharply to put him in his right place, and she added, as a moral, this will teach us not to talk to the first comer. At Oysel they changed trains, and at a little station further on Monsieur Joseph Rivet was waiting for them with a large cart with a number of chairs in it, drawn by a white horse. The carpenter politely kissed all the ladies and then helped them into his conveyance. Three of them sat on three chairs at the back, Raphael, Madame Tellier and her brother on the three chairs in front, while Rosa, who had no seat, settled herself as comfortably as she could on tall Fernandez's knees, and then they set off. But the horse's jerky trot shook the cart so terribly that the chairs began to dance and threw the travelers about, to the right and to the left, as if they were dancing puppets, which made them scream and make horrible grimaces. They clung on to the sides of the vehicle, their bonnets fell on their backs, over their faces and on their shoulders, and the white horse went on stretching out his head and holding out his little hairless tail like a rat's, with which he whisked his buttocks from time to time. Joseph Rivet with one leg on the shafts and the other doubled under him, held the reins with his elbows very high, and kept uttering a kind of clucking sound, which made the horse prick up its ears and go faster. The green country extended on either side of the road, and here and there the calza in flower presented a waving expanse of yellow, from which arose a strong, wholesome, sweet and penetrating odor, which the wind carried to some distance. The cornflowers showed their little blue heads amid the rye, and the women wanted to pick them, but Monsieur Rivet refused to stop. Then, sometimes, a whole field appeared to be covered with blood, so thick were the poppies, and the cart, which looked as if it were filled with flowers of more brilliant hue, jogged on through fields bright with wild flowers, and disappeared behind the trees of a farm, only to reappear and to go on again through the yellow or green standing crops, which were studded with red or blue. One o'clock struck as they drove up to the carpenter's door. They were tired out and pale with hunger, as they had eaten nothing since they left home. Madame Rivet ran out and made them alight, one after another, and kissed them as soon as they were on the ground, and she seemed as if she would never tire of kissing her sister-in-law, whom she apparently wanted to monopolize. They had lunch in the workshop, which had been cleared out for the next day's dinner. The capital omelette, 
followed by boiled chitlins and washed down with good hard cider, made them all feel comfortable. Rivet had taken a glass so that he might drink with them and his wife cooked, waited on them, brought in the dishes, took them out and asked each of them in a whisper whether they had everything they wanted. A number of boards standing against the walls and heaps of shavings that had been swept into the corners gave out a smell of planed wood, a smell of a carpenter's shop, that resinous odor which penetrates to the lungs. They wanted to see the little girl, but she had gone to church and would not be back again until evening, so they all went out for a stroll in the country. It was a small village, through which the high road passed. Ten or a dozen houses on either side of the single street were inhabited by the butcher, the grocer, the carpenter, the innkeeper, the shoemaker, and the baker. The church was at the end of the street and was surrounded by a small churchyard and four immense lime trees, which stood just outside the porch, shaded it completely. It was built of flint, in no particular style, and had a slate-roofed steeple. When you got past it, you were again in the open country, which was varied here and there by clumps of trees which hid the homesteads. Rivet had given his arm to his sister, out of politeness, although he was in his working clothes, and was walking with her in a dignified manner. His wife, who was overwhelmed by Raphael's gold-striped dress, walked between her and Fernande, and Roly Polly Rosa was trotting behind with Louise and Flora, the seesaw, who was limping along, quite tired out. The inhabitants came to their doors, the children left off playing, and a window curtain would be raised, so as to show a muslin cap, while an old woman with a crutch, who was almost blind, crossed herself as if it were a religious procession. And they all gazed for a long time at those handsome ladies from town, who had come so far to be present at the confirmation of Joseph Rivet's little girl, and the carpenter rose very much in the public estimation. As they passed the church they heard some children singing. Little shrill voices were singing a hymn, but Madame Tellier would not let them go in, for fear of disturbing the little cherubs. After the walk, during which Joseph Rivet enumerated the principal landed proprietors, spoke about the yield of the land and the productiveness of the cows and sheep, he took his tribe of women home and installed them in his house. And as it was very small, they had to put them into the rooms, two and two. Just for once Rivet would sleep in the workshop on the shavings, his wife was to share her bed with her sister-in-law, and Fernande and Raphael were to sleep together in the next room. Louise and Flora were put into the kitchen, where they had a mattress on the floor, and Rosa had a little dark cupboard to herself at the top of the stairs, close to the loft, where the candidate for confirmation was to sleep. When the little girl came in she was overwhelmed with kisses, all the women wished to caress her with that need of tender expansion, that habit of professional affection which had made them kiss the ducks in the railway carriage. They each of them took her on their knees, stroked her soft, light hair and pressed her in their arms with vehement and spontaneous outbursts of affection, and the child, who was very good and religious, bore it all patiently. As the day had been a fatiguing one for everybody, they all went to bed soon after dinner. The whole village was wrapped in that perfect stillness of the country, which is almost like a religious silence, and the girls, who were accustomed to the noisy evenings of their establishment, felt rather impressed by the perfect repose of the sleeping village, and they shivered, not with cold, but with those little shivers of loneliness which come over uneasy and troubled hearts. As soon as they were in bed, two and two together, they clasped each other in their arms, as if to protect themselves against this feeling of the calm and profound slumber of the earth. But Rosa, who was alone in her little dark cupboard, felt a vague and painful emotion come over her. She was tossing about in bed, unable to get to sleep, when she heard the faint sobs of a crying child close to her head, through the partition. She was frightened, and called out, and was answered by a weak voice, broken by sobs. It was the little girl, who was always used to sleeping in her mother's room, and who was afraid in her small attic. Rosa was delighted, got up softly so as not to awaken anyone, and went and fetched the child. She took her into her warm bed, kissed her and pressed her to her bosom, lavished exaggerated manifestations of tenderness on her, and at last grew calmer herself and went to sleep. And till morning the candidate for confirmation slept with her head on Rosa's bosom. At five o'clock the little church bell, ringing the Angelus, woke the women, who usually slept the whole morning long. The villagers were up already, 
and the women went busily from house to house, carefully bringing short, starched muslin dresses or very long wax tapers tied in the middle with a bow of silk fringed with gold, and with dents in the wax for the fingers. The sun was already high in the blue sky, which still had a rosy tint toward the horizon, like a faint remaining trace of dawn. Families of fowls were walking about outside the houses, and here and there a black cock, with a glistening breast, raised his head, which was crowned by his red comb, flapped his wings and uttered his shrill crow, which the other cocks repeated. Vehicles of all sorts came from neighboring parishes, stopping at the different houses, and tall Norman women dismounted, wearing dark dresses, with kerchiefs crossed over the bosom, fastened with silver brooches a hundred years old. The men had put on their blue smocks over their new frock coats or over their old dress coats of green cloth, the two tails of which hung down below their blouses. When the horses were in the stable there was a double line of rustic conveyances along the road, carts, cabriolets, tilburies, wagonettes, traps of every shape and age, tipping forward on their shafts or else tipping backward with the shafts up in the air. The carpenter's house was as busy as a beehive. The women, in dressing jackets and petticoats, with their thin, short hair, which looked faded and worn, hanging down their backs, were busy dressing the child, who was standing quietly on a table, while Madame Tellier was directing the movements of her battalion. They washed her, did her hair, dressed her, and with the help of a number of pins, they arranged the folds of her dress and took in the waist, which was too large. Then, when she was ready, she was told to sit down and not to move and the women hurried off to get ready themselves. The church bell began to ring again, and its tinkle was lost in the air, like a feeble voice which is soon drowned in space. The candidates came out of the houses and went toward the parochial building, which contained the two schools and the mansion house, and which stood quite at one end of the village, while the church was situated at the other. The parents, in their very best clothes, followed their children, with embarrassed looks, and those clumsy movements of a body bent by toil. The little girls disappeared in a cloud of muslin, which looked like whipped cream, while the lads, who looked like embryo waiters in a café and whose heads shone with pomatum, walked with their legs apart, so as not to get any dust or dirt on their black trousers. It was something for a family, to be proud of, when a large number of relatives, who had come from a distance, surrounded the child, and the carpenter's triumph was complete. Madame Tellier's regiment, with its leader at its head, followed Constance. Her father gave his arm to his sister, her mother walked by the side of Raphael, Fernande with Rosa and Louise and Flora together, and thus they proceeded majestically through the village, like a general's staff in full uniform. While the effect on the village was startling. At the school the girls ranged themselves under the Sister of Mercy and the boys under the schoolmaster, and they started off, singing a hymn as they went. The boys led the way, in two files, between the two rows of vehicles, from which the horses had been taken out, and the girls followed in the same order. And as all the people in the village had given the town ladies the precedence out of politeness, they came immediately behind the girls, and lengthened the double line of the procession still more, three on the right and three on the left, while their dresses were as striking as a display of fireworks. When they went into the church, the congregation grew quite excited. They pressed against each other, turned round and jostled one another in order to see, and some of the devout ones spoke almost aloud. For they were so astonished at the sight of those ladies whose dresses were more elaborate than the priest's vestments. The mayor offered them his pew, the first one on the right, close to the choir, and Madame Tellier sat there with her sister-in-law, Fernande, and Raphael. Rosa, Louise and Flora occupied the second seat, in company with the carpenter. The choir was full of kneeling children, the girls on one side and the boys on the other, and the long wax tapers which they held looked like lances pointing in all directions, and three men were standing in front of the lectern, singing as loud as they could. They prolonged the syllables of the sonorous Latin indefinitely, holding on to amends with interminable A.S., which the reed stop of the organ sustained in a monotonous, long-drawn-out tone. A child's shrill voice took up the reply and from time to time a priest sitting in a stall and wearing a beretta got up, muttered something and sat down again, while the three singers continued. 
their eyes fixed on the big book of plain chant lying open before them on the outstretched wings of a wooden eagle. Then silence ensued and the service went on. Toward the close Rosa, with her head in both hands, suddenly thought of her mother, her village church and her first communion. She almost fancied that that day had returned, when she was so small and was almost hidden in her white dress, and she began to cry. First of all she wept silently, and the tears dropped slowly from her eyes, but her emotion increased with her recollections, and she began to sob. She took out her pocket handkerchief, wiped her eyes and held it to her mouth, so as not to scream, but it was in vain. A sort of rattle escaped her throat, and she was answered by two other profound, heartbreaking sobs, for her two neighbors, Louise and Flora, who were kneeling near her, overcome by similar recollections, were sobbing by her side. Amid a flood of tears. And as tears are contagious, Madame Tellier soon in turn found that her eyes were wet, and on turning to her sister-in-law, she saw that all the occupants of her seat were also crying. Soon, throughout the church, here and there, a wife, a mother, a sister, seized by the strange sympathy of poignant emotion, and affected at the sight of those handsome ladies on their knees. Shaken with sobs was moistening her cambric pocket handkerchief and pressing her beating heart with her left hand. Just as the sparks from an engine will set fire to dry grass, so the tears of Rosa and of her companions infected the whole congregation in a moment. Men, women, old men and lads in new smocks were soon all sobbing, and something superhuman seemed to be hovering over their heads, a spirit, the powerful breath of an invisible and all-powerful being. Suddenly a species of madness seemed to pervade the church, the noise of a crowd in a state of frenzy, a tempest of sobs and stifled cries. It came like gusts of wind which blow the trees in a forest, and the priest, paralyzed by emotion, stammered out incoherent prayers, without finding words, ardent prayers of the soul soaring to heaven. The people behind him gradually grew calmer. The cantors, in all the dignity of their white surplices, went on in somewhat uncertain voices, and the reed stop itself seemed hoarse, as if the instrument had been weeping. The priest, however, raised his hand to command silence and went and stood on the chancel steps, when everybody was silent at once. After a few remarks on what had just taken place, and which he attributed to a miracle, he continued, turning to the seats where the carpenter's guests were sitting. I especially thank you, my dear sisters, who have come from such a distance, and whose presence among us, whose evident faith and ardent piety have set such a salutary example to all. You have edified my parish, your emotion has warmed all hearts. Without you, this great day would not, perhaps, have had this really divine character. It is sufficient, at times, that there should be one chosen lamb, for the Lord to descend on his flock. His voice failed him again, from emotion, and he said no more, but concluded the service. They now left the church as quickly as possible, the children themselves were restless and tired with such a prolonged tension of the mind. The parents left the church by degrees to see about dinner. There was a crowd outside, a noisy crowd, a babble of loud voices, where the shrill Norman accent was discernible. The villagers formed two ranks, and when the children appeared, each family took possession of their own. The whole houseful of women caught hold of Constance, surrounded her and kissed her, and Rosa was especially demonstrative. At last she took hold of one hand, while Madame Tellier took the other, and Raphael and Fernande held up her long muslin skirt, so that it might not drag in the dust, Louise and Flora brought up the rear with Madame Rivet. And the child, who was very silent and thoughtful, set off for home in the midst of this guard of honor. Dinner was served in the workshop on long boards supported by trestles, and through the open door they could see all the enjoyment that was going on in the village. Everywhere they were feasting, and through every window were to be seen tables surrounded by people in their Sunday best, and a cheerful noise was heard in every house, while the men sat in their shirt sleeves, drinking glass after glass of cider. In the carpenter's house the gaiety maintained somewhat of an air of reserve, the consequence of the emotion of the girls in the morning and Rimmet was the only one who was in a jolly mood, and he was drinking to excess. Madame Tellier looked at the clock every moment, for, in order not to lose two days running, they must take the 355 train, which would bring them to Fee Camp by dark. The carpenter tried very hard to distract her attention, 
so as to keep his guests until the next day, but he did not succeed, for she never joked when there was business on hand. And as soon as they had had their coffee she ordered her girls to make haste and get ready, and then, turning to her brother, she said. You must put in the horse immediately, and she herself went to finish her last preparations. When she came down again, her sister-in-law was waiting to speak to her about the child, and a long conversation took place, in which, however, nothing was settled. The carpenter's wife was artful and pretended to be very much affected, and Madame Tellier, who was holding the girl on her knee, would not pledge herself to anything definite, but merely gave vague promises she would not forget her. There was plenty of time, and besides, they would meet again. But the conveyance did not come to the door and the women did not come downstairs. Upstairs they even heard loud laughter, romping, little screams, and much clapping of hands, and so, while the carpenter's wife went to the stable to see whether the cart was ready, Madame went upstairs. Rivet, who was very drunk, was plaguing Rosa, who was half choking with laughter. Louise and Flora were holding him by the arms and trying to calm him, as they were shocked at his levity after that morning's ceremony. But Raphael and Fernande were urging him on, writhing and holding their sides with laughter, and they uttered shrill cries at every rebuff the drunken fellow received. The man was furious, his face was red, and he was trying to shake off the two women who were clinging to him, while he was pulling Rose's skirt with all his might and stammering incoherently. But Madame Tellier, who was very indignant, went up to her brother, seized him by the shoulders, and threw him out of the room with such violence that he fell against the wall in the passage. And a minute afterward they heard him pumping water on his head in the yard, and when he reappeared with the cart he was quite calm. They started off in the same way as they had come the day before, and the little white horse started off with his quick, dancing trot. Under the hot sun, their fun, which had been checked during dinner, broke out again. The girls now were amused at the jolting of the cart, pushed their neighbors' chairs, and burst out laughing every moment. There was a glare of light over the country, which dazzled their eyes, and the wheels raised two trails of dust along the high road. Presently, Fernande, who was fond of music, asked Rosa to sing something, and she boldly struck up the Gros Cure de Mudin, but Madame Tellier made her stop immediately, as she thought it a very unsuitable song for such a day. And she added, Sing us something of Beringer's. And so, after a moment's hesitation, Rosa began Beringer's song The Grandmother in her worn-out voice, and all the girls, and even Madame Tellier herself, joined in the chorus. How I regret. My dimpled arms. My nimble legs. And vanished charms. That is first-rate, Rivet declared, carried away by the rhythm, and they shouted the refrain to every verse while Rivet beat time on the shaft with his foot, and with the reins on the back of the horse, who, as if he himself were carried away by the rhythm, broke into a wild gallop, and threw all the women in a heap, one on top of the other, on the bottom of the conveyance. They got up, laughing as if they were mad, and the gong went on, shouted at the top of their voices, beneath the burning sky, among the ripening grain, to the rapid gallop of the little horse, who set off every time the refrain was sung and galloped a hundred yards, to their great delight, while occasionally a stonebreaker by the roadside sat up and looked at the load of shouting females through his wire spectacles. When they got out at the station, the carpenter said, I am sorry you are going, we might have had some good times together. But Madame Tellier replied very sensibly, everything has its right time, and we cannot always be enjoying ourselves. And then he had a sudden inspiration. Look here, I will come and see you at Fee Camp next month. And he gave Rosa a roguish and knowing look. Come, his sister replied, you must be sensible. You may come if you like, but you are not to be up to any of your tricks. He did not reply, and as they heard the whistle of the train, he immediately began to kiss them all. When it came to Rosa's turn, he tried to get to her mouth, which she, however, smiling with her lips closed, turned away from him each time by a rapid movement of her head to one side. He held her in his arms, but he could not attain his object, as his large whip, which he was holding in his hand and waving behind the girls back in desperation, interfered with his movements. Passengers for Rouen, take your seats. A guard cried, and they got in. 
There was a slight whistle, followed by a loud whistle from the engine, which noisily puffed out its first jet of steam, while the wheels began to turn a little with a visible effort. And Rivet left the station and ran along by the track to get another look at Rosa, and as the carriage passed him, he began to crack his whip and to jump, while he sang at the top of his voice. How I regret. My dimpled arms. My nimble legs. And vanished charms. And then he watched a white pocket handkerchief, which somebody was waving, as it disappeared in the distance. Part 3 They slept the peaceful sleep of a quiet conscience, until they got to Rouen, and when they returned to the house, refreshed and rested, Madame Tellier could not help saying. It was all very well, but I was longing to get home. They hurried over their supper, and then, when they had put on their usual evening costume, waited for their regular customers, and the little colored lamp outside the door told the passers-by that Madame Tellier had returned. And in a moment the news spread, nobody knew how or through whom. Monsieur Philippe, the banker's son, even carried his friendliness so far as to send a special messenger to Monsieur Tournevau, who was in the bosom of his family. The fish curer had several cousins to dinner every Sunday, and they were having coffee, when a man came in with a letter in his hand. Monsieur Tournevau was much excited, he opened the envelope and grew pale. It contained only these words in pencil. The cargo of cod has been found, the ship has come into port, good business for you. Come immediately. He felt in his pockets, gave the messenger two sons, and suddenly blushing to his ears, he said, I must go out. He handed his wife the laconic and mysterious note, rang the bell, and when the servant came in, he asked her to bring him his hat and overcoat immediately. As soon as he was in the street, he began to hurry, and the way seemed to him to be twice as long as usual, in consequence of his impatience. Madame Tellier's establishment had put on quite a holiday look. On the ground floor, a number of sailors were making a deafening noise, and Louise and Flora drank with one and the other, and were being called for in every direction at once. The upstairs room was full by nine o'clock. Monsieur Vass, the judge of the Tribunal of Commerce, Madame Tellier's regular but platonic wooer, was talking to her in a corner in a low voice, and they were both smiling, as if they were about to come to an understanding. Monsieur Poulin, the ex-mayor, was talking to Rosa, and she was running her hands through the old gentleman's white whiskers. Tall Fernande was on the sofa, her feet on the coat of Monsieur Pinapes, the tax collector, and leaning back against young Monsieur Philippe, her right arm around his neck, while she held a cigarette in her left hand. Raphael appeared to be talking seriously with Monsieur Dupuy, the insurance agent, and she finished by saying, yes, I will, yes. Just then, the door opened suddenly, and Monsieur Tournevau came in, and was greeted with enthusiastic cries of long live Tournevau. And Raphael, who was dancing alone up and down the room, went and threw herself into his arms. He seized her in a vigorous embrace and, without saying a word, lifted her up as if she had been a feather. Rosa was chatting to the ex-mayor, kissing him and puffing, both his whiskers at the same time, in order to keep his head straight. Ferdinand and Madame Tellier remained with the four men, and Monsieur Philippe exclaimed, I will pay for some champagne, get three bottles, Madame Tellier. And Fernande gave him a hug and whispered to him, play us a waltz, will you? So he rose and sat down at the old piano in the corner, and managed to get a hoarse waltz out of the depths of the instrument. The tall girl put her arms round the tax collector, Madame Tellier let Monsieur Vass take her round the waist, and the two couples turned round, kissing as they danced. Monsieur Vass, who had formerly danced in good society, waltzed with such elegance that Madame Tellier was quite captivated. Frederick brought the champagne. The first cork popped, and Monsieur Philippe played the introduction to a quadrille, through which the four dancers walked in society fashion, decorously, with propriety, deportment, bows and curtsies, and then they began to drink. Monsieur Philippe next struck up a lively polka, and Monsieur Tournevau started off with the handsome Jewess, whom he held without letting her feet touch the ground. Monsieur Pinapes and Monsieur Vass had started off with renewed vigor, and from time to time one or other couple would stop to toss off a long draught of sparkling wine, and that dance was threatening to become never-ending. When Rosa opened the door, 
I want to dance, she exclaimed. And she caught hold of Monsieur Dupuis, who was sitting idle on the couch, and the dance began again. But the bottles were empty. I will pay for one, Monsieur Tournevau said. So will I, Monsieur Vass declared. And I will do the same, Monsieur Dupuis remarked. They all began to clap their hands, and it soon became a regular ball, and from time to time Louise and Flora ran upstairs quickly and had a few turns, while their customers downstairs grew impatient. And then they returned regretfully to the taproom. At midnight they were still dancing. Madame Tellier let them amuse themselves while she had long private talks in corners with Monsieur Vass, as if to settle the last details of something that had already been settled. At last, at one o'clock, the two married men, Monsieur Tournevau and Monsieur Pinapes, declared that they were going home and wanted to pay. Nothing was charged for except the champagne, and that cost only six francs a bottle, instead of ten, which was the usual price, and when they expressed their surprise at such generosity, Madame Tellier, who was beaming, said to them, We don't have a holiday every day. Dennis. To Leon Chaperon. Marimbot opened the letter which his servant Dennis gave him and smiled. For twenty years Dennis has been a servant in this house. He was a short, stout, jovial man, who was known throughout the countryside as a model servant. He asked. Is Monsieur pleased? Has Monsieur received good news? M. Marimbot was not rich. He was an old village druggist, a bachelor, who lived on an income acquired with difficulty by selling drugs to the farmers. He answered. Yes, my boy. Old man Malwa is afraid of the lawsuit with which I am threatening him. I shall get my money tomorrow. Five thousand francs are not liable to harm the account of an old bachelor. M. Marimbot rubbed his hands with satisfaction. He was a man of quiet temperament, more sad than gay, incapable of any prolonged effort, careless in business. He could undoubtedly have amassed a greater income had he taken advantage of the deaths of colleagues established in more important centers, by taking their places and carrying on their business. But the trouble of moving and the thought of all the preparations had always stopped him. After thinking the matter over for a few days, he would be satisfied to say, Bah! I'll wait until the next time. I'll not lose anything by the delay. I may even find something better. Dennis, on the contrary, was always urging his master to new enterprises. Of an energetic temperament, he would continually repeat, Oh! If I had only had the capital to start out with, I could have made a fortune. One thousand francs would do me. M. Marimbot would smile without answering and would go out in his little garden, where, his hands behind his back, he would walk about dreaming. All day long, Dennis sang the joyful refrains of the folk songs of the district. He even showed an unusual activity, for he cleaned all the windows of the house, energetically rubbing the glass, and singing at the top of his voice. M. Marimbot, surprised at his zeal, said to him several times, smiling, My boy, if you work like that there will be nothing left for you to do tomorrow. The following day, at about nine o'clock in the morning, the postman gave Dennis four letters for his master, one of them very heavy. M. Marimbot immediately shut himself up in his room until late in the afternoon. He then handed his servant four letters for the mail. One of them was addressed to M. Malwa, it was undoubtedly a receipt for the money. Dennis asked his master no questions. He appeared to be as sad and gloomy that day as he had seemed joyful the day before. Night came. M. Marimbot went to bed as usual and slept. He was awakened by a strange noise. He sat up in his bed and listened. Suddenly the door opened, and Dennis appeared, holding in one hand a candle and in the other a carving knife, his eyes staring, his face contracted as though moved by some deep emotion, he was as pale as a ghost. M. Marimbot, astonished, thought that he was sleepwalking, and he was going to get out of bed and assist him when the servant blew out the light and rushed for the bed. His master stretched out his hands to receive the shock which knocked him over on his back, he was trying to seize the hands of his servant, whom he now thought to be crazy, 
in order to avoid the blows which the latter was aiming at him. He was struck by the knife, once in the shoulder, once in the forehead and the third time in the chest. He fought wildly, waving his arms around in the darkness, kicking and crying. Dennis! Dennis! Are you mad? Listen, Dennis! But the latter, gasping for breath, kept up his furious attack always striking, always repulsed, sometimes with a kick, sometimes with a punch, and rushing forward again furiously. M. Marimbot was wounded twice more, once in the leg and once in the stomach. But, suddenly, a thought flashed across his mind, and he began to shriek. Stop, stop, Dennis, I have not yet received my money. The man immediately ceased, and his master could hear his labored breathing in the darkness. M. Marimbot then went on. I have received nothing. M. Malwai takes back what he said, the lawsuit will take place. That is why you carried the letters to the mail. Just read those on my desk. With a final effort, he reached for his matches and lit the candle. He was covered with blood. His sheets, his curtains, and even the walls were spattered with red. Dennis, standing in the middle of the room, was also bloody from head to foot. When he saw the blood, M. Marimbot thought himself dead and fell unconscious. At break of day he revived. It was some time, however, before he regained his senses and was able to understand or remember. But, suddenly, the memory of the attack and of his wounds returned to him, and he was filled with such terror that he closed his eyes in order not to see anything. After a few minutes he grew calmer and began to think. He had not died immediately, therefore he might still recover. He felt weak, very weak, but he had no real pain, although he noticed an uncomfortable smarting sensation in several parts of his body. He also felt icy cold, and all wet, and as though wrapped up in bandages. He thought that this dampness came from the blood which he had lost. And he shivered at the dreadful thought of this red liquid which had come from his veins and covered his bed. The idea of seeing this terrible spectacle again so upset him that he kept his eyes closed with all his strength, as though they might open in spite of himself. What had become of Dennis? He had probably escaped. But what could he, Marimbot, do now? Get up? Call for help? But if he should make the slightest motions, his wounds would undoubtedly open up again and he would die from loss of blood. Suddenly, he heard the door of his room open. His heart almost stopped. It was certainly Dennis who was coming to finish him up. He held his breath in order to make the murderer think that he had been successful. He felt his sheet being lifted up and then someone feeling his stomach. A sharp pain near his hip made him start. He was being very gently washed with cold water. Therefore, someone must have discovered the misdeed and he was being cared for. A wild joy seized him. But prudently, he did not wish to show that he was conscious. He opened one eye, just one, with the greatest precaution. He recognized Dennis standing beside him, Dennis himself. Mercy. He hastily closed his eye again. Dennis. What could he be doing? What did he want? What awful scheme could he now be carrying out? What was he doing? Well, he was washing him in order to hide the traces of his crime. And he would now bury him in the garden, under ten feet of earth, so that no one could discover him. Or perhaps under the wine cellar. And M. Marimbot began to tremble like a leaf. He kept saying to himself, I am lost, lost. He closed his eyes so as not to see the knife as it descended for the final stroke. It did not come. Dennis was now lifting him up and bandaging him. Then he began carefully to dress the wound on his leg, as his master had taught him to do. There was no longer any doubt. His servant, after wishing to kill him, was trying to save him. Then M. Marimbot, in a dying voice, gave him the practical piece of advice. Wash the wounds in a dilute solution of carbolic acid. Dennis answered. This is what I am doing, monsieur. M. Marimbot opened both his eyes. There was no sign of blood either on the bed, on the walls, or on the murderer. 
The wounded man was stretched out on clean white sheets. The two men looked at each other. Finally M. Marimot said calmly. You have been guilty of a great crime. Dennis answered. I am trying to make up for it, monsieur. If you will not tell on me, I will serve you as faithfully as in the past. This was no time to anger his servant. M. Marimbot murmured as he closed his eyes. I swear not to tell on you. Dennis saved his master. He spent days and nights without sleep, never leaving the sick room, preparing drugs, broths, potions, feeling his pulse, anxiously counting the beats, attending him with the skill of a trained nurse and the devotion of a son. He continually asked. Well, monsieur, how do you feel? M. Marimbot would answer in a weak voice. A little better, my boy, thank you. And when the sick man would wake up at night, he would often see his servant seated in an armchair, weeping silently. Never had the old druggist been so cared for, so fondled, so spoiled. At first he had said to himself, As soon as I am well I shall get rid of this rascal. He was now convalescing, and from day to day he would put off dismissing his murderer. He thought that no one would ever show him such care and attention, for he held this man through fear, and he warned him that he had left a document with a lawyer denouncing him to the law if any new accident should occur. This precaution seemed to guarantee him against any future attack, and he then asked himself if it would not be wiser to keep this man near him, in order to watch him closely. Just as formerly, when he would hesitate about taking some larger place of business, he could not make up his mind to any decision. There is always time, he would say to himself. Dennis continued to show himself an admirable servant. M. Marimbot was well. He kept him. One morning, just as he was finishing breakfast, he suddenly heard a great noise in the kitchen. He hastened in there. Dennis was struggling with two gendarmes. An officer was taking notes on his pad. As soon as he saw his master, the servant began to sob, exclaiming. You told on me, monsieur, that's not right, after what you had promised me. You have broken your word of honor, monsieur Marimbot, that is not right, that's not right. M. Marimbot, bewildered and distressed at being suspected, lifted his hand. I swear to you before the Lord, my boy that I did not tell on you. I haven't the slightest idea how the police could have found out about your attack on me. The officer started. You say that he attacked you, M. Marimbot? The bewildered druggist answered. Yes, but I did not tell on him, I haven't said a word, I swear it, he has served me excellently from that time on. The officer pronounced severely. I will take down your testimony. The law will take notice of this new action, of which it was ignorant, Monsieur Marimbot. I was commissioned to arrest your servant for the theft of two ducks surreptitiously taken by him from M. Duhamel of which act there are witnesses. I shall make a note of your information. Then, turning toward his men, he ordered. Come on, bring him along. The two gendarmes dragged Dennis out. The lawyer used a plea of insanity, contrasting the two misdeeds in order to strengthen his argument. He had clearly proved that the theft of the two ducks came from the same mental condition as the eight knife wounds in the body of Marimot. He had cunningly analyzed all the phases of this transitory condition of mental aberration, which could, doubtless, be cured by a few months' treatment in a reputable sanatorium. He had spoken in enthusiastic terms of the continued devotion of this faithful servant, of the care with which he had surrounded his master, wounded by him in a moment of alienation. Touched by this memory, M. Marimbot felt the tears rising to his eyes. The lawyer noticed it, opened his arms with a broad gesture, spreading out the long black sleeves of his robe like the wings of a bat, and exclaimed. Look, look, gentlemen of the jury, look at those tears. What more can I say for my client? What speech, what argument, what reasoning would be worth these tears of his master? They speak louder than I do, louder than the law, they cry, mercy, for the poor wandering mind of a while ago. They implore, they pardon, they bless. He was silent and sat down. Then the judge, turning to Marimbot, 
whose testimony had been excellent for his servant, asked him. But, Monsieur, even admitting that you consider this man insane, that does not explain why you should have kept him. He was none the less dangerous. Marambot, wiping his eyes, answered. Well, Your Honor, what can you expect? Nowadays it's so hard to find good servants, I could never have found a better one. Dennis was acquitted and put in a sanatorium at his master's expense. My wife. It had been a stag dinner. These men still came together once in a while without their wives as they had done when they were bachelors. They would eat for a long time, drink for a long time, they would talk of everything, stir up those old and joyful memories which bring a smile to the lip and a tremor to the heart. One of them was saying, Georges, do you remember our excursion to St. Germain with those two little girls from Montmartre? I should say I do. And a little detail here or there would be remembered, and all these things brought joy to the hearts. The conversation turned on marriage, and each one said with a sincere air, Oh, if it were to do over again. Georges de Porton added, It's strange how easily one falls into it. You have fully decided never to marry, and then, in the springtime, you go to the country, the weather is warm, the summer is beautiful, the fields are full of flowers. You meet a young girl at some friend's house, crash. All is over. You return married. Pierre Latoyle exclaimed, correct. That is exactly my case, only there were some peculiar incidents. His friend interrupted him, as for you, you have no cause to complain. You have the most charming wife in the world, pretty, amiable, perfect. You are undoubtedly the happiest one of us all. The other one continued, it's not my fault. How so? It is true that I have a perfect wife, but I certainly married her much against my will. Nonsense. Yes, this is the adventure. I was thirty-five, and I had no more idea of marrying than I had of hanging myself. Young girls seemed to me to be inane, and I loved pleasure. During the month of May I was invited to the wedding of my cousin, Simon d'Arabel, in Normandy. It was a regular Normandy wedding. We sat down at the table at five o'clock in the evening and at eleven o'clock we were still eating. I had been paired off, for the occasion, with a Mademoiselle de Moulin, daughter of a retired colonel, a young, blonde, soldierly person, well-formed, frank and talkative. She took complete possession of me for the whole day, dragged me into the park, made me dance willy-nilly, bored me to death. I said to myself, that's all very well for today, but tomorrow I'll get out. That's all there is to it. Toward eleven o'clock at night the women retired to their rooms, the men stayed, smoking while they drank or drinking while they smoked, whichever you will. Through the open window we could see the country folks dancing. Farmers and peasant girls were jumping about in a circle yelling at the top of their lungs a dance air which was feebly accompanied by two violins and a clarinet. The wild song of the peasants often completely drowned the sound of the instruments, and the weak music, interrupted by the unrestrained voices, seemed to come to us in little fragments of scattered notes. Two enormous casks, surrounded by flaming torches, contained drinks for the crowd. Two men were kept busy rinsing the glasses or bowls in a bucket and immediately holding them under the spigots, from which flowed the red stream of wine or the golden stream of pure cider. And the parched dancers, the old ones quietly, the girls panting, came up, stretched out their arms and grasped some receptacle, threw back their heads and poured down their throats the drink which they preferred. On a table were bread, butter, cheese and sausages. Each one would step up from time to time and swallow a mouthful, and under the starlit sky this healthy and violent exercise was a pleasing sight and made one also feel like drinking from these enormous casks and eating the crisp bread and butter with a raw onion. A mad desire seized me to take part in this merrymaking, and I left my companions. I must admit that I was probably a little tipsy, but I was soon entirely so. I grabbed the hand of a big, panting peasant woman and I jumped her about until I was out of breath. Then I drank some wine and reached for another girl. In order to refresh myself afterward, I swallowed a bowlful of cider, and I began to bounce around as if possessed. I was very light on my feet. The boys, delighted, were watching me and trying to imitate me. 
The girls all wished to dance with me, and jumped about heavily with the grace of cows. After each dance I drank a glass of wine or a glass of cider, and toward two o'clock in the morning I was so drunk that I could hardly stand up. I realized my condition and tried to reach my room. Everybody was asleep and the house was silent and dark. I had no matches and everybody was in bed. As soon as I reached the vestibule I began to feel dizzy. I had a lot of trouble to find the banister. At last, by accident, my hand came in contact with it, and I sat down on the first step of the stairs in order to try to gather my scattered wits. My room was on the second floor. It was the third door to the left. Fortunately I had not forgotten that. Armed with this knowledge, I arose, not without difficulty, and I began to ascend, step by step. In my hands I firmly gripped the iron railing in order not to fall, and took great pains to make no noise. Only three or four times did my foot miss the steps, and I went down on my knees. But thanks to the energy of my arms and the strength of my will, I avoided falling completely. At last I reached the second floor and I set out in my journey along the hall, feeling my way by the walls. I felt one door, I counted, one. But a sudden dizziness made me lose my hold on the wall, make a strange turn and fall up against the other wall. I wished to turn in a straight line, the crossing was long and full of hardships. At last I reached the shore, and, prudently, I began to travel along again until I met another door. In order to be sure to make no mistake, I again counted out loud, too. I started out on my walk again. At last I found the third door. I said, three, that's my room, and I turned the knob. The door opened. Notwithstanding my befuddled state, I thought, since the door opens, this must be home. After softly closing the door, I stepped out in the darkness. I bumped against something soft, my easy chair. I immediately stretched myself out on it. In my condition it would not have been wise to look for my bureau, my candles, my matches. It would have taken me at least two hours. It would probably have taken me that long also to undress, and even then I might not have succeeded. I gave it up. I only took my shoes off, I unbuttoned my waistcoat, which was choking me, I loosened my trousers and went to sleep. This undoubtedly lasted for a long time. I was suddenly awakened by a deep voice which was saying, What, you lazy girl, still in bed? It's ten o'clock. A woman's voice answered, Already. I was so tired yesterday. In bewilderment I wondered what this dialogue meant. Where was I? What had I done? My mind was wandering, still surrounded by a heavy fog. The first voice continued, I'm going to raise your curtains. I heard steps approaching me. Completely at a loss what to do, I sat up. Then a hand was placed on my head. I started. The voice asked, Who is there? I took good care not to answer. A furious grasp seized me. I in turn seized him, and a terrific struggle ensued. We were rolling around, knocking over the furniture and crashing against the walls. A woman's voice was shrieking, Help! Help! Servants, neighbors, frightened women crowded around us. The blinds were open and the shades drawn. I was struggling with Colonel Dumoulin. I had slept beside his daughter's bed. When we were separated, I escaped to my room, dumbfounded. I locked myself in and sat down with my feet on a chair, for my shoes had been left in the young girl's room. I heard a great noise through the whole house, doors being opened and closed, whisperings and rapid steps. After half an hour someone knocked on my door. I cried, who is there? It was my uncle, the bridegroom's father. I opened the door. He was pale and furious, and he treated me harshly, you have behaved like a scoundrel in my house, do you hear? Then he added more gently but, you young fool, why the devil did you let yourself get caught at ten o'clock in the morning? You go to sleep like a log in that room, instead of leaving immediately, immediately after. I exclaimed, but, uncle, I assure you that nothing occurred. I was drunk and got into the wrong room. He shrugged his shoulders. Don't talk nonsense. 
I raised my hand, exclaiming, I swear to you on my honor. My uncle continued, yes, that's all right. It's your duty to say that. I in turn grew angry and told him the whole unfortunate occurrence. He looked at me with a bewildered expression, not knowing what to believe. Then he went out to confer with the colonel. I heard that a kind of jury of the mothers had been formed, to which were submitted the different phases of the situation. He came back an hour later, sat down with the dignity of a judge and began, no matter what may be the situation, I can see only one way out of it for you, it is to marry Mademoiselle de Moulin. I bounded out of the chair, crying, never. Never. Gravely he asked, well, what do you expect to do? I answered simply, why, leave as soon as my shoes are returned to me. My uncle continued, please do not jest. The colonel has decided to blow your brains out as soon as he sees you. And you may be sure that he does not threaten idly. I spoke of a duel and he answered, No, I tell you that I will blow his brains out. Let us now examine the question from another point of view. Either you have misbehaved yourself, and then so much the worse for you, my boy, one should not go near a young girl, or else, being drunk, as you say, you made a mistake in the room. In this case, it's even worse for you. You shouldn't get yourself into such foolish situations. Whatever you may say, the poor girl's reputation is lost, for a drunkard's excuses are never believed. The only real victim in the matter is the girl. Think it over. He went away, while I cried after him, say what you will, I'll not marry her. I stayed alone for another hour. Then my aunt came. She was crying. She used every argument. No one believed my story. They could not imagine that this young girl could have forgotten to lock her door in a house full of company. The colonel had struck her. She had been crying the whole morning. It was a terrible and unforgettable scandal. And my good aunt added, ask for her hand, anyhow. We may, perhaps, find some way out of it when we are drawing up the papers. This prospect relieved me. And I agreed to write my proposal. An hour later I left for Paris. The following day I was informed that I had been accepted. Then, in three weeks, before I had been able to find any excuse, the bans were published, the announcement sent out, the contract signed, and one Monday morning I found myself in a church, beside a weeping young girl. After telling the magistrate that I consented to take her as my companion, for better, for worse. I had not seen her since my adventure, and I glanced at her out of the corner of my eye with a certain malevolent surprise. However, she was not ugly, far from it. I said to myself, there is someone who won't laugh every day. She did not look at me once until the evening, and she did not say a single word. Toward the middle of the night I entered the bridal chamber with the full intention of letting her know my resolutions, for I was now master. I found her sitting in an armchair, fully dressed, pale and with red eyes. As soon as I entered she rose and came slowly toward me saying, Monsieur, I am ready to do whatever you may command. I will kill myself if you so desire. The colonel's daughter was as pretty as she could be in this heroic role. I kissed her, it was my privilege. I soon saw that I had not got a bad bargain. I have now been married five years. I do not regret it in the least. Pierre Latoyle was silent. His companions were laughing. One of them said, Marriage is indeed a lottery, you must never choose your numbers. The haphazard ones are the best. Another added by way of conclusion, Yes, but do not forget that the god of drunkards chose for Pierre. The Unknown we were speaking of adventures, and each one of us was relating his story of delightful experiences, surprising meetings, on the train, in a hotel, at the seashore. According to Roger D. Annette's, the seashore was particularly favorable to the little blind god. Gontran, who was keeping mum, was asked what he thought of it. I guess Paris is about the best place for that, he said. Woman is like a precious trinket, we appreciate her all the more when we meet her in the most unexpected places, but the rarest ones are only to be found in Paris. He was silent for a moment, and then continued. By Jove, it's great. 
walk along the streets on some spring morning. The little women, daintily tripping along, seem to blossom out like flowers. What a delightful, charming sight. The dainty perfume of violet is everywhere. The city is gay, and everybody notices the women. By Jove, how tempting they are in their light, thin dresses, which occasionally give one a glimpse of the delicate pink flesh beneath. One saunters along, head up, mind alert, and eyes open. I tell you it's great. You see her in the distance, while still a block away, you already know that she is going to please you at closer quarters. You can recognize her by the flower on her hat, the toss of her head, or her gait. She approaches, and you say to yourself, look out, here she is. You come closer to her, and you devour her with your eyes. Is it a young girl running errands for some store, a young woman returning from church, or hastening to see her lover? What do you care? Her well-rounded bosom shows through the thin waist. Oh, if you could only take her in your arms and fondle and kiss her. Her glance may be timid or bold, her hair light or dark. What difference does it make? She brushes against you, and a cold shiver runs down your spine. Ah, how you wish for her all day. How many of these dear creatures have I met this way, and how wildly in love I would have been had I known them more intimately. Have you ever noticed that the ones we would love the most distractedly are those whom we never meet to know? Curious, isn't it? From time to time we barely catch a glimpse of some woman, the mere sight of whom thrills our senses. But it goes no further. When I think of all the adorable creatures that I have elbowed in the streets of Paris, I fairly rave. Who are they? Where are they? Where can I find them again? There is a proverb which says that happiness often passes our way, I am sure that I have often passed alongside the one who could have caught me like a linnet in the snare of her fresh beauty. Roger Dionets had listened smilingly. He answered, I know that as well as you do. This is what happened to me, about five years ago, for the first time I met, on the Pont de la Concorde, a young woman who made a wonderful impression on me. She was dark, rather stout, with glossy hair and eyebrows which nearly met above two dark eyes. On her lip was a scarcely perceptible down, which made one dream dream as one dreams of beloved woods, on seeing a bunch of wild violets. She had a small waist and a well-developed bust, which seemed to present a challenge, offer a temptation. Her eyes were like two black spots on white enamel. Her glance was strange, vacant, unthinking, and yet wonderfully beautiful. I imagined that she might be a Jewess. I followed her, and then turned round to look at her, as did many others. She walked with a swinging gait that was not graceful, but somehow attracted one. At the Place de la Concorde she took a carriage, and I stood there like a fool, moved by the strongest desire that had ever assailed me. For about three weeks I thought only of her, and then her memory passed out of my mind. Six months later I descried her in the Rue de la Pax again. On seeing her I felt the same shock that one experiences on seeing a once dearly loved woman. I stopped that I might better observe her. When she passed close enough to touch me I felt as though I were standing before a red-hot furnace. Then, when she had passed by, I noticed a delicious sensation, as of a cooling breeze blowing over my face. I did not follow her. I was afraid of doing something foolish. I was afraid of myself. She haunted all my dreams. It was a year before I saw her again. But just as the sun was going down on one beautiful evening in May I recognized her walking along the Avenue de Champs-Élysées. The Arc de Triomphe stood out in bold relief against the fiery glow of the sky. A golden haze filled the air. It was one of those delightful spring evenings which are the glory of Paris. I followed her, tormented by a desire to address her, to kneel before her, to pour forth the emotion which was choking me. Twice I passed by her only to fall back, and each time as I passed by I felt the sensation, as of scorching heat, which I had noticed in the Rue de la Pax. She glanced at me, and then I saw her enter a house on the Rue de Presbourg. I waited for her two hours and she did not come out. Then I decided to question the janitor. He seemed not to understand me. She must be visiting someone, he said. 
The next time I was eight months without seeing her. But one freezing morning in January, I was walking along the Boulevard Malherbe at a dog trot, so as to keep warm, when at the corner I bumped into a woman and knocked a small package out of her hand. I tried to apologize. It was she. At first I stood stock still from the shock, then having returned to her the package which she had dropped, I said abruptly. I am both grieved and delighted, madam, to have jostled you. For more than two years I have known you, admired you, and had the most ardent wish to be presented to you, nevertheless I have been unable to find out who you are, or where you live. Please excuse these foolish words. Attribute them to a passionate desire to be numbered among your acquaintances. Such sentiments can surely offend you in no way. You do not know me. My name is Baron Roger Dionetz. Make inquiries about me, and you will find that I am a gentleman. Now, if you refuse my request, you will throw me into abject misery. Please be good to me and tell me how I can see you. She looked at me with her strange vacant stare and answered smilingly. Give me your address. I will come and see you. I was so dumbfounded that I must have shown my surprise. But I quickly gathered my wits together and gave her a visiting card, which she slipped into her pocket with a quick, deft movement. Becoming bolder, I stammered. When shall I see you again? She hesitated, as though mentally running over her list of engagements, and then murmured. Will Sunday morning suit you? I should say it would. She went on, after having stared at me, judged, weighed and analyzed me with this heavy and vacant gaze which seemed to leave a quieting and deadening impression on the person towards whom it was directed. Until Sunday my mind was occupied day and night trying to guess who she might be and planning my course of conduct towards her. I finally decided to buy her a jewel, a beautiful little jewel, which I placed in its box on the mantelpiece and left it there awaiting her arrival. I spent a restless night waiting for her. At ten o'clock she came calm and quiet, and with her hand outstretched, as though she had known me for years. Drawing up a chair, I took her hat and coat and furs, and laid them aside. And then, timidly, I took her hand in mine. After that all went on without a hitch. Ah, my friends! What a bliss it is, to stand at a discreet distance and watch the hidden pink and blue ribbons, partly concealed, to observe the hazy lines of the beloved one's form as they become visible through the last of the filmy garments. What a delight it is to watch the ostrich-like modesty of those who are in reality none too modest. And what is so pretty as their motions. Her back was turned towards me, and suddenly, my eyes were irresistibly drawn to a large black spot right between her shoulders. What could it be? Were my eyes deceiving me? But no, there it was, staring me in the face. Then my mind reverted to the faint down on her lip, the heavy eyebrows almost meeting over her coal black eyes, her glossy black hair, I should have been prepared for some surprise. Nevertheless I was dumbfounded, and my mind was haunted by dim visions of strange adventures. I seemed to see before me one of the evil genii of the Thousand and One Nights, one of these dangerous and crafty creatures whose mission it is to drag men down to unknown depths. I thought of Solomon who made the Queen of Sheba walk on a mirror that he might be sure that her feet were not cloven. And when the time came for me to sing of love to her, my voice forsook me. At first she showed surprise, which soon turned to anger, and she said, quickly putting on her wraps. It was hardly worth while for me to go out of my way to come here. I wanted her to accept the ring which I had bought for her, but she replied haughtily, For whom do you take me, sir? I blushed to the roots of my hair. She left without saying another word. There is my whole adventure. But the worst part of it is that I am now madly in love with her. I can't see a woman without thinking of her. All the others disgust me, unless they remind me of her. I cannot kiss a woman without seeing her face before me, and without suffering the torture of unsatisfied desire. She is always with me, always there, dressed or nude, my true love. She is there, beside the other one, visible but intangible. I am almost willing to believe that she was bewitched, and carried a talisman between her shoulders. Who is she? I don't know yet. I have met her once or twice since. 
I bowed, but she pretended not to recognize me. Who is she? An Oriental? Yes, doubtless an Oriental Jewess. I believe that she must be a Jewess. But why? Why? I don't know. The apparition. The subject of sequestration of the person came up in speaking of a recent lawsuit, and each of us had a story to tell, a true story, he said. We had been spending the evening together at an old family mansion in the Rue de Grenelle, just a party of intimate friends. The old Marquis de Latour Samuel, who was eighty-two, rose, and, leaning his elbow on the mantelpiece, said in his somewhat shaky voice, I also know of something strange, so strange that it has haunted me all my life. It is now fifty-six years since the incident occurred, and yet not a month passes that I do not see it again in a dream, so great is the impression of fear it has left on my mind. For ten minutes I experienced such horrible fright that ever since then a sort of constant terror has remained with me. Sudden noises startle me violently, and objects imperfectly distinguished at night inspire me with a mad desire to flee from them. In short, I am afraid of the dark. But I would not have acknowledged that before I reached my present age. Now I can say anything. I have never receded before real danger, ladies. It is, therefore, permissible, at eighty-two years of age, not to be brave in presence of imaginary danger. That affair so completely upset me, caused me such deep and mysterious and terrible distress, that I never spoke of it to any one. I will now tell it to you exactly as it happened, without any attempt at explanation. In July, 1827, I was stationed at Rouen. One day, as I was walking along the quay, I met a man whom I thought I recognized without being able to recall exactly who he was. Instinctively I made a movement to stop. The stranger perceived it and at once extended his hand. He was a friend to whom I had been deeply attached as a youth. For five years I had not seen him, he seemed to have aged half a century. His hair was quite white and he walked bent over as though completely exhausted. He apparently understood my surprise, and he told me of the misfortune which had shattered his life. Having fallen madly in love with a young girl, he had married her, but after a year of more than earthly happiness she died suddenly of an affection of the heart. He left his country home on the very day of her burial and came to his townhouse in Rouen, where he lived, alone and unhappy, so sad and wretched that he thought constantly of suicide. Since I have found you again in this manner, he said, I will ask you to render me an important service. It is to go and get me out of the desk in my bedroom, our bedroom, some papers of which I have urgent need. I cannot send a servant or a business clerk, as discretion and absolute silence are necessary. As for myself, nothing on earth would induce me to re-enter that house. I will give you the key of the room, which I myself locked on leaving, and the key of my desk, also a few words for my gardener, telling him to open the chateau for you. But come and breakfast with me tomorrow, and we will arrange all that. I promised to do him the slight favor he asked. It was, for that matter, only a ride which I could make in an hour on horseback, his property being but a few miles distant from Rouen. At ten o'clock the following day I breakfasted, tete-a-tete, -tete, with my friend, but he scarcely spoke. He begged me to pardon him, the thought of the visit I was about to make to that room, the scene of his dead happiness overcame him, he said. He, indeed, seemed singularly agitated and preoccupied, as though undergoing some mysterious mental struggle. At length he explained to me exactly what I had to do. It was very simple. I must take two packages of letters and a roll of papers from the first right-hand drawer of the desk, of which I had the key. He added, I need not beg you to refrain from glancing at them. I was wounded at that remark and told him so somewhat sharply. He stammered. Forgive me, I suffer so, and tears came to his eyes. At about one o'clock I took leave of him to accomplish my mission. The weather was glorious, and I trotted across the fields, listening to the song of the larks and the rhythmical clang of my sword against my boot. Then I entered the forest and walked my horse. Branches of trees caressed my face as I passed and now and then I caught a leaf with my teeth and chewed it, from sheer gladness of heart at being alive and vigorous on such a radiant day. 
As I approached the chateau, I took from my pocket the letter I had for the gardener, and was astonished at finding it sealed. I was so irritated that I was about to turn back without having fulfilled my promise, but reflected that I should thereby display undue susceptibility. My friend in his troubled condition might easily have fastened the envelope without noticing that he did so. The manor looked as if it had been abandoned for twenty years. The open gate was falling from its hinges, the walks were overgrown with grass and the flower beds were no longer distinguishable. The noise I made by kicking at a shutter brought out an old man from a side door. He seemed stunned with astonishment at seeing me. On receiving my letter, he read it, reread it, turned it over and over, looked me up and down, put the paper in his pocket and finally said, Well, what is it you wish? I replied shortly. You ought to know, since you have just read your master's orders. I wish to enter the chateau. He seemed overcome. Then you are going in, into her room? I began to lose patience. Damn it. Are you presuming to question me? He stammered in confusion. No, oh, sir, but, but it has not been opened since, since the death. If you will be kind enough to wait five minutes I will go and, and see if. I interrupted him angrily. See here, what do you mean by your tricks? You know very well you cannot enter the room, since here is the key. He no longer objected. Then, sir, I will show you the way. Show me the staircase and leave me. I'll find my way without you. But, sir, indeed. This time I lost patience, and pushing him aside, went into the house. I first went through the kitchen, then two rooms occupied by this man and his wife. I then crossed a large hall, mounted a staircase and recognized the door described by my friend. I easily opened it and entered the apartment. It was so dark that at first I could distinguish nothing. I stopped short, disagreeably affected by that disagreeable, musty odor of closed, unoccupied rooms. As my eyes slowly became accustomed to the darkness I saw plainly enough a large and disordered bedroom, the bed without sheets but still retaining its mattresses and pillows, on one of which was a deep impression. As though an elbow or a head had recently rested there. The chairs all seemed out of place. I noticed that a door, doubtless that of a closet, had remained half open. I first went to the window, which I opened to let in the light, but the fastenings of the shutters had grown so rusty that I could not move them. I even tried to break them with my sword, but without success. As I was growing irritated over my useless efforts and could now see fairly well in the semi-darkness, I gave up the hope of getting more light, and went over to the writing desk. I seated myself in an armchair and, letting down the lid of the desk, I opened the drawer designated. It was full to the top. I needed but three packages, which I knew how to recognize, and began searching for them. I was straining my eyes in the effort to read the superscriptions when I seemed to hear, or, rather, feel, something rustle back of me. I paid no attention, believing that a draft from the window was moving some drapery. But in a minute or so another movement, almost imperceptible, sent a strangely disagreeable little shiver over my skin. It was so stupid to be affected, even slightly, that self-respect prevented my turning around. I had just found the second package I needed and was about to lay my hand on the third when a long and painful sigh, uttered just at my shoulder, made me bound like a madman from my seat and land several feet off. As I jumped I had turned round my hand on the hilt of my sword, and, truly, if I had not felt it at my side I should have taken to my heels like a coward. A tall woman dressed in white, stood gazing at me from the back of the chair where I had been sitting an instant before. Such a shudder ran through all my limbs that I nearly fell backward. No one who has not experienced it can understand that frightful, unreasoning terror. The mind becomes vague, the heart ceases to beat, the entire body grows as limp as a sponge. I do not believe in ghosts, nevertheless I collapsed from a hideous dread of the dead, and I suffered, oh. I suffered in a few moments more than in all the rest of my life from the irresistible terror of the supernatural. If she had not spoken I should have died perhaps. But she spoke, she spoke in a sweet, sad voice that set my nerves vibrating. I dare not say that I became master of myself and recovered my reason. 
No. I was terrified and scarcely knew what I was doing. But a certain innate pride, a remnant of soldierly instinct, made me, almost in spite of myself, maintain a bold front. She said, Oh, sir, you can render me a great service. I wanted to reply, but it was impossible for me to pronounce a word. Only a vague sound came from my throat. She continued, Will you? You can save me, cure me. I suffer frightfully. I suffer, oh. How I suffer. And she slowly seated herself in my armchair, still looking at me. Will you, she said. I nodded in assent, my voice still being paralyzed. Then she held out to me a tortoise shell comb and murmured. Comb my hair, oh. Comb my hair. That will cure me, it must be combed. Look at my head, how I suffer, and my hair pulls so. Her hair, unbound, very long and very black, it seemed to me, hung over the back of the armchair and touched the floor. Why did I promise? Why did I take that comb with a shudder, and why did I hold in my hands her long black hair that gave my skin a frightful cold sensation, as though I were handling snakes? I cannot tell. That sensation has remained in my fingers, and I still tremble in recalling it. I combed her hair. I handled, I know not how, those icy locks. I twisted, knotted, and unknotted, and braided them. She sighed, bowed her head, seemed happy. Suddenly she said, thank you, snatched the comb from my hands and fled by the door that I had noticed ajar. Left alone, I experienced for several seconds the horrible agitation of one who awakens from a nightmare. At length I regained my senses. I ran to the window and with a mighty effort burst open the shutters, letting a flood of light into the room. Immediately I sprang to the door by which that being had departed. I found it closed and immovable. Then the mad desire to flee overcame me like a panic the panic which soldiers know in battle. I seized the three packets of letters on the open desk, ran from the room, dashed down the stairs four steps at a time, found myself outside, I know not how and, perceiving my horse a few steps off, leaped into the saddle and galloped away. I stopped only when I reached Rouen and alighted at my lodgings. Throwing the reins to my orderly, I fled to my room and shut myself in to reflect. For an hour I anxiously asked myself if I were not the victim of a hallucination. Undoubtedly I had had one of those incomprehensible nervous attacks those exaltations of mind that give rise to visions and are the stronghold of the supernatural and I was about to believe I had seen a vision, had a hallucination, when, as I approached the window, my eyes fell, by chance, upon my breast. My military cape was covered with long black hairs. One by one, with trembling fingers, I plucked them off and threw them away. I then called my orderly. I was too disturbed, too upset to go and see my friend that day, and I also wished to reflect more fully upon what I ought to tell him. I sent him his letters, for which he gave the soldier a receipt. He asked after me most particularly, and, on being told I was ill, had had a sunstroke, appeared exceedingly anxious. Next morning I went to him, determined to tell him the truth. He had gone out the evening before and had not yet returned. I called again during the day, my friend was still absent. After waiting a week longer without news of him, I notified the authorities and a judicial search was instituted. Not the slightest trace of his whereabouts or manner of disappearance was discovered. A minute inspection of the abandoned chateau revealed nothing of a suspicious character. There was no indication that a woman had been concealed there. After fruitless researches all further efforts were abandoned, and for fifty-six years I have heard nothing, I know no more than before. Original Short Stories, Volume 8 Guy de Maupassant. Original Short Stories. Translated by Albert M. C. McMaster, B.A. A. E. Henderson, B.A. Emmy Casada and others. Volume 8. Clochette. How strange those old recollections are which haunt us, without our being able to get rid of them. This one is so very old that I cannot understand how it has clung so vividly and tenaciously to my memory. 
since then I have seen so many sinister things, which were either affecting or terrible, that I am astonished at not being able to pass a single day without the face of Mother Bellflower recurring to my mind's eye, just as I knew her formerly. Now so long ago, when I was ten or twelve years old. She was an old seamstress who came to my parents' house once a week, every Thursday, to mend the linen. My parents lived in one of those country houses called chateaux, which are merely old houses with gable roofs, to which are attached three or four farms lying around them. The village, a large village, almost a market town, was a few hundred yards away, closely circling the church, a red brick church, black with age. Well, every Thursday Mother Clochette came between half-past six and seven in the morning, and went immediately into the linen room and began to work. She was a tall, thin, bearded, or rather hairy woman, for she had a beard all over her face, a surprising, an unexpected beard, growing in improbable tufts. In curly bunches which looked as if they had been sewn by a madman over that great face of a gendarme in petticoats. She had them on her nose, under her nose, round her nose, on her chin, on her cheeks. And her eyebrows, which were extraordinarily thick and long, and quite grey, bushy and bristling, looked exactly like a pair of mustaches stuck on there by mistake. She limped, not as lame people generally do, but like a ship at anchor. When she planted her great, bony, swerving body on her sound leg, she seemed to be preparing to mount some enormous wave and then suddenly she dipped as if to disappear in an abyss, and buried herself in the ground. Her walk reminded one of a storm, as she swayed about, and her head, which was always covered with an enormous white cap, whose ribbons fluttered down her back, seemed to traverse the horizon from north to south and from south to north. At each step. I adored Mother Clochette. As soon as I was up I went into the linen room where I found her installed at work, with a foot warmer under her feet. As soon as I arrived, she made me take the foot warmer and sit upon it, so that I might not catch cold in that large, chilly room under the roof. That draws the blood from your throat, she said to me. She told me stories, whilst mending the linen with her long crooked nimble fingers, her eyes behind her magnifying spectacles, for age had impaired her sight, appeared enormous to me, strangely profound, double. She had, as far as I can remember the things which she told me and by which my childish heart was moved, the large heart of a poor woman. She told me what had happened in the village, how a cow had escaped from the cowhouse and had been found the next morning in front of Prosper Mallet's windmill, looking at the sails turning. Or about a hen's egg which had been found in the church belfry without any one being able to understand what creature had been there to lay it, or the story of Jean Jean Pila's dog who had been ten leagues to bring back his master's breeches which a tramp had stolen whilst they were hanging up to dry out of doors, after he had been in the rain. She told me these simple adventures in such a manner, that in my mind they assumed the proportions of never-to-be-forgotten dramas, of grand and mysterious poems. And the ingenious stories invented by the poets which my mother told me in the evening, had none of the flavor, none of the breadth or vigor of the peasant woman's narratives. Well, one Tuesday, when I had spent all the morning in listening to Mother Clochette, I wanted to go upstairs to her again during the day after picking hazelnuts with the manservant in the wood behind the farm. I remember it all as clearly as what happened only yesterday. On opening the door of the linen room, I saw the old seamstress lying on the ground by the side of her chair, with her face to the ground and her arms stretched out, but still holding her needle in one hand and one of my shirts in the other. One of her legs in a blue stocking, the longer one, no doubt, was extended under her chair, and her spectacles glistened against the wall, as they had rolled away from her. I ran away uttering shrill cries. They all came running, and in a few minutes I was told that Mother Clochette was dead. I cannot describe the profound, poignant, terrible emotion which stirred my childish heart. I went slowly down into the drawing-room and hid myself in a dark corner, in the depths of an immense old armchair, where I knelt down and wept. I remained there a long time, no doubt, for night came on. Suddenly somebody came in with a lamp, without seeing me, however, and I heard my father and mother talking with the medical man, whose voice I recognized. He had been sent for immediately, and he was explaining the causes of the accident, of which I understood nothing, however. 
Then he sat down and had a glass of liqueur and a biscuit. He went on talking, and what he then said will remain engraved on my mind until I die. I think that I can give the exact words which he used. Ah, said he, the poor woman. She broke her leg the day of my arrival here, and I had not even had time to wash my hands after getting off the diligence before I was sent for in all haste, for it was a bad case, very bad. She was seventeen, and a pretty girl, very pretty. Would anyone believe it? I have never told her story before, and nobody except myself and one other person who is no longer living in this part of the country ever knew it. Now that she is dead, I may be less discreet. Just then a young assistant teacher came to live in the village, he was a handsome, well-made fellow, and looked like a non-commissioned officer. All the girls ran after him, but he paid no attention to them, partly because he was very much afraid of his superior, the schoolmaster, Old Grabu, who occasionally got out of bed the wrong foot first. Old Grabu already employed pretty Hortense who has just died here, and who was afterwards nicknamed Clochette. The assistant master singled out the pretty young girl, who was, no doubt, flattered at being chosen by this impregnable conqueror. At any rate, she fell in love with him, and he succeeded in persuading her to give him a first meeting in the hayloft behind the school, at night, after she had done her day's sewing. She pretended to go home, but instead of going downstairs when she left the grabus she went upstairs and hid among the hay, to wait for her lover. He soon joined her, and was beginning to say pretty things to her, when the door of the hayloft opened and the schoolmaster appeared, and asked, What are you doing up there, Sigisbert? Feeling sure that he would be caught, the young schoolmaster lost his presence of mind and replied stupidly, I came up here to rest a little amongst the bundles of hay, Monsieur Grabu. The loft was very large and absolutely dark, and Sigisbert pushed the frightened girl to the further end and said, Go over there and hide yourself. I shall lose my position, so get away and hide yourself. When the schoolmaster heard the whispering, he continued, Why, you are not by yourself? Yes, I am, Monsieur Grabu. But you are not, for you are talking. I swear I am, Monsieur Grabu. I will soon find out, the old man replied, and double locking the door, he went down to get a light. Then the young man, who was a coward such as one frequently meets, lost his head, and becoming furious all of a sudden, he repeated, Hide yourself, so that he may not find you. You will keep me from making a living for the rest of my life. You will ruin my whole career. Do hide yourself. They could hear the key turning in the lock again, and Hortense ran to the window which looked out on the street, opened it quickly, and then said in a low and determined voice, You will come and pick me up when he is gone, and she jumped out. Old Grabu found nobody and went down again in great surprise, and a quarter of an hour later, Monsieur Sigisbert came to me and related his adventure. The girl had remained at the foot of the wall unable to get up, as she had fallen from the second story, and I went with him to fetch her. It was raining in torrents, and I brought the unfortunate girl home with me, for the right leg was broken in three places, and the bones had come trough the flesh. She did not complain, and merely said, with admirable resignation, I am punished, well punished. I sent for assistance and for the work girl's relatives and told them a made up story of a runaway carriage which had knocked her down and lamed her outside my door. They believed me, and the gendarmes for a whole month tried in vain to find the author of this accident. That is all. And I say that this woman was a heroine and belonged to the race of those who accomplished the grandest deeds of history. That was her only love affair, and she died a virgin. She was a martyr, a noble soul, a sublimely devoted woman. And if I did not absolutely admire her, I should not have told you this story, which I would never tell anyone during her life. You understand why? The doctor ceased. Mama cried and Papa said some words which I did not catch. Then they left the room and I remained on my knees in the armchair and sobbed whilst I heard a strange noise of heavy footsteps and something knocking against the side of the staircase. They were carrying away Clochette's body. The kiss. My little darling, so you are crying from morning until night and from night until morning, because your husband leaves you, you do not know what to do and so you ask your old aunt for advice, you must consider her quite an expert. 
I don't know as much as you think I do, and yet I am not entirely ignorant of the art of loving, or, rather, of making one's self loved, in which you are a little lacking. I can admit that at my age. You say that you are all attention, love, kisses and caresses for him. Perhaps that is the very trouble, I think you kiss him too much. My dear, we have in our hands the most terrible power in the world, love. Man is gifted with physical strength, and he exercises force. Woman is gifted with charm, and she rules with caresses. It is our weapon, formidable and invincible, but we should know how to use it. Know well that we are the mistresses of the world. To tell the history of love from the beginning of the world would be to tell the history of man himself, everything springs from it, the arts, great events, customs, wars, the overthrow of empires. In the Bible you find Delilah, Judith. In fables we find Omphile, Helen, in history the Sabines, Cleopatra, and many others. Therefore we reign supreme, all-powerful. But, like kings, we must make use of delicate diplomacy. Love, my dear, is made up of imperceptible sensations. We know that it is as strong as death, but also as frail as glass. The slightest shock breaks it, and our power crumbles, and we are never able to raise it again. We have the power of making ourselves adored, but we lack one tiny thing, the understanding of the various kinds of caresses. In embraces we lose the sentiment of delicacy, while the man over whom we rule remains master of himself, capable of judging the foolishness of certain words. Take care, my dear, that is the defect in our armor. It is our Achilles' heel. Do you know whence comes our real power? From the kiss, the kiss alone. When we know how to hold out and give up our lips we can become queens. The kiss is only a preface, however, but a charming preface. More charming than the realization itself. A preface which can always be read over again, whereas one cannot always read over the book. Yes, the meeting of lips is the most perfect, the most divine sensation given to human beings, the supreme limit of happiness, it is in the kiss alone that one sometimes seems to feel this union of souls after which we strive. The intermingling of hearts, as it were. Do you remember the verses of Sully Prudhomme? Caresses are nothing but anxious bliss. Vain attempts of love to unite souls through a kiss. One caress alone gives this deep sensation of two beings welded into one, it is the kiss. No violent delirium of complete possession is worth this trembling approach of the lips, this first moist and fresh contact, and then the long, lingering, motionless rapture. Therefore, my dear, the kiss is our strongest weapon, but we must take care not to dull it. Do not forget that its value is only relative, purely conventional. It continually changes according to circumstances, the state of expectancy and the ecstasy of the mind. I will call attention to one example. Another poet, Francois Capi, has written a line which we all remember, a line which we find delightful, which moves our very hearts. After describing the expectancy of a lover, waiting in a room one winter's evening, his anxiety, his nervous impatience, the terrible fear of not seeing her, he describes the arrival of the beloved woman, who at last enters hurriedly, out of breath, bringing with her part of the winter breeze, and he exclaims, Oh! The taste of the kisses first snatched through the veil. Is that not a line of exquisite sentiment, a delicate and charming observation, a perfect truth? All those who have hastened to a clandestine meeting, whom passion has thrown into the arms of a man, well do they know these first delicious kisses through the veil, and they tremble at the memory of them. And yet their sole charm lies in the circumstances, from being late, from the anxious expectancy, but from the purely, or, rather, impurely, if you prefer, sensual point of view, they are detestable. Think. Outside it is cold. The young woman has walked quickly, the veil is moist from her cold breath. Little drops of water shine in the lace. The lover seizes her and presses his burning lips to her liquid breath. The moist veil, which discolors and carries the dreadful odor of chemical dye, penetrates into the young man's mouth, moistens his mustache. He does not taste the lips of his beloved, he tastes the dye of this lace moistened with cold breath. And yet, like the poet, we would all exclaim. Oh! 
the taste of the kisses first snatched through the veil. Therefore, the value of this caress being entirely a matter of convention, we must be careful not to abuse it. Well, my dear, I have several times noticed that you are very clumsy. However, you were not alone in that fault, the majority of women lose their authority by abusing the kiss with untimely kisses. When they feel that their husband or their lover is a little tired, at those times when the heart as well as the body needs rest, instead of understanding what is going on within him, they persist in giving inopportune caresses. Tire him by the obstinacy of begging lips and give caresses lavished with neither rhyme nor reason. Trust in the advice of my experience. First, never kiss your husband in public, in the train, at the restaurant. It is bad taste, do not give in to your desires. He would feel ridiculous and would never forgive you. Beware of useless kisses lavished in intimacy. I am sure that you abuse them. For instance, I remember one day that you did something quite shocking. Probably you do not remember it. All three of us were together in the drawing room, and, as you did not stand on ceremony before me, your husband was holding you on his knees and kissing you at great length on the neck, the lips and throat. Suddenly you exclaimed, Oh! The fire! You had been paying no attention to it, and it was almost out. A few lingering embers were glowing on the hearth. Then he rose, ran to the woodbox, from which he dragged two enormous logs with great difficulty, when you came to him with begging lips, murmuring. Kiss me. He turned his head with difficulty and tried to hold up the logs at the same time. Then you gently and slowly placed your mouth on that of the poor fellow, who remained with his neck out of joint, his sides twisted, his arms almost dropping off, trembling with fatigue and tired from his desperate effort. And you kept drawing out this torturing kiss, without seeing or understanding. Then when you freed him, you began to grumble, how badly you kiss. No wonder. Oh, take care of that. We all have this foolish habit, this unconscious need of choosing the most inconvenient moments. When he is carrying a glass of water, when he is putting on his shoes, when he is tying his scarf, in short. When he finds himself in any uncomfortable position, then is the time which we choose for a caress which makes him stop for a whole minute in the middle of a gesture with the sole desire of getting rid of us. Do not think that this criticism is insignificant. Love, my dear, is a delicate thing. The least little thing offends it, know that everything depends on the tact of our caresses. An ill-placed kiss may do any amount of harm. Try following my advice. Your old aunt. Colette. This story appeared in the Galois in November, 1882, under the pseudonym of Maufrenews. The Legion of Honor. How he got the Legion of Honor. From the time some people begin to talk they seem to have an overmastering desire or vocation. Ever since he was a child, M. Kaylord had only had one idea in his head, to wear the ribbon of an order. When he was still quite a small boy he used to wear a zinc cross of the Legion of Honor pinned on his tunic, just as other children wear a soldier's cap, and he took his mother's hand in the street with a proud air. Sticking out his little chest with its red ribbon and metal star so that it might show to advantage. His studies were not a success, and he failed in his examination for Bachelor of Arts, so, not knowing what to do, he married a pretty girl, as he had plenty of money of his own. They lived in Paris, as many rich middle class people do, mixing with their own particular set, and proud of knowing a deputy, who might perhaps be a minister some day, and counting two heads of departments among their friends. But M. Kaylord could not get rid of his one absorbing idea, and he felt constantly unhappy because he had not the right to wear a little bit of colored ribbon in his buttonhole. When he met any men who were decorated on the boulevards, he looked at them askance, with intense jealousy. Sometimes, when he had nothing to do in the afternoon, he would count them and say to himself, just let me see how many I shall meet between the Madeline and the Rue Drouet. Then he would walk slowly, looking at every coat with a practiced eye for the little bit of red ribbon, and when he had got to the end of his walk he always repeated the numbers aloud. Eight officers and seventeen knights. As many as that. It is stupid to sew the cross broadcast in that fashion. 
I wonder how many I shall meet going back. And he returned slowly, unhappy when the crowd of passers-by interfered with his vision. He knew the places where most were to be found. They swarmed in the Palais Royal. Fewer were seen in the Avenue de l'Opera than in the Rue de la Paix, while the right side of the boulevard was more frequented by them than the left. They also seemed to prefer certain cafés and theatres. Whenever he saw a group of white-haired old gentlemen standing together in the middle of the pavement, interfering with the traffic, he used to say to himself, They are officers of the Legion of Honor. And he felt inclined to take off his hat to them. He had often remarked that the officers had a different bearing to the mere knights. They carried their head differently, and one felt that they enjoyed a higher official consideration and a more widely extended importance. Sometimes, however, the worthy man would be seized with a furious hatred for everyone who was decorated, he felt like a socialist toward them. Then, when he got home, excited at meeting so many crosses, just as a poor, hungry wretch might be on passing some dainty provision shop, he used to ask in a loud voice, When shall we get rid of this wretched government? And his wife would be surprised, and ask, What is the matter with you today? I am indignant, he replied, at the injustice I see going on around us. Oh, the communards were certainly right. After dinner he would go out again and look at the shops where the decorations were sold, and he examined all the emblems of various shapes and colors. He would have liked to possess them all, and to have walked gravely at the head of a procession, with his crush hat under his arm and his breast covered with decorations, radiant as a star, amid a buzz of admiring whispers and a hum of respect. But, alas! He had no right to wear any decoration whatever. He used to say to himself, it is really too difficult for any man to obtain the Legion of Honor unless he is some public functionary. Suppose I try to be appointed an officer of the academy. But he did not know how to set about it, and spoke on the subject to his wife, who was stupefied. Officer of the academy. What have you done to deserve it? He got angry. I know what I am talking about. I only want to know how to set about it. You are quite stupid at times. She smiled. You are quite right. I don't understand anything about it. An idea struck him, suppose you were to speak to M. Rosalyn, the deputy, he might be able to advise me. You understand I cannot broach the subject to him directly. It is rather difficult and delicate, but coming from you it might seem quite natural. Madame Kaylord did what he asked her, and M. Rosalind promised to speak to the minister about it, and then Kaylord began to worry him, till the deputy told him he must make a formal application and put forward his claims. What were his charms, he said. He was not even a Bachelor of Arts. However, he set to work and produced a pamphlet, with the title, The People's Right to Instruction, but he could not finish it for want of ideas. He sought for easier subjects, and began several in succession. The first was, the instruction of children by means of the eye. He wanted gratuitous theatres to be established in every poor quarter of Paris for little children. Their parents were to take them there when they were quite young, and, by means of a magic lantern, all the notions of human knowledge were to be imparted to them. There were to be regular courses. The sight would educate the mind, while the pictures would remain impressed on the brain, and thus science would, so to say, be made visible. What could be more simple than to teach universal history, natural history, geography, botany, zoology, anatomy, etc., etc., in this manner? He had his ideas printed in pamphlets, and sent a copy to each deputy, ten to each minister, fifty to the president of the republic, ten to each Parisian, and five to each provincial newspaper. Then he wrote on street lending libraries. His idea was to have little pushcarts full of books drawn about the streets. Everyone would have a right to ten volumes a month in his home on payment of one so. The people, M. Kaylord said, will only disturb itself for the sake of its pleasures, and since it will not go to instruction, instruction must come to it, etc., etc. His essays attracted no attention, but he sent in his application, and he got the usual formal official reply. He thought himself sure of success, but nothing came of it. 
Then he made up his mind to apply personally. He begged for an interview with the Minister of Public Instruction, and he was received by a young subordinate, who was very grave and important, and kept touching the knobs of electric bells to summon ushers and footmen and officials inferior to himself. He declared to M. Kaylord that his matter was going on quite favorably, and advised him to continue his remarkable labors, and M. Kaylord said at it again. M. Rosalyn, the deputy, seemed now to take a great interest in his success, and gave him a lot of excellent, practical advice. He, himself, was decorated, although nobody knew exactly what he had done to deserve such a distinction. He told Kaylord what new studies he ought to undertake, he introduced him to learned societies which took up particularly obscure points of science, in the hope of gaining credit and honors thereby. And he even took him under his wing at the ministry. One day, when he came to lunch with his friend, for several months past he had constantly taken his meals there, he said to him in a whisper as he shook hands, I have just obtained a great favor for you. The Committee of Historical Works is going to entrust you with a commission. There are some researches to be made in various libraries in France. Kaylord was so delighted that he could scarcely eat or drink, and a week later he set out. He went from town to town, studying catalogues, rummaging in lofts full of dusty volumes, and was hated by all the librarians. One day, happening to be at Rouen, he thought he should like to go and visit his wife, whom he had not seen for more than a week so he took the nine o'clock train, which would land him at home by twelve at night. He had his latchkey, so he went in without making any noise, delighted at the idea of the surprise he was going to give her. She had locked herself in. How tiresome! However, he cried out through the door. Jean, it is I. She must have been very frightened, for he heard her jump out of her bed and speak to herself, as if she were in a dream. Then she went to her dressing room, opened and closed the door, and went quickly up and down her room barefoot two or three times, shaking the furniture till the vases and glasses sounded. Then at last she asked, Is it you, Alexander? Yes, yes, he replied, make haste and open the door. As soon as she had done so, she threw herself into his arms, exclaiming, Oh, what a fright! What a surprise! What a pleasure! He began to undress himself methodically, as he did everything, and took from a chair his overcoat, which he was in the habit of hanging up in the hall. But suddenly he remained motionless, struck dumb with astonishment, there was a red ribbon in the buttonhole. Why, he stammered, this, this, this overcoat has got the ribbon in it. In a second, his wife threw herself on him, and, taking it from his hands, she said, No. You have made a mistake, give it to me. But he still held it by one of the sleeves, without letting it go, repeating in a half-dazed manner. Oh. Why? Just explain, whose overcoat is it? It is not mine, as it has the Legion of Honor on it. She tried to take it from him, terrified and hardly able to say. Listen, listen. Give it to me. I must not tell you. It is a secret. Listen to me. But he grew angry and turned pale. I want to know how this overcoat comes to be here? It does not belong to me. Then she almost screamed at him. Yes, it does, listen. Swear to me, well, you are decorated. She did not intend to joke at his expense. He was so overcome that he let the overcoat fall and dropped into an armchair. I am, you say I am, decorated? Yes, but it is a secret, a great secret. She had put the glorious garment into a cupboard, and came to her husband pale and trembling. Yes, she continued, it is a new overcoat that I have had made for you. But I swore that I would not tell you anything about it, as it will not be officially announced for a month or six weeks, and you were not to have known till your return from your business journey. M. Rosalyn managed it for you. Rosalyn. He contrived to utter in his joy. He has obtained the decoration for me? He, oh. And he was obliged to drink a glass of water. A little piece of white paper fell to the floor out of the pocket of the overcoat. Kaylord picked it up. 
It was a visiting card, and he read out. Rosalyn deputy. You see how it is, said his wife. He almost cried with joy, and, a week later, it was announced in the journal Officiel that M. Kaylord had been awarded the Legion of Honor on account of his exceptional services. The Test The Bondells were a happy family, and although they frequently quarreled about trifles, they soon became friends again. Bondell was a merchant who had retired from active business after saving enough to allow him to live quietly. He had rented a little house at St. Germain and lived there with his wife. He was a quiet man with very decided opinions. He had a certain degree of education and read serious newspapers, nevertheless, he appreciated the Galois wit. Endowed with a logical mind, and that practical common sense which is the master quality of the industrial French bourgeois, he thought little, but clearly, and reached a decision only after careful consideration of the matter in hand. He was of medium size, with a distinguished look, and was beginning to turn gray. His wife, who was full of serious qualities, had also several faults. She had a quick temper and a frankness that bordered upon violence. She bore a grudge a long time. She had once been pretty, but had now become too stout and too red, but in her neighborhood at St. Germain she still passed for a very beautiful woman, who exemplified health and an uncertain temper. Their dissensions almost always began at breakfast, over some trivial matter, and they often continued all day and even until the following day. Their simple, common, limited life imparted seriousness to the most unimportant matters, and every topic of conversation became a subject of dispute. This had not been so in the days when business occupied their minds, drew their hearts together, and gave them common interests and occupation. But at St. Germain they saw fewer people. It had been necessary to make new acquaintances, to create for themselves a new world among strangers, a new existence devoid of occupations. Then the monotony of loneliness had soured each of them a little. And the quiet happiness which they had hoped and waited for with the coming of riches did not appear. One June morning, just as they were sitting down to breakfast, Bondell asked. Do you know the people who live in the little red cottage at the end of the Rue du Berceau? Madame Bondel was out of sorts. She answered. Yes and no. I am acquainted with them, but I do not care to know them. Why not? They seem to be very nice. Because? This morning I met the husband on the terrace and we took a little walk together. Seeing that there was danger in the air, Bendel added, it was he who spoke to me first. His wife looked at him in a displeased manner. She continued, you would have done just as well to avoid him. Why? Because there are rumors about them. What kind? Oh. Rumors such as one often hears. M. Bondell was, unfortunately, a little hasty. He exclaimed. My dear, you know that I abhor gossip. As for those people, I find them very pleasant. She asked testily, the wife also? Why, yes. Although I have barely seen her. The discussion gradually grew more heated, always on the same subject for lack of others. Madame Bondel obstinately refused to say what she had heard about these neighbors, allowing things to be understood without saying exactly what they were. Bendel would shrug his shoulders, grin, and exasperate his wife. She finally cried out, Well, that gentleman is deceived by his wife, there. The husband answered quietly, I can't see how that affects the honor of a man. She seemed dumbfounded, what? You don't see, you don't see, well, that's too much. You don't see. Why, it's a public scandal. He is disgraced. He answered, ah. By no means. Should a man be considered disgraced because he is deceived, because he is betrayed, robbed? No, indeed. I'll grant you that that may be the case for the wife, but as for him. She became furious, exclaiming, for him as well as for her. They are both in disgrace, it's a public shame. Bondell, very calm, asked, first of all, is it true? Who can assert such a thing as long as no one has been caught in the act? Madame Bondell was growing uneasy, she snapped, what? Who can assert it? 
Why, everybody. Everybody. It's as clear as the nose on your face. Everybody knows it and is talking about it. There is not the slightest doubt. He was grinning, for a long time people thought that the sun revolved around the earth. This man loves his wife and speaks of her tenderly and reverently. This whole business is nothing but lies. Stamping her foot, she stammered, Do you think that that fool, that idiot, knows anything about it? Bondell did not grow angry, he was reasoning clearly, Excuse me. This gentleman is no fool. He seemed to me, on the contrary, to be very intelligent and shrewd. And you can't make me believe that a man with brains doesn't notice such a thing in his own house, when the neighbors, who are not there, are ignorant of no detail of this liaison, for I'll warrant that they know everything. Madame Bondel had a fit of angry mirth, which irritated her husband's nerves. She laughed, ha! 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 They're all the same. There's not a man alive who could discover a thing like that unless his nose was stuck into it. The discussion was wandering to other topics now. She was exclaiming over the blindness of deceived husbands, a thing which he doubted and which she affirmed with such airs of personal contempt that he finally grew angry. Then the discussion became an angry quarrel, where she took the side of the women and he defended the men. He had the conceit to declare, well, I swear that if I had ever been deceived, I should have noticed it, and immediately, too. And I should have taken away your desire for such things in such a manner that it would have taken more than one doctor to set you on foot again. Boiling with anger, she cried out to him, You! You! Why, you're as big a fool as the others, do you hear? He still maintained, I can swear to you that I am not. She laughed so impertinently that he felt his heart beat and a chill run down his back. For the third time he said, I should have seen it. She rose, still laughing in the same manner. She slammed the door and left the room, saying, Well, if that isn't too much. Bondell remained alone, ill at ease. That insolent, provoking laugh had touched him to the quick. He went outside, walked, dreamed. The realization of the loneliness of his new life made him sad and morbid. The neighbor, whom he had met that morning, came to him with outstretched hands. They continued their walk together. After touching on various subjects, they came to talk of their wives. Both seemed to have something to confide, something inexpressible, vague, about these beings associated with their lives, their wives. The neighbor was saying, Really, at times, one might think that they bear some particular ill will toward their husband, just because he is a husband. I love my wife, I love her very much, I appreciate and respect her, well. There are times when she seems to have more confidence and faith in our friends than in me. Bondell immediately thought, there is no doubt, my wife was right. When he left this man he began to think things over again. He felt in his soul a strange confusion of contradictory ideas, a sort of interior burning, that mocking, impertinent laugh kept ringing in his ears and seemed to say, why, you are just the same as the others, you fool. That was indeed bravado, one of those pieces of impudence of which a woman makes use when she dares everything, risks everything, to wound and humiliate the man who has aroused her ire. This poor man must also be one of those deceived husbands, like so many others. He had said sadly, there are times when she seems to have more confidence and faith in our friends than in me. That is how a husband formulated his observations on the particular attentions of his wife for another man. That was all. He had seen nothing more. He was like the rest, all the rest. And how strangely Bondel's own wife had laughed as she said, you, too, you, too. How wild and imprudent these creatures are who can arouse such suspicions in the heart for the sole purpose of revenge. He ran over their whole life since their marriage, reviewed his mental list of their acquaintances, to see whether she had ever appeared to show more confidence in anyone else than in himself. He never had suspected anyone, he was so calm, so sure of her, so confident. But, now he thought of it, she had had a friend, an intimate friend, who for almost a year had dined with them three times a week. 
Tancred, good old Tancred, whom he, Bendel, loved as a brother and whom he continued to see on the sly, since his wife, he did not know why, had grown angry at the charming fellow. He stopped to think, looking over the past with anxious eyes. Then he grew angry at himself for harboring this shameful insinuation of the defiant, jealous, bad ego which lives in all of us. He blamed and accused himself when he remembered the visits and the demeanor of this friend whom his wife had dismissed for no apparent reason. But, suddenly, other memories returned to him, similar ruptures due to the vindictive character of Madame Bondel, who never pardoned a slight. Then he laughed frankly at himself for the doubts which he had nursed. And he remembered the angry looks of his wife as he would tell her, when he returned at night, I saw good old Tancred, and he wished to be remembered to you, and he reassured himself. She would invariably answer, When you see that gentleman you can tell him that I can very well dispense with his remembrances. With what an irritated, angry look she would say these words. How well one could feel that she did not and would not forgive, and he had suspected her even for a second. Such foolishness. But why did she grow so angry? She never had given the exact reason for this quarrel. She still bore him that grudge. Was it, but no, no, and Bondel declared that he was lowering himself by even thinking of such things. Yes, he was undoubtedly lowering himself, but he could not help thinking of it, and he asked himself with terror if this thought which had entered into his mind had not come to stop, if he did not carry in his heart the seed of fearful torment. He knew himself, he was a man to think over his doubts, as formerly he would ruminate over his commercial operations, for days and nights, endlessly weighing the pros and the cons. He was already becoming excited. He was walking fast and losing his calmness. A thought cannot be downed. It is intangible, cannot be caught, cannot be killed. Suddenly a plan occurred to him, it was bold, so bold that at first he doubted whether he would carry it out. Each time that he met Tancred, his friend would ask for news of Madame Bondel, and Bondel would answer, she is still a little angry. Nothing more. Good Lord! What a fool he had been! Perhaps. Well, he would take the train to Paris, go to Tancred, and bring him back with him that very evening, assuring him that his wife's mysterious anger had disappeared. But how would Madame Bondel act? What a scene there would be! What anger! What scandal! What of it, that would be revenge! When she should come face to face with him, unexpectedly, he certainly ought to be able to read the truth in their expressions. He immediately went to the station, bought his ticket, got into the car, and as soon as he felt himself being carried away by the train, he felt a fear, a kind of dizziness, at what he was going to do. In order not to weaken, back down, and return alone, he tried not to think of the matter any longer, to bring his mind to bear on other affairs, to do what he had decided to do with a blind resolution. And he began to hum tunes from operettas and music halls until he reached Paris. As soon as he found himself walking along the streets that led to Tancred's, he felt like stopping, he paused in front of several shops, noticed the prices of certain objects, was interested in new things, felt like taking a glass of beer. Which was not his usual custom. And as he approached his friend's dwelling he ardently hoped not meet him. But Tancred was at home, alone, reading. He jumped up in surprise, crying, Ah! Bondel! What luck! Bondel, embarrassed, answered, Yes, my dear fellow, I happen to be in Paris, and I thought I'd drop in and shake hands with you. That's very nice, very nice. The more so that for some time you have not favored me with your presence very often. Well, you see, even against one's will, one is often influenced by surrounding conditions, and as my wife seemed to bear you some ill will. Jove, seemed, she did better than that, since she showed me the door. What was the reason? I never heard it. Oh. Nothing at all, a bit of foolishness, a discussion in which we did not both agree. But what was the subject of this discussion? A lady of my acquaintance, whom you may perhaps know by name, Madame Bouton. Ah. Really? Well, I think that my wife has forgotten her grudge, for this very morning she spoke to me of you in very pleasant terms. 
Tancred started and seemed so dumbfounded that for a few minutes he could find nothing to say. Then he asked, she spoke of me, in pleasant terms? Yes. You are sure? Of course I am. I am not dreaming. And then? And then, as I was coming to Paris I thought that I would please you by coming to tell you the good news. Why, yes, why, yes. Bondel appeared to hesitate, then, after a short pause, he added, I even had an idea. What is it? To take you back home with me to dinner. Tancred, who was naturally prudent, seemed a little worried by this proposition, and he asked, Oh. Really, is it possible? Are we not exposing ourselves to, to, be a scene? No, no, indeed. Because, you know, Madame Bendel bears malice for a long time. Yes, but I can assure you that she no longer bears you any ill will. I am even convinced that it will be a great pleasure for her to see you thus, unexpectedly. Really? Yes, really. Well, then. Let us go along. I am delighted. You see, this misunderstanding was very unpleasant for me. They set out together toward the St. Lazare station, arm in arm. They made the trip in silence. Both seemed absorbed in deep meditation. Seated in the car, one opposite the other, they looked at each other without speaking, each observing that the other was pale. Then they left the train and once more linked arms as if to unite against some common danger. After a walk of a few minutes they stopped, a little out of breath, before Bondel's house. Bondel ushered his friend into the parlor, called the servant, and asked, Is Madame at home? Yes, Monsieur. Please ask her to come down at once. They dropped into two armchairs and waited. Both were filled with the same longing to escape before the appearance of the much-feared person. A well-known, heavy tread could be heard descending the stairs. A hand moved the knob, and both men watched the brass handle turn. Then the door opened wide, and Madame Bondel stopped and looked to see who was there before she entered. She looked, blushed, trembled, retreated a step, then stood motionless, her cheeks aflame and her hands resting against the sides of the doorframe. Tancred, as pale as if about to faint, had arisen, letting fall his hat, which rolled along the floor. He stammered out, Mon Dieu, Madame, it is I, I thought, I ventured, I was so sorry. As she did not answer, he continued, Will you forgive me? Then, quickly, carried away by some impulse, she walked toward him with her hands outstretched, and when he had taken, pressed, and held these two hands, she said, in a trembling, weak little voice, which was new to her husband. Ah! My dear friend, how happy I am! And Bondel, who was watching them, felt an icy chill run over him, as if he had been dipped in a cold bath. Found on a drowned man. Madam, you ask me whether I am laughing at you? You cannot believe that a man has never been in love. Well, then, no, no, I have never loved, never. Why is this? I really cannot tell. I have never experienced that intoxication of the heart which we call love. Never have I lived in that dream, in that exaltation, in that state of madness into which the image of a woman casts us. I have never been pursued, haunted, roused to fever heat, lifted up to paradise by the thought of meeting, or by the possession of, a being who had suddenly become for me more desirable than any good fortune, more beautiful than any other creature. Of more consequence than the whole world. I have never wept, I have never suffered on account of any of you. I have not passed my nights sleepless, while thinking of her. I have no experience of waking thoughts bright with thought and memories of her. I have never known the wild rapture of hope before her arrival, or the divine sadness of regret when she went from me, leaving behind her a delicate odor of violet powder. I have never been in love. I have also often asked myself why this is. And truly, I can scarcely tell. Nevertheless, I have found some reasons for it but they are of a metaphysical character, and perhaps you will not be able to appreciate them. I suppose I am too critical of women to submit to their fascination. I ask you to forgive me for this remark. I will explain what I mean. In every creature there is a moral being and a physical being. In order to love, 
it would be necessary for me to find a harmony between these two beings which I have never found. One always predominates, sometimes the moral, sometimes the physical. The intellect which we have a right to require in a woman, in order to love her, is not the same as the virile intellect. It is more, and it is less. A woman must be frank, delicate, sensitive, refined, impressionable. She has no need of either power or initiative in thought, but she must have kindness, elegance, tenderness, coquetry, and that faculty of assimilation which, in a little while, raises her to an equality with him who shares her life. Her greatest quality must be tact, that subtle sense which is to the mind what touch is to the body. It reveals to her a thousand little things, contours, angles and forms on the plane of the intellectual. Very frequently, pretty women have not intellect to correspond with their personal charms. Now, the slightest lack of harmony strikes me and pains me at the first glance. In friendship this is not of importance. Friendship is a compact in which one fairly shares defects and merits. We may judge of friends, whether man or woman, giving them credit for what is good, and overlooking what is bad in them, appreciating them at their just value, while giving ourselves up to an intimate, intense, and charming sympathy. In order to love, one must be blind, surrender one's self absolutely, see nothing, question nothing, understand nothing. One must adore the weakness as well as the beauty of the beloved object, renounce all judgment, all reflection, all perspicacity. I am incapable of such blindness and rebel at unreasoning subjugation. This is not all. I have such a high and subtle idea of harmony that nothing can ever fulfill my ideal. But you will call me a madman. Listen to me. A woman, in my opinion, may have an exquisite soul and charming body without that body and that soul being in perfect harmony with one another. I mean that persons who have noses made in a certain shape should not be expected to think in a certain fashion. The fat have no right to make use of the same words and phrases as the thin. You, who have blue eyes, madam, cannot look at life and judge of things and events as if you had black eyes. The shade of your eyes should correspond, by a sort of fatality, with the shade of your thought. In perceiving these things, I have the scent of a bloodhound. Laugh if you like, but it is so. And yet, once I imagined that I was in love for an hour, for a day. I had foolishly yielded to the influence of surrounding circumstances. I allowed myself to be beguiled by a mirage of dawn. Would you like me to tell you this short story? I met, one evening, a pretty, enthusiastic little woman who took a poetic fancy to spend a night with me in a boat on a river. I would have preferred a room and a bed, however, I consented to the river and the boat. It was in the month of June. My fair companion chose a moonlight night in order the better to stimulate her imagination. We had dined at a riverside inn and set out in the boat about ten o'clock. I thought it a rather foolish kind of adventure, but as my companion pleased me I did not worry about it. I sat down on the seat facing her. I seized the oars, and off we starred. I could not deny that the scene was picturesque. We glided past a wooded isle full of nightingales, and the current carried us rapidly over the river covered with silvery ripples. The tree toads uttered their shrill, monotonous cry. The frogs croaked in the grass by the river's bank, and the lapping of the water as it flowed on made around us a kind of confused murmur almost imperceptible, disquieting, and gave us a vague sensation of mysterious fear. The sweet charm of warm nights and of streams glittering in the moonlight penetrated us. It was delightful to be alive and to float along thus, and to dream and to feel at one's side a sympathetic and beautiful young woman. I was somewhat affected, somewhat agitated, somewhat intoxicated by the pale brightness of the night and the consciousness of my proximity to a lovely woman. Come and sit beside me, she said. I obeyed. She went on. Recite some poetry for me. This appeared to be rather too much. I declined, she persisted. She certainly wanted to play the game, to have a whole orchestra of sentiment, from the moon to the rhymes of poets. In the end I had to yield, and, as if in mockery, I repeated to her a charming little poem by Louis Boulhay, of which the following are the last verses. I hate the poet who with tearful eye 
murmurs some name while gazing toward yes the star, who sees no magic in the earth or sky, and lest Lizette or Ninon be not far, the bard who in all nature nothing sees, divine, and less a petticoat he ties, amorously to the branches of the trees, or nightcap to the grass, is scarcely wise. He has not heard the eternal's thunder tone, the voice of nature in her various moods. Who cannot tread the dim ravines alone? And of no woman dream mid whispering woods. I expected some reproaches. Nothing of the sort. She murmured. How true it is. I was astonished. Had she understood? Our boat had gradually approached the bank and become entangled in the branches of a willow which impeded its progress. I placed my arm round my companion's waist, and very gently approached my lips towards her neck. But she repulsed me with an abrupt, angry movement. Have done, pray. How rude you are. I tried to draw her toward me. She resisted, caught hold of the tree, and was near flinging us both into the water. I deemed it prudent to cease my importunities. She said. I would rather capsize you. I feel so happy. I want to dream. This is so delightful. Then, in a slightly malicious tone, she added. Have you already forgotten the verses you repeated to me just now? She was right. I became silent. She went on. Come, now. And I plied the oars once more. I began to think the night long and my position ridiculous. My companion said to me. Will you make me a promise? Yes. What is it? To remain quiet, well-behaved and discreet, if I permit you. What? Say what you mean. Here is what I mean. I want to lie down on my back at the bottom of the boat with you by my side. But I forbid you to touch me, to embrace me, in short, to caress me. I promised. She said warningly. If you move, I'll capsize the boat. And then we lay down side by side, our eyes turned toward the sky, while the boat glided slowly through the water. We were rocked by its gentle motion. The slight sounds of the night came to us more distinctly in the bottom of the boat, sometimes causing us to start. And I felt springing up within me a strange, poignant emotion, an infinite tenderness, something like an irresistible impulse to open my arms in order to embrace, to open my heart in order to love, to give myself, to give my thoughts, my body, my life, my entire being to someone. My companion murmured, like one in a dream. Where are we, where are we going? It seems to me that I am leaving the earth. How sweet it is. Ah, if you loved me, a little. My heart began to throb. I had no answer to give. It seemed to me that I loved her. I had no longer any violent desire. I felt happy there by her side, and that was enough for me. And thus we remained for a long, long time without stirring. We had clasped each other's hands. Some delightful force rendered us motionless, an unknown force stronger than ourselves, an alliance, chaste, intimate, absolute, of our beings lying there side by side, belonging to each other without contact. What was this? How do I know? Love, perhaps? Little by little the dawn appeared. It was three o'clock in the morning. Slowly a great brightness spread over the sky. The boat knocked up against something. I rose up. We had come close to a tiny islet. But I remained enchanted, in an ecstasy. Before us stretched the firmament, red, pink, violet, spotted with fiery clouds resembling golden vapor. The river was glowing with purple and three houses on one side of it seemed to be burning. I bent toward my companion. I was going to say, oh. Look. But I held my tongue, quite dazed, and I could no longer see anything except her. She, too, was rosy, with rosy flesh tints with a deeper tinge that was partly a reflection of the hue of the sky. Her tresses were rosy, her eyes were rosy, her teeth were rosy, her dress, her laces, her smile, all were rosy. And in truth I believed, so overpowering was the illusion, 
that the dawn was there in the flesh before me. She rose softly to her feet, holding out her lips to me. And I moved toward her, trembling, delirious feeling indeed that I was going to kiss heaven, to kiss happiness, to kiss a dream that had become a woman, to kiss the ideal which had descended into human flesh. She said to me, you have a caterpillar in your hair. And, suddenly, I felt as sad as if I had lost all hope in life. That is all, madam. It is puerile, silly, stupid. But I am sure that since that day it would be impossible for me to love. And yet, who can tell? The young man upon whom this letter was found was yesterday taken out of the Seine between Bujival and Marley. An obliging bargeman, who had searched the pockets in order to ascertain the name of the deceased, brought this paper to the author. The Orphan Mademoiselle Source had adopted this boy under very sad circumstances. She was at the time thirty-six years old. Being disfigured through having as a child slipped off her nurse's lap into the fireplace and burned her face shockingly, she had determined not to marry, for she did not want any man to marry her for her money. A neighbor of hers, left a widow just before her child was born, died in giving birth, without leaving a sow. Mademoiselle Source took the newborn child, put him out to nurse, reared him, sent him to a boarding school, then brought him home in his fourteenth year, in order to have in her empty house somebody who would love her, who would look after her, and make her old age pleasant. She had a little country place four leagues from Rennes, and she now dispensed with a servant. Her expenses having increased to more than double since this orphan's arrival, her income of three thousand francs was no longer sufficient to support three persons. She attended to the housekeeping and cooking herself, and sent out the boy on errands, letting him also occupy himself in cultivating the garden. He was gentle, timid, silent, and affectionate. And she experienced a deep happiness, a fresh happiness when he kissed her without surprise or horror at her disfigurement. He called her aunt, and treated her as a mother. In the evening they both sat down at the fireside, and she made nice little dainties for him. She heated some wine and toasted a slice of bread, and it made a charming little meal before going to bed. She often took him on her knees and covered him with kisses, murmuring tender words in his ear. She called him, my little flower, my cherub, my adored angel, my divine jewel. He softly accepted her caresses, hiding his head on the old maid's shoulder. Although he was now nearly fifteen, he had remained small and weak, and had a rather sickly appearance. Sometimes Mademoiselle Source took him to the city, to see two married female relatives of hers, distant cousins, who were living in the suburbs, and who were the only members of her family in existence. The two women had always found fault with her, for having adopted this boy, on account of the inheritance. But for all that, they gave her a cordial welcome, having still hopes of getting a share for themselves, a third, no doubt, if what she possessed were only equally divided. She was happy, very happy, always occupied with her adopted child. She bought books for him to improve his mind, and he became passionately fond of reading. He no longer climbed on her knee to pet her as he had formerly done. But, instead, would go and sit down in his little chair in the chimney corner and open a volume. The lamp placed at the edge of the tittle table above his head shone on his curly hair and on a portion of his forehead. He did not move, he did not raise his eyes or make any gesture. He read on, interested, entirely absorbed in the story he was reading. Seated opposite to him, she would gaze at him earnestly, astonished at his studiousness, often on the point of bursting into tears. She said to him occasionally, You will fatigue yourself, my treasure. Hoping that he would raise his head and come across to embrace her, but he did not even answer her, he had not heard or understood what she was saying, he paid no attention to anything save what he read in those pages. For two years he devoured an incalculable number of volumes. His character changed. After this, he asked Mademoiselle Source several times for money, which she gave him. As he always wanted more, she ended by refusing, for she was both methodical and decided, and knew how to act rationally when it was necessary to do so. By dint of entreaties he obtained a large sum from her one night. But when he begged her for more a few days later, she showed herself inflexible and did not give way to him further, 
in fact. He appeared to be satisfied with her decision. He again became quiet, as he had formerly been, remaining seated for entire hours, without moving, plunged in deep reverie. He now did not even talk to Madame Source, merely answering her remarks with short, formal words. Nevertheless, he was agreeable and attentive in his manner toward her, but he never embraced her now. She had by this time grown slightly afraid of him when they sat facing one another at night on opposite sides of the fireplace. She wanted to wake him up, to make him say something, no matter what, that would break this dreadful silence, which was like the darkness of a wood. But he did not appear to listen to her, and she shuddered with the terror of a poor feeble woman when she had spoken to him five or six times successively without being able to get a word out of him. What was the matter with him? What was going on in that closed-up head? When she had remained thus two or three hours opposite him, she felt as if she were going insane, and longed to rush away and to escape into the open country in order to avoid that mute, eternal companionship and also some vague danger. Which she could not define, but of which she had a presentiment. She frequently wept when she was alone. What was the matter with him? When she expressed a wish, he unmurmuringly carried it into execution. When she wanted anything brought from the city, he immediately went there to procure it. She had no complaint to make of him, no, indeed. And yet. Another year flitted by, and it seemed to her that a fresh change had taken place in the mind of the young man. She perceived it, she felt it, she divined it. How? No matter. She was sure she was not mistaken but she could not have explained in what manner the unknown thoughts of this strange youth had changed. It seemed to her that, until now, he had been like a person in a hesitating frame of mind, who had suddenly arrived at a determination. This idea came to her one evening as she met his glance, a fixed, singular glance which she had not seen in his face before. Then he commenced to watch her incessantly, and she wished she could hide herself in order to avoid that cold eye riveted on her. He kept staring at her, evening after evening, for hours together, only averting his eyes when she said, utterly unnerved. Do not look at me like that, my child. Then he would lower his head. But the moment her back was turned she once more felt that his eyes were upon her. Wherever she went, he pursued her with his persistent gaze. Sometimes, when she was walking in her little garden, she suddenly noticed him hidden behind a bush, as if he were lying in wait for her. And, again, when she sat in front of the house mending stockings while he was digging some vegetable bed, he kept continually watching her in a surreptitious manner as he worked. It was in vain that she asked him. What's the matter with you, my boy? For the last three years, you have become very different. I don't recognize you. Do tell me what ails you and what you are thinking of. He invariably replied, in a quiet, weary tone. Why, nothing ails me, aunt. And when she persisted. Ah. My child, answer me, answer me when I speak to you. If you knew what grief you caused me, you would always answer, and you would not look at me that way. Have you any trouble? Tell me. I'll comfort you. He went away, with a tired air, murmuring. But there is nothing the matter with me, I assure you. He had not grown much having always a childish look, although his features were those of a man. They were, however, hard and badly cut. He seemed incomplete, abortive, only half-finished, and disquieting as a mystery. He was a self-contained, unapproachable being, in whom there seemed always to be some active, dangerous mental labor going on. Mademoiselle Source was quite conscious of all this, and she could not sleep at night, so great was her anxiety. Frightful terrors, dreadful nightmares assailed her. She shut herself up in her own room and barricaded the door, tortured by fear. What was she afraid of? She could not tell. She feared everything, the night, the walls, the shadows thrown by the moon on the white curtains of the windows, and, above all, she feared him. Why? What had she to fear? Did she know what it was? She could live this way no longer. She felt certain that a misfortune threatened her, a frightful misfortune. She set forth secretly one morning, 
and went into the city to see her relatives. She told them about the matter in a gasping voice. The two women thought she was going mad and tried to reassure her. She said, If you knew the way he looks at me from morning till night. He never takes his eyes off me. At times, I feel a longing to cry for help, to call in the neighbors, so much am I afraid. But what could I say to them? He does nothing but look at me. The two female cousins asked. Is he ever brutal to you? Does he give you sharp answers? She replied. No, never, he does everything I wish, he works hard, he is steady, but I am so frightened that I care nothing for that. He is planning something, I am certain of that, quite certain. I don't care to remain all alone like that with him in the country. The relatives, astonished at her words, declared that people would be amazed, would not understand. And they advised her to keep silent about her fears and her plans, without, however, dissuading her from coming to reside in the city, hoping in that way that the entire inheritance would eventually fall into their hands. They even promised to assist her in selling her house and in finding another near them. Mademoiselle Source returned home. But her mind was so much upset that she trembled at the slightest noise, and her hands shook whenever any trifling disturbance agitated her. Twice she went again to consult her relatives, quite determined now not to remain any longer in this way in her lonely dwelling. At last, she found a little cottage in the suburbs, which suited her, and she privately bought it. The signature of the contract took place on a Tuesday morning, and Mademoiselle Source devoted the rest of the day to the preparations for her change of residence. At eight o'clock in the evening she got into the diligence which passed within a few hundred yards of her house, and she told the conductor to put her down in the place where she usually alighted. The man called out to her as he whipped his horses. Good evening, Mademoiselle Source, good night. She replied as she walked on. Good evening, Père Joseph. Next morning, at half-past seven, the postman who conveyed letters to the village noticed at the crossroad, not far from the high road, a large splash of blood not yet dry. He said to himself, Hello. Some boozer must have had a nosebleed. But he perceived ten paces farther on a pocket handkerchief also stained with blood. He picked it up. The linen was fine, and the postman, in alarm, made his way over to the ditch, where he fancied he saw a strange object. Mademoiselle Source was lying at the bottom on the grass, her throat cut with a knife. An hour later, the gendarmes, the examining magistrate, and other authorities made an inquiry as to the cause of death. The two female relatives, called as witnesses, told all about the old maid's fears and her last plans. The orphan was arrested. After the death of the woman who had adopted him, he wept from morning till night, plunged, at least to all appearance, in the most violent grief. He proved that he had spent the evening up to eleven o'clock in a café. Ten persons had seen him, having remained there till his departure. The driver of the diligence stated that he had set down the murdered woman on the road between half-past nine and ten o'clock. The accused was acquitted. A will, drawn up a long time before, which had been left in the hands of a notary in Rennes, made him sole heir. So he inherited everything. For a long time, the people of the country boycotted him, as they still suspected him. His house, that of the dead woman, was looked upon as accursed. People avoided him in the street. But he showed himself so good-natured, so open, so familiar, that gradually these horrible doubts were forgotten. He was generous, obliging, ready to talk to the humblest about anything, as long as they cared to talk to him. The notary, Maitre Rameau, was one of the first to take his part, attracted by his smiling loquacity. He said at a dinner, at the tax collector's house. A man who speaks with such facility and who is always in good humor could not have such a crime on his conscience. Touched by his argument, the others who were present reflected, and they recalled to mind the long conversations with this man who would almost compel them to stop at the road corners to listen to his ideas. Who insisted on their going into his house when they were passing by his garden, who could crack a joke better than the lieutenant of the gendarmes himself and who possessed such contagious gaiety that, in spite of the repugnance with which he inspired them, 
they could not keep from always laughing in his company. All doors were opened to him after a time. He is today the mayor of his township. The beggar. He had seen better days, despite his present misery and infirmities. At the age of fifteen both his legs had been crushed by a carriage on the Varville Highway. From that time forth he begged, dragging himself along the roads and through the farmyards, supported by crutches which forced his shoulders up to his ears. His head looked as if it were squeezed in between two mountains. A foundling, picked up out of a ditch by the priest of Les Belettes on the eve of All Saints' Day and baptized, for that reason, Nicholas Toussaint, reared by charity, utterly without education. Crippled in consequence of having drunk several glasses of brandy given him by the baker, such a funny story. And a vagabond all his life afterward, the only thing he knew how to do was to hold out his hand for alms. At one time the Baroness d'Avery allowed him to sleep in a kind of recess spread with straw, close to the poultry yard in the farm adjoining the chateau. And if he was in great need he was sure of getting a glass of cider and a crust of bread in the kitchen. Moreover, the old lady often threw him a few pennies from her window. But she was dead now. In the villages people gave him scarcely anything, he was too well known. Everybody had grown tired of seeing him, day after day for forty years, dragging his deformed and tattered person from door to door on his wooden crutches. But he could not make up his mind to go elsewhere, because he knew no place on earth but this particular corner of the country, these three or four villages where he had spent the whole of his miserable existence. He had limited his begging operations and would not for worlds have passed his accustomed bounds. He did not even know whether the world extended for any distance beyond the trees which had always bounded his vision. He did not ask himself the question. And when the peasants, tired of constantly meeting him in their fields or along their lanes, exclaimed, Why don't you go to other villages instead of always limping about here? He did not answer, but slunk away possessed with a vague dread of the unknown, the dread of a poor wretch who fears confusedly a thousand things, new faces, taunts, insults. The suspicious glances of people who do not know him and the policemen walking in couples on the roads. These last he always instinctively avoided, taking refuge in the bushes or behind heaps of stones when he saw them coming. When he perceived them in the distance, with uniforms gleaming in the sun, he was suddenly possessed with unwanted agility the agility of a wild animal seeking its lair. He threw aside his crutches, fell to the ground like a limp rag, made himself as small as possible and crouched like a hare under cover, his tattered vestments blending in hue with the earth on which he cowered. He had never had any trouble with the police, but the instinct to avoid them was in his blood. He seemed to have inherited it from the parents he had never known. He had no refuge, no roof for his head, no shelter of any kind. In summer he slept out of doors and in winter he showed remarkable skill in slipping unperceived into barns and stables. He always decamped before his presence could be discovered. He knew all the holes through which one could creep into farm buildings, and the handling of his crutches having made his arms surprisingly muscular he often hauled himself up through sheer strength of wrist into haylofts, where he sometimes remained for four or five days at a time provided he had collected a sufficient store of food beforehand. He lived like the beasts of the field. He was in the midst of men, yet knew no one, loved no one, exciting in the breasts of the peasants only a sort of careless contempt and smoldering hostility. They nicknamed him Bell, because he hung between his two crutches like a church bell between its supports. For two days he had eaten nothing. No one gave him anything now. Everyone's patience was exhausted. Women shouted to him from their doorsteps when they saw him coming. Be off with you, you good-for-nothing vagabond. Why, I gave you a piece of bread only three days ago. And he turned on his crutches to the next house, where he was received in the same fashion. The women declared to one another as they stood at their doors. We can't feed that lazy brute all the year round. And yet the lazy brute needed food every day. He had exhausted St. Hilaire, Varville and Les Belettes without getting a single copper or so much as a dry crust. His only hope was in Ternoles, but to reach this place he would have to walk five miles along the high road, and he felt so weary that he could hardly drag himself another yard. 
his stomach and his pocket were equally empty, but he started on his way. It was December and a cold wind blew over the fields and whistled through the bare branches of the trees, the clouds careered madly across the black, threatening sky. The cripple dragged himself slowly along, raising one crutch after the other with a painful effort, propping himself on the one distorted leg which remained to him. Now and then he sat down beside a ditch for a few moments' rest. Hunger was gnawing his vitals, and in his confused, slow-working mind he had only one idea to eat but how this was to be accomplished he did not know. For three hours he continued his painful journey. Then at last the sight of the trees of the village inspired him with new energy. The first peasant he met, and of whom he asked alms, replied, So it's you again, is it, you old scamp? Shall I never be rid of you? And Bell went on his way. At every door he got nothing but hard words. He made the round of the whole village, but received not a halfpenny for his pains. Then he visited the neighboring farms, toiling through the muddy land, so exhausted that he could hardly raise his crutches from the ground. He met with the same reception everywhere. It was one of those cold, bleak days, when the heart is frozen and the temper irritable, and hands do not open either to give money or food. When he had visited all the houses he knew, Bell sank down in the corner of a ditch running across Jacques' farmyard. Letting his crutches slip to the ground, he remained motionless, tortured by hunger, but hardly intelligent enough to realize to the full his unutterable misery. He awaited he knew not what, possessed with that vague hope which persists in the human heart in spite of everything. He awaited in the corner of the farmyard in the biting December wind, some mysterious aid from heaven or from men, without the least idea whence it was to arrive. A number of black hens ran hither and thither, seeking their food in the earth which supports all living things. Ever now and then they snapped up in their beaks a grain of corn or a tiny insect. Then they continued their slow, sure search for nutriment. Bell watched them at first without thinking of anything. Then a thought occurred rather to his stomach than to his mind, the thought that one of those fowls would be good to eat if it were cooked over a fire of dead wood. He did not reflect that he was going to commit a theft. He took up a stone which lay within reach and, being of skillful aim, killed at the first shot the fowl nearest to him. The bird fell on its side, flapping its wings. The others fled wildly hither and thither, and Bell, picking up his crutches, limped across to where his victim lay. Just as he reached the little black body with its crimsoned head he received a violent blow in his back which made him let go his hold of his crutches and sent him flying ten paces distant. And Farmer Chiquet, beside himself with rage, cuffed and kicked the marauder with all the fury of a plundered peasant as Bell lay defenseless before him. The farmhands came up also and joined their master in cuffing the lame beggar. Then when they were tired of beating him they carried him off and shut him up in the woodshed, while they went to fetch the police. Bell, half dead, bleeding and perishing with hunger, lay on the floor. Evening came, then night, then dawn. And still he had not eaten. About midday the police arrived. They opened the door of the woodshed with the utmost precaution, fearing resistance on the beggar's part, for Farmer Chiquet asserted that he had been attacked by him and had had great difficulty in defending himself. The sergeant cried. Come, get up. But Bell could not move. He did his best to raise himself on his crutches, but without success. The police, thinking his weakness feigned, pulled him up by main force and set him between the crutches. Fear seized him, his native fear of a uniform, the fear of the game in presence of the sportsman, the fear of a mouse for a cat and by the exercise of almost superhuman effort he succeeded in remaining upright. Forward, said the sergeant. He walked. All the inmates of the farm watched his departure. The women shook their fists at him the men scoffed at and insulted him. He was taken at last. Good riddance. He went off between his two guards. He mustered sufficient energy, the energy of despair, to drag himself along until the evening, two days to know what was happening to him, too frightened to understand. People whom he met on the road stopped to watch him go by and peasants muttered. It's some thief or other. Toward evening he reached the country town. 
He had never been so far before. He did not realize in the least what he was there for or what was to become of him. All the terrible and unexpected events of the last two days, all these unfamiliar faces and houses struck dismay into his heart. He said not a word, having nothing to say because he understood nothing. Besides, he had spoken to no one for so many years past that he had almost lost the use of his tongue, and his thoughts were too indeterminate to be put into words. He was shut up in the town jail. It did not occur to the police that he might need food, and he was left alone until the following day. But when in the early morning they came to examine him he was found dead on the floor. Such an astonishing thing. The Rabbit Old Lecashur appeared at the door of his house between five and a quarter past five in the morning, his usual hour, to watch his men going to work. He was only half awake, his face was red, and with his right eye open and the left nearly closed, he was buttoning his braces over his fat stomach with some difficulty. At the same time looking into every corner of the farmyard with a searching glance. The sun darted its oblique rays through the beech trees by the side of the ditch and athwart the apple trees outside, and was making the cocks crow on the dunghill, and the pigeons coo on the roof. The smell of the cow stable came through the open door, and blended in the fresh morning air with the pungent odor of the stable, where the horses were neighing, with their heads turned toward the light. As soon as his trousers were properly fastened, Lecashur came out, and went, first of all, toward the henhouse to count the morning's eggs, for he had been afraid of thefts for some time. But the servant girl ran up to him with lifted arms and cried, Master! Master! They have stolen a rabbit during the night. A rabbit? Yes, master, the big gray rabbit, from the hutch on the left. Whereupon the farmer completely opened his left eye, and said, simply, I must see about that and off he went to inspect it. The hutch had been broken open and the rabbit was gone. Then he became thoughtful, closed his right eye again, and scratched his nose, and after a little consideration, he said to the frightened girl, who was standing stupidly before her master, Go and fetch the gendarmes. Say I expect them as soon as possible. Lekashur was mayor of the village, Pavigny Lugra, and ruled it like a master, on account of his money and position and as soon as the servant had disappeared in the direction of the village, which was only about five hundred yards off. He went into the house to have his morning coffee and to discuss the matter with his wife, whom he found on her knees in front of the fire, trying to make it burn quickly, and as soon as he got to the door, he said, Somebody has stolen the grey rabbit. She turned round so suddenly that she found herself sitting on the floor, and looking at her husband with distressed eyes, she said, what is it, cashews? Somebody has stolen a rabbit? The big gray one. She sighed. What a shame! Who can have done it? She was a little, thin, active, neat woman who knew all about farming. Lekashur had his own ideas about the matter. It must be that fellow, Paulite. His wife got up suddenly and said in a furious voice, He did it. He did it. You need not look for anyone else. He did it. You have said it, Cashews. All her peasant's fury, all her avarice, all her rage of a saving woman against the man of whom she had always been suspicious, and against the girl whom she had always suspected, showed themselves in the contraction of her mouth, and the wrinkles in the cheeks and forehead of her thin, exasperated face. And what have you done? she asked. I have sent for the gendarmes. This Paulite was a laborer, who had been employed on the farm for a few days, and who had been dismissed by Lekashur for an insolent answer. He was an old soldier, and was supposed to have retained his habits of marauding and debauchery from his campaigns in Africa. He did anything for a livelihood, but whether he were a mason, a navvy, a reaper, whether he broke stones or lopped trees, he was always lazy, and so he remained nowhere for long, and had, at times, to change his neighborhood to obtain work. From the first day that he came to the farm, Lekashur's wife had detested him, and now she was sure that he had committed the theft. In about half an hour the two gendarmes arrived. Brigadier Senator was very tall and thin, and gendarme lenient short and fat. 
Lekasher made them sit down and told them the affair, and then they went and saw the scene of the theft, in order to verify the fact that the hutch had been broken open and to collect all the proofs they could. When they got back to the kitchen, the mistress brought in some wine, filled their glasses, and asked with a distrustful look, Shall you catch him? The brigadier, who had his sword between his legs, appeared thoughtful. Certainly, he was sure of taking him if he was pointed out to him, but if not, he could not answer for being able to discover him, himself, and after reflecting for a long time, he put this simple question. Do you know the thief? And Lekasher replied, with a look of Normandy slyness in his eyes. As for knowing him, I do not, as I did not see him commit the theft. If I had seen him, I should have made him eat it raw, skin and flesh, without a drop of cider to wash it down. But as for saying who it is, I cannot, although I believe it is that good-for-nothing Paulite. Then he related at length his troubles with Paulite, his leaving his service, his bad reputation, things which had been told him, accumulating insignificant and minute proofs, and then, the brigadier, who had been listening very attentively while he emptied his glass and filled it again with an indifferent air, turned to his gendarme and said, We must go and look in the cottage of Severin's wife. At which the gendarme smiled and nodded three times. Then Madame Lekasher came to them and very quietly, with all a peasant's cunning, questioned the brigadier in her turn. That shepherd Severin, a simpleton, a sort of brute who had been brought up and had grown up among his bleeding flocks, and who knew scarcely anything besides them in the world, had nevertheless preserved the peasant's instinct for saving. At the bottom of his heart. For years and years he must have hidden in hollow trees and crevices in the rocks all that he earned. Either as a shepherd or by curing animals' sprains, for the bone-setter's secret had been handed down to him by the old shepherd whose place he took by touch or word, and one day he bought a small property, consisting of a cottage and a field. For three thousand francs. A few months later it became known that he was going to marry a servant, notorious for her bad morals, the innkeeper's servant. The young fellow said that the girl, knowing that he was pretty well off, had been to his cottage every night, and had taken him, captured him, led him on to matrimony, little by little night by night. And then, having been to the mayor's office and to church, she now lived in the house which her man had bought, while he continued to tend his flocks, day and night, on the plains. And the brigadier added, Paulite has been sleeping there for three weeks, for the thief has no place of his own to go to. The gendarme made a little joke. He takes the shepherd's blankets. Madame Lekasher, who was seized by a fresh access of rage, of rage increased by a married woman's anger against debauchery, exclaimed. It is she, I am sure. Go there. Ah, the blaggard thieves. But the brigadier was quite unmoved. One minute, he said. Let us wait until twelve o'clock, as he goes and dines there every day. I shall catch them with it under their noses. The gendarme smiled pleased at his chief's idea, and Lekasher also smiled now, for the affair of the shepherd struck him as very funny, deceived husbands are always a joke. Twelve o'clock had just struck when the brigadier, followed by his man, knocked gently three times at the door of a little lonely house, situated at the corner of a wood, five hundred yards from the village. They had been standing close against the wall, so as not to be seen from within, and they waited. As nobody answered, the brigadier knocked again in a minute or two. It was so quiet that the house seemed uninhabited. But lenient, the gendarme, who had very quick ears, said that he heard somebody moving about inside, and then Senator got angry. He would not allow anyone to resist the authority of the law for a moment, and, knocking at the door with the hilt of his sword, he cried out. Open the door, in the name of the law. As this order had no effect, he roared out. If you do not obey, I shall smash the lock. I am the brigadier of the gendarmerie, by G. Here, lenient. He had not finished speaking when the door opened and Senator saw before him a fat girl, with a very red, blousy face, with drooping breasts, a big stomach and broad hips, a sort of animal, the wife of the shepherd Severin. And he went into the cottage. I have come to pay you a visit, as I want to make a little search, he said, and he looked about him. 
On the table there was a plate, a jug of cider and a glass half full, which proved that a meal was in progress. Two knives were lying side by side, and the shrewd gendarme winked at his superior officer. It smells good, the latter said. One might swear that it was stewed rabbit, lenient added, much amused. Will you have a glass of brandy? The peasant woman asked. No, thank you, I only want the skin of the rabbit that you are eating. She pretended not to understand, but she was trembling. What rabbit? The brigadier had taken a seat and was calmly wiping his forehead. Come, come, you are not going to try and make us believe that you live on couch grass. What were you eating there all by yourself for your dinner? I? Nothing whatever, I swear to you. A mite of butter on my bread. You are a novice, my good woman. A mite of butter on your bread. You are mistaken, you ought to have said, a mite of butter on the rabbit. By gee, your butter smells good. It is special butter, extra good butter, butter fit for a wedding. Certainly, not household butter. The gendarme was shaking with laughter, and repeated. Not household butter certainly. As Brigadier Senator was a joker, all the gendarmes had grown facetious, and the officer continued. Where is your butter? My butter? Yes, your butter. In the jar. Then where is the butter jar? Here it is. She brought out an old cup, at the bottom of which there was a layer of rancid salt butter, and the brigadier smelled of it, and said, with a shake of his head. It is not the same. I want the butter that smells of the rabbit. Come, lenient, open your eyes, look under the sideboard, my good fellow, and I will look under the bed. Having shut the door, he went up to the bed and tried to move it. But it was fixed to the wall, and had not been moved for more than half a century, apparently. Then the brigadier stooped and made his uniform crack. A button had flown off. Lenient, he said. Yes, brigadier? Come here, my lad, and look under the bed, I am too tall. I will look after the sideboard. He got up and waited while his man executed his orders. Lenient, who was short and stout, took off his kepi, laid himself on his stomach, and, putting his face on the floor, looked at the black cavity under the bed, and then, suddenly, he exclaimed. All right, here we are. What have you got? The rabbit? No, the thief. The thief. Pull him out, pull him out. The gendarme had put his arms under the bed and laid hold of something, and he was pulling with all his might, and at last a foot, shod in a thick boot, appeared, which he was holding in his right hand. The brigadier took it, crying. Pull. Pull. And lenient, who was on his knees by that time, was pulling at the other leg. But it was a hard job for the prisoner kicked out hard and arched up his back under the bed. Courage! Courage! Pull! Pull! Senator cried, and they pulled him with all their strength, so that the wooden slat gave way, and he came out as far as his head. But at last they got that out also, and they saw the terrified and furious face of Polite, whose arms remained stretched out under the bed. Pull away, the brigadier kept on exclaiming. Then they heard a strange noise, and as the arms followed the shoulders, and the hands the arms, they saw in the hands the handle of a saucepan, and at the end of the handle the saucepan itself, which contained stewed rabbit. Good Lord! Good Lord! The brigadier shouted in his delight, while lenient took charge of the man, the rabbit's skin, an overwhelming proof, was discovered under the mattress, and then the gendarmes returned in triumph to the village with their prisoner and their booty. A week later, as the affair had made much stir, Lekashur, on going into the Mary to consult the schoolmaster, was told that the shepherd Severin had been waiting for him for more than an hour, and he found him sitting on a chair in a corner, with his stick between his legs. When he saw the mayor, he got up, took off his cap, and said, Good morning, Maitre Cashews, and then he remained standing, timid and embarrassed. What do you want? the former said. This is it, monsieur. Is it true that somebody stole one of your rabbits last week? Yes, it is quite true, Severin. Who stole the rabbit? 
Paulite Ancas, the laborer. Right. Right. And is it also true that it was found under my bed? What do you mean, the rabbit? The rabbit and then Paulite. Yes, my poor Severin, quite true, but who told you? Pretty well everybody. I understand. And I suppose you know all about marriages, as you marry people? What about marriage? With regard to one's rights. What rights? The husband's rights and then the wife's rights. Of course I do. Oh. Then just tell me, so cashews, has my wife the right to go to bed with Paulite? What, to go to bed with Paulite? Yes, has she any right before the law, and, seeing that she is my wife, to go to bed with Paulite? Why, of course not, of course not. If I catch him there again, shall I have the right to thrash him and her also? Why, 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 yes. Very well, then, I will tell you why I want to know. One night last week, as I had my suspicions, I came in suddenly, and they were not behaving properly. I chucked Paulite out, to go and sleep somewhere else. But that was all, as I did not know what my rights were. This time I did not see them, I only heard of it from others. That is over, and we will not say any more about it. But if I catch them again, by gee, if I catch them again, I will make them lose all taste for such nonsense, Maitre Cashews, as sure as my name is Severin. His Avenger. When M. Antoine Lulet married the widow, Madame Mathilde Suris, he had already been in love with her for ten years. M. Suris has been his friend, his old college chum. Lulet was very much attached to him, but thought he was somewhat of a simpleton. He would often remark, that poor Suris who will never set the world on fire. When Suris married Miss Mathilde Duval, Lulet was astonished and somewhat annoyed, as he was slightly devoted to her, himself. She was the daughter of a neighbor, a former proprietor of a draper's establishment who had retired with quite a small fortune. She married Suris for his money. Then Lulet thought he would start a flirtation with his friend's wife. He was a good-looking man, intelligent and also rich. He thought it would be all plain sailing, but he was mistaken. Then he really began to admire her with an admiration that his friendship for the husband obliged him to keep within the bounds of discretion, making him timid and embarrassed. Madame Suris believing that his presumptions had received a wholesome check now treated him as a good friend. This went on for nine years. One morning a messenger brought Lulet a distracted note from the poor woman. Suris had just died suddenly from the rupture of an aneurysm. He was dreadfully shocked for they were just the same age. But almost immediately a feeling of profound joy, of intense relief, of emancipation filled his being. Madame Suris was free. He managed, however, to assume the sad, sympathetic expression that was appropriate, waited the required time, observed all social appearances. At the end of fifteen months he married the widow. This was considered to be a very natural, and even a generous action. It was the act of a good friend of an upright man. He was happy at last, perfectly happy. They lived in the most cordial intimacy, having understood and appreciated each other from the first. They had no secrets from one another and even confided to each other their most secret thoughts. Lulet loved his wife now with a quiet and trustful affection, he loved her as a tender, devoted companion who was an equal and a confidant but there lingered in his mind a strange and inexplicable bitterness towards the defunct Suris, who had first been the husband of this woman, who had had the flower of her youth and of her soul, and had even robbed her of some of her poetry. The memory of the dead husband marred the happiness of the living husband, and this posthumous jealousy tormented his heart by day and by night. The consequence was he talked incessantly of Suris, asked about a thousand personal and secret minutiae, wanted to know all about his habits and his person. And he sneered at him even in his grave, recalling with self-satisfaction his whims, ridiculing his absurdities, dwelling on his faults. He would call to his wife all over the house. Hello, Mathilde. Here I am, dear. Come here a moment. She would come, always smiling, 
knowing well that he would say something about Surus and ready to flatter her new husband's inoffensive mania. Tell me, do you remember one day how Surus insisted on explaining to me that little men always commanded more affection than big men? And he made some remarks that were disparaging to the deceased, who was a small man, and decidedly flattering to himself, Lulit, who was a tall man. Madame. Lulit allowed him to think he was right, quite right, and she laughed heartily, gently ridiculing her former husband for the sake of pleasing the present one, who always ended by saying, All the same, what a ninny that Surus was. They were happy, quite happy, and Lulit never ceased to show his devotion to his wife. One night, however, as they lay awake, Lulit said as he kissed his wife, See here, dearie. Well? Was Surus, I don't exactly know how to say it, was Surus very loving? She gave him a kiss for reply and murmured, Not as loving as you are, Mon Chat. He was flattered in his self-love and continued. He must have been, a ninny, was he not? She did not reply. She only smiled slyly and hid her face in her husband's neck. He must have been a ninny and not, not, not smart? She shook her head slightly to imply, no, not at all smart. He continued. He must have been an awful nuisance, eh? This time she was frank and replied. Oh yes. He kissed her again for this avowal and said. What a brute he was. You were not happy with him? No, she replied. It was not always pleasant. Lulit was delighted, forming in his mind a comparison, much in his own favor, between his wife's former and present position. He was silent for a time, and then with a burst of laughter he asked. Tell me? What? Will you be frank, very frank with me? Why yes, my dear. Well then, tell me truly did you never feel tempted to, to, to deceive that imbecile Surus? Madame Lulet said, oh. Pretending to be shocked and hid her face again on her husband's shoulder. But he saw that she was laughing. Come now, own up, he persisted. He looked like a ninny, that creature. It would be funny, so funny. Good old Surus. Come, come, dearie, you do not mind telling me, me, of all people. He insisted on the me thinking that if she had wished to deceive Surus she would have chosen him, and he was trembling in anticipation of her avowal, sure that if she had not been a virtuous woman she would have encouraged his own attentions. But she did not answer, laughing still, as at the recollection of something exceedingly comical. Lulit, in his turn began to laugh, thinking he might have been the lucky man, and he muttered amid his mirth, that poor Surus, that poor Surus, oh, yes, he looked like a fool. Madame Lulit was almost in spasms of laughter. Come, confess, be frank. You know I will not mind. Then she stammered out, almost choking with laughter, yes, yes. Yes, what, insisted her husband. Come, tell all. She was quieter now and putting her mouth to her husband's ear, she whispered, yes, I did deceive him. He felt a chill run down his back and to his very bones, and he stammered out, dumbfounded, you, you, deceived him, criminally? She still thought he was amused and replied, yes, yes, absolutely. He was obliged to sit up to recover his breath, he was so shocked and upset at what he had heard. She had become serious, understanding too late what she had done. With whom? Said Lulit at length. She was silent seeking some excuse. A young man, she replied at length. He turned suddenly toward her and said drilly. I did not suppose it was the cook. I want to know what young man, do you hear? She did not answer. He snatched the covers from her face, repeating. I want to know what young man, do you hear? Then she said sorrowfully, I was only in fun. But he was trembling with rage. What? How? You were only in fun? You were making fun of me, then? But I am not satisfied, do you hear? I want the name of the young man. She did not reply, but lay there motionless. He took her by the arm and squeezed it, saying, Do you understand me, finally? I wish you to reply when I speak to you. 
I think you are going crazy, she said nervously, let me alone. He was wild with rage, not knowing what to say, exasperated, and he shook her with all his might, repeating. Do you hear me, do you hear me? She made an abrupt effort to disengage herself and the tips of her fingers touched her husband's nose. He was furious, thinking she had tried to hit him, and he sprang upon her holding her down. And boxing her ears with all his might, he cried, Take that, and that, there, there, wretch. When he was out of breath and exhausted, he rose and went toward the dressing table to prepare a glass of eau sucre with orange flour, for he felt as if he should faint. She was weeping in bed, sobbing bitterly, for she felt as if her happiness was over, through her own fault. Then, amidst her tears, she stammered out. Listen, Antoine, come here, I told you a lie, you will understand, listen. And prepared to defend herself now, armed with excuses and artifice, she raised her disheveled head with its nightcap all awry. Turning toward her, he approached, ashamed of having struck her, but feeling in the bottom of his heart as a husband, a relentless hatred toward this woman who had deceived the former husband, Surus. My uncle Jules. A white-haired old man begged us for alms. My companion, Joseph Davranch, gave him five francs. Noticing my surprised look, he said. That poor unfortunate reminds me of a story which I shall tell you, the memory of which continually pursues me. Here it is. My family, which came originally from Haver, was not rich. We just managed to make both ends meet. My father worked hard, came home late from the office, and earned very little. I had two sisters. My mother suffered a good deal from our reduced circumstances, and she often had harsh words for her husband, veiled and sly reproaches. The poor man then made a gesture which used to distress me. He would pass his open hand over his forehead, as if to wipe away perspiration which did not exist, and he would answer nothing. I felt his helpless suffering. We economized on everything, and never would accept an invitation to dinner, so as not to have to return the courtesy. All our provisions were bought at bargain sales. My sisters made their own gowns, and long discussions would arise on the price of a piece of braid worth fifteen centimes a yard. Our meals usually consisted of soup and beef, prepared with every kind of sauce. They say it is wholesome and nourishing, but I should have preferred a change. I used to go through terrible scenes on account of lost buttons and torn trousers. Every Sunday, dressed in our best, we would take our walk along the breakwater. My father, in a frock coat, high hat and kid gloves, would offer his arm to my mother, decked out and beribboned like a ship on a holiday. My sisters, who were always ready first, would await the signal for leaving. But at the last minute someone always found a spot on my father's frock coat, and it had to be wiped away quickly with a rag moistened with benzene. My father, in his shirt sleeves, his silk hat on his head, would await the completion of the operation, while my mother, putting on her spectacles, and taking off her gloves in order not to spoil them, would make haste. Then we set out ceremoniously. My sisters marched on ahead, arm in arm. They were of marriageable age and had to be displayed. I walked on the left of my mother and my father on her right. I remember the pompous air of my poor parents in these Sunday walks, their stern expression, their stiff walk. They moved slowly, with a serious expression, their bodies straight, their legs stiff, as if something of extreme importance depended upon their appearance. Every Sunday, when the big steamers were returning from unknown and distant countries, my father would invariably utter the same words. What a surprise it would be if Jules were on that one. Eh? My uncle Jules, my father's brother, was the only hope of the family, after being its only fear. I had heard about him since childhood, and it seemed to me that I should recognize him immediately, knowing as much about him as I did. I knew every detail of his life up to the day of his departure for America, although this period of his life was spoken of only in hushed tones. It seems that he had led a bad life, that is to say, he had squandered a little money, which action, in a poor family, is one of the greatest crimes. With rich people a man who amuses himself only sows his wild oats. He is what is generally called a sport. 
but among needy families a boy who forces his parents to break into the capital becomes a good-for-nothing, a rascal, a scamp. And this distinction is just, although the action be the same, for consequences alone determine the seriousness of the act. Well, Uncle Jules had visibly diminished the inheritance on which my father had counted, after he had swallowed his own to the last penny. Then, according to the custom of the times, he had been shipped off to America on a freighter going from Haver to New York. Once there, my uncle began to sell something or other, and he soon wrote that he was making a little money and that he soon hoped to be able to indemnify my father for the harm he had done him. This letter caused a profound emotion in the family. Jules, who up to that time had not been worth his salt, suddenly became a good man, a kind-hearted fellow, true and honest like all the Davranches. One of the captains told us that he had rented a large shop and was doing an important business. Two years later a second letter came, saying, My dear Philippe, I am writing to tell you not to worry about my health, which is excellent. Business is good. I leave tomorrow for a long trip to South America. I may be away for several years without sending you any news. If I shouldn't write, don't worry. When my fortune is made I shall return to Haver. I hope that it will not be too long and that we shall all live happily together. This letter became the gospel of the family. It was read on the slightest provocation, and it was shown to everybody. For ten years nothing was heard from Uncle Jules. But as time went on my father's hope grew, and my mother, also, often said, When that good Jules is here, our position will be different. There is one who knew how to get along. And every Sunday, while watching the big steamers approaching from the horizon, pouring out a stream of smoke, my father would repeat his eternal question. What a surprise it would be if Jules were on that one. Eh? We almost expected to see him waving his handkerchief and crying. Hey! Philippe! Thousands of schemes had been planned on the strength of this expected return. We were even to buy a little house with my uncle's money, a little place in the country near Ngouville. In fact, I wouldn't swear that my father had not already begun negotiations. The elder of my sisters was then twenty-eight, the other twenty-six. They were not yet married, and that was a great grief to every one. At last a suitor presented himself for the younger one. He was a clerk, not rich, but honorable. I have always been morally certain that Uncle Jules letter, which was shown him one evening, had swept away the young man's hesitation and definitely decided him. He was accepted eagerly, and it was decided that after the wedding the whole family should take a trip to Jersey. Jersey is the ideal trip for poor people. It is not far. One crosses a strip of sea in a steamer and lands on foreign soil, as this little island belongs to England. Thus, a Frenchman, with a two-hours sail, can observe a neighboring people at home and study their customs. This trip to Jersey completely absorbed our ideas, was our sole anticipation, the constant thought of our minds. At last we left. I see it as plainly as if it had happened yesterday. The boat was getting up steam against the quay at Granville. My father, bewildered, was superintending the loading of our three pieces of baggage, my mother, nervous, had taken the arm of my unmarried sister, who seemed lost since the departure of the other one, like the last chicken of a brood. Behind us came the bride and groom, who always stayed behind, a thing that often made me turn round. The whistle sounded. We got on board, and the vessel, leaving the breakwater, forged ahead through a sea as flat as a marble table. We watched the coast disappear in the distance, happy and proud, like all who do not travel much. My father was swelling out his chest in the breeze, beneath his frock coat, which had that morning been very carefully cleaned. And he spread around him that odor of benzene which always made me recognize Sunday. Suddenly he noticed two elegantly dressed ladies to whom two gentlemen were offering oysters. An old, ragged sailor was opening them with his knife and passing them to the gentleman, who would then offer them to the ladies. They ate them in a dainty manner, holding the shell on a fine handkerchief and advancing their mouths a little in order not to spot their dresses. Then they would drink the liquid with a rapid little motion and throw the shell overboard. My father was probably pleased with this delicate manner of eating oysters on a moving ship. 
He considered it good form, refined, and, going up to my mother and sisters, he asked. Would you like me to offer you some oysters? My mother hesitated on account of the expense, but my two sisters immediately accepted. My mother said in a provoked manner. I am afraid that they will hurt my stomach. Offer the children some, but not too much, it would make them sick. Then, turning toward me, she added. As for Joseph, he doesn't need any. Boys shouldn't be spoiled. However, I remained beside my mother, finding this discrimination unjust. I watched my father as he pompously conducted my two sisters and his son-in-law toward the ragged old sailor. The two ladies had just left, and my father showed my sisters how to eat them without spilling the liquor. He even tried to give them an example and seized an oyster. He attempted to imitate the ladies and immediately spilled all the liquid over his coat. I heard my mother mutter. He would do far better to keep quiet. But, suddenly, my father appeared to be worried, he retreated a few steps, stared at his family gathered around the old shell opener, and quickly came toward us. He seemed very pale, with a peculiar look. In a low voice he said to my mother, It's extraordinary how that man opening the oysters looks like jewels. Astonished, my mother asked. What jewels? My father continued. Why, my brother? If I did not know that he was well off in America, I should think it was he. Bewildered, my mother stammered. You are crazy. As long as you know that it is not he, why do you say such foolish things? But my father insisted. Go on over and see, Clarice. I would rather have you see with your own eyes. She arose and walked to her daughters. I, too, was watching the man. He was old, dirty, wrinkled, and did not lift his eyes from his work. My mother returned. I noticed that she was trembling. She exclaimed quickly. I believe that it is he. Why don't you ask the captain? But be very careful that we don't have this rogue on our hands again. My father walked away, but I followed him. I felt strangely moved. The captain, a tall, thin man, with blonde whiskers, was walking along the bridge with an important air as if he were commanding the Indian mail steamer. My father addressed him ceremoniously and questioned him about his profession, adding many compliments. What might be the importance of Jersey? What did it produce? What was the population? The customs? The nature of the soil, etc., etc. You have there an old shell opener who seems quite interesting. Do you know anything about him? The captain, whom this conversation began to weary, answered dryly. He is some old French tramp whom I found last year in America, and I brought him back. It seems that he has some relatives in Haver, but that he doesn't wish to return to them because he owes them money. His name is Jules, Jules Darmanche or Darvanch or something like that. It seems that he was once rich over there, but you can see what's left of him now. My father turned ashy pale and muttered, his throat contracted, his eyes haggard. Ah. Ah. Very well, very well. I'm not in the least surprised. Thank you very much, Captain. He went away, and the astonished sailor watched him disappear. He returned to my mother so upset that she said to him. Sit down, someone will notice that something is the matter. He sank down on a bench and stammered. It's he. It's he. Then he asked. What are we going to do? She answered quickly. We must get the children out of the way. Since Joseph knows everything, he can go and get them. We must take good care that our son-in-law doesn't find out. My father seemed absolutely bewildered. He murmured. What a catastrophe! Suddenly growing furious, my mother exclaimed. I always thought that that thief never would do anything, and that he would drop down on us again. As if one could expect anything from a davranch. My father passed his hand over his forehead, as he always did when his wife reproached him. She added. Give Joseph some money so that he can pay for the oysters. All that it needed to cap the climax would be to be recognized by that beggar. 
That would be very pleasant. Let's get down to the other end of the boat and take care that that man doesn't come near us. They gave me five francs and walked away. Astonished, my sisters were awaiting their father. I said that Mama had felt a sudden attack of seasickness, and I asked the shell opener. How much do we owe you, monsieur? I felt like laughing, he was my uncle. He answered. Two francs fifty. I held out my five francs and he returned the change. I looked at his hand, it was a poor, wrinkled, sailor's hand, and I looked at his face, an unhappy old face. I said to myself, That is my uncle, the brother of my father, my uncle. I gave him a ten-cent tip. He thanked me. God bless you, my young sir. He spoke like a poor man receiving alms. I couldn't help thinking that he must have begged over there. My sisters looked at me, surprised at my generosity. When I returned the two francs to my father, my mother asked me in surprise. Was there three francs worth? That is impossible. I answered in a firm voice. I gave ten cents as a tip. My mother started, and, staring at me, she exclaimed. You must be crazy. Give ten cents to that man, to that vagabond? She stopped at a look from my father, who was pointing at his son-in-law. Then everybody was silent. Before us, on the distant horizon, a purple shadow seemed to rise out of the sea. It was Jersey. As we approached the breakwater a violent desire seized me once more to see my uncle Jules, to be near him, to say to him something consoling, something tender. But as no one was eating any more oysters, he had disappeared, having probably gone below to the dirty hold which was the home of the poor wretch. The model. Curving like a crescent moon, the little town of Etretat, with its white cliffs, its white, shingly beach and its blue sea, lay in the sunlight at high noon one July day. At either extremity of this crescent its two gates, the smaller to the right, the larger one at the left, stretched forth, one a dwarf and the other a colossal limb, into the water, and the bell tower, almost as tall as the cliff, wide below. Narrowing at the top, raised its pointed summit to the sky. On the sands beside the water a crowd was seated watching the bathers. On the terrace of, the casino another crowd, seated or walking, displayed beneath the brilliant sky a perfect flower patch of bright costumes, with red and blue parasols embroidered with large flowers in silk. On the walk at the end of the terrace, other persons, the restful, quiet ones, were walking slowly, far from the dressy throng. A young man, well known and celebrated as a painter, Jean Sumner, was walking with a dejected air beside a wheelchair in which sat a young woman, his wife. A manservant was gently pushing the chair, and the crippled woman was gazing sadly at the brightness of the sky, the gladness of the day, and the happiness of others. They did not speak. They did not look at each other. Let us stop a while, said the young woman. They stopped, and the painter sat down on a camp stool that the servant handed him. Those who were passing behind the silent and motionless couple looked at them compassionately. A whole legend of devotion was attached to them. He had married her in spite of her infirmity, touched by her affection for him, it was said. Not far from there, two young men were chatting, seated on a bench and looking out into the horizon. No, it is not true, I tell you that I am well acquainted with Jean Sumner. But then, why did he marry her? For she was a cripple when she married, was she not? Just so. He married her, he married her, just as every one marries, parbleu. Because he was an idiot. But why? But why, but why, my friend? There is no why. People do stupid things just because they do stupid things. And, besides, you know very well that painters make a specialty of foolish marriages. They almost always marry models, former sweethearts, in fact, women of doubtful reputation, frequently. Why do they do this? Who can say? One would suppose that constant association with the general run of models would disgust them forever with that class of women. Not at all. After having posed them they marry them. Read that little book, So True, So Cruel and So Beautiful, by Alphonse Derdet, Artists' Wives. 
In the case of the couple you see over there the accident occurred in a special and terrible manner. The little woman played a frightful comedy, or, rather, tragedy. She risked all to win all. Was she sincere? Did she love Jean? Shall we ever know? Who was able to determine precisely how much is put on and how much is real in the actions of a woman? They are always sincere in an eternal mobility of impressions. They are furious, criminal, devoted, admirable and base in obedience to intangible emotions. They tell lies incessantly without intention, without knowing or understanding why, and in spite of it all are absolutely frank in their feelings and sentiments, which they display by violent, unexpected, incomprehensible. Foolish resolutions which overthrow our arguments, our customary poise and all our selfish plans. The unforeseenness and suddenness of their determinations will always render them undecipherable enigmas as far as we are concerned. We continually ask ourselves. Are they sincere? Are they pretending? But, my friend, they are sincere and insincere at one and the same time, because it is their nature to be extremists in both and to be neither one nor the other. See the methods that even the best of them employ to get what they desire. They are complex and simple, these methods. So complex that we can never guess at them beforehand, and so simple that after having been victimized, we cannot help being astonished and exclaiming, What? Did she make a fool of me so easily as that? And they always succeed, old man, especially when it is a question of getting married. But this is Sumner's story. The little woman was a model, of course. She posed for him. She was pretty, very stylish looking, and had a divine figure, it seems. He fancied that he loved her with his whole soul. That is another strange thing. As soon as one likes a woman one sincerely believes that they could not get along without her for the rest of their life. One knows that one has felt the same way before and that disgust invariably succeeded gratification. That in order to pass one's existence side by side with another there must be not a brutal, physical passion which soon dies out, but a sympathy of soul, temperament and temper. One should know how to determine in the enchantment to which one is subjected whether it proceeds from the physical, from a certain sensuous intoxication, or from a deep spiritual charm. Well, he believed himself in love. He made her no end of promises of fidelity, and was devoted to her. She was really attractive, gifted with that fashionable flippancy that little Parisians so readily affect. She chattered, babbled, made foolish remarks that sounded witty from the manner in which they were uttered. She used graceful gestures which were calculated to attract a painter's eye. When she raised her arms, when she bent over, when she got into a carriage, when she held out her hand to you, her gestures were perfect and appropriate. For three months Jean never noticed that, in reality, she was like all other models. He rented a little house for her for the summer at Andresi. I was there one evening when for the first time doubts came into my friend's mind. As it was a beautiful evening we thought we would take a stroll along the bank of the river. The moon poured a flood of light on the trembling water, scattering yellow gleams along its ripples in the currents and all along the course of the wide, slow river. We strolled along the bank, a little enthused by that vague exaltation that these dreamy evenings produce in us. We would have liked to undertake some wonderful task, to love some unknown, deliciously poetic being. We felt ourselves vibrating with raptures, longings, strange aspirations. And we were silent, our beings pervaded by the serene and living coolness of the beautiful night, the coolness of the moonlight, which seemed to penetrate one's body, permeate it, soothe one's spirit fill it with fragrance and steep it in happiness. Suddenly Josephine, that is her name, uttered an exclamation. Oh, did you see the big fish that jumped, over there? He replied without looking, without thinking. Yes, dear. She was angry. No, you did not see it, for your back was turned. He smiled. Yes, that's true. It is so delightful that I am not thinking of anything. She was silent, but at the end of a minute she felt as if she must say something and asked. Are you going to Paris tomorrow? I do not know, he replied. She was annoyed again. Do you think it is very amusing to walk along without speaking? 
People talk when they are not stupid. He did not reply. Then, feeling with her woman's instinct that she was going to make him angry, she began to sing a popular air that had harassed our ears and our minds for two years. J. E. Regardes and Fair. He murmured. Please keep quiet. She replied angrily. Why do you wish me to keep quiet? You spoil the landscape for us, he said. Then followed a scene, a hateful, idiotic scene, with unexpected reproaches, unsuitable recriminations, then tears. Nothing was left unsaid. They went back to the house. He had allowed her to talk without replying, enervated by the beauty of the scene and dumbfounded by this storm of abuse. Three months later he strove wildly to free himself from those invincible and invisible bonds with which such a friendship chains our lives. She kept him under her influence, tyrannizing over him, making his life a burden to him. They quarreled continually, vituperating and finally fighting each other. He wanted to break with her at any cost. He sold all his canvases, borrowed money from his friends, realizing twenty thousand francs, he was not well known then, and left them for her one morning with a note of farewell. He came and took refuge with me. About three o'clock that afternoon there was a ring at the bell. I went to the door. A woman sprang toward me, pushed me aside, came in and went into my atelier. It was she. He had risen when he saw her coming. She threw the envelope containing the banknotes at his feet with a truly noble gesture and said in a quick tone, There's your money. I don't want it. She was very pale, trembling and ready undoubtedly to commit any folly. As for him, I saw him grow pale also, pale with rage and exasperation, ready also perhaps to commit any violence. He asked. What do you want? She replied. I do not choose to be treated like a common woman. You implored me to accept you. I asked you for nothing. Keep me with you. He stamped his foot. No, that's a little too much. If you think you are going. I had seized his arm. Keep still, Jean. Let me settle it. I went toward her and quietly, little by little, I began to reason with her, exhausting all the arguments that are used under similar circumstances. She listened to me, motionless, with a fixed gaze, obstinate and silent. Finally, not knowing what more to say, and seeing that there would be a scene, I thought of a last resort and said, He loves you still, my dear, but his family want him to marry someone. And you understand? She gave a start and exclaimed, Ah! Ah! Now I understand. And turning toward him, she said, You are, you are going to get married? He replied decidedly, Yes. She took a step forward. If you marry, I will kill myself. Do you hear? He shrugged his shoulders and replied. Well, then kill yourself. She stammered out, almost choking with her violent emotion. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Say it again. He repeated. Well, then kill yourself if you like. With her face almost livid, she replied. Do not dare me. I will throw myself from the window. He began to laugh, walked toward the window, opened it, and bowing with the gesture of one who desires to let someone else precede him, he said. This is the way. After you. She looked at him for a second with terrible, wild, staring eyes. Then, taking a run as if she were going to jump a hedge in the country, she rushed past me and passed him, jumped over the sill and disappeared. I shall never forget the impression made on me by that open window after I had seen that body pass through it to fall to the ground. It appeared to me in a second to be as large as the heavens and as hollow as space. And I drew back instinctively, not daring to look at it, as though I feared I might fall out myself. Jean, dumbfounded, stood motionless. They brought the poor girl in with both legs broken. She will never walk again. Jean, wild with remorse and also possibly touched with gratitude, made up his mind to marry her. There you have it, old man. It was growing dusk. The young woman felt chilly and wanted to go home, 
and the servant wheeled the invalid chair in the direction of the village. The painter walked beside his wife, neither of them having exchanged a word for an hour. This story appeared in Lu Galwa, December 17, 1883. A Vagabond He was a journeyman carpenter, a good workman and a steady fellow, twenty-seven years old, but, although the eldest son, Jacques Randall had been forced to live on his family for two months, owing to the general lack of work. He had walked about seeking work for over a month and had left his native town, Villavery, in La Manche, because he could find nothing to do and would no longer deprive his family of the bread they needed themselves. When he was the strongest of them all. His two sisters earned but little as charwomen. He went and inquired at the town hall, and the mayor's secretary told him that he would find work at the labor agency, and so he started, well provided with papers and certificates, and carrying another pair of shoes. A pair of trousers and a shirt in a blue handkerchief at the end of his stick. And he had walked almost without stopping, day and night, along interminable roads, in sun and rain, without ever reaching that mysterious country where workmen find work. At first he had the fixed idea that he must only work as a carpenter, but at every carpenter's shop where he applied he was told that they had just dismissed men on account of work being so slack, and, finding himself at the end of his resources. He made up his mind to undertake any job that he might come across on the road. And so by turns he was a navvy, stableman, stonecutter. He split wood, lopped the branches of trees, dug wells, mixed mortar, tied up faggots, tended goats on a mountain, and all for a few pence, for he only obtained two or three days' work occasionally by offering himself at a shamefully low price in order to tempt the avarice of employers and peasants. And now for a week he had found nothing, and had no money left, and nothing to eat but a piece of bread, thanks to the charity of some women from whom he had begged at house doors on the road. It was getting dark, and Jacques Randall, jaded, his legs failing him, his stomach empty, and with despair in his heart, was walking barefoot on the grass by the side of the road, for he was taking care of his last pair of shoes as the other pair had already ceased to exist for a long time. It was a Saturday, toward the end of autumn. The heavy grey clouds were being driven rapidly through the sky by the gusts of wind which whistled among the trees, and one felt that it would rain soon. The country was deserted at that hour on the eve of Sunday. Here and there in the fields there rose up stacks of wheat straw, like huge yellow mushrooms, and the fields looked bare, as they had already been sown for the next year. Randall was hungry, with the hunger of some wild animal, such a hunger as drives wolves to attack men. Worn out and weakened with fatigue, he took longer strides, so as not to take so many steps, and with heavy head, the blood throbbing in his temples, with red eyes and dry mouth, he grasped his stick tightly in his hand. With a longing to strike the first passerby who might be going home to supper. He looked at the sides of the road, imagining he saw potatoes dug up and lying on the ground before his eyes. If he had found any he would have gathered some dead wood, made a fire in the ditch and have had a capital supper off the warm, round vegetables with which he would first of all have warmed his cold hands. But it was too late in the year, and he would have to gnaw a raw beetroot which he might pick up in a field as he had done the day before. For the last two days he had talked to himself as he quickened his steps under the influence of his thoughts. He had never thought much hitherto, as he had given all his mind, all his simple faculties to his mechanical work. But now fatigue and this desperate search for work which he could not get, refusals and rebuffs, nights spent in the open air lying on the grass, long fasting, the contempt which he knew people with a settled abode felt for a vagabond. And that question which he was continually asked, why do you not remain at home? Distress at not being able to use his strong arms which he felt so full of vigor, the recollection of the relations he had left at home and who also had not a penny, filled him by degrees with rage, which had been accumulating every day, every hour, every minute, and which now escaped his lips in spite of himself in short, growling sentences. As he stumbled over the stones which tripped his bare feet, he grumbled, How wretched! How miserable! A set of hogs, to let a man die of hunger, a carpenter, a set of hogs, not two sous, not two sous, and now it is raining, a set of hogs. 
He was indignant at the injustice of fate, and cast the blame on men, on all men, because nature, that great, blind mother, is unjust, cruel and perfidious. And he repeated through his clenched teeth. A set of hogs as he looked at the thin gray smoke which rose from the roofs, for it was the dinner hour. And, without considering that there is another injustice which is human, and which is called robbery and violence, he felt inclined to go into one of those houses to murder the inhabitants and to sit down to table in their stead. He said to himself, I have no right to live now, as they are letting me die of hunger, and yet I only ask for work, a set of hogs. And the pain in his limbs, the gnawing in his heart rose to his head like terrible intoxication, and gave rise to this simple thought in his brain, I have the right to live because I breathe and because the air is the common property of everybody. So nobody has the right to leave me without bread. A fine, thick, icy cold rain was coming down, and he stopped and murmured, Oh, misery! Another month of walking before I get home. He was indeed returning home then, for he saw that he should more easily find work in his native town, where he was known, and he did not mind what he did than on the high roads, where everybody suspected him. As the carpentering business was not prosperous, he would turn day laborer, be a mason's hodman, a ditcher, break stones on the road. If he only earned a franc a day, that would at any rate buy him something to eat. He tied the remains of his last pocket handkerchief round his neck to prevent the cold rain from running down his back and chest, but he soon found that it was penetrating the thin material of which his clothes were made. And he glanced about him with the agonized look of a man who does not know where to hide his body and to rest his head, and has no place of shelter in the whole world. Night came on and wrapped the country in obscurity, and in the distance, in a meadow, he saw a dark spot on the grass, it was a cow, and so he got over the ditch by the roadside and went up to her without exactly knowing what he was doing. When he got close to her she raised her great head to him, and he thought, if I only had a jug I could get a little milk. He looked at the cow and the cow looked at him and then, suddenly giving her a kick in the side, he said, get up. The animal got up slowly, letting her heavy udders bang down. Then the man lay down on his back between the animal's legs and drank for a long time, squeezing her warm, swollen teats, which tasted of the cow's tall, with both hands, and he drank as long as she gave any milk. But the icy rain began to fall more heavily, and he saw no place of shelter on the whole of that bare plain. He was cold, and he looked at a light which was shining among the trees in the window of a house. The cow had lain down again heavily, and he sat down by her side and stroked her head, grateful for the nourishment she had given him. The animal's strong, thick breath, which came out of her nostrils like two jets of steam in the evening air, blew on the workman's face, and he said, You are not cold inside there. He put his hands on her chest and under her stomach to find some warmth there, and then the idea struck him that he might pass the night beside that large, warm animal. So he found a comfortable place and laid his head on her side, and then, as he was worn out with fatigue, fell asleep immediately. He woke up, however, several times, with his back or his stomach half frozen, according as he put one or the other against the animal's flank. Then he turned over to warm and dry that part of his body which had remained exposed to the night air, and soon went soundly to sleep again. The crowing of a cock woke him, the day was breaking, it was no longer raining, and the sky was bright. The cow was resting with her muzzle on the ground, and he stooped down, resting on his hands, to kiss those wide, moist nostrils, and said, Goodbye, my beauty, until next time. You are a nice animal. Goodbye. Then he put on his shoes and went off, and for two hours walked straight before him, always following the same road, and then he felt so tired that he sat down on the grass. It was broad daylight by that time, and the church bells were ringing. Men in blue blouses, women in white caps, some on foot, some in carts, began to pass along the road, going to the neighboring villages to spend Sunday with friends or relations. A stout peasant came in sight, driving before him a score of frightened, bleeding sheep, with the help of an active dog. Randall got up, and raising his cap, said, You do not happen to have any work for a man who is dying of hunger? But the other, giving an angry look at the vagabond, replied, I have no work for fellows whom I meet on the road. 
and the carpenter went back and sat down by the side of the ditch again. He waited there for a long time, watching the country people pass and looking for a kind, compassionate face before he renewed his request and finally selected a man in an overcoat whose stomach was adorned with a gold chain. I have been looking for work, he said, for the last two months and cannot find any, and I have not a sew in my pocket. But the would-be gentleman replied, you should have read the notice which is stuck up at the entrance to the village, begging is prohibited within the boundaries of this parish. Let me tell you that I am the mayor, and if you do not get out of here pretty quickly I shall have you arrested. Randall, who was getting angry, replied, have me arrested if you like. I should prefer it, for, at any rate, I should not die of hunger. And he went back and sat down by the side of his ditch again, and in about a quarter of an hour two gendarmes appeared on the road. They were walking slowly side by side, glittering in the sun with their shining hats, their yellow accoutrements and their metal buttons, as if to frighten evildoers and to put them to flight at a distance. He knew that they were coming after him, but he did not move, for he was seized with a sudden desire to defy them, to be arrested by them, and to have his revenge later. They came on without appearing to have seen him, walking heavily, with military step, and balancing themselves as if they were doing the goose step. And then, suddenly, as they passed him, appearing to have noticed him, they stopped and looked at him angrily and threateningly, and the brigadier came up to him and asked, What are you doing here? I am resting, the man replied calmly. Where do you come from? If I had to tell you all the places I have been to it would take me more than an hour. Where are you going to? To Ville Avery. Where is that? In La Manche. Is that where you belong? It is. Why did you leave it? To look for work. The brigadier turned to his gendarme and said in the angry voice of a man who is exasperated at last by an oft-repeated trick, they all say that, these scamps. I know all about it. And then he continued, have you any papers? Yes, I have some. Give them to me. Randall took his papers out of his pocket, his certificates, those poor, worn-out, dirty papers which were falling to pieces, and gave them to the soldier who spelled them through, hemming and hawing, and then, having seen that they were all in order, he gave them back to Randall with the dissatisfied look of a man whom someone cleverer than himself has tricked. After a few moments further reflection, he asked him, have you any money on you? No. None whatever? None. Not even a so? Not even a son. How do you live then? On what people give me? Then you beg? And Randall answered resolutely, Yes, when I can. Then the gendarme said, I have caught you on the high road in the act of vagabondage in begging, without any resources or trade, and so I command you to come with me. The carpenter got up and said, Wherever you please. And, placing himself between the two soldiers, even before he had received the order to do so, he added, Well, lock me up, that will at any rate put a roof over my head when it rains. And they set off toward the village, the red tiles of which could be seen through the leafless trees, a quarter of a league off. Service was about to begin when they went through the village. The square was full of people, who immediately formed two lines to see the criminal pass. He was being followed by a crowd of excited children. Male and female peasants looked at the prisoner between the two gendarmes, with hatred in their eyes and a longing to throw stones at him, to tear his skin with their nails to trample him under their feet. They asked each other whether he had committed murder or robbery. The butcher, who was an ex-Spahi, declared that he was a deserter. The tobacconist thought that he recognized him as the man who had that very morning passed a bad half-franc piece off on him, and the ironmonger declared that he was the murderer of Widow Mallet, whom the police had been looking for for six months. In the municipal court, into which his custodians took him, Randall saw the mayor again sitting on the magisterial bench, with the schoolmaster by his side. Aha! Aha! the magistrate exclaimed, so here you are again, my fine fellow. I told you I should have you locked up. Well, brigadier, what is he charged with? He is a vagabond without house or home, Monsieur Le Maire, without any resources or money, so he says, who was arrested in the act of begging, 
but he is provided with good testimonials, and his papers are all in order. Show me his papers, the mayor said. He took them, read them, reread, returned them and then said, search him. So they searched him, but found nothing, and the mayor seemed perplexed, and asked the workman. What were you doing on the road this morning? I was looking for work. Work. On the high road? How do you expect me to find any, if I hide in the woods? They looked at each other with the hatred of two wild beasts, which belong to different hostile species, and the magistrate continued, I am going to have you set at liberty, but do not be brought up before me again. To which the carpenter replied, I would rather you locked me up, I have had enough running about the country. But the magistrate replied severely, Be silent. And then he said to the two gendarmes, You will conduct this man two hundred yards from the village and let him continue his journey. At any rate, give me something to eat, the workman said, but the other grew indignant, Have we nothing to do but to feed you? Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, ah! Uh. That is rather too much. But Randall went on firmly, if you let me nearly die of hunger again, you will force me to commit a crime, and then, so much the worse for you other fat fellows. The mayor had risen and he repeated, take him away immediately or I shall end by getting angry. The two gendarmes thereupon seized the carpenter by the arms and dragged him out. He allowed them to do it without resistance, passed through the village again and found himself on the high road once more. And when the men had accompanied him two hundred yards beyond the village, the brigadier said, Now off with you and do not let me catch you about here again, for if I do, you will know it. Randall went off without replying or knowing where he was going. He walked on for a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes, so stupefied that he no longer thought of anything. But suddenly, as he was passing a small house, where the window was half open, the smell of the soup and boiled meat stopped him suddenly, and hunger, fierce, devouring, maddening hunger, seized him and almost drove him against the walls of the house like a wild beast. He said aloud in a grumbling voice, in heaven's name. They must give me some this time. And he began to knock at the door vigorously with his stick, and as no one came he knocked louder and called out, Hey! Hey! You people in there, open the door. And then, as nothing stirred, he went up to the window and pushed it wider open with his hand, and the close warm air of the kitchen, full of the smell of hot soup, meat and cabbage, escaped into the cold outer air. And with a bound the carpenter was in the house. Two places were set at the table, and no doubt the proprietors of the house, on going to church, had left their dinner on the fire, their nice Sunday boiled beef and vegetable soup, while there was a loaf of new bread on the chimney piece. Between two bottles which seemed full. Randall seized the bread first of all and broke it with as much violence as if he were strangling a man, and then he began to eat voraciously, swallowing great mouthfuls quickly. But almost immediately the smell of the meat attracted him to the fireplace, and, having taken off the lid of the saucepan, he plunged a fork into it and brought out a large piece of beef tied with a string. Then he took more cabbage, carrots and onions until his plate was full, and, having put it on the table, he sat down before it, cut the meat into four pieces, and dined as if he had been at home. When he had eaten nearly all the meat, besides a quantity of vegetables, he felt thirsty and took one of the bottles off the mantelpiece. Scarcely had he poured the liquor into his glass when he saw it was brandy. So much the better. It was warming and would instill some fire into his veins, and that would be all right, after being so cold, and he drank some. He certainly enjoyed it, for he had grown unaccustomed to it, and he poured himself out another glassful, which he drank at two gulps. And then almost immediately he felt quite merry and light-hearted from the effects of the alcohol, just as if some great happiness filled his heart. He continued to eat, but more slowly, and dipping his bread into the soup. His skin had become burning, and especially his forehead, where the veins were throbbing. But suddenly the church bells began to ring. Mass was over, an instinct rather than fear, the instinct of prudence, which guides all beings and makes them clear-sighted in danger, made the carpenter get up. He put the remains of the loaf into one pocket and the brandy bottle into the other, and he furtively went to the window and looked out into the road. It was still deserted, 
so he jumped out and set off walking again, but instead of following the high road he ran across the fields toward a wood he saw a little way off. He felt alert, strong, light-hearted, glad of what he had done, and so nimble that he sprang over the enclosure of the fields at a single bound. And as soon as he was under the trees he took the bottle out of his pocket again and began to drink once more, swallowing it down as he walked, and then his ideas began to get confused, his eyes grew dim, and his legs as elastic as springs. And he started singing the old popular song. Oh! What joy, what joy it is! To pick the sweet, wild strawberries. He was now walking on thick, damp, cool moss, and that soft carpet under his feet made him feel absurdly inclined to turn head over heels as he used to do when a child, so he took a run, turned a somersault, got up and began over again. And between each time he began to sing again. Oh! What joy, what joy it is! To pick the sweet, wild strawberries. Suddenly he found himself above a deep road, and in the road he saw a tall girl, a servant, who was returning to the village with two pails of milk. He watched, stooping down, and with his eyes as bright as those of a dog who scents a quail, but she saw him raised her head and said, Was that you singing like that? He did not reply, however, but jumped down into the road, although it was a fall of at least six feet and when she saw him suddenly standing in front of her, she exclaimed, Oh! Dear, how you frightened me! But he did not hear her, for he was drunk, he was mad, excited by another requirement which was more imperative than hunger, more feverish than alcohol. By the irresistible fury of the man who has been deprived of everything for two months, and who is drunk, who is young, ardent and inflamed by all the appetites which nature has implanted in the vigorous flesh of men. The girl started back from him, frightened at his face, his eyes, his half-open mouth, his outstretched hands, but he seized her by the shoulders, and without a word, threw her down in the road. She let her two pails fall, and they rolled over noisily, and all the milk was spilt, and then she screamed lustily, but it was of no avail in that lonely spot. When she got up the thought of her overturned pails suddenly filled her with fury, and, taking off one of her wooden sabots, she threw it at the man to break his head if he did not pay her for her milk. But he, mistaking the reason of this sudden violent attack, somewhat sobered, and frightened at what he had done, ran off as fast as he could, while she threw stones at him, some of which hit him in the back. He ran for a long time, very long, until he felt more tired than he had ever been before. His legs were so weak that they could scarcely carry him. All his ideas were confused, he lost recollection of everything and could no longer think about anything, and so he sat down at the foot of a tree, and in five minutes was fast asleep. He was soon awakened, however, by a rough shake, and, on opening his eyes, he saw two cocked hats of shiny leather bending over him, and the two gendarmes of the morning, who were holding him and binding his arms. I knew I should catch you again, said the brigadier jeeringly. But Randall got up without replying. The two men shook him, quite ready to ill-treat him if he made a movement, for he was their prey now. He had become a jailbird, caught by those hunters of criminals who would not let him go again. Now, start, the brigadier said, and they set off. It was late afternoon, and the autumn twilight was setting in over the land, and in half an hour they reached the village, where every door was open, for the people had heard what had happened. Peasants and peasant women and girls, excited with anger, as if every man had been robbed and every woman attacked, wished to see the wretch brought back, so that they might overwhelm him with abuse. They hooted him from the first house in the village until they reached the Hotel de Ville, where the mayor was waiting for him to be himself avenged on this vagabond, and as soon as he saw him approaching he cried. Ah! My fine fellow! Here we are. And he rubbed his hands, more pleased than he usually was, and continued, I said so. I said so, the moment I saw him in the road. And then with increased satisfaction. Oh, you blaggard. Oh, you dirty blaggard. You will get your twenty years, my fine fellow. The fishing hole. Cuts and wounds which caused death. Such was the charge upon which Leopold Renard, upholsterer, was summoned before the court of assizes. Round him were the principal witnesses, Madame Flame Che, widow of the victim, and Louis Laduro, 
cabinet maker, and Jean Durdent, plumber. Near the criminal was his wife, dressed in black, an ugly little woman, who looked like a monkey dressed as a lady. This is how Renard, Leopold, recounted the drama. Good heavens, it is a misfortune of which I was the prime victim all the time, and with which my will has nothing to do. The facts are their own commentary, Monsieur le President. I am an honest man, a hard-working man, an upholsterer, living in the same street for the last sixteen years, known, liked, respected and esteemed by all, as my neighbors can testify, even the porter's wife, who is not amiable every day. I am fond of work, I am fond of saving, I like honest men and respectable amusements. That is what has ruined me, so much the worse for me, but as my will had nothing to do with it, I continue to respect myself. Every Sunday for the last five years my wife and I have spent the day at Passy. We get fresh air, and, besides, we are fond of fishing. Oh! We are as fond of it as we are of little onions. Mealy inspired me with that enthusiasm, the jade, and she is more enthusiastic than I am, the scold, seeing that all the mischief in this business is her fault, as you will see immediately. I am strong and mild-tempered, without a pennyworth of malice in me. But she. Oh. La. La. She looks like nothing, she is short and thin. Very well, she does more mischief than a weasel. I do not deny that she has some good qualities. She has some, and very important ones for a man in business. But her character. Just ask about it in the neighborhood, and even the porter's wife, who has just sent me about my business, she will tell you something about it. Every day she used to find fault with my mild temper, I would not put up with this. I would not put up with that. If I had listened to her, Monsieur le President, I should have had at least three hand-to-hand -hand fights a month. Madame Renard interrupted him, and for good reasons, too, they laugh best who laugh last. He turned toward her frankly, well, I can't blame you, since you were not the cause of it. Then, facing the President again, he said, I will continue. We used to go to Passy every Saturday evening, so as to begin fishing at daybreak the next morning. It is a habit which has become second nature with us, as the saying is. Three years ago this summer I discovered a place, oh! Such a spot! Oh, dear, dear! In the shade, eight feet of water at least and perhaps ten, a hole with cavities under the bank a regular nest for fish and a paradise for the fishermen. I might look upon that fishing hole as my property, Monsieur le President, as I was its Christopher Columbus. Everybody in the neighborhood knew it, without making any opposition. They would say, that is Renard's place. And nobody would have gone there, not even Monsieur Plumeau, who is well known, be it said without any offense, for poaching on other people's preserves. Well, I returned to this place of which I felt certain, just as if I had owned it. I had scarcely got there on Saturday, when I got into Delilah, with my wife. Delilah is my Norwegian boat, which I had built by Fornair, and which is light and safe. Well, as I said, we got into the boat and we were going to set bait, and for setting bait there is none to be compared with me, and they all know it. You want to know with what I bait? I cannot answer that question. It has nothing to do with the accident. I cannot answer, that is my secret. There are more than three hundred people who have asked me, I have been offered glasses of brandy and liqueur, fried fish, matlows, to make me tell. But just go and try whether the chub will come. Ah! They have tempted my stomach to get at my secret, my recipe. Only my wife knows, and she will not tell it any more than I will. Is not that so, Mealy? The president of the court interrupted him. Just get to the facts as soon as you can, and the accused continued, I am getting to them, I am getting to them. Well, on Saturday, July 8th, we left by the twenty-five past five train and before dinner we went to set bait as usual. The weather promised to keep fine and I said to Mealy, all right for tomorrow. And she replied, if looks like it, we never talk more than that together. And then we returned to dinner. I was happy and thirsty, and that was the cause of everything. I said to Mealy, look here, Mealy, it is fine weather, suppose I drink a bottle of cask a mesh dot. 
That is a weak white wine which we have christened so, because if you drink too much of it it prevents you from sleeping and takes the place of a nightcap. Do you understand me? She replied, you can do as you please, but you will be ill again and will not be able to get up tomorrow. That was true, sensible and prudent, clear-sighted, I must confess. Nevertheless I could not resist, and I drank my bottle. It all came from that. Well, I could not sleep. By Jove. It kept me awake till two o'clock in the morning, and then I went to sleep so soundly that I should not have heard the angel sounding his trump at the last judgment. In short, my wife woke me at six o'clock and I jumped out of bed, hastily put on my trousers and jersey, washed my face and jumped on board Delilah. But it was too late, for when I arrived at my hole it was already occupied. Such a thing had never happened to me in three years, and it made me feel as if I were being robbed under my own eyes. I said to myself, confound it all. Confound it. And then my wife began to nag at me. Eh? What about your cascamesh? Get along, you drunkard. Are you satisfied, you great fool? I could say nothing, because it was all true, but I landed all the same near the spot and tried to profit by what was left. Perhaps after all the fellow might catch nothing and go away. He was a little thin man in white linen coat and waistcoat and a large straw hat, and his wife, a fat woman, doing embroidery, sat behind him. When she saw us take up our position close to them she murmured, Are there no other places on the river? My wife, who was furious, replied, People who have any manners make inquiries about the habits of the neighborhood before occupying reserved spots. As I did not want a fuss, I said to her, Hold your tongue, Mealy. Let them alone, let them alone. We shall see. Well, we fastened Delilah under the willows and had landed and were fishing side by side, Mealy and I, close to the two others. But here, monsieur, I must enter into details. We had only been there about five minutes when our neighbor's line began to jerk twice, thrice, and then he pulled out a chub as thick as my thigh, rather less, perhaps, but nearly as big. My heart beat, the perspiration stood on my forehead and Mealy said to me, Well, you saw it, did you see that? Just then Monsieur Brew, the grocer of Poissy, who is fond of gudgeon fishing, passed in a boat and called out to me, So somebody has taken your usual place, Monsieur Renard? And I replied, Yes, Monsieur Brew, there are some people in this world who do not know the rules of common politeness. The little man in linen pretended not to hear, nor his fat lump of a wife, either. Here the president interrupted him a second time, Take care, you are insulting the widow, Madame Flameche, who is present. Renard made his excuses, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon, my anger carried me away. Well, not a quarter of an hour had passed when the little man caught another chub, and another almost immediately, and another five minutes later. Tears were in my eyes, and I knew that Madame Renard was boiling with rage, for she kept on nagging at me. Oh, how horrid! Don't you see that he is robbing you of your fish? Do you think that you will catch anything? Not even a frog, nothing whatever. Why, my hands are tingling, just to think of it. But I said to myself, let us wait until twelve o'clock. Then this poacher will go to lunch and I shall get my place again. As for me, Monsieur le President, I lunch on that spot every Sunday. We bring our provisions in Delilah. But there. At noon the wretch produced a chicken in a newspaper, and while he was eating, he actually caught another chub. Mealy and I had a morsel also, just a bite, a mere nothing, for our heart was not in it. Then I took up my newspaper to aid my digestion. Every Sunday I read the gill bloss in the shade by the side of the water. It is Columbine's day, you know. Columbine, who writes the articles in the gill bloss. I generally put Madame Renard into a rage by pretending to know this Columbine. It is not true, for I do not know her and have never seen her, but that does not matter. She writes very well, and then she says things that are pretty plain for a woman. She suits me, and there are not many of her sort. Well, I began to tease my wife, but she got angry immediately, and very angry, so I held my tongue. At that moment are two witnesses who are present here. Monsieur Ladouro and Monsieur Durdent, 
appeared on the other side of the river. We knew each other by sight. The little man began to fish again and he caught so many that I trembled with vexation and his wife said, It is an uncommonly good spot, and we will come here always, desire. As for me, a cold shiver ran down my back, and Madame Renard kept repeating, You are not a man, you have the blood of a chicken in your veins, and suddenly I said to her, Look here, I would rather go away or I shall be doing something foolish. And she whispered to me, as if she had put a red-hot iron under my nose, you are not a man. Now you are going to run away and surrender your place. Go, then, Bazaine. I felt hurt, but yet I did not move, while the other fellow pulled out a bream, oh, I never saw such a large one before, never. And then my wife began to talk aloud, as if she were thinking, and you can see her tricks. She said, that is what one might call stolen fish, seeing that we set the bait ourselves. At any rate, they ought to give us back the money we have spent on bait. Then the fat woman in the cotton dress said in her turn, do you mean to call us thieves, madam? Explanations followed and compliments began to fly. Oh, Lord! Those creatures know some good ones. They shouted so loud that our two witnesses, who were on the other bank, began to call out by way of a joke, less noise over there, you will interfere with your husband's fishing. The fact is that neither the little man nor I moved any more than if we had been two tree stumps. We remained there, with our eyes fixed on the water, as if we had heard nothing, but, by Jove, we heard all the same. You are a thief. You are nothing better than a tramp. You are a regular jade, and so on and so on. A sailor could not have said more. Suddenly I heard a noise behind me and turned round. It was the other one, the fat woman, who had attacked my wife with her parasol. Whack, whack! Mealy got two of them. But she was furious, and she hits hard when she is in a rage. She caught the fat woman by the hair and then thump. Thump! Slaps in the face rained down like ripe plums. I should have let them fight it out, women together, men together. It does not do to mix the blows. But the little man in the linen jacket jumped up like a devil and was going to rush at my wife. Ah! No, no, not that, my friend. I caught the gentleman with the end of my fist, and crash. Crash. One on the nose, the other in the stomach. He threw up his arms and legs and fell on his back into the river, just into the hole. I should have fished him out most certainly, Monsieur le President, if I had had time. But, to make matters worse, the fat woman had the upper hand and was pounding mealy for all she was worth. I know I ought not to have interfered while the man was in the water, but I never thought that he would drown and said to myself, bah, it will cool him. I therefore ran up to the women to separate them and all I received was scratches and bites. Good Lord, what creatures! Well, it took me five minutes, and perhaps ten, to separate those two viragos. When I turned round there was nothing to be seen. The water was as smooth as a lake and the others yonder kept shouting, Fish him out! Fish him out! It was all very well to say that, but I cannot swim and still less dive. At last the man from the dam came and two gentlemen with boat hooks, but over a quarter of an hour had passed. He was found at the bottom of the hole, in eight feet of water, as I have said. There he was, the poor little man, in his linen suit. Those are the facts such as I have sworn to. I am innocent, on my honor. The witnesses having given testimony to the same effect, the accused was acquitted. The spasm. The hotel guests slowly entered the dining room and took their places. The waiters did not hurry themselves, in order to give the late comers a chance and thus avoid the trouble of bringing in the dishes a second time. The old bathers, the habitués, whose season was almost over, glanced, gazed toward the door whenever it opened, to see what new faces might appear. This is the principal distraction of watering places. People look forward to the dinner hour in order to inspect each day's new arrivals, to find out who they are, what they do, and what they think. We always have a vague desire to meet pleasant people, to make agreeable acquaintances, perhaps to meet with a love adventure. 
In this life of elbowings, unknown strangers assume an extreme importance. Curiosity is aroused, sympathy is ready to exhibit itself, and sociability is the order of the day. We cherish antipathies for a week and friendships for a month. We see people with different eyes, when we view them through the medium of acquaintanceship at watering places. We discover in men suddenly, after an hour's chat, in the evening after dinner, under the trees in the park where the healing spring bubbles up, a high intelligence and astonishing merits. And a month afterward we have completely forgotten these new friends, who were so fascinating when we first met them. Permanent and serious ties are also formed here sooner than anywhere else. People see each other every day, they become acquainted very quickly, and their affection is tinged with the sweetness and unrestraint of long-standing intimacies. We cherish in after years the dear and tender memories of those first hours of friendship, the memory of those first conversations in which a soul was unveiled. Of those first glances which interrogate and respond to questions and secret thoughts which the mouth has not as yet uttered, the memory of that first cordial confidence. The memory of that delightful sensation of opening our hearts to those who seem to open theirs to us in return. And the melancholy of watering places, the monotony of days that are all alike, proves hourly an incentive to this heart expansion. Well, this evening, as on every other evening, we awaited the appearance of strange faces. Only two appeared, but they were very remarkable, a man and a woman, father and daughter. They immediately reminded me of some of Edgar Poe's characters and yet there was about them a charm, the charm associated with misfortune. I looked upon them as the victims of fate. The man was very tall and thin, rather stooped, with perfectly white hair, too white for his comparatively youthful physiognomy. And there was in his bearing and in his person that austerity peculiar to Protestants. The daughter, who was probably twenty-four or twenty-five, was small in stature, and was also very thin, very pale and she had the air of one who was worn out with utter lassitude. We meet people like this from time to time, who seem too weak for the tasks and the needs of daily life, too weak to move about, to walk, to do all that we do every day. She was rather pretty, with a transparent, spiritual beauty. And she ate with extreme slowness, as if she were almost incapable of moving her arms. It must have been she, assuredly, who had come to take the waters. They sat facing me, on the opposite side of the table. And I at once noticed that the father had a very singular, nervous twitching. Every time he wanted to reach an object, his hand described a sort of zigzag before it succeeded in reaching what it was in search of, and after a little while this movement annoyed me so that I turned aside my head in order not to see it. I noticed, too, that the young girl, during meals, wore a glove on her left hand. After dinner I went for a stroll in the park of the bathing establishment. This led toward the little Auvergne's station of chatel Guyon, hidden in a gorge at the foot of the high mountain, from which flowed so many boiling springs, arising from the deep bed of extinct volcanoes. Over yonder, above our heads, the domes of extinct craters lifted their ragged peaks above the rest in the long mountain chain. For chatel Guyon is situated at the entrance to the land of mountain domes. Beyond it stretches out the region of peaks, and, farther on again the region of precipitous summits. The Puy de Dome is the highest of the domes, the peak of Sanchi is the loftiest of the peaks, and Cantal is the most precipitous of these mountain heights. It was a very warm evening, and I was walking up and down a shady path, listening to the opening, strains of the casino band, which was playing on an elevation overlooking the park and I saw the father and the daughter advancing slowly in my direction. I bowed as one bows to one's hotel companions at a watering place. And the man, coming to a sudden halt, said to me, Could you not, monsieur, tell us of a nice walk to take, short, pretty, and not steep, and pardon my troubling you? I offered to show them the way toward the valley through which the little river flowed, a deep valley forming a gorge between two tall, craggy, wooded slopes. They gladly accepted my offer. And we talked, naturally, about the virtue of the waters. Oh, he said, my daughter has a strange malady, the seed of which is unknown. She suffers from incomprehensible nervous attacks. At one time the doctors think she has an attack of heart disease, at another time they imagine it is some affection of the liver, 
and at another they declare it to be a disease of the spine. Today this protean malady, that assumes a thousand forms and a thousand modes of attack, is attributed to the stomach, which is the great cauldron and regulator of the body. This is why we have come here. For my part, I am rather inclined to think it is the nerves. In any case it is very sad. Immediately the remembrance of the violent spasmodic movement of his hand came back to my mind, and I asked him. But is this not the result of heredity? Are not your own nerves somewhat affected? He replied calmly. Mine? Oh, no my nerves have always been very steady. Then, suddenly, after a pause, he went on. Ah. You were alluding to the jerking movement of my hand every time I try to reach for anything? This arises from a terrible experience which I had. Just imagine, this daughter of mine was actually buried alive. I could only utter, ah. So great were my astonishment and emotion. He continued. Here is the story. It is simple. Juliet had been subject for some time to serious attacks of the heart. We believed that she had disease of that organ, and were prepared for the worst. One day she was carried into the house cold, lifeless, dead. She had fallen down unconscious in the garden. The doctor certified that life was extinct. I watched by her side for a day and two nights. I laid her with my own hands in the coffin, which I accompanied to the cemetery, where she was deposited in the family vault. It is situated in the very heart of Lorraine. I wished to have her interred with her jewels, bracelets, necklaces, rings, all presents which she had received from me, and wearing her first ball dress. You may easily imagine my state of mind when I re-entered our home. She was the only one I had, for my wife had been dead for many years. I found my way to my own apartment in a half-distracted condition, utterly exhausted, and sank into my easy chair, without the capacity to think or the strength to move. I was nothing better now than a suffering, vibrating machine, a human being who had, as it were, been flayed alive, my soul was like an open wound. My old valet, Prosper, who had assisted me in placing Juliet in her coffin, and aided me in preparing her for her last sleep, entered the room noiselessly, and asked. Does Monsieur want anything? I merely shook my head in reply. Monsieur is wrong, he urged. He will injure his health. Would Monsieur like me to put him to bed? I answered, No, let me alone. And he left the room. I know not how many hours slipped away. Oh, what a night, what a night! It was cold. My fire had died out in the huge grate, and the wind, the winter wind, an icy wind, a winter hurricane, blew with a regular, sinister noise against the windows. How many hours slipped away? There I was without sleeping, powerless, crushed, my eyes wide open, my legs stretched out, my body limp, inanimate, and my mind torpid with despair. Suddenly the great doorbell, the great bell of the vestibule, rang out. I started so that my chair cracked under me. The solemn, ponderous sound vibrated through the empty country house as through a vault. I turned round to see what the hour was by the clock. It was just two in the morning. Who could be coming at such an hour? And, abruptly, the bell again rang twice. The servants, without doubt, were afraid to get up. I took a wax candle and descended the stairs. I was on the point of asking, who is there? Then I felt ashamed of my weakness, and I slowly drew back the heavy bolts. My heart was throbbing wildly. I was frightened. I opened the door brusquely and in the darkness I distinguished a white figure, standing erect, something that resembled an apparition. I recoiled petrified with horror, faltering. Who 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 are you? A voice replied. It is I, father. It was my daughter. I really thought I must be mad, and I retreated backward before this advancing specter. I kept moving away, making a sign with my hand, as if to drive the phantom away, that gesture which you have noticed, that gesture which has remained with me ever since. Do not be afraid of Papa, said the apparition. I was not dead. Somebody tried to steal my rings and cut one of my fingers, the blood began to flow, and that restored me to life. 
and, in fact, I could see that her hand was covered with blood. I fell on my knees, choking with sobs and with a rattling in my throat. Then, when I had somewhat collected my thoughts, though I was still so bewildered that I scarcely realized the awesome happiness that had befallen me, I made her go up to my room and sit down in my easy chair. Then I rang excitedly for Prosper to get him to rekindle the fire and to bring some wine, and to summon assistance. The man entered, stared at my daughter, opened his mouth with a gasp of alarm and stupefaction, and then fell back dead. It was he who had opened the vault, who had mutilated and then abandoned my daughter, for he could not efface the traces of the theft. He had not even taken the trouble to put back the coffin into its place, feeling sure, besides, that he would not be suspected by me, as I trusted him absolutely. You see, Monsieur, that we are very unfortunate people. He was silent. The night had fallen, casting its shadows over the desolate, mournful veil, and a sort of mysterious fear possessed me at finding myself by the side of those strange beings, of this young girl who had come back from the tomb. And this father with his uncanny spasm. I found it impossible to make any comment on this dreadful story. I only murmured. What a horrible thing! Then, after a minute's silence, I added. Let us go indoors. I think it is growing cool. And we made our way back to the hotel. In the wood. As the mayor was about to sit down to breakfast, word was brought to him that the rural policeman, with two prisoners, was awaiting him at the Hotel de Ville. He went there at once and found old Hoshider standing guard before a middle-class couple whom he was regarding with a severe expression on his face. The man, a fat old fellow with a red nose and white hair, seemed utterly dejected. While the woman, a little roundabout individual with shining cheeks, looked at the official who had arrested them, with defiant eyes. What is it? What is it, Hoshider? The rural policeman made his deposition, he had gone out that morning at his usual time, in order to patrol his beat from the forest of Champiax as far as the boundaries of Argentai. He had not noticed anything unusual in the country except that it was a fine day, and that the wheat was doing well, when the son of old Bredel, who was going over his vines, called out to him, Here, Daddy Hoshider. Go and have a look at the outskirts of the wood. In the first thicket you will find a pair of pigeons who must be a hundred thirty years old between them. He went in the direction indicated, entered the thicket, and there he heard words which made him suspect a flagrant breach of morality. Advancing, therefore, on his hands and knees as if to surprise a poacher, he had arrested the couple whom he found there. The mayor looked at the culprits in astonishment, for the man was certainly sixty, and the woman fifty-five at least, and he began to question them, beginning with the man, who replied in such a weak voice that he could scarcely be heard. What is your name? Nicholas Berain. Your occupation? Haberdasher, in the Rue des Martyrs, in Paris. What were you doing in the wood? The haberdasher remained silent, with his eyes on his fat paunch, and his hands hanging at his sides, and the mayor continued. Do you deny what the officer of the municipal authority states? No, monsieur. So you confess it? Yes, monsieur. What have you to say in your defense? Nothing, monsieur. Where did you meet the partner in your misdemeanor? She is my wife, monsieur. Your wife? Yes, monsieur. Then, then, you do not live together in Paris? I beg your pardon, monsieur, but we are living together. But in that case, you must be mad, altogether mad, my dear sir, to get caught playing lovers in the country at ten o'clock in the morning. The haberdasher seemed ready to cry with shame, and he muttered, it was she who enticed me. I told her it was very stupid, but when a woman once gets a thing into her head, you know, you cannot get it out. The mayor, who liked a joke, smiled and replied, in your case, the contrary ought to have happened. You would not be here, if she had had the idea only in her head. Then Monsieur Bowine was seized with rage and turning to his wife, he said, do you see to what you have brought us with your poetry? And now we shall have to go before the courts at our age, for a breach of morals. And we shall have to shut up the shop, sell our goodwill, and go to some other neighborhood. That's what it has come to. 
Madame Borain got up, and without looking at her husband, she explained herself without embarrassment, without useless modesty, and almost without hesitation. Of course, monsieur, I know that we have made ourselves ridiculous. Will you allow me to plead my cause like an advocate, or rather like a poor woman? And I hope that you will be kind enough to send us home, and to spare us the disgrace of a prosecution. Years ago, when I was young, I made Monsieur Burin's acquaintance one Sunday in this neighborhood. He was employed in a draper's shop, and I was a saleswoman in a ready-made clothing establishment. I remember it as if it were yesterday. I used to come and spend Sundays here occasionally with a friend of mine, Rose Levesque, with whom I lived in the Rue Pagal, and Rose had a sweetheart, while I had none. He used to bring us here, and one Saturday he told me laughing that he should bring a friend with him the next day. I quite understood what he meant, but I replied that it would be no good, for I was virtuous, monsieur. The next day we met Monsieur Beaurain at the railway station, and in those days he was good-looking but I had made up my mind not to encourage him, and I did not. Well, we arrived at Bezin's. It was a lovely day, the sort of day that touches your heart. When it is fine even now, just as it used to be formerly, I grow quite foolish, and when I am in the country I utterly lose my head. The green grass, the swallows flying so swiftly, the smell of the grass, the scarlet poppies, the daisies, all that makes me crazy. It is like champagne when one is not accustomed to it. Well, it was lovely weather, warm and bright, and it seemed to penetrate your body through your eyes when you looked and through your mouth when you breathed. Rose and Simon hugged and kissed each other every minute, and that gave me a queer feeling. Monsieur Beaurain and I walked behind them, without speaking much, for when people do not know each other, they do not find anything to talk about. He looked timid, and I liked to see his embarrassment. At last we got to the little wood, it was as cool as in a bath there, and we four sat down. Rose and her lover teased me because I looked rather stern, but you will understand that I could not be otherwise. And then they began to kiss and hug again, without putting any more restraint upon themselves than if we had not been there. And then they whispered together, and got up and went off among the trees, without saying a word. You may fancy what I looked like, alone with this young fellow whom I saw for the first time. I felt so confused at seeing them go that it gave me courage, and I began to talk. I asked him what his business was, and he said he was a linen draper's assistant, as I told you just now. We talked for a few minutes, and that made him bold, and he wanted to take liberties with me, but I told him sharply to keep his place. Is not that true, Monsieur Borain? Monsieur Borain, who was looking at his feet in confusion, did not reply, and she continued, then he saw that I was virtuous, and he began to make love to me nicely, like an honorable man, and from that time he came every Sunday. For he was very much in love with me. I was very fond of him also, very fond of him. He was a good-looking fellow, formerly, and in short he married me the next September, and we started in business in the Rue des Martyrs. It was a hard struggle for some years, monsieur. Business did not prosper, and we could not afford many country excursions, and, besides, we had got out of the way of them. One has other things in one's head, and thinks more of the cash box than of pretty speeches, when one is in business. We were growing old by degrees without perceiving it, like quiet people who do not think much about love. One does not regret anything as long as one does not notice what one has lost. And then, Monsieur, business became better, and we were tranquil as to the future. Then, you see, I do not exactly know what went on in my mind, no, I really do not know, but I began to dream like a little boarding school girl. The sight of the little carts full of flowers which are drawn about the streets made me cry, the smell of violets sought me out in my easy chair, behind my cash box, and made my heart beat. Then I would get up and go out on the doorstep to look at the blue sky between the roofs. When one looks up at the sky from the street, it looks like a river which is descending on Paris, winding as it flows, and the swallows pass to and fro in it like fish. These ideas are very stupid at my age. But how can one help it, monsieur, when one has worked all one's life? A moment comes in which one perceives that one could have done something else, and that one regrets, oh. Yes, one feels intense regret. Just think, 
For twenty years I might have gone and had kisses in the woods, like other women. I used to think how delightful it would be to lie under the trees and be in love with someone. And I thought of it every day and every night. I dreamed of the moonlight on the water, until I felt inclined to drown myself. I did not venture to speak to Monsieur Borain about this at first. I knew that he would make fun of me and send me back to sell my needles and cotton. And then, to speak the truth, Monsieur Borain never said much to me, but when I looked in the glass, I also understood quite well that I no longer appealed to anyone. Well, I made up my mind, and I proposed to him an excursion into the country, to the place where we had first become acquainted. He agreed without mistrusting anything, and we arrived here this morning, about nine o'clock. I felt quite young again when I got among the wheat, for a woman's heart never grows old. And really, I no longer saw my husband as he is at present, but just as he was formerly. That I will swear to you, monsieur. As true as I am standing here I was crazy. I began to kiss him, and he was more surprised than if I had tried to murder him. He kept saying to me, why, you must be mad. You are mad this morning. What is the matter with you? I did not listen to him, I only listened to my own heart, and I made him come into the wood with me. That is all. I have spoken the truth, Monsieur Le Maire, the whole truth. The mayor was a sensible man. He rose from his chair, smiled, and said, Go in peace, madam, and when you again visit our forests, be more discreet. Martine. It came to him one Sunday after Mass. He was walking home from church along the by-road that led to his house when he saw ahead of him Martine, who was also going home. Her father walked beside his daughter with the important gait of a rich farmer. Discarding the smock, he wore a short coat of grey cloth and on his head a round-topped hat with wide brim. She, laced up in a corset which she wore only once a week, walked along erect, with her squeezed-in waist, her broad shoulders and prominent hips, swinging herself a little. She wore a hat trimmed with flowers, made by a milliner at Ivetot, and displayed the back of her full, round, supple neck, reddened by the sun and air, on which fluttered little stray locks of hair. The noist saw only her back. But he knew well the face he loved, without, however, having ever noticed it more closely than he did now. Suddenly he said, Nom dun nom, she is a fine girl, all the same, that Martine. He watched her as she walked, admiring her hastily, feeling a desire taking possession of him. He did not long to see her face again, no. He kept gazing at her figure, repeating to himself, Nom dun nom, she is a fine girl. Martine turned to the right to enter La Martinier, the farm of her father, Jean Martin, and she cast a glance behind her as she turned round. She saw Benoist, who looked to her very comical. She called out, Good morning, Benoist. He replied, Good morning, Martine, good morning, mate Martin, and went on his way. When he reached home the soup was on the table. He sat down opposite his mother beside the farmhand and the hired man while the maid-servant went to draw some cider. He ate a few spoonfuls, then pushed away his plate. His mother said, Don't you feel well? No. I feel as if I had some pap in my stomach and that takes away my appetite. He watched the others eating, as he cut himself a piece of bread from time to time and carried it lazily to his mouth, masticating it slowly. He thought of Martine. She is a fine girl, all the same. And to think that he had not noticed it before, and that it came to him, just like that, all at once, and with such force that he could not eat. He did not touch the stew. His mother said, Come, Benoist, try and eat a little, it is loin of mutton, it will do you good. When one has no appetite, they should force themselves to eat. He swallowed a few morsels, then, pushing away his plate, said, No. I can't go that, positively. When they rose from table he walked round the farm, telling the farmhand he might go home and that he would drive up the animals as he passed by them. The country was deserted, as it was the day of rest. Here and there in a field of clover cows were moving along heavily, with full bellies, chewing their cud under a blazing sun. Unharnessed plows were standing at the end of a furrow. 
and the upturned earth ready for the seed showed broad brown patches of stubble of wheat and oats that had lately been harvested. A rather dry autumn wind blew across the plain, promising a cool evening after the sun had set. Benoist sat down on a ditch, placed his hat on his knees as if he needed to cool off his head, and said aloud in the stillness of the country, If you want a fine girl, she is a fine girl. He thought of it again at night, in his bed, and in the morning when he awoke. He was not sad, he was not discontented, he could not have told what ailed him. It was something that had hold of him, something fastened in his mind, an idea that would not leave him and that produced a sort of tickling sensation in his heart. Sometimes a big fly is shut up in a room. You hear it flying about, buzzing, and the noise haunts you, irritates you. Suddenly it stops, you forget it, but all at once it begins again, obliging you to look up. You cannot catch it, nor drive it away, nor kill it, nor make it keep still. As soon as it settles for a second, it starts off buzzing again. The recollection of Martine disturbed Benoist's mind like an imprisoned fly. Then he longed to see her again and walked past the Martinier several times. He saw her, at last, hanging out some clothes on a line stretched between two apple trees. It was a warm day. She had on only a short skirt and her chemise, showing the curves of her figure as she hung up the towels. He remained there, concealed by the hedge, for more than an hour, even after she had left. He returned home more obsessed with her image than ever. For a month his mind was full of her, he trembled when her name was mentioned in his presence. He could not eat, he had night sweats that kept him from sleeping. On Sunday, at Mass, he never took his eyes off her. She noticed it and smiled at him, flattered at his appreciation. One evening, he suddenly met her in the road. She stopped short when she saw him coming. Then he walked right up to her, choking with fear and emotion, but determined to speak to her. He began falteringly. See here, Martine, this cannot go on like this any longer. She replied as if she wanted to tease him. What cannot go on any longer, Benoist? My thinking of you as many hours as there are in the day, he answered. She put her hands on her hips. I do not oblige you to do so. Yes, it is you, he stammered. I cannot sleep, nor rest, nor eat, nor anything. What do you need to cure you of all that, she asked. He stood there in dismay, his arms swinging, his eyes staring, his mouth agape. She hit him a punch in the stomach and ran off. From that day they met each other along the roadside, in byroads or else at twilight on the edge of a field, when he was going home with his horses and she was driving her cows home to the stable. He felt himself carried, cast toward her by a strong impulse of his heart and body. He would have liked to squeeze her, strangle her, eat her, make her part of himself. And he trembled with impotence, impatience, rage, to think she did not belong to him entirely, as if they were one being. People gossiped about it in the countryside. They said they were engaged. He had, besides, asked her if she would be his wife, and she had answered yes. They were waiting for an opportunity to talk to their parents about it. But, all at once, she stopped coming to meet him at the usual hour. He did not even see her as he wandered round the farm. He could only catch a glimpse of her at Mass on Sunday. And one Sunday, after the sermon, the priest actually published the bans of marriage between Victoire Adelaide Martin and Josephine Isidore Vallon. Benoist felt a sensation in his hands as if the blood had been drained off. He had a buzzing in the ears, and could hear nothing, and presently he perceived that his tears were falling on his prayer book. For a month he stayed in his room. Then he went back to his work. But he was not cured, and it was always in his mind. He avoided the roads that led past her home, so that he might not even see the trees in the yard, and this obliged him to make a great circuit morning and evening. She was now married to Valen, the richest farmer in the district. Benoist and he did not speak now, though they had been comrades from childhood. One evening, as Benoist was passing the town hall, he heard that she was enceinte. Instead of experiencing a feeling of sorrow, he experienced, on the contrary, a feeling of relief. It was over, now, all over. They were more separated by that than by her marriage. 
he really preferred that it should be so. Months passed, and more months. He caught sight of her, occasionally, going to the village with a heavier step than usual. She blushed as she saw him, lowered her head and quickened her pace. And he turned out of his way so as not to pass her and meet her glance. He dreaded the thought that he might one morning meet her face to face and be obliged to speak to her. What could he say to her now, after all he had said formerly, when he held her hands as he kissed her hair beside her cheeks? He often thought of those meetings along the roadside. She had acted horridly after all her promises. By degrees his grief diminished, leaving only sadness behind. And one day he took the old road that led past the farm where she now lived. He looked at the roof from a distance. It was there, in there, that she lived with another. The apple trees were in bloom, the cocks crowed on the dung hill. The whole dwelling seemed empty, the farmhands had gone to the fields to their spring toil. He stopped near the gate and looked into the yard. The dog was asleep outside his kennel, three calves were walking slowly, one behind the other, towards the pond. A big turkey was strutting before the door, parading before the turkey hens like a singer at the opera. Benoist leaned against the gatepost and was suddenly seized with a desire to weep. But suddenly, he heard a cry, a loud cry for help coming from the house. He was struck with dismay, his hands grasping the wooden bars of the gate, and listened attentively. Another cry, a prolonged, heartrending cry, reached his ears, his soul, his flesh. It was she who was crying like that. He darted inside, crossed the grass patch, pushed open the door, and saw her lying on the floor, her body drawn up, her face livid, her eyes haggard, in the throes of childbirth. He stood there, trembling and paler than she was, and stammered. Here I am, here I am, Martine. She replied in gasps. Oh, do not leave me, do not leave me, Benoist. He looked at her, not knowing what to say, what to do. She began to cry out again. Oh, oh, it is killing me. Oh, Benoist. She writhed frightfully. Benoist was suddenly seized with a frantic longing to help her, to quiet her, to remove her pain. He leaned over, lifted her up and laid her on her bed. And while she kept on moaning he began to take off her clothes, her jacket, her skirt and her petticoat. She bit her fists to keep from crying out. Then he did as he was accustomed to doing for cows, ewes, and mares, he assisted in delivering her and found in his hands a large infant who was moaning. He wiped it off and wrapped it up in a towel that was drying in front of the fire, and laid it on a bundle of clothes ready for ironing that was on the table. Then he went back to the mother. He took her up and placed her on the floor again, then he changed the bedclothes and put her back into bed. She faltered. Thank you, Benoist, you have a noble heart. And then she wept a little as if she felt regretful. He did not love her any longer, not the least bit. It was all over. Why? How? He could not have said. What had happened had cured him better than ten years of absence. She asked, exhausted and trembling. What is it? He replied calmly. It is a very fine girl. Then they were silent again. At the end of a few moments, the mother, in a weak voice, said. Show her to me, Benoist. He took up the little one and was showing it to her as if he were holding the consecrated wafer, when the door opened, and Isidore Valen appeared. He did not understand at first, then all at once he guessed. Benoist, in consternation, stammered out. I was passing, I was just passing by when I heard her crying out, and I came, there is your child, Valen. Then the husband, his eyes full of tears, stepped forward, took the little mite of humanity that he held out to him, kissed it, unable to speak from emotion for a few seconds. Then placing the child on the bed, he held out both hands to Benoist, saying, Your hand upon it, Benoist. From now on we understand each other. If you are willing, we will be a pair of friends, a pair of friends. And Benoist replied, Indeed I will, certainly, indeed I will. All over. Comte de Lormarin had just finished dressing. 
He cast a parting glance at the large mirror which occupied an entire panel in his dressing room and smiled. He was really a fine-looking man still, although quite gray. Tall, slight, elegant, with no sign of a paunch, with a small mustache of doubtful shade, which might be called fair, he had a walk, a nobility, a chic, in short. That indescribable something which establishes a greater difference between two men than would millions of money. He murmured. Lormarin is still alive. And he went into the drawing room where his correspondence awaited him. On his table, where everything had its place, the work table of the gentleman who never works, there were a dozen letters lying beside three newspapers of different opinions. With a single touch he spread out all these letters, like a gambler giving the choice of a card, and he scanned the handwriting, a thing he did each morning before opening the envelopes. It was for him a moment of delightful expectancy, of inquiry, and vague anxiety. What did these sealed mysterious letters bring him? What did they contain of pleasure, of happiness, or of grief? He surveyed them with a rapid sweep of the eye, recognizing the writing, selecting them, making two or three lots, according to what he expected from them. Here, friends, there, persons to whom he was indifferent, further on, strangers. The last kind always gave him a little uneasiness. What did they want from him? What hand had traced those curious characters full of thoughts, promises, or threats? This day one letter in particular caught his eye. It was simple, nevertheless, without seeming to reveal anything, but he looked at it uneasily, with a sort of chill at his heart. He thought, from whom can it be? I certainly know this writing, and yet I can't identify it. He raised it to a level with his face, holding it delicately between two fingers, striving to read through the envelope, without making up his mind to open it. Then he smelled it, and snatched up from the table a little magnifying glass which he used in studying all the niceties of handwriting. He suddenly felt unnerved. Whom is it from? This hand is familiar to me, very familiar. I must have often read its tracings, yes, very often. But this must have been a long, long time ago. Whom the deuce can it be from? Pooh. It's only somebody asking for money. And he tore open the letter. Then he read. My dear friend, you have, without doubt, forgotten me, for it is now. Twenty-five years since we saw each other. I was young, I am old. When I bade you farewell, I left Paris in order to follow into the provinces my husband, my old husband, whom you used to call my hospital. Do you remember him? He died five years ago, and now I am returning to Paris to get my daughter married, for I have a daughter, a beautiful girl of eighteen, whom you have never seen. I informed you of her birth but you certainly did not pay much attention to so trifling an event. You are still the handsome Lormoran, so I have been told. Well, if you still recollect little Lees, whom you used to call Lyson, come and dine with her this evening, with the elderly Baron de Vance. Your ever faithful friend, who, with some emotion, although happy, reaches out to you a devoted hand, which you must clasp, but no. Longer kiss, my poor Jacklet. Lise de Vance. Lormoran's heart began to throb. He remained sunk in his armchair with the letter on his knees, staring straight before him, overcome by a poignant emotion that made the tears mount up to his eyes. If he had ever loved a woman in his life it was this one, little Lise, Lise de Vance, whom he called Ashflower, on account of the strange color of her hair and the pale gray of her eyes. Oh. What a dainty, pretty, charming creature she was, this frail baron, the wife of that gouty, pimply baron, who had abruptly carried her off to the provinces, shut her up, kept her in seclusion through jealousy, jealousy of the handsome Lormoran. Yes, he had loved her, and he believed that he too, had been truly loved. She familiarly gave him, the name of Jacklet, and would pronounce that word in a delicious fashion. A thousand forgotten memories came back to him far, off and sweet and melancholy now. One evening she had called on him on her way home from a ball, and they went for a stroll in the Bois de Boulogne, she in evening dress, he in his dressing jacket. 
It was springtime, the weather was beautiful. The fragrance from her bodice embalmed the warm air the odor of her bodice, and perhaps, too, the fragrance of her skin. What a divine night! When they reached the lake, as the moon's rays fell across the branches into the water, she began to weep. A little surprised, he asked her why. I don't know. The moon and the water have affected me. Every time I see poetic things I have a tightening at the heart, and I have to cry. He smiled, affected himself, considering her feminine emotion charming, the unaffected emotion of a poor little woman, whom every sensation overwhelms. And he embraced her passionately, stammering. My little Lise, you are exquisite. What a charming love affair, short-lived and dainty, it had been and over all too quickly, cut short in the midst of its ardor by this old brute of a baron, who had carried off his wife, and never let anyone see her afterward. Lormorin had forgotten, in fact, at the end of two or three months. One woman dries out another so quickly in Paris, when one is a bachelor. No matter, he had kept a little altar for her in his heart, for he had loved her alone. He assured himself now that this was so. He rose and said aloud, Certainly, I will go and dine with her this evening. And instinctively he turned toward the mirror to inspect himself from head to foot. He reflected, she must look very old, older than I look. And he felt gratified at the thought of showing himself to her still handsome, still fresh, of astonishing her, perhaps of filling her with emotion, and making her regret those bygone days so far, far distant. He turned his attention to the other letters. They were of no importance. The whole day he kept thinking of this ghost of other days. What was she like now? How strange it was to meet in this way, after twenty-five years. But would he recognize her? He made his toilet with feminine coquetry, put on a white waistcoat, which suited him better with the coat than a black one, sent for the hairdresser to give him a finishing touch with the curling iron, for he had preserved his hair. And started very early, in order to show his eagerness to see her. The first thing he saw on entering a pretty drawing-room newly furnished was his own portrait, an old faded photograph, dating from the days when he was a beau, hanging on the wall in an antique silk frame. He sat down and waited. A door opened behind him. He rose up abruptly, and, turning round, beheld an old woman with white hair who extended both hands toward him. He seized them, kissed them one after the other several times. Then, lifting up his head, he gazed at the woman he had loved. Yes, it was an old lady, an old lady whom he did not recognize, and who, while she smiled, seemed ready to weep. He could not abstain from murmuring. Is it you, Lise? She replied. Yes, it is I, it is I, indeed. You would not have known me, would you? I have had so much sorrow, so much sorrow. Sorrow has consumed my life. Look at me now, or, rather, don't look at me. But how handsome you have kept, and young. If I had by chance met you in the street I would have exclaimed, Jacklet. Now, sit down and let us, first of all, have a chat. And then I will call my daughter, my grown-up daughter. You'll see how she resembles me, or, rather, how I resembled her, no, it is not quite that, she is just like the me of former days, you shall see. But I wanted to be alone with you first. I feared that there would be some emotion on my side, at the first moment. Now it is all over, it is past. Pray be seated, my friend. He sat down beside her, holding her hand, but he did not know what to say. He did not know this woman, it seemed to him that he had never seen her before. Why had he come to this house? What could he talk about? Of the long ago? What was there in common between him and her? He could no longer recall anything in presence of this grandmotherly face. He could no longer recall all the nice, tender things, so sweet, so bitter, that had come to his mind that morning when he thought of the other, of little Lees, of the dainty ash flower. What, then, had become of her, the former one, the one he had loved? That woman of far-off dreams, the blonde with gray eyes, the young girl who used to call him Jacklet so prettily? They remained side by side, motionless, both constrained, troubled, profoundly ill at ease. 
As they talked only commonplaces, awkwardly and spasmodically and slowly, she rose and pressed the button of the bell. I am going to call Renee, she said. There was a tap at the door, then the rustle of a dress, then a young voice exclaimed. Here I am, Mama. Lormorin remained bewildered, as at the sight of an apparition. He stammered. Good day, Mademoiselle. Then, turning toward the mother. Oh. It is you. In fact, it was she, she whom he had known in bygone days, the Lees who had vanished and come back. In her he found the woman he had won twenty-five years before. This one was even younger, fresher, more childlike. He felt a wild desire to open his arms, to clasp her to his heart again, murmuring in her ear. Good morning, Lyson. A manservant announced. Dinner is ready, madam. And they proceeded toward the dining room. What passed at this dinner? What did they say to him, and what could he say in reply? He found himself plunged in one of those strange dreams which border on insanity. He gazed at the two women with a fixed idea in his mind, a morbid, self-contradictory idea. Which is the real one? The mother smiled again repeating over and over. Do you remember? And it was in the bright eyes of the young girl that he found again his memories of the past. Twenty times he opened his mouth to say to her, Do you remember, Lyson? forgetting this white-haired lady who was looking at him tenderly. And yet, there were moments when, he no longer felt sure, when he lost his head. He could see that the woman of today was not exactly the woman of long ago. The other one, the former one, had in her voice, in her glances, in her entire being, something which he did not find again. And he made prodigious efforts of mind to recall his lady love, to seize again what had escaped from her, what this resuscitated one did not possess. The Baron said. You have lost your old vivacity, my poor friend. He murmured. There are many other things that I have lost. But in his heart, touched with emotion, he felt his old love springing to life once more, like an awakened wild beast ready to bite him. The young girl went on chattering, and every now and then some familiar intonation, some expression of her mother's, a certain style of speaking and thinking, that resemblance of mind and manner which people acquire by living together, shook Lormorin from head to foot. All these things penetrated him, making the reopened wound of his passion bleed anew. He got away early and took a turn along the boulevard. But the image of this young girl pursued him, haunted him, quickened his heart, inflamed his blood. Apart from the two women, he now saw only one, a young one, the old one come back out of the past, and he loved her as he had loved her in bygone years. He loved her with greater ardor, after an interval of twenty-five years. He went home to reflect on this strange and terrible thing, and to think what he should do. But, as he was passing, with a wax candle in his hand, before the glass, the large glass in which he had contemplated himself and admired himself before he started, he saw reflected there an elderly, gray-haired man. And suddenly he recollected what he had been in olden days, in the days of little Lees. He saw himself charming and handsome, as he had been when he was loved. Then, drawing the light nearer, he looked at himself more closely, as one inspects a strange thing with a magnifying glass, tracing the wrinkles, discovering those frightful ravages, which he had not perceived till now. And he sat down, crushed at the sight of himself, at the sight of his lamentable image, murmuring. All over, Lormorin. The parrot. I. Everybody in Fee Camp knew Mother Patton's story. She had certainly been unfortunate with her husband, for in his lifetime he used to beat her, just as wheat is threshed in the barn. He was master of a fishing bark and had married her, formerly, because she was pretty, although poor. Patton was a good sailor, but brutal. He used to frequent Father Aubin's inn where he would usually drink four or five glasses of brandy, on lucky days eight or ten glasses and even more, according to his mood. The brandy was served to the customers by Father Aubin's daughter, a pleasing brunette, who attracted people to the house only by her pretty face, for nothing had ever been gossiped about her. Patton, when he entered the inn, would be satisfied to look at her and to compliment her politely and respectfully. 
after he had had his first glass of brandy he would already find her much nicer, at the second he would wink. At the third he would say. If you were only willing, Mamselle Desiree, without ever finishing his sentence, at the fourth he would try to hold her back by her skirt in order to kiss her. And when he went as high as ten it was Father Aubin who brought him the remaining drinks. The old innkeeper, who knew all the tricks of the trade, made Desiree walk about between the tables in order to increase the consumption of drinks. And Desiree, who was a worthy daughter of Father Aubin, flitted around among the benches and joked with them, her lips smiling and her eyes sparkling. Patton got so well accustomed to Desiree's face that he thought of it even while at sea, when throwing out his nets, in storms or in calms, on moonlit or dark evenings. He thought of her while holding the tiller in the stern of his boat, while his four companions were slumbering with their heads on their arms. He always saw her, smiling, pouring out the yellow brandy with a peculiar shoulder movement and then exclaiming as she turned away, There, now, are you satisfied? He saw her so much in his mind's eye that he was overcome by an irresistible desire to marry her, and, not being able to hold out any longer, he asked for her hand. He was rich, owned his own vessel, his nets in a little house at the foot of the hill on the retinue, whereas Father Aubin had nothing. The marriage was therefore eagerly agreed upon and the wedding took place as soon as possible, as both parties were desirous for the affair to be concluded as early as convenient. Three days after the wedding Patton could no longer understand how he had ever imagined Desiree to be different from other women. What a fool he had been to encumber himself with a penniless creature, who had undoubtedly inveigled him with some drug which she had put in his brandy. He would curse all day long, break his pipe with his teeth and maul his crew. After he had sworn by every known term at everything that came his way he would rid himself of his remaining anger on the fish and lobsters, which he pulled from the nets and threw into the baskets amid oaths and foul language. When he returned home he would find his wife, Father Aubin's daughter, within reach of his mouth and hand, and it was not long before he treated her like the lowest creature in the world. As she listened calmly, accustomed to paternal violence, he grew exasperated at her quiet, and one evening he beat her. Then life at his home became unbearable. For ten years, the principal topic of conversation on the retinue was about the beatings that Patton gave his wife and his manner of cursing at her for the least thing. He could, indeed, curse with a richness of vocabulary in a roundness of tone unequaled by any other man in fee camp. As soon as his ship was sighted at the entrance of the harbor, returning from the fishing expedition, everyone awaited the first volley he would hurl from the bridge as soon as he perceived his wife's white cap. Standing at the stern he would steer, his eye fixed on the bows and on the sail, and, notwithstanding the difficulty of the narrow passage and the height of the turbulent waves, he would search among the watching women and try to recognize his wife. Father Aubin's daughter, the wretch. Then, as soon as he saw her, notwithstanding the noise of the wind and waves, he would let loose upon her with such power and volubility that every one would laugh, although they pitied her greatly. When he arrived at the dock he would relieve his mind, while unloading the fish, in such an expressive manner that he attracted around him all the loafers of the neighborhood. The words left his mouth sometimes like shots from a cannon, short and terrible, sometimes like peals of thunder, which roll and rumble for five minutes. Such a hurricane of oaths that he seemed to have in his lungs one of the storms of the Eternal Father. When he left his ship and found himself face to face with her, surrounded by all the gossips of the neighborhood, he would bring up a new cargo of insults and bring her back to their dwelling, she in front, he behind, she weeping, he yelling at her. At last, when alone with her behind closed doors, he would thrash her on the slightest pretext. The least thing was sufficient to make him raise his hand, and when he had once begun he did not stop, but he would throw into her face the true motive for his anger. At each blow he would roar, There, you beggar! There, you wretch! There, you pauper! What a bright thing I did when I rinsed my mouth with your rascal of a father's apology for brandy! The poor woman lived in continual fear, in a ceaseless trembling of body and soul, in everlasting expectation of outrageous thrashings. This lasted ten years. She was so timorous that she would grow pale whenever she spoke to anyone, and she thought of nothing but the blows with which she was threatened, and she became thinner, more yellow and drier than a smoked fish. 
2. One night, when her husband was at sea, she was suddenly awakened by the wild roaring of the wind. She sat up in her bed, trembling, but, as she hear nothing more, she lay down again.